comes around with his talent scouts at this time on Monday has just about finished his summer holiday. Godfrey will be back with us two weeks from tonight on August 28th. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's the shrieking edge of a numb universe that lies in the shadows and licks its wounds. And it's wasteland, a tinseled wasteland that wears the motley, wears the scarlet of neon, the harsh gold of a trumpet scream, the kaleidoscope of color a tear makes when it's held up to the light. There's the color of the desolate wind that sighs through Broadway, nameless and cold. The wind that drifts, touches everything, seeps in through windows and under doors, and lends its quality to whatever room in which it dies. Like the room where I was standing. Mrs. Branch's rooming house. Cretan drapes. Dusty. Beaded lamp. Dusty. Wash basin. Rust stained. The bed pulled down from the wall. The crumpled sheets. And the dead woman. And Mrs. Branch not believing a bit of it. Oh, I know it. I know it. I know it. What, Mrs. Branch? Someone's going to come along and pinch me and I'm going to wake up and this whole thing will be a dream. Won't it, Mr. Clover? No. Who is this girl? I'm going to tell you because it doesn't matter, because it's a dream. Her name's Mary Dimming. How long has she lived here? Four years. Five. One morning she rang my doorbell. She had a black suitcase in her hand. I liked her. She liked me. Yes, she stayed. Always paid her rent. Now... Oh, I don't believe it. Now she's dead, Mrs. Branch. She's been stabbed to death. You've got to convince yourself of that and help. Who were her friends? Oh, she was very popular. Whenever the doorbell rang or the phone, it was for Mary. I often wondered why she didn't marry with so many friends. Tell me how you found her. Well, I brought Mary her coffee this morning. She didn't smile when she saw me. Something was wrong, I told myself. I shook her, and then I saw the knife. And then I said to myself, someone's going to come along and pinch me in this whole but thing. But you called the police, anyhow. I pride myself on presence of mind in any circumstances. Did she have any visitors last night? I wouldn't know. I wasn't home. Oh, that book. What about it? Mary loved it so. It was her dearest possession. A yearbook from high school, you know. She loved to look at it before she went to sleep. I suppose that's why it's on the bed beside her. Here, let me show you. What? You see. You see. Mary's picture in a yearbook. Uh-huh. Mary Deming. Voted by the class of 1937. Is as... the girl most likely to succeed, Mr. Clover? Isn't that nice? Fingers of sunlight reached through the windows hung with the torn, soot-stained cretan, reached out for the woman lying there, touched her face, her throat, her shoulders. For an instant, youth flowed over the dead woman's body. The youth her dead hand held in the shape of a high school yearbook. For an instant, a girl lay there in sleep, sun warm in the power that is a girl's. Then the instant was gone. A little while they came, the servicemen of death, the technical man, the photographers, the coroner, Mugovan. I gave Mugovan the notes I'd made, the yearbook, told him what I needed, sent him on his way. A little while after it was done, the men in the white jackets brought up the wicker basket and the joke to fit the occasion. At headquarters, a man stood at my desk, a bald man, eating a big red apple, enjoying it. It was Sergeant Gino Tertaglian. Danny, I was saving this for you for my lunch, but it took you such a long time, I couldn't save it no longer. <laughs> I know, Gino. Did Mugovan... Yeah, did... yeah, he gave me a message, Danny, and I got all the dope right here in my pocket. Well, let's take it out and look at it, shall we? Huh? Oh, oh, sure, sure. I can tell you what's in the dope without you looking if you want. Okay, I want. The girl, lately deceased, Mary Deeming. 
Shadow police record. Oh. Not that serious the way you said, oh, Danny. A record that is not unordinary among certain type people. Reckless driving, driving while under the influence, bashing a cop in the eye because he stopped her while she was doing 90 on a Sunday afternoon, disturbances of the peace on occasion, shoplifting, little ordinary things like that. Uh, anything else? Uh, not for me, Danny. You, Muggerman? Yeah, Danny. I checked and cross-checked the high school yearbook like you told me. Mary Deming against everybody else in the book. Something? Maybe. Anyway, I came up with the names of four students that the Deming girls seemed to be most intimate with during the high school years. Uh, who were they? Uh, I made up a list, Danny, here. I traced their addresses, their occupations. Three of them, anyhow. Fourth is going to take more time. Thanks, Muggerman. Wasn't too easy, Danny. Cross-checking all that stuff. The sororities, the uh, San Susi French language club, the lettermen, the a cappella choir, the proms, the national thespians. All that high school stuff wasn't easy. <laughs> Tell Gino about it, Muggerman. He'll save you a big red apple. So it began, a woman dead in a boarding house, and her last identification with life, a high school yearbook. A woman, anonymous except for that. Somewhere, if Muggerman's checking was correct, four people had intruded upon her life, tempered it, perhaps shaped her dying. Only perhaps, a policeman has to make sure. Call on number one, George Ferris, football player, who made All-State back in 1937. Now department store floor walker. Wade through the ladies' wear department, through the bookstore, down the escalator, and seek out the man who quarterbacked the bargain basement. And pose a name for him. Uh, Mary Deming, you said. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what about her? Uh, Mary Deming. Mr. Ferris, will you okay this charge, too? Uh-huh. There we are. Thank you, Mr. Ferris. Now, uh, now then about Mary Deming. She's dead. Well, now. Well, well... Uh, I guess we're all getting old, Mr. Clover. Just last week, I met old Polyakov. You know, Ferris to Polyakov. What a combination we were. I flipped him, he caught him. Ferris to Polyakov. Polyakov said we were all getting old. Yeah, rackety racks and a locomotive for us. So Mary's dead. We found her this morning with a knife in her back. You know, she had to end that way. Why? Human nature. It's in the books, Mr. Clover. Mary Deming was wild for her age. Wild? What do you mean? Boys. Lots of them. That included you? I was a star quarterback. She wore my sweater for a week. Then one Monday afternoon, I saw her in the drugstore with a left tackle. Yeah, Mary Deming was a wild kid. I liked her. For the week, I knew her. Have you seen her since high school? Yeah, about a year ago, when I was in ladies' lingerie, a woman with a shopping bag was stealing one of our 498 items. Mary Deming. Did you have her arrested? Well. Well? Yes, I did. After all, I worked for this store. Sure. That's the last time I saw her. Mary Deming. Well, well. The next on the list Muggerman had compiled from the yearbook was a woman. Lillian Hess. Address New Rochelle. Occupation, unmarried. Her picture came to mind. A girl with a plain face with gentle eyes. A sweet smile. Her dark hair cut in a page boy. The woman who opened the door was the same girl, the same plain face, the same gentle eyes, the same sweet smile, the same cut of hair. Time had only touched the corners of her mouth, had drawn the lips back and down, had brushed her cheeks delicately with shadow, hollowed them slightly. That was all. Even her voice was a girl's voice. What is it? What do you want? I'm uh, Danny Clover of the police. I want to talk to you about Mary Deming. Oh, of course you do. I'm practically the only girlfriend Mary has. Please come in. Let's go into the den. I call it a den. I suppose a man would call it that. You said you were practic practically Mary's only girlfriend? I'm proud of it. I like Mary. I like her a lot. No matter what the other girls say about her, there's more to Mary than they... Well, they just don't understand her, that's all. Miss Hess, Mary Deming is, uh... What I want to say is that she's... You want to tell me that Mary is dead. I know that, Mr. Clover. I saw the afternoon paper. Here we are. This is my den. I, I was just playing some music and reading. I love that song, don't you, Mr. Clover? I, I play it over and over. Please sit down next to me on the couch. Thank you. 
Mary Deming was murdered. They were jealous of her. That's why they killed her. Who? Oh, almost all the girls. Some of the boys, too. All jealous of Mary, for their own reasons. You know, Mr. Clover, Mary once came to my room and cried because she knew how they felt about her. She never showed it, but it hurt her. That's why she went on those reckless, dangerous drives at night. She told me so. Still, she was voted most likely to succeed. They voted her that out of meanness. They didn't mean it the way it sounds. They they didn't say out loud what she was going to succeed at. When was the last time you saw her, Miss Hess? Mary? It was in the afternoon, just before... She congratulated me. She kissed me and said she wanted all the happiness in the world for me. In the afternoon before what did she do that, Miss Hess? Before the graduation dance. In June? It's always in June, Mr. Clover. You see, Paul and I were going to announce our engagement formally at the dance. But Paul died. That evening he died. Oh? Yes. I went to his house just before dinner to ask him... Well, to ask him did he really love me... He ran down the stairs to answer me and fell and died just like that, without any reason. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. It's all here in my diary, Mr. Clover. The last time I saw Paul, the last time I saw Mary. My last entry, June 12, 1937. It tells all about Paul and me and... I'm sorry, Mr. Clover. Will you stay to tea, please? I did. Tea poured by delicate hands into delicate china. Smiles and chit-chat and small, fragilely iced cakes. Yesterday's time recaptured and held briefly until time changed and it was suddenly evening. The fingers on my arm when she showed me to the door... Number three on the list, Ona Webster, cheerleader, class of 37, the yearbook had said. Now, Ona March, married five years before to a Keith March. Address, 8020 Andrews Avenue in the Bronx. You got here. You finally got here. What? You are the police, aren't you? I called. I'm looking for Mrs. Ona March. She's in there, in the bedroom. I told you she would be. Come on. Look, I... I just came home, went out for a walk. There have been prowlers. Maybe I should... Wait a minute. I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you? Ona's husband. I told the policeman on the phone about my wife. What's the matter with her? She's in there, on the bed. She's been stabbed to death. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Martin Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. An old friend of yours comes back tomorrow night, Luigi Basco. And once more, you can live that wonderful life with Luigi. So join us on CBS this Tuesday night for Life with Luigi on most of the same CBS stations. There's a special hour on Broadway, the hour between twilight and darkness, dinner time. It's the time of the swarming into the earth because home is at the end of a long tunnel and walk three blocks. Or it's the time of the fast look at the translux, the run out into the streets and say, cooled out, huh? Coffee, hot dogs, cream soda, and the nickel tip. And Broadway tries to gulp its dinner the way it's seen ordinary people gulp their dinner. Wipes up the gravy with a second piece of bread and compares boyfriends, girlfriends, and recurring dreams... But my dinner time wasn't like that, because it didn't happen, because it was being preempted by something else, by a woman with a dime store knife pushed deep into her, by a man with a fright of death goading him, taunting him into screaming at me. Do something! Don't just stand there! Take her away, whatever it is. That's why I called you, police, because I thought you knew how to... Please, please do something, please. Take it easy, Mr. March, easy. We'll do what needs to be done. I'm, I'm sorry. Just that I... That's my my wife lying there. I understand, Mr. March. Here, sit down over here. Come on. Thank you. Would you like some water? Anything? No. No, thank you. Do... Do they always look like that? Huh? When people die, do they always look like that? 
Who'd want your wife dead, Mr. March? What a strange way to say it. But then I suppose whoever killed her wanted her dead, or he wouldn't have, have done that to her. Who? I don't know. I told you I thought a prowler, a thief, maybe. But nothing's been disturbed, has it? I don't maybe know. Maybe you, Mr. March? No, no. But you understand, Mr. March, that you'll be treated as a suspect until we... Yes, of course, of course. I understand. Good. Now, there's some questions I want to ask you. Did your wife know a woman named Mary Deming? Once she did. They were classmates in high school. And you? I knew Mary. She was one of my students. Oh? I'm a high school teacher, science. Only and I recall that Mary Deming was in my class when we read about her murder. You think Ona and Mary Deming... You think the reason... You fell in love with your wife when she was in high school, Mr. March? I used to watch her at the football games. She was a cheerleader. She was young, exciting. You you know how a girl can be. You fell in love with her then? I suppose so. But I didn't know it until five years ago. We met again by chance in a theater. After a while, we got married. Your wife and Mary Deming, were they friendly? Did they go around together, have the same boyfriends, things like that? I honestly don't know. Only and I almost forgot we'd known each other in high school. We hardly ever talked about it. Mr. March, how well did you know Mary Deming? What? How well did I know her? Huh? Only as a student. You never saw her or talked to her after she left high school? No. And Mrs. March, did she ever see or talk to Mary Deming? Well, if she did, she never told me. What? What's that? I'll see. It's the police you called for, Mr. March. I'll let them in. Hi, Danny. Oh, Gino. Come in. I brought you what to eat, Danny. A box lunch for supper. <laughs> Thanks. Put it down. I'll eat it later. Okay. I already peeked in mine, Danny. I got an apple. How about you? Probably an apple. Box lunches never change. Oh, I don't know. Once I found a dollar bill in mine. Gino, I... Once I found an Easterling sterling silver spoon with which to eat my potato salad. Gino, I... I guess I'm born lucky. Gino, please, I'm tired. I've had a tough day. Two people have been killed, and I'm no closer now to the answer than I was when... I'm sorry. Do you have anything to tell me, Gino, about Mary Deming or Ona March? No, Danny. I'm sorry. Danny? Yeah? What is it, Margovan? found what we were looking for. And what was that? Fourth name on the list, the one I couldn't trace down, Milliken Polk. Hey, that Milliken Polk. I was looking through that yearbook. That guy was the genius of the class. Got through high school in two years, the type I admire most highly. Where is he, Margovan? In the penitentiary, Sing Sing, a three-time loser, for selling oil wells to visiting movie stars and poor Texans. Don't stare at me, Danny. So his education turned him into a con man. So kill me. How come you had such a hard time finding him? Polk had eight aliases. I tracked down one, he'd suddenly dissolve into another man. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, Danny, it's too late to drive up to Sing Sing tonight. You haven't eaten your supper. Don't worry about it. Muggerman. Oh, yeah, Danny. Call Sing Sing. Tell him I'll be up in the morning and tell him to throw a guard around the cell for Millican Polk so he won't dissolve into another man. right where you are, sir? Huh? Nothing personal, sir. It's just that the slightest movement, the slightest distraction upsets the delicately balanced mental processes of my student here. Doesn't it, Jerome? Uh, Yeah, it does do that, Professor. Uh, Just what you said it does. Shall we show the policeman what we've learned today, Jerome? You are a policeman, aren't you, sir? I am, Millican. Oh, goody. Yeah, let's show the policeman what we learned today, huh, Professor? Go right ahead, Jerome. Uh, Today we have learned that... uh, Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. That's excellent, Jerome. Excellent. Isn't it, sir? Excellent. And now will you tell me about the Pythagorean theory? Uh, Please, Professor. Even the slough said I was excellent. Later, Jerome. First, we must find out what the slough wants with us. What is it you want with us, sir? Only you, Millican. Thank you, sir. You may take a recess, Jerome. But the Pythagorean... Take a recess, Jerome. Mm. And now, sir, we are in effect alone. What can I do for you? You went to high school with Mary Deming. My congratulations, sir. However did you track me down to this, my private lair? 
I thought I'd successfully wiped out that puerile phase of my life. Not quite, Professor. Now that you've found me, I suppose you want all I can give you on Mary Deming and, uh, let me see, Ona March, Neona Webster. Am I right, sir? How did you... I keep up with things, newspapers, magazines. I'm the uh, institution's librarian. I assumed it was only a matter of time before one of you would appear asking me what you're asking me. You assumed right. So? I don't suppose you would arrange for this favor a little time off, say, a furlough, so to speak? Uh Uh-uh. I thought not, sir. About Mary, most delicious girl, provocative, stimulating, quite an experience to a youth who had the intelligence to appreciate her qualities as I did. You knew her well. Let's put it this way, sir. When I was in high school, I'd put my brain against any football letter on the campus. Mary was quite interested in me till I tired of her, threw her to the athletes. What about Ono Webster? A bore, always turning cartwheels, screaming through a megaphone. Ah, Mary, Mary. You really like Mary, huh, Professor? There were so many things about Mary too, like... Like the way she could wriggle out of trouble... All these years, in trouble, out of trouble, like putting on and taking off a nightgown. Always somebody to take care of Mary. You have any theories, Millican, as to who might want the girl's dad? I haven't wasted my brains on it, sir. For the past five years, I've been occupied with Jerome here. Now, Professor, now you're going to tell me about the Pythagorean theory? Now, Jerome. I'm sorry, sir, I'm calling my class to order. Goodbye, sir. And the things Millick and Polk had told me had their own place with the fragments I'd gathered up about two women. Ona March, cheerleader. Mary Deming, most likely to succeed. Classmates of the year 1937. Ona, the respectable wife of a respectable man who lived in a respectable house. Mary, a woman whose youth fled in a hurry because Mary was in a hurry. Too much of one. Back at headquarters, I went over a police record again. Reckless driving, 1937, license revoked. Drunk driving, 1939, fined $100. One night spent in jail, then released, fine paid. Drunk and disorderly, 1941, fined $50 in 30 days. Sentence suspended, fine paid. Went like that, fine paid, fine paid. Then a felony a year ago, shoplifting. But a lenient judge changed it to read petty theft. Fine $500 in probation, fine paid. The fine was always paid. Go back again and start all over. In 1939, the money for the fine was furnished by Joe Sage, bail bondsman. And in 1940, by Joe Sage. All of them, every one of them. Maybe Joe Sage had a fragment to hand me, too. Hey, what is it? Oh, hello, Danny. I didn't recognize you. The light in here. (laughs) Maybe it's because you haven't been in here so long. I need some help, Joe. For you, the house. Thanks. About a client of hey, yours. Except about clients. Ah, oh, Dan, you know in this bail bonding profession we ain't required to give information about clients? Like a doctor, like a lawyer, Danny. Look, you're talking to me, Joe. You know as well as I we can subpoena your books. Sure you could. With a good reason. Try murder. Which of my clients do you wish to ask me about, Danny? Mary Deming. Like the back of my hand. I know her that well. Good. You know, tell me all about it. Sure. Here is a dame who used to get herself into trouble peck after peck. Drunk driving, disturbing, heisting underwear, little things, but you could count on her. And her fines got paid every time. I'm just trying to find out how Mary could afford to pay you back. You know I went her fines, huh? Uh-huh. Uh, because I had a standing order. About ten years ago, a man came to me and he said, This girl, Mary Deming, ever gets into trouble, help her. This man said he would personally guarantee I would be paid back. What man? A professor. High school teacher. He wrote after the word business on my client's card. Named Keith March? Name Keith March. Why do you ask me questions when you know the answers? Oh, Mr. Clover, please come in. Thanks. I will. I was expecting you sooner. I came back to check something with you. Yes? You said you hardly knew Mary Deming. You only knew her as a student. Would you like to add to that, Mr. March? No. Why should I? You were in love with her, weren't you? 
You're being ridiculous. It wasn't Ona you watched in school. It was Mary, because you were in love with her. What are you talking about? She was a child. Your wife's age. How old are you now, Mr. March? Thirty-nine. Thirteen years ago, you were twenty-six, just starting out as a teacher. A man twenty-six can fall in love with a seventeen-year-old girl. There's nothing unusual in that. But I still don't Every see... time Mary got in trouble with the police, you got her off. Got her fines paid. We've records that you helped Mary. Why should you do that? Mary... Mary... Mary's the kind of a girl who never looks twice at a man like me. You'd have to take my word for that. I helped her. Why? Because the times I helped, paid money to help her. She would thank me, let me do other things for her. There's, there's this, Mr. Clover. What? I did love Mary. Then why do you accuse me of killing her? You didn't, did you? No. I told you I loved her. Sometimes I hated myself for it. But I loved her. But you know who killed her, don't you? So do you. Your wife? She hated Mary. Hated her for what she could do to me. I never kept it a secret from Ona. That's why Ona killed her. That's why you killed Ona. From my point of view, that was the only thing to do. Ona had killed the thing I loved. After Mary was dead, nothing had any value. Not even taking another life. You understand that, don't you? Let's go. It's not going to be that easy. <laughs> Keep open that desk. I'm going to kill you, Mr. Clover. <laughs> you're, a, you're a fool, Mr. Clover. <laughs> you you did just, just what I wanted, wanted you to do. I wanted to die... That's all I wanted. You fell into my trap. I didn't have the nerve to do away with myself. So I used you. Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. Danny, Gino, get an ambulance up to 8020 Andrews Street in the Bronx. Roger, we'll call. Anything serious? Just a shoulder wound. Nothing serious. Who, Danny? Not you? Not me, Gino. The man who lived to go on trial for murder. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory. The street is lettered with odds and ends. Fit them together in any design you want. Only nothing slips into place. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Jay Novello... Hi, Aberbeck, Peggy Weber, Sammy Hill, Lou Merrill, and Jack Crucian. There's always plenty of fun on hand when you hear Columbia's Monday night program, Too Many Cooks. The hilarious adventures of a father, mother, and their ten children. Stay tuned now for Too Many Cooks, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, where you live life with Luigi on Tuesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Arthur Godfrey, who usually comes around with his talent scouts at this time on Monday, has just about finished his summer holiday. Godfrey will be back with us one week from tonight on August 28th.
Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's the place you drift to because the other promises you made to yourself never happened. You leave your life behind and stand on a street corner beating down the scream in your throat. It's the best of the thousand and one nights you dreamed of. The one place in the world where something happens to you outside of the movies. It always happens. Something starts it, the tap on the shoulder, the laughter that floats down to your end of the bar, the smile, the special delivery, the phone call. Your phone's ringing, Danny. Now, thanks, Gino. Danny Clover speaking. You gotta help. You gotta come here. You gotta come to my home. Who is this? Mrs. Corey. Please, please, my husband. What is it, Miss Corey? A suicide pack. He's trying to make me. He's trying to force so me to kill me. myself. Yeah, I don't want to die. He's gonna make me. Die. Hello. 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 Who is this? What happened? Mr. Corey. I've just killed my wife. Now it's the time for my dying. Listen, don't be a fool. Hello. Hello. Tartaglia. Oh, wait a minute, Danny. What did you say, operator? Oh? Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. Party hung up too soon. Couldn't trace it, Danny. It began that way, with a desperate protest against private agonies. The protest that can't face the loneliness of death and must kill the loved ones so that the path into darkness will not be walked alone. The man, Corey, murdered his wife and then himself. And the glittering, blood-spangled shriek for attention, final identity, set into motion only an old, a familiar routine. The official collecting of the dead. But first we had to find them. Detective Muggerman brought in the phone book. We sat over it, turned to the seas, found there were 25 Corys. We divided them, went our way. The treasure hunt for the dead. The first Corey was very much alive. She told me so. Nobody dead here, mister. Everybody much, much alive. Come on in and I'll prove it to you. You live here alone? Uh Uh-huh. I'll take a look. Love it. Come on in. See? Alone. Just you and me. Touch me. I ain't dead. Yeah, sure. My name's Corey. Why do you have to know? man named Corey killed his wife, said he was going to kill himself. Killed his wife, huh? Guts? That takes guts. Where's your wife, Mr. Corey? She's in the kitchen washing out my work pants so I can go out and look for work. Come on, I'll show it to you. Look, mister, even if you're a policeman, it doesn't give you a right to ask me a thing like that. I love my wife. We never say a harsh word. Where is she? She's asleep. This late? She sleeps this late every morning. I was just preparing her breakfast. Call her. Look, mister, you don't know what you're asking. Call her. Fanny. Fanny, uh, wake up for a minute. It's a policeman. He wants to know, did we have a suicide pact? Fanny. Fanny. (sighs) Suicide pact? Tell him no, but thank him for the suggestion. You finish your list, Danny? Yeah, Muggerman. Find him? No. You? No. Maybe it was a joke, huh, Danny? A practical joke? I don't think so. Did you finish the list? No, I, uh, I got two more to go. I'll take them. The reason I didn't finish, Danny, I, uh, I had to come back to headquarters to... I just got tired. Forget it. Give them to me. Yeah. uh, Here, Danny. Two more. Maybe Muggerman was right. Maybe it had been a joke. Someone's grisly idea of a joke to play on the gullible police. There are people like that. There are people who make a pact to die. The first Corey on Muggerman's remaining list of two was an invalid, a bedridden woman tended by her middle-aged bachelor son. He asked me to stay and chat with them. It was such an interesting thing to have happen to them. 
At the last place, the manager of a plush apartment house just off the park told me, indeed, yes, indeed, he had a Mr. and Mrs. Corey. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, They've been with us, uh, let me see, uh, five years, I should say. What apartment are they in? 3A. You understand, of course, that solicitors and peddlers are not allowed on the premises. No. I'm from the police. See? Police. Hmm. Police. What is your interest in Mr. and Mrs. Corey? You're perfectly right. Which way is 3A? Down this center hall. But we'll announce ourselves first, shall we? Hmm. No answer. Well, they're either not at home or they've overslept. With Mr. and Mrs. Corey, I should say they're not at home. Let's go find out and bring the key. Oh, but that's... Bring the key. Oh, very well. Here it is. After me, please. Mr. Corey. Mr. Corey, I'm sorry, but there's someone from the police. Mr. Corey? Mrs. Corey. Open it. But I... Open it. See? There's no one at home. They've gone out. Where's the bedroom? Through here, but I don't believe you have the right to intrude like this. As you can see, everything is in apple pie order. What are you looking for? Why do you pry so? They're dead, that's why. Oh. Oh. Well, in that case, you might be interested in something I... In what? A woman called me just a while ago. Said she'd been trying to reach Mr. and Mrs. Corey all morning. On their private phone. There was no answer, so she left the message with me. What message? Uh, Her name, her phone number. They interest you? Get them for me. Now, get them. This time it was easier. The message was from one Zella Stanley for the phone number to match. As easy as investing a nickel in the nearest phone booth and telling Zella Stanley you were the police. Asking her if she had been calling the Corries and would she be home and I wanted to talk with her. Miss Stanley was in turn noncommittal, puzzled, cooperative. Please come up, Mr. Clover. The address is 1520 West 46th, apartment 2A. Mr. Clover? Yes. Please come in. Will you sit down? Let me get these things out of here. I I was so tired when I came home last night, I undressed walking into the bedroom. Now, won't you sit down? Thank you. About Mr. and Ms. Corey. Now, don't put me on the defensive, Mr. Clover. I want to help you with whatever it is, so just let me tell you. Good. Go ahead. I've been calling Alice all morning. That's Alice Corey. That's right. There's been no answer at her apartment. Is that something unusual? Not in itself. I've called people before, and I suppose you have. Called them, and no one answers. Was it important that you get in touch with Mrs. Corey? Not in itself. I I just wanted to talk to her. I see. Just a kind of, good morning, Alice. How are you? Is that it? Something like that. Just let me tell you. Will that be all right, Mr. Clover? It'll be just fine. (laughs) Well, I was at the Corey's last night for bridge. There was something in that house that had never been there before. What? Please. Sorry. Something was wrong. No laughter between the two. Silence, mostly. And now and then, a a bitter word. I've known them for years. The Corys have been the cliché of matrimonial bliss. It uh, it embarrassed me. I I, I left early. May I? Of course. You said you were playing bridge. You, Mr. Corey, Mrs. Corey. Who else? And Tom's partner. Tom Corey's partner? His business partner, Henry. Henry who, Miss Stanley? Henry Fairchild. Fairchild of Corey and Fairchild, you know. No, I don't, Miss Stanley. A factory. They make small things, uh, electrical parts or something. I don't know. Now, tell me a bit more about last night. Well, just that Tom was depressed. Alice looked, well, frightened. i never seen Alice look frightened, but I think that's what it was. Henry did everything he could to brighten things up. It didn't work. You go ask him. Ask Henry. Henry Fairchild of Corey and Fairchild. Ask him. My secretary tells me you're from the police. I can't tell you how delighted I am to see you. Delighted. Thank you, Mr. Fairchild. Come over here, Mr. Clover. Quick, come over. I want you to see something. I'll draw these drapes back so you can see something. Look down there. What do you think? 
Yeah, it's quite a little factory you have there. It's more than that, Mr. Clover. It's ten years of our lives. Ten years of blood, sweat, tears. No other way to say it. Ten years of that. And he walks on it, squashes it like it was a, a cockroach we'd built. Oh? We're ruined, destroyed, milk dry, all that work sucked dry because he was greedy, hungry for more money. Fifty thousand dollars, like that. Like he was taking it out of a piggy bank. Arrest him, Mr. Clover. Go arrest him. Who? My partner. I'm Corey. Arrest him for grand larceny. Arrest him for dipping his fingers into our till. Arrest him for being an ungrateful greedy. Tom Corey did that? Yeah, here are the books. Look for yourself. But you wouldn't know about a thing like that. Your experts will, though. They'll see how month after month he stole 5,000 here, three here, ten here, two here. Uh Uh-huh. When did you see Corey last? Last night. (laughs) We were playing bridge. He was moody. Blew to his wife, to Alice. I tried to cheer him up because I thought it was dyspepsia or something. This morning I find it was was this. When you arrest him, Mr. Clover, tell him I'll make it a point to visit him in jail. You'll give me kicks to see him there every chance I get. Corey killed his wife this morning, then himself. Huh? He didn't have to do that. He could have come to me, I would have... I'd have helped him. Honest, I... We can't find them. They're not at the apartment. How about their place on Fire Island? Where? They have a house on Fire Island. You think we should try there, Mr. Kohler? We did. Mr. Fairchild drove me out to the landing dock, hired the power launch that took us to Fire Island. Then the short walk across the bone-white sands and a small cottage... The front of it was draped with a yellowed fishing net and life preservers whitewashed for the season. Starfish had been nailed over the door. The top of the door was glass porthole, and the door was open. First time this has ever happened. What? Leaving that door open like this. Come on. Now, where's the phone? In the other room, Mr. Clover. Uh-huh. Yeah. What? Oh. Dead. Shot through the heart. Poor Alice. She had nothing to do with it. What about her husband? What? Where is he if he shot himself? Where is he? That's what I said, Mr. Fairchild. Where is he? Wait a minute. Blood here on the floor. See it? Trailing toward the back door. Here. Now the blood stops. But no time. Where is he? You said he committed suicide. I was wrong. He committed murder. You were listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Next week, along about this time... Arthur Godfrey and his talent scouts will be on hand again to delight and entertain you. You'll find that Godfrey's amateur but knowing scouting have dug up some wonderful new discoveries for you. And they'll be here Monday after Monday all season long. By the way, next Monday also marks the return of my friend Irma, the Lux Radio Theater, and the Bob Hawk Show on most of the same CBS stations. Don't miss next Monday evening with CBS, the network of the stars. <laughs> There's this about Broadway. It wants everything neat and in place. A word misspelled on a spectacular can stop traffic. A girl lamenting a run in her nylons, likewise, and for longer. The scream of the loudspeakers has to be adjusted just so. And the deep, anguished weeping in a darkened doorway, not too much. Even death and violence have to meet Broadway's standards. The death of Alice Corey by a bullet through the heart, that would measure up. This violence committed upon her by her husband... It would measure up, too. Very poignant. Very class A. We've stood in line for worse, huh, kid? A man makes a pact with his wife to commit double suicide, kills his wife, only wounds himself. That's hard to do when you're hungry for dying. And harder still to be wounded and disappear from an island. Uh, I'd wanted to kill myself, I'd have succeeded. How could Tom only have wounded himself, Mr. Clover? Maybe that's all he intended to do. 
Meant to murder, Ellis? The policeman has to consider the possibility, Mr. Fairchild. And then how would I ask you before? How could he have only wounded himself? He shot Mrs. Corey in the heart. He must have thought that was the best way, in the heart. When he shot himself, he must have flinched the reflex against his own death. He flinched. He saw he wasn't dead. He liked it that way. It's been that way before. But you said he committed... Murder? That's right. When someone kills someone else like that, we call it murder. Is there anywhere else on the island he might be, Mr. Fairchild? No, we've covered all of it. Places I never knew existed. I don't mind telling you I'm tired, Mr. Clover. And he must have crossed over to the mainland. You know these people at the landing dock, Mr. Fairchild? Most of them. Call out and ask if anyone took Tom Corey across. All right. Did anyone here take Tom Corey across today? Did anyone take... Oh, Graham did, Mr. Fairchild. Where is he? Just the other side of the landing. See his boat? Let's go, Fairchild. You, Joe Graham? Hi there, Mr. Fairchild. Hello, Joe. This is Mr. Clover, Joe. He's a detective. He wants to... I want to know if you took Tom Corey across today. You want to know, too, Mr. Fairchild? We do, Joe. Yeah, I took Tom across. When? You say something, Mr. Fairchild? When did you take him across, Joe? Early day, around noon, Mr. Fairchild. Did he say anything to you? Uh, Tell your friend I'm a very sociable man, Mr. Fairchild. People talk to me, I talk to people. People I care about. Mr. Clover asked that because Tom Corey is a murderer. He killed Mrs. Corey this morning. Guess that's why Tom wasn't very talkative. Had things on his mind, just kept biting his lip, just sat huddled there. Uh, didn't think it proper to ask him why. Glad I didn't. Where'd you take him? Well, I always took him, Mr. Fairchild, like I've taken you and him and Alice many times. So you should go back to your factory over there. Ask him if he'll take us back. Will you take us back, Joe? You and the detective? Yes. It'll cost you more for him. Hop aboard. I'll take you. Come on in, Gino. What's on your mind? It came through, Danny. I'm going to miss you. Why are you going to miss me, Gino? What came through? Well, Captain Julius okayed your vacation request, and so did the inspector, and so did the commissioner. Then back again through the inspector and Captain Julius. So, here it is. Where are you going, Danny? I haven't made up my mind. I've been mulling over the travel folders, me and Mrs. Tartaglia, and we feel the place for you is Mexico. Mexico, huh? See, si, in Ensenada, in Mexico... In the Riviera Pacifico. Imagine you with a serape over your shoulder, rachas on your feet, and a la cucaracha on your lips. See, si, Mexico. Man amigo. Uh, me amigo. We are friends, aren't we? Uh, Gino. Uh, Lieutenant Clover? Yes. What is it? I'm Dr. Haskell. They told me to come right in. Of course. What is it, Doctor? They said you'd want to see me, that you were working on something that might have something to do with what I want to see you about. All right. What is it? About 20 minutes ago, a man forced his way into my office. I say forced himself because he had a gun. What did the man look like? Oh, about 40, strongly built. I wrote it all down here because I knew you'd want to know. Here. Oh. I knew you'd ask me. Uh-huh. About 20 minutes ago, he came to see you about a bullet wound, didn't he? Yes. How did you know? We're looking for this man. How badly is he hurt? He'll die. Unless a miracle. But then I'm only a doctor. I gave him plasma, extracted the bullet, shot him to the heart. He wouldn't let me give him anesthetic. He's hurt. Unless he's found immediately, he'll die. You let him go? I told you he had a gun. Oh, I see. Where do you live, Doctor? Uh, here. Here's my car. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to tell me? No, I believe that's all. It just came in, Danny, over the teletype. What did? Item about a woman you talked to earlier, uh, Zella Stanley. Off the dime, Muggerman. What about her? She was found in her apartment, shot to death. Pretty expensive dress she's wearing, Danny. Uh Uh-huh. She must have been very pretty once. Zella. No girl in high school. Her name is Zella. Well, she's lying. He must have shot her the minute she opened the door, huh? Yeah. Take the other room, Muggerman. I'll go through this one. Okay, Danny. 
Danny? Yeah? The radio? Radio phonograph combo. Also very expensive. The bed also, the furnishings. Wonder how she managed. Maybe she was rich, huh? Maybe. I think I find out how, Danny. How what? How she managed. These men's shirts in the bedroom closet. This robe. Let's see them. Embroidered initials in silk. Wish I could afford things like that. T.C., uh, Tom Coring, Danny? Uh-huh. T.C., Tom Coring. So it began to take shape. Tom Corey had killed his wife, turned the gun on himself, had missed his heart. Then he had decided to rid himself of the source of his trouble, Zella Stanley. Committed grand larceny, committed murder, two murders. Now he was a dying man someplace in the city. Find him. We tried all points bulletins, newspaper releases, call in the hospitals, then back to headquarters and wait. Then nodded a man who nudged his head through a door and listened to his story. I run the Diamond Hotel on 37th Street. A little while ago, a man came in my place to register. Why do you think that's of interest to me? The man had no bags. I saw that right away when I handed him the pen to write. Then on top of that, he said, you write my name for me. It's Smith. That's what he said. Write John Smith. I said, why? He said, because I got my hands in my pockets. That's why. I said, oh, do you? Come to the point, will you? The point is this. I looked over the desk at these hands in his pockets just to see what went. What went was the side of his coat was blood. And I got KG. KG? KG. I said, how long you want the room? Months? Day? Week? And he looked funny and said all he wanted to do was rest a while. I said, uh-uh, because I saw trouble. He left. I came here. I did right, didn't I? Danny Clover speaking. There's a man in my house. Who is this? Mrs. Barry. I live on West 57th Street, 1209. I'm frightened. There's a man in... What man? He rang my bell and pointed a gun at me and walked into my house. Is he still there? Yes. He, he looked tired. He sat in the big chair in the parlor. He fell asleep. He's there now, sleeping. I'll be right there. you understand? He's gone. Just ten minutes ago, you called. Ten minutes ago, he was sitting in that chair sleeping. He woke up and left. He had a gun. All right, all right. All right, he says. He had a gun pointed at my nose. What did you want me to do? Hit him over the head with a candlestick? Not me. He left. Look, left blood, too. All over my rug. Back to headquarters again. Then a phone call from a pedestrian who had just seen a man who fitted Tom Corey's description on West 62nd. The man was staggering, Mr. Clover. So Mr. Clover dispatched a squad car to the area. The man was nowhere in sight. Then Mr. Clover sat down and thought about it. Tom Corey left Fire Island by boat, found a doctor on 12th Street in the village. Put a thumbtack on the map. Tom Corey has tried to get a room at the Diamond Hotel on West 37th. Thumbtack. Tom Corey had murdered Zella Stanley, West 46th. Thumbtack. Tom Corey had been asleep in a parlor on West 57th. Thumbtack. Then a phone. Man, probably Tom Corey was seen staggering on West 62nd. Thumbtack. Tom Corey was headed uptown. Tom Corey was crazed with pain. Then a recheck of my notebook. Tom Corey had a partner named Henry Fairchild. Henry Fairchild lived uptown. He lived on West 70th. Maybe I could get there before Tom Corey. Who is it? The police. Danny Clover. Oh, come in. Quickly. Oh. I'm glad it's you. You afraid of something, Mr. Fairchild? Huh? What? The door bolted, locked. What are you afraid of? I read it in the newspapers. Tom, he's still loose. You still haven't answered my question. What are you afraid of? Isn't it obvious? Tom has killed his wife, killed Zeller. Now he's... That's why you're here, Mr. Clover. You know Tom is on his way. Uh-huh. I figure he is. I'm just wondering why you figured it. You just said it's obvious. Tom is out of his mind. He killed Zeller, didn't he? You know why, too, don't you? No. 
No. Tell me why. You found his shirts there, didn't you? It's zealous. How did you know that, Mr. Fairchild? It wasn't in the newspapers. Why? Oh, no, it wasn't. It's simply that Tom told me all about it, about Tom and Zella, how expensive she was. That's why he stole all that money. I see. Mr. Clover. Put down that gun. But, uh, give it to me. I said, give it to me. Stand right where you are. I'll take care of it. Come in, Tom. Shoot him. Shoot him. He killed me. I'll take that gun, Corey. Come on, Corey. I'll help you. Sit down over here. There. Don't believe him, Mr. Clover. Don't believe anything Corey says. Huh? Uh, he's going to tell you I killed his wife, that I shot him, that I stole the money. Ridiculous things, crazy things, because he's crazy now. Tom? Of course, Tom. He's crazy. He's going to say that Zella and I arranged the whole thing to make it look like a suicide pact, that I killed Zella. Tom. Tom. That's right. Tom's dead. He just confessed to a dead man. Broadway stretches out in front of you. A livid scar slashed into the night. It's a cruel and fantastic carousel. A palace of fun. A hall of mirrors. You pay your way and you take your choice. Me? I get in on a pass on Broadway. The gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Herb Butterfield, Janet Logan, Ann Stone, Junius Matthews, Byron Kane, and Jack Crucian. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's program concludes the present series of Broadway's My Beat... We thank you for listening and hope to return in the near future when Danny Clover will bring you more adventures along the Great White Way. Meanwhile, listen to Arthur Godfrey, who returns at the same time next Monday with his talent scouts. There's always plenty of fun on hand when you hear Columbia's Monday night program, Too Many Cooks, the hilarious misadventures of a father, mother, and ten children. Stay tuned now for Too Many Cooks, which follows immediately over most of these Columbia stations. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, where you live life with Luigi on Tuesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, 
where you walk through the October evening and hold close the things you want to save for memories. Then Broadway's as innocent and nostalgic as music drifting from a carousel. And you move on. You get hit in the face by a guy fishing for nickels under a grating. Whatever you were pursuing is gone now, lost. And Broadway trails off into the side streets. Walk them, like I did. And try to close your eyes against the pattern of scars in the street of the tenements. The kids with the torn deck of cards under the lamppost. The dogs at the trash cans. The wide-eyed girl who lurched against me. Pardon me. That's all right. Pardon me. Pardon me. That's all right. Is something wrong, miss? No, no, it's all right. I'll find it all right. Find what? Can I help you? You've seen it? You know where it is? You're not feeling well, miss. Let me take you home. Home? That's right. Where do you live? I don't know. Then tell me your name or find out. I don't know my name. I don't know who I am. I, I don't know. Tell me who I am. Now, just take it easy. That's better. What were you looking for? A pocketbook. I, I remember I had it. I think I had it when I was rocking right over there. I fell down. Well, let's go see. How long ago did you miss your pocketbook? A little while, I, I think. I don't know. An hour? I don't know, just a few minutes ago. I can't remember when. Here's where you fell? Yes. I remember because when it happened, I stretched out my arm so I wouldn't hit the trash can. Uh huh. Is this it, miss? Yes. Yes, that's it. I can remember that. Let's open it. Yes, yes. Here, a wallet. This is a driver's license made out to Linda Arnold, 1912 West 54th Street. Five, four, blonde hair, green eyes. That fits. And this, in case of accident, notify Helen Carroll. Address the same. Helen Carroll. Aunt Helen. Yes, that's right. My name's Linda Arnold, and Helen Carroll's my aunt. Uh-huh. Something else in this purse, Miss Arnold. Recognize it? What? Why, that's a letter opener. Aunt Helen's. And there's blood on it. That's right, Miss Arnold. It's sticky with blood. Which is your apartment, Miss Arnold? That one. The one at the... Okay. Oh. There, you all right? Yes. I'm all right. It's the one at the end of the hall. Can I have your key? It's in my purse. I... Who... Mugovan. Hi, Danny. You got the call, huh? What call? I'm sorry, Danny. You mean you didn't get it? Then why are you here? Miss Arnold lives here. She's ill. I found her wandering in the street, so I brought her home. You she... said someone was dead. Who is it? Who's dead? Who, Mugovan? A woman named Carol, Mrs. Helen Carroll, in the kitchen. Oh, yeah, take care of her, Mugovan. Make her lie down someplace. Okay, Danny. The bedroom over there. Uh, here, Miss Arnold, let me help you. Danny, we've been waiting for you. Hi. You got a cigarette, Danny? Oh, uh, sure, Dr. Siski. He's here. Mm. How? Stab. In the chest. Over and over. Pierced the lungs, the heart. The murderer made very sure, Danny. Like it was what he'd lived for all his life. Who called it in, do you know? Yeah, Detective Mugovan said some man from a coin box. Wouldn't give his name. Mm. Stabbed. The boys know it what? No weapons and evidence, Danny. They think it was a knife, a small knife like A letter opener, maybe? The boys mentioned the possibility of a letter opener, yeah. There's a girl in the bedroom, Doctor. She'll need your help. Don't take me to her, Danny. I killed her! I killed her! I hated her! She was mean and rotten! She twisted everything and made it dirty and mean! I killed her! Hold it, Danny. You too, Mugovan. But gently. It'll be all right, miss. It'll be all right. I want Ted. Bring Ted to me. Tell him. Tell Ted. Oh. Oh. Tell him I killed her. Tell him to come to me. Dr. Siski. A moment longer, Danny. In a moment, she'll be asleep. This girl murdered Danny? She's asleep. You're right, Dr. Sinsky. It only took a moment. It 
only took a moment, and sleep touched Linda Arnold, and the face gouged with hysteria smoothed down to a kind of release and innocence. Her lips formed a final word, Ted, once. Then she surrendered to sleep. I left. Routine, then. Questions. Questions prefaced with the word Ted. And answers from people who lived in the apartment house. Ted? I guess that's her boyfriend that always comes calling, mister. The good-looking boy in the uniform. Then a woman who opened the door for me before I knocked told me, Ted, you mean Ted Raymond, mister. Linda's boyfriend. About his uniform, mister. I guess that's because he drives a bus. The more questions. And find out Ted Raymond drove a bus for cross-country tours. Go to the depot. Ted was off yesterday, but here's his address. But Ted wasn't home when I got there. Assign a man to call me when Ted got in. The next morning at 10, a phone call. Ted Raymond had been out all night. He just got in. I went there. You're the police. That's right. Danny Clover. Come on in. Thanks. How'd you know I was... You were the police? How did I know? One of your boys was outside this house when I came in. He was trying to look like a maple tree, like the one that's outside, real detective-y looking. <laughs> Fat man with a cigar trying to look like a maple tree. I came home. He went across the street and made a call. Then you came. Have a chair. Thanks. Do you know why I'm here? Sure. Uh -huh. That's why you were packing that bag over in the bed. Maybe I was doing the wrong thing. I don't know the etiquette about getting arrested. Do they furnish prisoners with small and necessary items like razor and toothbrush and combs and brushes, huh? Go ahead. Look, that's what I'm packing. Look and then arrest me. Arrest you for what? Come on, come on. I don't get cagey on me. Arrest me for murder. I killed Helen Carroll. Where were you all last night, Ted? Killing Helen Carroll and walking the streets atoning to myself for my crime. How'd you make out? Fine. She needed to be killed. All her money. Linda never got a cent of it. Kill her Aunt Helen. Marry Linda, be rich, logic. But now I'm caught. How'd you kill her? I stabbed with her. With what? How do I know with what? I picked up something and stabbed her. Let's go, Mr. Clover. Take me down to headquarters, get me a secretary, and I'll dictate my confession. It could have ended there with the boy's confession and arrest. It could have been easy. Easy to erase the words of a girl, the cries of a girl uttered in anguish and hysteria, the sickness of the lost. Easy to put out of mind the blood on a letter opener found in her purse, found behind a trash can. A girl wandering aimlessly in the twilight. That never happened. But you know it did, all of it. So you make a call to Dr. Sinsky and he tells you the girl is in the police hospital. Yes, yeah, she can talk to you. She's been asking for you. And the girl sitting upright in the bed is a girl who was never lost, who never cried, except alone. I've waited for you to come back, Mr. Clover. You're better now. Feel all right? Look at me. What do you think? You look fine. I tried. I made them bring me lipstick and powder. And this negligee. It's one I've been saving. You like it? You consider this an occasion, Miss Arnold? Isn't it? Can you remember what you told me when I brought you home the other night, when we found your aunt... I remember it exactly, word for word. I said it killed her because I hated her. My aunt was mean, Mr. Clover, and rotten. That's why I killed her. This makes it an occasion, doesn't it? You lived with your aunt? Ever since I was in pigtails. Ever since I was twelve. I think it began the first night I stayed in her house. Yeah. That's right. That's when it began. What began? The hate... The loathing. Why? Because she made me cry. Because she put me in a dark room and let me cry all night. You'd done something wrong? Mm-hmm. I did wrong. My mother and father were dead. That's what I did wrong. There was no one to take me except a school friend of my mother's. I call her Aunt Helen. That's what I did wrong. And after that? Have you ever had to live on the charity of a bitter old woman, Mr. Clover? It could have been so nice. She was that rich, a hundred thousand dollars, Alfred said. A hundred thousand dollars, and we ate out of paper bags we dressed Alfred. in... Alfred? Who was he? Alfred Carroll, my uncle. My aunt's husband. Poor thing. We didn't even know about him. Where is he? I don't know. But find him, Mr. Clover. He'll be so relieved that I've killed her, so happy. I'd like to see his face. Find him for me, please. We will. 
We'll put out an all-points bulletin. Thank you. Now you'll put me in a cell, I suppose. I'm well enough for you to do that. Ted Raymond says he killed your aunt. You're not fooled, are you? He said that because he loves me. Turn your back, Mr. Clover. I'll get dressed so you can put me away. Hmm, well, come on in, Tartaglia. Well, what's on your mind? Oh, thanks, Danny. Especially to extend to you formally the warm hand of welcome back from your vacation west of the Great Divide. Oh, thanks, Gino. <laughs> and to remark that the western winds have indeed done wonders to your features. The sunburned brow, the hearty handshake, and that Don Juan shirt. You look like a veritable Don Juan. Thanks, Gino. And to tell you that I have prepared myself during your vacation for whatever problems perplex your brain. Oh, tell me about it. Well, I have been studying the exploits of Mike Schreck, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia. Detective Schreck is a man who has coined two interesting theories. Uh, Gino. First theory, find the woman. Second theory, the criminal always returns to the scene of his crime. Put them together... In other words, when a man walks past the scene of the crime with a girl... It... He's the killer. Hey, how did you know? Ten Clover? That's right. Come in. Thank you. I understand you're looking for me. I am? My name is Alfred Carroll. Yes. Yes, we were looking for you, Mr. Carroll. Do you know why we want you? Yes. Yes, of course I do. It's about my wife's murder. It's this way. Two people have confessed to your wife's murder. What? That's right. Linda Arnold and Ted Raymond. I'm not a young man anymore, Lieutenant. Would you mind if I sat down? Please do. That's strange. Why should two people confess to my wife's murder? What? Why should they do that? I killed my wife. I killed Helen. You're listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Keep your guard up. That's the key slogan of the 1950 National Guard recruiting drive, and it's a slogan as timely as today's headlines. More than ever before, America stands prepared, and the National Guard must recruit approximately 220,000 men as soon as possible. By joining the National Guard, young men will have the advantage of choosing their own unit and preparing themselves for promotion by being in a job for which they are best qualified. Investigate the National Guard now. Help America to keep up its guard. In the late October afternoon, Broadway stands on a corner, sips its coffee, snaps at a coney, and sums up the day. Some days are better than others. You know because the Translux says it was. Our men in Korea are doing fine, it says. A horse out in far Hollywood paid 90 for two, it says. But you went on it, were you, kid? For the rich, they run, I get. Get this item, look what it says. Three people confessed to murder of Helen Carroll. A field day for the police, I get. Three tries, three scores. Coming up in the world, the police. And at headquarters, the husband sits quietly waiting for the police stenographer to catch up with him because his confession spills out of him like laughter, like it has to be shared with the world. Have you got that now, young man? All of it? Every word? He's got it, Mr. Carroll. Go on. There's not much more. I wish there were. There are so many things. Where did you go after you killed your wife, Mr. Carroll? I went to do things she'd never let me do. Like what? Enjoyable things. Pleasurable things. Like what? I went to a bar and had a drink. A lot of drinks. With her money. With Helen's money. What else? There was a girl there sitting all alone. She came up to me and asked me if I was having a good time. I said, indeed I was. Then I asked her if I could buy her a drink. And she smiled. What have you done with Linda? Where's Linda? How much money did your wife have? A hundred thousand dollars. Imagine. 
a hundred thousand dollars, and she made us live like pigs, like beggars. She wouldn't even let me get a job so I could have money for myself. Why does she keep her money? It's all in the bank, in her name. It's all coming to me now. You know what I'm going to do with it after I die, after you... What are you going to do with it? I'm going to leave it all to Linda, to my child. I think of her as my child, but she isn't, you know. It's like a blessing to have Linda in our house. I want her to have all that money. Well, let me look at the transcript, Florio. Thanks. You'll see to it that Linda gets that money, won't you? You said here you stabbed your wife with a letter opener, Mr. Carroll. What did you do with it? Didn't I tell you that? I must have forgotten. <laughs> the excitement. I walked around, and all of a sudden I was on the dock. A garbage scow floated right past, so I threw the weapon onto the garbage. I thought that was right for hell. Is this the ladder opener? Uh, let me see. Yes, that's it. It belonged to Helen. That's what I killed her with. I found it in Linda's purse with blood on it. You lie. You're lying. I threw it away. I threw it on that barge. You're lying. Tartaglia, see that Mr. Carroll gets home. I right. killed her. I killed Take her. Take her home, Tartaglia. <laughs> There it was. Three people confessed to a single murder. An elderly man, Alfred Carroll, said he killed his wife, but the details of the killing were too cloudy. A young woman, Linda Arnold, said she did it, killing done in a mental blackout. A young man, Ted Raymond, swore he was the killer. Take a premise, consider it, make up your mind that one of the suspects was the murderer. But who? All had motive. As far as I could gather, all had opportunity. That was the Joker. Routine again, and questions again. The knocking on doors, and tipping the hat, and flashing the badge, and intrude into lives of people who thought the word murder was reserved for headlines only. A person like Mrs. Westfall, for instance, landlady and purveyor of towels and clean sheets for Ted Raymond. Uh, you're talking about Ted Raymond, ain't you? That's right. Uh, Ted drives a bus. <laughs> what are you looking at, Mrs. Westfall? Kittle Fettleberg. Look at her walking down the street. Giddled in her uppity ways. It's just October and she's got out the raccoon coat already. Look at her. Ted Raymond. He drives a bus. Bus driver. Jockey for a bus. Look at Giddle. Do you know whether we made any phone calls? On my phone where he always makes them. Broke a date with his girl. I heard him because I was peeping with my ear. Then what'd he do? I don't know. Maybe he went to work where he works at the bus depot. I'll bet it's not even real raccoon. Bus leaving. Are you Mr. McLean? That's right. What can I do with you, sir? I'm from the police. Oh, fine. I drive that bus for cross-country tours. I'm supposed to take it out to Washington in five minutes. Think I'll make it? Sure. This will only take a minute. The man at the ticket window said you were a friend of Ted Raymond's. Was Ted in trouble? Oh, I'm just supposed to answer the questions. So you'll make the bus. I know, Ted. Did you see him last night? All night. Sat up with Pinochle all night from 5 p.m. to 4 a.m. That's funny, you know. What's funny? He called me very early this morning. Uh, told me if anyone asked to say I never saw him at all last night. Bus but leaving you're a policeman. Yeah, better Philadelphia, catch your bus, Mr. McLean. Baltimore and Washington, leaving in four. Your name, Clover? That's right. Who are you? My name is Jones, and I've been looking for you. Why have you been doing that? Because I read in the paper you were assigned to the murder of Mrs. Carroll. Therefore this. Therefore what? Here. Hundred dollar bill. Take it. You see, I didn't spend a cent of it. Look, Mr. Jones, what's this all about? It's about that boy, Ted Raymond. He gave me the $100, and I'm giving it to you. Why are you doing that? Because I'm the superintendent of the apartment house in which Mrs. Carroll was slain. Ted Raymond gave me the $100 early this morning. He said to tell anyone that asked that he was lurking around the apartment house at the time of the murder. I see. What took you all this time to come to the police? Yes. What? Yes, it did take me a long time. Uh, what happens to the $100 bill now, Mr. Clover? Hello, 
know, Ted. Your marbles must have come loose, Mr. Clover. You leave that door open, I make a dash for it, escape, become a fugitive from justice, make a name for myself in the papers. But you won't do that, will you, Ted? <laughs> a dreamer. You won't do it because you like it here. Yeah, that's right. I like it here. The walls are worn thin where guys have cried on them, where guys have beaten their heads against them. Oh, yeah, I like it here, Mr. Clover. But you'll be careful, huh? Careful I don't hurt you when I try. It's open, Ted. All you have to do is walk out. So what is this? This I never even read about. You told me you killed Helen Carroll. Yeah. Who else should I tell? Bring him to me. I'll whisper it in their ears. She was killed in the evening at 7 o'clock. The medical examiner says so. Bless him. I killed her in the evening at 7 o'clock. You're lying, Ted. We know everything you did from 5 until 4 in the morning. You weren't even near Helen Carroll. How much did you lose at Pinochle, Ted? You're crazy. The man you played cards with, McLean, is he crazy too, Ted? All of us and Jones? The man you paid $100 to establish at the scene of the crime? That the current price for a confession of murder? Answer me, Ted. So I didn't kill anybody. So you don't have to put your hands on me. Who did you do it for? It's this way, Mr. Clover. Somebody gets killed, I feel guilty. So I confess and I don't feel guilty anymore. It was for Linda, wasn't it? I do it for her, too. For Linda, huh, Ted? Leave her out of this. I want you to leave her out. Look, Mr. Clover. You're wrong. Linda couldn't kill. She's a sick... But she wouldn't kill. Not Linda. She's just sick, that's all. All she needs is... How sick? Ask her doctor. He'll tell you. Dr. Malcolm. Dr. Malcolm? Yes, Dr. Robert Malcolm in the Equitable Building. Go ask him how sick a girl like Linda can be. We won't need you anymore, Ted. The guard at the end of the tier will show you where to go. Goodbye, Ted. Now, the case of Linda Arnold is not a very exciting one, Mr. Clover. I don't want to write a magazine article, Dr. Malcolm. I'm just trying to clear up a murder. I'll wager the material you police come in contact Look, with. Look, Doctor. Uh, of course, of course, Linda Arnold. Uh, she came to me some years ago. How many years ago? Oh, about ten, I'd say. Charity patient. Uh, later, I found out her aunt was quite wealthy, so I had a done for my fee. Her aunt was the one who was murdered. Really? Now, that's interesting. Oh? Why? Well, let me ask you a question, Mr. Clover. Did uh, Linda kill her aunt? We're not sure. Maybe she did. Why do you ask? Well, there might be a pattern for murder there. Uh, Linda was an emotional girl, and when an emotional crisis presented itself, she would, uh, well, black out. In other words, at times, rather than face reality, Linda would... I said it. Black out. Would you say you cured her, Doctor? I can only say she hasn't had need to see me for the last three years. Yes, I'd say she was a perfectly healthy, normal girl. Anything else? No? Good day, Mr. Clover. It was 5 p.m. when I walked out of Dr. Malcolm's office. It was ten minutes after five when I called the police headquarters and had them release Linda Arnold. Then back on Broadway for a hot pastrami sandwich. I almost had some cream soda, too, but Morris, the waiter, said, Ah, oh, Danny, you look dyspeptic. I prescribed celery tonic. Then the theater crowds began to gather, and Broadway became crowded, so I left it. Linda Arnold should be home by now. I went there, to her apartment. But it wasn't Linda Arnold who opened the door for me. Oh. Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. Please come in. Thanks, I will. Where's Linda? She was just admiring the clothes I bought for her. I opened a charge account for her because I'm going to get all that money, and I bought all those beautiful clothes for her. Silks. Linda looks so wonderful in silks. See? These. And these. And these. Where's Linda, Mr. Carroll? And this. You should have seen Linda in this. We played that record you're listening to so Linda could walk around to it. Let's get rid of it, huh? Where's Linda, Mr. Carroll? Oh, she's in her room changing into something else. Call her. Because you want to take her back for murder? It won't work, you know. Linda has no mental responsibility for what she did. And besides that, if she were brought to trial, I'd say I did it. Uh, Linda, doesn't she look beautiful, Mr. Clover? How do you feel, Linda? I'm happy. What happened to the music? I turned it off. But I'm happy. I need music to go with it. Look at these things. Look at them. Uncle Alfred bought them for me. Yes, I did. 
Didn't I, Linda? Tad signed his confession, Linda. What? Yes, the district attorney's going to arraign him tomorrow morning. Oh, that's wonderful. Ted did that? Isn't that wonderful, Linda? I asked you, isn't that wonderful? Ted's in jail? Now we have nothing to worry about, don't you see, Linda? Yes. Yes, Uncle Alfred. Linda, don't call me uncle. I'm not your uncle, Linda. Linda, Linda, you're so lovely, so lovely, lovely. You. Oh, Linda. You. Take your hands off me. You old man. You. Take your hands off How me. How dare you talk to me like that? Get out of here. Get out of my sight. How dare you? I killed for you. Planned this whole thing for you. The years I waited for you. 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 An old man. An old, old man. Don't leave her alone. I'll show you. Take her, Mr. Clover. Take her. Me too. Alfred, you're crazy. Listen to me, Mr. Clover. I planned it all. It was I who told her to walk around, to be found in a daze with a knife in her purse. No jury would convict her. I killed my wife, and Linda helped me to do it. Linda. All those beautiful things. They'll take them all away. All these, these things. All these beautiful things. In the time of autumn twilight sighs down on Broadway. You walk toward it. Someone smiles and takes your hand, whispers to close your eyes, then bangs your head against a wall. Your scream mixes well with the shriek of the night. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Joyce McCluskey, Herb Butterfield, Peggy Weber, Lou Krugman, David Ellis, and Jack Crucian. Jack Smith, Dinah Shore, Margaret Whiting, Bob Crosby, the Andrews Sisters, Lowell Thomas, Beulah, Ed Murrow. Anywhere else, they'd make up an all-star list for a week. But at CBS, the star's address, you can hear them every evening, Monday through Friday. Dan Coverley speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, this Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. You walk slowly and you lean your heart against it. Then something explodes in your face and you run and you're one of the crowd. You shop for the kicks, the bargains and the heartbreak. And inevitably you find it, one or the other, like I did. On the street of the tired apartment houses, a street leased on the premise that both parents should work so they can come home, smile bravely at each other, beat their children, then snore. 
It was 7 p.m. when I walked up to the second floor landing of the El Royale Apartments in answer to a call. Detective Mugovan was waiting for me. There he is, Danny, on the floor over by the railing. Uh-huh. Who is he? Hey, why don't you people break it up? Go on, get back to your apartments. You read all about it in the paper. Who is he, Mugovan? Name's Harold Clark. Lives apartment 2C. Married. No children. Dead from 238 slugs in his chest. That's who he is. Who killed him? Tenant named Lloyd Ramey. Had the apartment right here, 2A. Blasted Mr. Clark right through the door. Two shots connected with both. Here, see? Two shots right through the door here and here. Uh-huh. What about Lloyd Ramey? Killer? Nothing. He shot Clark and took a fire escape exit through his own room. What else, Muggerman? What about the rest of the tenants? Do they know anything about Ramey? I asked them. They shake their heads. No. Okay, ask them some more. Uh, you said Clark was married. Uh, his wife is home. Thanks. Mrs. Clark. It's the police, Ms. Clark. I've got... Please come in. Excuse the way I look. Of course. Mrs. Clark, What I... do you want me to say to you? Excuse the way I look? Excuse the way the apartment looks? The way my husband looks lying out there in the hall in his undershirt? What else can I say to you? I'm sorry about it. I've got to ask you some questions. I know all about that. Here, see? Right here. Detective. Did you ever own a gun? Suspect. No, sir, I did not. Detective. Did you shoot this man? Suspect. No, sir, I did not. Just like in these true-type detective story magazines. I read them all the time. I know all about what you've got to do. All right, then it'll make it a lot easier. If you're going to ask me, did I shoot my husband, I'm going to say, no, sir, I did not. We know you didn't. Don't be too sure. I was in Lloyd Ramey's apartment when it happened. Oh? Tell me about it. I went across the hall to borrow some tea bags from Mr. Ramey because my husband likes tea. I must have stayed more than ten seconds because my husband got panicky and came after me. He knocked on the door. Mr. Ramey didn't even answer. He pulled out a gun and shot. How well did you know, Ramey? For tea bags. With my husband, tea bags means I'm not being true blue. Your husband was wrong, wasn't he? My husband is dead. I guess that's pretty wrong. He knocked on the door and yelled to open it or he'd break it down, and now he's dead. Because he liked tea. Dr. Sinsky, the technical boys are here, Danny. Oh, uh, good. I'm through here. Tell them to go to work. Okay. Now, uh, look, you people. Why don't you break it up? Why don't you go home to your own apartment? They stood there, the tenants of the El Royale apartment, summoned by the violence, drawn by the clamor of the violent dead, drawn by the cold wind that had touched their throats and led them to the warmth of the spectacle. A child's harsh voice ordered his father to hoist him to his shoulder so he could see, could see better. The father slapped him hard across the mouth. The child wailed and scurried down the corridor, and the father looked after him, his eyes filled with pain and confusion. And then emptying of these things, forgetting the child... Remembering death. Mugovan had got one thing out of the tenants. The fact that Lloyd Ramey, the murderer, was known to a certain party. The party being the Wilkins Rental Agency on West 58th Street. The forms you had to fill out to get an apartment from them, your life was on a piece of paper in a wooden file box. Go ask Mr. Wilkins about Lloyd Ramey. He'll have it in the box. Mr. Wilkins did Committed murder, did he? Yeah, it just goes to show you, Miss Clover, you never know, you never know. You found it? Mm-hmm, I found it. It's right here to hand. Man tries his best, Mr. Clover. Tries to find a select clientele for his clients. Tries to judge a man by his clothes, his shifting eyes, the woman hanging on his arm. Good wrist, bad wrist. Man asks himself... Mr. Wilkins. Please, you're eating into my time. Permit me to eat into yours. Things they put on the questionnaire on the form so often lie, sheer lies. All I want is... I know, I know. Information on one of my tenants, a murderer. Whenever you feel up to it, Mr. Wilkins. Thank you. According to my files, Lloyd Ramey is a man I never set eyes upon. But you just told I me know, that... I know, I know. But sometimes in my profession, as it must be in yours, there are extenuating circumstances. Like what, Mr. Wilkins? Like this letter from Lloyd Ramey. Let me see it. Patience, patience, Mr. Clover. This letter is an extenuating circumstance because with it came the money for a year's lease on apartment 2A, El Royal Apartments. 
We find questionnaires, personal interviews, unnecessary when a gentleman has the foresight to... What else does it have? A few well-wrought phrases stating that he, Mr. Lloyd Ramey, had seen our ad in the news, had gone to the apartment, found it suitable to his needs, and enclosed find eight uh, uh, years' rent. Dated September 3rd, 1950. From that day forward, we rejected all other applicants. Give it to me. I must, I suppose, hate to part with it. This letterhead... It brought joy into our lives here at the agency. Isn't it joyful? <laughs> yes, Berkey Siegmiller, tattoos, and the slogan. What you want, where you want it. Joyful, huh? Take a chair. I'll be right with you as soon as I finish with this sailor. Now, hold still, sailor boy. And my name's Danny Clover. Hi, Danny. You can look at the patterns on the wall. We're having a special this week on Mother. You know, M is for the, O is for I'm the... I'm from the police. Well, I'd give you a special on that, too. P is for the, O is for the... What's the matter with you, sailor boy? Be brave. Is your name Berkey Siegmiller? Yeah. Hey, you ain't got that tattoo look in your eye. You don't want to get tattooed, do you? I want some information. Look, sailor boy. If you don't hold still, you're going to have the strangest-looking mermaid on your chest in the Navy. <sighs> kind of information you want, Danny? A man came in here about four weeks ago and used your stationery here. Stationery from your place. Oh, yeah, I recall the request. man dropped in for a touch-up job of a coiled rattlesnake. And he asked me for a sheet of paper when I was done. I gave it to him. You got the one I gave him in your hand. Had you ever seen the man before? No. What's he done? Murder? That's a new one. Did an admiral once, but never a murderer. Okay, button up your shirt, sailor boy. Have you any idea where I can find this man? There's no use you asking me any more questions, Danny, because I couldn't give you any more answers. Just tattoos. That's all I give. Danny? Danny, it is I, you're ever faithful. Hello, Gino. Likewise, I'm sure. Well? You uh, seem lost, Danny. Huh? Lost in some reverie into which perhaps it is implied that I intrude my face. That's all right. You can stay. Thank you. Well? You sure it's all right? What's eating you? Danny, the rumor is making its way through the nooks and crannies of police headquarters that you have lately visited a tattoo parlor. Oh, rumor is right. Danny, you have not gone and indulged yourself in some mad whim or other. You have not. You don't approve, Gino? Well, it is not for me to approve or not to approve, Danny. It is only that in a like circumstance, Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia... Yes, tattoo? You guessed it. In the middle of his forehead, the tattoo of a snow crystal, imprinted there by a high lama hailing from Tibet. Yeah, Mike Shrek has regretted this indiscretion all his life. So? So? Well, I don't want this same thing to happen to you, this regret. Danny, I won't breathe a word if you... I know I can trust you, Sergeant. Now, in the matter of Lloyd Ramey, you have something for me? Gino. In the matter of Lloyd Ramey... Oh, oh, yeah. In the matter of Lloyd Ramey, the usual standard operating procedure. All points bulletins, terminals watched in relays. Nothing. Hey, you can't just barge in here, lady. You have hey, it's to... it's all right, Gino. You want to see me, Miss Clark? Not particularly. I only thought that if you were cracking your skull over the murder of my husband, maybe I could help. Sit down, Miss Clark. There isn't time to be la-di-da with me, Mr. Clover. If you want to capture him, you better hurry. He was just beginning the soup course when I spotted him. Lloyd Ramey? Where? Don't panic yourself, Mr. Clover. Not Lloyd Ramey. But a man who was often a caller at the apartment of Lloyd Ramey. Ramey was such a secretive type, I took mental notes on his callers. Where is this man? Beginning a meal at the Hotel Adams. I dropped in there myself for a bite. While waiting for a table, I spotted him. Who could eat? I ran quick to you with a hot clue clutched tight in my little hand. You want it? You'll point him out to me, won't you, Mrs. Clark? Why else do you think I missed my dinner? (laughs) 
There he is, Mr. Clover. Which one? There, near the back of the room. Man sitting at the small table against the wall. You wait here. Mind if I sit down, mister? Mm -hmm. Oh, sit down. Have a drink, go ahead. Sit down, sir. Thanks. I'm from the police. Why don't you bring a lady, too? I see you come with the lady. Go back and get the lady. I'm not feeling so good, but who needs it to talk with a lady? Lady. You're sick. Sick and drunk. Sick. Drunk. Go. Go get the. Get the lady. Hey. We'd better get you to. I lifted his head up from the table and his eyes were open, open and staring and not reacting to anything in the world. And here's part of it. The maitre d' hurrying over the polite music, the finger bowls and the demi tasse and the fillets. None of it registered. He just slumped to the floor. I knelt over him, felt for a pulse. There wasn't any. He was dead. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. This Sunday, Frank Sinatra joins Arthur Godfrey and the other fine entertainers and programs to be heard on CBS in the afternoons. His new show is called Meet Frank Sinatra, and you'll hear members of Frank's studio audience being interviewed by The Voice and telling him their favorite songs. At their request, Frank either will sing the song himself or play a famous record. Meet Frank Sinatra, who will bring you a surefire entertainment for a whole hour, starting this Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS stations. Broadway is generous in many ways. It offers you for free its own private set of values, for instance. The essence of a man's life, his worth, measure it in terms of darkness and light. Big man, big Mazda bulb shining bright. So many yards of neon hissing his name into the screaming night. Little man, his proper share of darkness. A spectacular with burned out bulbs sighing into nothing. Harold Clark, the man shot down because he had pounded on a door. That was a little man. The man at a dinner table who hadn't recognized the feel of death, who thought he was only drunk. Also a little man as witness how discreetly the management tried to hide his dying from the diners. Hardly worth Broadway's notice. Hardly worth interrupting the choice of a pastry. But at police headquarters, he found his importance. Under a microscope, in a test tube, a hooded light bulb shining down on his death, giving it shape, shining down on the white-coated figure who ran it through his fingers, analyzed it. This is it, Danny. This is what did it to him. The cliché of poison. It bores you, huh, Gordon? Well, if you ask me, Danny, I'll tell you. Such an unoriginal poison, cheap, common. It can be boring. How was it administered? I've been waiting for you to ask me. Get off it, Gordon. Well, you surprise me, Danny. I should have thought it was normal routine that you ask questions at the hotel bar. It was slipped into his drink. I have proof positive. You didn't ask questions? To make you any happier, yeah, I did. The bartender couldn't remember him. Couldn't remember anybody. That's why he's worked this so long, he said, because he couldn't remember faces. <laughs> tough. That makes it tough on you, doesn't it, Danny? You think Lloyd Ramey did our fellow in? What else have you got, Gordon? It's all over there in that pile. Help yourself. You do it, Gordon. Because you're a lieutenant? Still? All right. I'll do it for you, lieutenant. His clothes, tailored, his wallet, alligator, his driving license, wrapped in cellophane. It says he had brown eyes, was 5'11", age 36. It says he lived at 2354, he's 47th, that his name is Henry Gaynor. You can stop me any time, Lieutenant. Nothing else? Nothing. Except this package of orange lifesavers. Have one, Danny. <laughs> Come on, have one. I'll analyze them. They're harmless. Orangey. Goodbye, Gordon. Not at all. Lloyd Rainey, Lieutenant. <laughs> How are you doing on that one? Oh, you're very welcome, Lieutenant. Hello there. 
Yeah, good morning. Hello, my name's Danny Clover. Well, let's come the... in, chat inside. There now, isn't this better? Uh, sit down. Try that chair over there, the flowered creton. Thanks. I started to say I was from the police. Well, I don't understand. There's nothing to understand. Police, that's who I work for. But why do you want to see me? By the way, who are you? Tommy Lawrence. You live here with Henry Gaynor? I did live here with Henry Gaynor. He's dead. I read about it in the late editions. Oh. Oh, that's why. Henry's dead, and you're the police, and you've come here. Oh. That's why. That's why. Tell me about Henry. Well, I advertised in the paper for a clean living man to share this apartment. I chose Henry. Uh Uh-huh. But I made a mistake. I learned not to like him. That's why I'm not outraged or worried or sorry that Henry's dead. He did nothing but dote on girls. He and his buddy. Buddy? Well, that chaser, Frank Muir. If you want his address, I don't know it. But his phone number's around. You think you can trace it? Frank Muir. I'd track him down where I were you. He's the cause of it all. Poor Henry. I detached him from his Cretan grief, made him look for Frank Muir's phone number. He found it on a pad next to the phone. He did that by lifting up a French doll, and there it all was. Surprise. I phoned Muir. He was at home. I told him to stay there. He said he had a date. I tinkled my badge into the receiver. He said he'd break the date. When I got there, he was still doing it. Come on in, Mr. Clover. Mix yourself up a happy, happy at the bar. This lady I'm talking to on the phone, (laughs) she's bitter. She don't believe I got a rendezvous with a policeman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, honey. I swear it's only a cop. A cop? What kind of a cop? I know all about those females. For 20 minutes you've been holding up the phone, honey. Here. Yeah, I'll prove it to you. Yeah, yeah. Say something to my lady. Prove to her you're only a man cop. Hang up. But, well, look, be a pal. Hang up. Between the two of you. She, she'll fracture me. I don't do this sort of thing to ladies normally, you understand, Mr. Clover? You had a friend, Henry Gaynor. You can say that again. Head is just the word. I read in the papers how a friend I once had is now gone. Why didn't you see him last? (laughs) You think I killed him? When Henry and me had such snazzy times together on blind dates? On with your eyes open dates? When did you see him last? On the occasion when I turned over Mrs. Ellen Clark to him. What? You heard me. That was three, maybe four Saturdays ago. I make it four. Mrs. Clark was one of your lady friends oh, like... <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Clark was, uh... How do you classify? A smile filled with hidden meanings. Uh, the touch of a knee under a checkered tablecloth. That was all Mrs. Clark was to me. That's why you handed her over to your buddy? Uh-huh. Wrong again. You see that plaster cast up there on the mantelpiece? That's courtesy of irate husband, Mr. Clark. He found me once with his missus waiting to catch a bus. He clobbered me, broke my arm. Care to autograph it, Mr. Clover? All my friends, eh? No? Oh, you'll excuse me. It's undoubtedly... <laughs> Danny, I feel... Uh, there have been better times, Mugovan. There always are. Uh, seen the papers? Uh-uh. Haven't had the time. You should have looked. What have you got in your mind, Mugovan? You don't have to bite my head off because I suggest you read the papers. It's got a picture of Lloyd Ramey on the front page. What? Yep. Only his name isn't Lloyd Ramey. The name is George Harvey. Something, huh? You want me to invest a nickel in a newspaper or you want to tell me why? We took the two bullets from the body of Harold Clark and checked the riflings of what we got on file. We didn't have anything. So? Sent them to Washington. FBI checked. Sent a wire back. They got what the two bullets matched. Two more bullets. Where'd they get them? One of them out of a murdered bank clerk of Vincennes, Indiana. The other from a woman shot down during a liquor store robbery in uh, St. Louis. Both shootings done by George Harvey. Wanted by Indiana, Missouri police for murder. What does it do to you, Danny? Does a whole lot, Mugovan. May I come in? What are you looking for, mister? I'm Joseph Goodness. May I come in? What's on your mind, Mr. Goodness? Uh, thank you. Who do I see about the reward? Reward? Yeah, it says right here in the paper, reward. And don't you people try to 
talk your way out of it either. You see? Right here on the front page. Have you seen this man, it says. I've seen this man. What about the reward? If there's a reward, we'll see that you get it. Where did you see him? <laughs> Where'd you see him, yes. Where's the reward? The man in charge of the reward department's just stepped out. Oh, wait. Sure, wait. But if George Harvey escapes while you're waiting, you'll be held for... What'll he be held for, Muggerman? Aiding and abetting a criminal. Aiding and abetting a criminal. Aiding and abetting a criminal. The man whose picture appears in the paper moved in this morning next door to me. Hotel Hobart, into the hall, third floor. No, I'll, I'll just wait. Down the end of the hall, the man said. That's what Mr. Driven has said, Danny. Here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what do you want? Come on, open up, Harvey. Move away from the door, Muggerman. Open the door, I'll break it down. You cops still there? Or are you dead? Shoot the lock off the door, Muggerman. I'll kick it open. Let's go. Harvey. No one's home. Come back later. Danny, in that hallway. Yeah. You better call an ambulance, Muggerman. Okay, Danny. Turn the radio off. What do you know? There was somebody home. Can you talk, Harvey? I just talked, didn't I? Your cop's been chasing me all over the country just to chat with me. Advertise me in post offices, detective magazines, and a radio. Why did you kill Harold Clark? He pounded on my... on my door. You saw what happened. I thought he was a cop. He yelled open the door, I'll break it down. Cops talk like that. Did you poison a man named Listen, Henry Gaynor? I'm losing blood, cop. Pity me. Did you poison a man named Henry Gaynor? Poison? <laughs> uh, never in my life. Henry Gaynor? Never in my life. One more question, Harvey. Was Mrs. Clark in your apartment when you killed her husband? You kidding? That's one of the tough things about running all the time. You never have time for a dame. She wasn't in my apartment. You're sure? I'm confessing to murder, mister. But don't try to book me for a dame in my apartment. Because Mrs. Clark wasn't there. <laughs> Yes? Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. I know. You've come to tell me you've got my husband's murderer. Did you bring me some good news like that? I'll come in and tell you about it, Mrs. Clark. I was just going to ask you to do that. My apartment looks better now, doesn't it? How does a woman feel when the man she loves is murdered? I felt numb at first, but I'm getting better. Harold, my husband was a jealous man. Harold was always... I'm not talking about your husband. I'm talking about Henry Gaynor. Who? The man you poisoned after he refused to have anything to do with you. You poisoned him and brought me there to watch him die. You're crazy. Before you killed Gaynor, did you tell him how you arranged your husband's murder? You invited yourself in, now invite yourself out. What are you doing? What are you walking around my place for? Place looks nice. Thanks. Get out. Really looks a lot better. Neat. Things in order. Where are all those true-type detective story magazines? I gave them away. A man came, offered me a dollar for all those magazines I had. I gave him five bundles wrapped in twine. Did you save one of them? What? The one with a picture of George Harvey, alias Lloyd Ramey. What did he say under his picture? That he was armed, that he was wanted for murder, that he was dangerous not to approach him but to notify the police? Get out of here. You knew your husband was bitterly jealous. You goaded him, made him believe you were carrying on with a neighbor across the hall. Get out. You sent him over there knowing that trigger-happy killer would shoot him as soon as he knocked on the door. And Harvey did. I'll kill you. Harvey said you were never in his apartment. You were too frightened of him ever to talk to him. Let's go, Mrs. Clark. Take your hands off me. 
I said let's go, Mrs. Clark. I had it all. I had it in the palm of my hand until you, you... Come on, Mrs. Clark. Look. Look, you've got to understand. My husband was jealous. He spoiled everything. Every man I ever looked at. You don't know how it was. He ruined everything. He spoiled everything. It's the street of the hunter, Broadway, and the smile that's dropped at the tip of a hat. And the lights are flung from windows, out of doorways, and you walk a pavement speckled with a thousand colors. But between the lights, that's where the darkness is. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Kathy Lewis, Vivi Janis, Anthony Barrett, Leo Cleary, Jack Crucian, and Ed Max. Jack Smith, Dinah Shore, Margaret Whiting, Bob Crosby, the Andrews Sisters, Lowell Thomas, Beulah, Ed Murrow. Anywhere else, they'd make up an all-star list for a week. But at CBS, the star's address, you can hear them every evening, Monday through Friday. Yes, every weekday evening, most of these same CBS stations bring you these top-ranking stars in their specialties. Music, comedy, top reporting. Be listening for Jack Smith, Dinah Shore, and Margaret Whiting. For Bob Crosby and the Andrews Sisters. For Beulah and for those great radio reporters, Lowell Thomas and Edward R. Murrow. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. my beat from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. It's the neon avenue of beggars, the gleaming alley where you dart and search and revel in the blaze of fury. You sidestep the gutters of night, try to close your heart against the carnival scream that rises high above Broadway, shatters, then prowls through the city. But it's no good. It holds you close. But at the waterfront, it releases you, hands you over to other sounds, the voices of the river, the waking wind that has slept in the sea... The siren wind that clears the way for morning and for death and beckons you up the protesting stairs of a waterfront hotel. Opens a door and invites you to consider a dead girl. She sits sprawled on the floor, her head resting on the edge of a bed, her eyes gray, like mirrors reflecting the gray of the sea through the open window. Detective Muggerman lets you absorb it, gets your fill of it, then hands you a cigarette. Light, Danny? Thanks. If you want coffee, the manager's perking some down the hall. It's very friendly. It said while I waited, I could... Strangled. Yeah. With a cord off a robe. Man's bathrobe, I'd say. Where's the rest of it? Couldn't find it, Danny. I've been all over. The killer cut it in half. Thrifty type killer, half a bathrobe cord. Very thrifty. Who found her? The manager. The friendly one? Yeah. 
A husband and wife registered here. Early this morning, husband woke manager out of a sweet dream, told him to bring breakfast to his wife in a half an hour. The manager did. But she wasn't hungry. She was that way. So the manager ate the breakfast himself. You said her husband. Yeah, Robert Burton, husband. Registered here last night with his wife, Laura Burton. No baggage, paid in advance. You're not reacting, Danny. You said something? Yeah, I did. I said, Laura Burton, you didn't react. She dies different from other people? Easy, Danny. I only meant it's funny you haven't heard about Laura Burton. You know, the heiress. Daddy made millions of baby food. Educated in watering places. Educated by counts and dukes and ski instructors. Married a few of them. Funny I haven't heard. Where's her husband? I told you. He ordered a breakfast, took a walk, fed a seagull. That's the last anyone saw him. He was talking to a seagull. Yeah. Oh, well. What's the matter with you? All that money. A park avenue mansion. She dies like this. In a place like this. Mugovan sat at nice shrugged, and over Mugovan's shoulder and through the window I could see the early morning mist rise frostily from the river, and a tugboat and a man leaning over its side. And suddenly the sun was out, striking glints on the water. Daytime had just entered the port of New York. Laura Burton, heiress, Laura Burton, strangled in a dollar-a-night hotel. Find out why. Go to the Park Avenue address of Laura Burton. Be suitably impressed by the paneled oak doors, the musical chimes. The butler who took my badge and placed it on a silver tray disappeared, then returned and gave it back to me between his thumb and forefinger and told me to sit. Then 15 minutes of considering the 17th century tapestries and wondering how George killed such a big dragon with such a small sword. And just as I was about to figure it, someone tapped me on the shoulder. I had to leave George to his own devices. You like tapestries? Not especially. I was just... Oh, because if you did, I've got some in the study that would make your back teeth rattle. Oh, some other time, maybe. Right now... You're I'm... a policeman, aren't you? What policeman? Clover. Danny Clover. Homicide. I'm Muriel Carlson. What can I do for you? I asked to see Robert Burton, Laura Burton's husband. And you're from Homicide? That's right. Wonderful. Who did Robert murder? We just want to talk to him. We're not sure he committed murder, Miss Carlson. But it's possible that he did. Did he kill Laura? Laura is dead. Shot? Strangled? Beaten? Poisoned? Strangled. Well, I only ask because, well, I'm Laura's sister, and if any of my friends ask me how Laura died, I can tell them. That's all your sister's dying dust, yeah? Oh, it's much more than that, Mr. Clover. It's a release. For years I've been wondering how Laura would die. It's been bothering me. Now I can think of something else. Where'd she die? In a waterfront hotel. Then Robert killed her, of course. I say of course because there's no doubt about it. Laura was always running off to places like waterfront hotels with him so she could get to know him better. Or maybe her own canopied furniture bored her. You know, I thought Laura's second husband would kill her. Now it turns out her fourth husband. Well, what do you know? Where will I find him? Robert. Robert, the man with the muscles, the man with the flat stomach and the fat mouth. Robert, fourth husband, Robert the stevedore. Where will I find him? I wouldn't know. But Robert could never get waterfront out of his hair. Literally. You could smell it. Am I being helpful, Mr. Clover? Then the glee at what I'd brought her couldn't be held back. It bubbled up, spilled out of her mouth, shaped itself into a girlish giggle. <laughs> she tried to smooth it off her lips with the back of her hand. Couldn't. Instead, stroked her throat, arranged her back hair, watched herself. Mm. Admired her image in an antique mirror. With her eyes, invited me to the same. And I got out. Then the official, the routine pattern, began to spin itself out. The APBs, all points bulletin on one Robert Burton, suspicion of murder. The inquiries at the waterfront places. Robert, if you find him, mister, send him back to me. I miss dear old Robert. My Prince Charming, I called him. Find him for me. The waterfront buddies. Robert, married something rich, I hear. Gilda, eh? Well, she wasn't the rich for his blood, eh? Huh? <laughs> That's a rabbit for you. The waterfront hiring halls. You're kidding, detective. We haven't seen him here since he married Mink and Laddie Dare. Robert's dream boat come in, huh, detective? Dead wife, live money, huh? And finally, a man on the docks. A man loading cargo. A man who knew Robert like he was his brother. Like my brother, we loaded junk together. We dreamed together of faraway places and girls with bells on their toes. Now, where is he? Pulled up with a bag of gold and a golden girl in some hole on Park Avenue. Like I'll be someday if I'm a good boy. Uh, 
By the way, I'm Marty Dixon. And you're a cop. But you've got a name, huh? Uh, Danny Clover. Danny Clover. They tell me you used to room with Burton. Uh Uh-huh. We shared everything. A room, old comic books, girly magazines. Sometimes we shared our friends, until. (laughs) Till he married Laura? That part of himself he kept to himself, like I'll do someday. You won't begrudge me that, will you, Danny? Like I don't begrudge my friend Robert, who's like a brother. Tell me about their marriage. It's been in the society columns. You tell me, because you knew him so well. Gladly. I've just been waiting to be asked. I'm tired of thinking about it in the loneliness of my room. Their marriage was champagne and antique mirrors and velvet carpets. Sometimes he and Laura would come down and share the crumbs with me. That was gay. Why do you need to know nice things like that? Because we think he murdered Laura. Why, that crawl and no good... What's the matter, Marty? You want the killer? I'll give him to you. Where? I'll give him to you because that he shares with me. He comes to me and says he's in a little trouble. Will I put him up for a couple of days? Sure, I'll put him up. Where? In my room, 1823 West 6. You know something, Danny? I'm glad you found me. Cross my heart, I'm glad. Come on, open up, Burton. Open. Who is it? Police. You got the wrong room. Open the door. No? Okay, Burton. Let's go. Not gonna be that easy, copper. You... Like I said, Burton. Let's go. In here, Burton. Hi, Danny. Brought Burton along because he wants to talk to us. Good. Sit down, Burton. Over there. Thanks. Lawyer said I should tell all. You got a smart lawyer. And he can afford it. How many millions does your wife leave, Burton? Seven or ten? I never can remember. I get all flustered when I mention that much money. Why'd you strangle your wife, Burton? Oh, such a leading question, fellas. Next thing you'll want to know, did I enjoy it? Did you enjoy it, Burton? Thinking about it, I enjoy it because now there's all that money. That's the part that's enjoyable. But I didn't kill her. Is that what your lawyer told you to say? Say it, he said. If you didn't do it, my boy, he said, say it. How about that bathrobe cord? Whose bathrobe? Mine, fellas. Who registered at the hotel with your wife? I did, fellas. I've been telling your police that for six hours. You got a pretty nice place on Park Avenue, Burton. Why pick a flea bag? Salt air, fellas. The commonplace things. Laura and I enjoyed it. I'm a different man near the waterfront. Laura enjoyed it. Okay, Burton, what happened? Woke up this morning, felt like a walk, stopped at the manager's room, told him to send breakfast up to Laura. What about the manager, Muggerman? He's an old man. Dr. Sinsky said he wouldn't have the strength to strangle. So you killed your wife and went for a walk. Is that what happened, Burton? My lawyer said you might say that. Even said the DA will probably arraign me because it looks like open and shut I killed my wife. Why'd you run? Why'd you hide? Because he killed her. Because I came back to the hotel and saw the crowd and heard that Laura Burton had been murdered, so I ran. What'd you do with the other half of the bathrobe cord? The one she was strangled with? The one you used to strangle her. All right, it was my robe, but I didn't Why'd use Why'd you only it? use half the cord? Because, look. Why? You trying to confuse me? I didn't kill her. But you're glad she's dead. Now, take me back to my cell. Sergeant Muggerman asked you a question. Take me back to my cell. Your lawyer said talk, Burton. Talk. Take me back. Sure. Take you back and get your confession. Now, uh, Danny? Oh, what is it, Peter? Homicide call just came in. Waterfront. Call said, tell Clover to get down here. I'm busy, Gino. Call came through the DA's office, Danny. Said you. I got a squad car waiting. You gonna take it? Sure, Gino. That's all I've got to do. I've been waiting for you, Lieutenant. It's right down the alley. Thanks, officer. I was just making the beat and stopped here for a drag and a cigarette. I mean, I was just checking. Routine, you know, Lieutenant. You stopped for a drag. Yeah, that's right, Lieutenant. Well, when I lighted up the light from the match... Oh, anyway, there she was, laying there. I thought she was a drunk. Told her to move on. I poked her. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. This is the way you found her? Yeah, just like that, Lieutenant. I, 
I figure she wasn't drunk. I figure she was strangled to death. I shouldn't have poked her. Don't worry about it. You know who she is? No. Here, I'll hold the flash so you can see better. Good. Hey, you see? She looks a lot like that Laura Burton who was strangled with a bathrobe cord. Same features. Almost identical. Is that why they made such a big to-do about when I phoned in, Lieutenant? And I thought I had a killer. You were wrong, huh? Hold that flash still. Over and over, they asked me, are you sure she was strangled with half a bathrobe cord? Sure, I'm sure, I said. You were wrong about having a killer, huh, Lieutenant? Yeah, I was wrong. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The election news. You'll hear it best on CBS next Tuesday, November 7, with its world-famous reporter Edward R. Murrow heading up the staff. CBS News will bring you the latest up-to-the-minute returns in state and important local contests. Be sure you get the election news fastest and the most accurately next Tuesday night. You'll hear it best on CBS. Broadway all depends on the mood you're in. You can be part of the mob and perform for the sightseers. Or you can create a stir by strangling women with a cord of a flannel bathrobe. In the latter case, you have an advantage. Broadway performs for you. It hangs on the ropes and talks in whispers and clucks its tongue about the police department. The ray of sunshine the next morning, the pure gold in an otherwise drab November day, the Sergeant Tartaglia, who did remarkable things with file cards, with inkwells, with pencil sharpeners. Ah. What's the matter, Jim? Ah, this pencil sharpener, Danny. A veritable ogre of pencils. Chews them up and gives no points in return. I've been waiting for you to come in, and I've been sharpening your pencils. I'm here now, Gino. Huh? Well, you said you were waiting for me. You got something to tell me? Roger. Then tell me. Wilco. Of the matter of the girl who was strangled in an alley. Her name was Annalise Sisler, a name known most especially to Precinct 45 for various and sundry misdemeanors. Go on. Technical ass, and it be pointed out to you that Miss Sisler had physical attributes which were also observed on Laura Burton, also deceased. Uh huh. Such as, to wit, maybe the killer strangled the wrong woman the first time because both were blonde, both had blue eyes, both approximately the same age, same height, same weight, both strangled, and both by opposite ends of the identical bathrobe cord. You know, Danny, this brings to mind a famous case which involved Mike Shrek, the bald headed. Tartaglia. Well. It was almost a miracle detector from Philadelphia's undoing, Danny. If he hadn't disguised himself in the nick of time as a midget... Get on with it, it Gino. Uh, to wit, the DA has released Robert Burton as a murder suspect since he was in the pokey at the time of the murder of Miss Sisler. And since the murder weapon which killed Miss Sisler also killed Laura Burton. Okay, what else? What else is that Miss Sisler's last known address, according to the records of the 45th Precinct, is the Kenneth McManus Monsieur Powers on East 34th Street. <laughs> How'd I do, Danny? Great, Gino. I'll get you a new pencil sharpener. Sure you wouldn't care to grab yourself a steam, Mr. Clover? Then a nice salt rub from the salty hands of one of my experts. All in the house, of course. All I want And wanted. you can get your soup clean and pressed while being catered to. We think of everything in this calling. Look. And we got a ladies, too, in case you got a wife or a girlfriend or something else on the pump side. But for them, we got home permanence while being cooked and mauled and freshened up. That's all of it? You're through? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, can't tell you, huh? All you want is what do I know about Annalise Sisler? That's all. Why did, huh? In an alley, huh? Well... Such a good worker. One of my best. Little Annalie in such demand. By whom? Ladies. Fat ladies, skinny ladies, happy ladies, sad ladies. Little Annalie had a way with a steam cabinet. They always asked for her. She finished her work last night, punched her time card, waved goodbye to you from the door. That's and... right. She did all that, just like you said. Oh, but you got one detail wrong, Mr. Clover. She didn't wave goodbye. Wrong again. She waved, but not last night. Five months ago. She heard a call from somewhere deep inside her. She left my employee to answer it. You'll explain to me about the call. Happens to guys like little Annalie. She heard a call to be a photographer's model. Nice, clean wake. Uh, you wouldn't know where. 
Wrong again. With Leroy, the photographer on West 10th. Can't inveigle you into a steam, huh, Mr. Clover? My receptionist secretary said you were different from the other people who come to study with me. How much are you different? This much, Leroy. I've photographed those, too. Police badges, yes, in my formative stage, when I was desperate, naive about subject matter. But now you're doing better, huh, Leroy? Oh, much, much. As witness this mass class, three models, assembly line methods, mm-hmm. pardon me. Uh, try one from the floor, Mr. Holmes, and this time we'll shoot it with film, shall we, Mr. Holmes? That's right. Yes, it's better with film. Now, Mr. Clover, where were we? You had a model. Oh, that's why you're here. You want stuff about Anna Lee. Now you know. Wonderful girl. Ordinary, but wonderful in such a wonderful way. The textures, the highlights, the shadows. Yes, we miss Anna Lee, don't we, Mr. Holmes? Of course we do. Ever done art studies in a prison cell, Leroy? The texture, the highlights, a man like you could do wonders. You mean because I don't nudge up to your questions, you'd do that to me? You'd, uh... Uh-huh. Hold my camera, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Now, look here, Mr. Clover. I don't believe it. Oh, I'm not going to hit you. Don't fear. I'm just going to tell you off. Annalise Sizzler was our favorite model. We've lost her. We've mourned for her for five weeks now. What? Five weeks ago, she said she had something much better than us. I pleaded with her, tried to bribe her to come back to us, even went to her apartment, my arms full of goodies. She slammed the door in my face. Her apartment, where is it? 1923's 32nd top floor in the rear. Wonderful subject matter, but you don't care. All you care about is murder, spoiling things, things like that. That's right. Yes. You can give him back his camera, Mr. Holmes. Leroy just told me off. East 32nd top floor in the rear. The door open, and a woman in the room her back to you, not hearing you walk in. A woman intent on grubbing through the open drawers of a bureau, finding things, holding them close for an instant, tossing them on a pile of stuff already on the floor, grubbing for more. Then finally aware of your presence, trying to still the greed trembling in her fingers and her body. What do you want here? What are you doing here? Spying. Get out. This is Miss Sisler's apartment, isn't it? What of it? She's got no use for all this now. She didn't deserve things like this anyway. But you do. Yes, I do. All my life I deserved them. Now they're mine and you can't take them away. Let's have a look. I'll call the police. I'm the police. And you? I own this place. I run it. Rent rooms to girls like her. Clean up after. That gives you the right to steal from a dead girl like her? Not stealing. Only taking what she would have given me anyway if she'd known she's going to die. Anna was a girl like that. Generous. Generous didn't care about her things. And they're expensive. Silk. Imported. Never had anything like that. Not next to my body, I haven't. Just watched her put them on sometimes. All right. Don't take them away, mister. She'd have given them to me. I swear it. I swear it. Danny Clover speaking. This is Gordon, Danny, the lab. Come across the hall for a minute. I have something to show you. What? The lady slip you brought in, the underwear. Don't walk, run. Gordon? Hello? Did you walk or run, Danny? Don't you ever smile? What's on your mind, Gordon? On my mind? Well, all right, I'll tell you. Why is it when the department is up to its neck in unsolved murders, they make kissing sounds at John Gordon? You got something to tell me, or you just want me to admire you? Well, first I'll tell you something, then you can drop your chin in frank admiration. Take a look at this slip. Uh, go ahead, hold it up to the light. See what I mean? I see a black silk slip. A real expensive black silk slip. Feel it. Go ahead, right here. See what I mean? No, you don't see. That roughness is thread. Something was sewn on that slip and torn off. A laundry mark? Oh, Danny, what you don't know about slips. A laundry mark on a slip sewn here? Sewn here was a French word, toujours. And sewn here was a name, Laura. 
The stitches were pulled out, but they left their pattern. Now you want to admire me, Danny? The Taglia. Hey, Gino, where are you? Uh, what do you want, Danny? Call the seaboard shipping line, Gino. Get the dock foreman and ask for Marty Dixon. Well, suppose they won't call Marty to the phone, Danny. Dixon's just a stevedore. Well, that's what I'm counting on. Leave word. Tell him it's urgent. Say Robert Burton wants to see Dixon as soon as Dixon gets off from work. Roger, Danny. And also, Wilco. It was four o'clock when Muggerman called in. He'd just seen the dock foreman at the seaboard shipping line hand Marty Dixon a note. It was a few minutes past 5.30 when Muggerman called back again. The quitting whistle had just blown down at the waterfront, and Marty Dixon had just punched his time clock. It'd take him 25 minutes to get to Burton's mansion on Park Avenue. It took me 10 minutes. Robert Burton said he was glad to see me. We could talk in privacy. Laura's sister was judging a dog show on Long Island, and he'd given the servants the day off to grieve his wife's death. So we can talk in privacy, Danny, but you know what? What? You didn't have to come back and apologize for the rough way you fellas treated me. I understand these things. I didn't come back for that. Oh. You got something in your mind, Danny? Tell me I can fix it. I got nothing but money. Eight million dollars and change. Eight million dollars. And that's what the taxes skimmed off. Tell me, Danny. I know who murdered your wife. And you want a reward. How much you want, Danny? That's besides the gold watch you already got in mind. How do you want it engraved, Danny? And a matching gold cigarette case to anything. Because I'm indebted to you, fella. Don't you want to know who murdered your wife? I figure you'll tell me when the time is right, fella. Uh, tell me and let's uh, forget all about it, huh? I'll tell you, fella. You did. You murdered your wife. Oh, Danny. You know better. How could I have killed Laura? Same guy who killed her strangled that girl in the alley. Even the D.A. knows that. What's the matter? Is he on your back for a killer? No. Matter of fact, he gave me permission to pick you up for murder. All this magnificence around here make your head spin, huh, fella? You tried to give me trouble before, Burton. Remember what it got you? Well, this time I get something better. I heard you've been admiring that tapestry, Danny. It's worth maybe 60 G's. How would you like to use something like that for a bath towel and not worry about it, huh? Like it, wouldn't you, Danny? You would, wouldn't you? Tell me, how do you figure I killed my wife? Like we told you before, strangled her in that flea bag. Your pal, Marty Dixon, wants to come in, Burton. How come you're so good, Danny? You stand here, talk to me, hear some chimes, and know it's Marty. How do you do things like that, fella? Open the door for him, Burton. Yeah, I will. What do you know? Hi, Marty. Come on in. You're real good, Danny. Hello, Marty. What goes on here? It's this way, Marty. The DA's on my back. I need a killer. Isn't that right, fella? Yeah. Yeah, that's the way it is, Marty. What does he know, Burton? Let me. I know Burton strangled his wife with half that cord. Gave you the other half so you could strangle that Sisler girl. Had it all arranged. How could the D.A. indict Burton when it was obvious the killer was still on the loose? You know a lot. How is it that you know a lot? That Sisler girl had an expensive slip that once belonged to Laura Burton. How long did it take you boys to find a girl with the same features as Laura to make it look like a killer had strangled the wrong girl when he killed Laura Burton? Oh, it didn't take you very long to find it, did it, Marty? A couple of weeks. Then you wind her and dined her. Oh, I helped, didn't I, Marty? Gave you my wife's cast-off clothes so you could give the girl presents, make her love you. You making a deal with the cop, Burton? He likes nice things. I'm in a position to give him anything he wants. Me too. Because everything you got, I got half. That was the arrangement he made when we started this thing, Clover. When did all this happen, Marty? It happened. And that's the way it is. I didn't sign anything. I don't remember doing that. Anyway, you're a murderer. Man in my position can't have any truck with murderers, and that's why I'm giving you to the cop. You know, when I got a message this afternoon, I figured something had gone sour. So I brought a friend. Uh, Marty, don't, don't be crazy. Ah, uh, Clover, don't go for your gun. I kill cops, too. Look, Marty, we, we were having a joke, weren't we, Danny? It's, listen to me. <laughs> Marty. You don't have to rough me, Clover. Gun's empty. Let's go, Marty. Sure. You want to know something? What? I feel real good. I'm going to the electric chair and I feel real good. 
How many men get the opportunity to die for half of eight million dollars? minutes before dawn, Broadway lies huddled in a dreamless sleep. It's the time of the long black night, and no stars, and the muted wind, and on the wind the sly whispers. Start running, kid. You'll never get home again. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Clayton Post, Larry Dobkin, Betty Lou Gerson, Jody Gilbert, Ed Max, Jack Crucian, and Jerry Hausner. Every Saturday night, Americans from coast to coast play Sing It Again. Do you? Well, if you don't, you don't know the fun and excitement you're missing. Not to mention radio's largest cash award, if you can name the Phantom Voice. There's music on Sing It Again, music with Alan Dale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, the Riddlers, Ray Block and his orchestra. There's contestants, contestants from all over America, phoned by Dan Seymour. And there's prizes galore, plus that special jackpot prize we mentioned earlier. So stay at home. Play at home on Saturday nights when over many of these same CBS stations, Dan Seymour says it's Sing It Again. Dan Coverly speaking, this is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway takes its nighttime out of the river. The autumn mists rise from the water, scurl down the furious avenues of the city, and moisten the shadows. And for an instant, Broadway is stunned. Night has come too swiftly. It's suddenly November, and the people of the time clock go home to dinner in darkness. And I watched it from my window at headquarters, the crowd, fragments breaking off here and there to try its luck in this doorway and that. Wiped my hand across the frosting glass and considered it. That's why I didn't hear the man when he came in. <clears throat> huh? The man's lying dead. Who are you? What are you talking about? I'm Finch. Room service. Hotel Haddon. Finch. What are you trying to tell me about a man lying dead? In the penthouse. Hotel Haddon. And I walked in to deliver the drinks. Noted that the drapes were drawn. Noted that the spread had not been drawn back. Noted that he hadn't taken off his shoes. I noted that he was dead. How could you tell? He didn't move when I tapped him on the shoulder. He didn't breathe. Either inhale or exhale. That's being dead. And you notified the manager. Did you hear me say I did that? No, but... No, of course you didn't. I'm reporting it directly to the police. So it'll be on the records that I found the man. Finch found him. Finch. F-I-N-C-H. Alan Finch. You'll tell the papers that. Yeah. Oh. Danny Clover speaking. Homicide, Danny. Call just came in. Where? Penthouse, Hotel Hatton. You going to take it? Right away, Tartaglia. Finch. F-I-N-C-H. Alan Finch. Don't forget it. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> what do you want? Oh, it's you, Daddy. I'm glad it's you. <laughs> Makes you happy, huh, Morrow? Yeah, come on in. That comic on television, he kills me. You ever watch him, Danny? Uh-uh. You should, you should. Look, look at him. <laughs> he kills me. Where is he, Marl? <laughs> the dead one? He's in the bedroom. Come on, I'll show you. If you could tear yourself away from the comic. Ah, uh, Danny, don't be like that. How many laughs does a house dig get in a day? Uh, I mean, for free. Yeah. <laughs> There he is, Danny, on his 20-buck-a-day bed. Shut the door. The television is for free, too, Danny. In every room, we can cop a look in between, you know. Shut the door. Uh, whatever you say, Danny. Who was he? Here, I'll hold up his head so you can look at him. Looks different, huh? We've been waiting a long time to see him like this, huh, Danny? Johnny Hill. The same. A little punctured, but the same. Ha. Johnny Hill. Tell me about it. A lady was bidding a gentleman good night at the door. While lost in a kiss, she heard shots. She told me so on the phone. Did she see anyone leave this apartment? Uh-uh. It was all too frustrating. She didn't see a thing because her eyes were filled with tears, she told me. Boyfriend scurried away, didn't want to get caught in a mess. The lady wept. Any ideas, Morrow? On who put so many holes in him? Uh-uh. Except everybody who ever wanted Johnny Hill dead. Johnny Hill. King of the Chicago hooligans. Wanted for all the small print in the book. Who's to put the finger on who wanted him dead? Look, Marlon. I wanted it, you wanted it. Who didn't want it, Danny? Tell me so I can get him a free room in this classy flea bag. After that, there wasn't anything much. Morrow said he was going back and look at the comic, except now the comic was through and there was a cowboy instead, which was even better, Morrow assured me. And when the boys from Technical came, they were on Morrow's side. When I asked everybody why the cowboy carried three guns, they sneered at me. So I left. Then it was legwork. Find out why a hoodlum from Chicago had come to New York to die. Ring doorbells. And ask a man in a midnight blue dinner jacket what he knew about the death of Johnny Hill. And have him beckon to five more midnight blue dinner jackets. Alibis. Then the nightclub circuit. Start where the cover charge is $10 in the upholstery genuine and ask questions. And get no answers. Then to the joints of plastic leather and no dance floor and no minimum and get no answers. Then to the dives of the open collar and the biggest beer in town for a dime. And in one of them, there's a man. His name is Benny Fain. He's not happy. Go away, Danny. What's the matter with you, Benny? Uh, nothing. He used to help us out. What happened? I'm not stooling no more, that's all. Go away, Danny. Because you don't want to tell me about Johnny Hill? Yes, go away. Suppose the boys around got to know you used to work for me, Benny. What about Johnny Hill? Yesterday. That's when he hit town. Where'd he go? There's people watching us, Danny. There's nobody watching us. Where'd he go? Checked in at the head. They went to where they all go, Danny, the Griffin Club. Please go away, Danny. That's all you know? I swear on the missus. The missus is doing time at the state reformatory. Yeah, but she'll be out in ten years. The Griffin Club, Danny. The Griffin Club was a polite brownstone mansion that peeked at the park through white lace curtains, needle-pointed with aqua griffons. Its decor, late prohibition. Its membership, lovely ladies and equally elegant gentlemen. Their amusement, conversation of latter-day hooligans who have become quality folk. I knew that because when I walked in, the tinkle stopped. The whisper of silk took over, and I was looked at as if I were a cheap wine spilled on the fawn-colored rug. A lady rose quickly to wipe away the stain I was making in their drawing room. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. We are only for members. Uh, we suggest the wise, right? Don't I'll... you know me, Betsy? Uh, you're full of them, aren't you? Mistakes. I'm Mrs. Crane, vice president in charge of accepting and rejecting. Oh, sure you are, Betsy. All right, so I know you. You're running out of your class, aren't you, Danny? I don't think so. Johnny Hill made me a member. You were having a lovely time till you walked in. You turned it sour. But I recall that's the way you are. I said Johnny Hill and you didn't even drop your fan. Drop it, Betsy, so I'll have to pick it up for you. He's in Chicago. Uh-uh, in the morgue. But 
You know that, don't you, Betsy? He finally made it. I'm glad for Johnny. You'll tell him. Before that, he did all the normal things for him. Checked in at the Haddon penthouse, came here, then back to the Haddon. Died in his bed. Normal for Johnny. I'll tell my friends how it was. Thanks, Danny. They've been itching to know. And you'll tell me the things that Johnny did here, won't you, Betsy? For old times' sake? Grab a handful of canopies, Danny. Take some to your friends. Because we're through reminiscing. Uh, Wait, I'll get you a brown paper bag. I couldn't go without you, Betsy. You've got nothing. Not on me, not on the club. Only a murder, Johnny Hill. You know how these things work, Betsy. We hold you on suspicion. A day, a month, as long as you want. What happens to your vice presidency then? It took me a long time. It's mine. No part of it belongs to anyone else. Sure. Think how hard you worked for it, Betsy. I rocked myself to sleep thinking about it. All right. Johnny came in here about four o'clock last night. Alone? For a while alone. For about an hour, he nibbled at the caviar, the entertainment. Then he got bored. Called Nick Joyner. Nick was here? Johnny called him, didn't he? Johnny calls, people come. (laughs) Used to. They played cards, then something must have happened because they started calling each other names. So I called Johnny's boy to break it up. He came, he did. Johnny's boy, who is it now? Harry Bishop. Where? 1923 East 47. I've been awfully good to you, Danny. It didn't cost you a cent. Not a penny. (laughs) Clutch it close to you, because that's all you get. Goodbye forever, Danny. Yeah? You, Harry Bishop? Let's go inside. Let's go, Harry. You sound like law. Uh Uh-uh, law. Later, law. The mood will come to me in our court. It's that inside. Inside. (laughs) Better. You got a permit for this gun? Gun, Harry, on the bed. Holy smokes, a gun. You shoot Johnny Hill with it? Yeah, have yourself a sniff. See? Hasn't been used since it mowed down ducks in Lake Michigan. I duck hunt with a thirty-eight. The ducks appreciate it. I wonder how that gun got here. I thought it was in Chicago. I'll ask you again, Harry. Did you shoot Johnny with it? You lost your mibs. Johnny was done with a forty-five. How would you know that? It wasn't in the papers. Nick carried a forty-five. Nick Joyner, the guy who shot Johnny. You're sure of it, huh? Johnny was killed with a forty-five, wasn't he? That's right. See, Nick Joyner. What happened at the Griffin Club last night? A card game with peckled cards. Johnny dropped maybe 50 G's. Nick won it with peckled cards. Maybe Johnny wasn't going to stand for it. Maybe Nick beat him to it. You took Johnny home after the game? Back to the hat and tucked him in. Where's Nick? I'll find him. That's why the gun, Harry? You're going to take care of Nick? Where's Nick? Leave him to me. Let's go. If we go, you're never going to find Nick. Come on, Harry. I'm booking you on a weapons charge. You're taking me in, huh? Where is he? Where else? Hotel Haddon under an alias? Of what alias? Markle, Merkel, something I don't know. I can save you the trouble, cop. I owe it to Johnny. Then you'll be held for homicide. Uh Uh-uh. Then you'll have to catch me. I already did. Turn off your radio and let's go, Harry. Imagine Nick Joyner living under an alias. Merkel. <laughs> Merkel. The things a guy will go through to get a room. You didn't know about it, huh, Morrill? So help me, Danny, not till you told me. This is a big hole. I can't keep my eye on everything that crawls into it. So help me, Danny. All right, you didn't know. You think Nick's the one who got the Danny? I ask you a civil question. The least you can do is... Huh? Yeah, yeah, 1218. A room reserved for shoe salesmen, usually. <laughs> Must be slow in shoes. Maybe Nick's out. Maybe you got a pass key. Sure, Danny. I got everything. But maybe Nick's. Open it. Whatever you say, Danny. See, Danny, he's out. Is there another room? This one with bath. All rooms with bath. Nick, I am sorry to barge in, but guess who? Hey, Danny, he's in the shower. Nick. Nick. Hey, Nick. Open it, Mara. Tell him we're here. Nick. Nick. Nick can't hear.
hear you, Maury. He can't hear anything anymore. Nick is dead. You're listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. How's for trying to sing it again this Saturday night? $5,000 in cold, hard cash and $10,000 in fine prices are waiting for the CBS listener who can solve the new Phantom Voice mystery. Dan Seymour will be on hand with those coast-to-coast phone calls, and Alan Dale, Judy Lynn, Bob Howard, and the Riddlers will be making music. It's an hour of fun and song to entertain you and perhaps pay off every Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. Here, sing it again this Saturday, won't you? Broadway stands on a street corner and raises its collective coat collar against the coming of winter's night. Tries to find warmth in the blaze of neon or in the ashes of a summer night's dream. And for a time, Broadway warms its hands with memory, tasting its glow, watching it flicker, watching it die. Then it goes looking somewhere else, and the translux screams in its ear. Murder, it screams. Gangster dead in Swank Hotel. Nick Joyner found dead. Broadway is happy. Broadway is daring goes right ahead and accepts the substitute. Grins. It found what it was looking for. And at police headquarters the next day, the probing over the murder of two men, Johnny Hill and Nick Joyner. And assisting at the probe, a man with an apple in his mouth. Mmm. Mmm. Good. What, Tatagra? I was merely remarking that this apple is... Mmm, mmm, good. Try on a bite, Danny. Uh, some other time. Roger, I will save you a piece in wax paper. Look for it around the water cooler, Danny. That way it'll keep cool. Anything else you're saving for me, Gino? No, nothing. Oh, you mean... Uh-huh. Oh, you didn't have to mention it, Danny. I was coming out with it anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, you're forgiven. If I don't forgive you, who should I? All right, Danny, all right. In the matter of the killing of Johnny Hill, hailing from Chicago... You'll tell me, huh? Well, it goes without saying. Established by technical, said Johnny Hill was undone by a revolver caliber forty-five. I know that. They've checked on the bullets. Found them to stem from a gun owned by Nick Joyner, hailing lately from this city. That means that... The... Uh, permit me to finish your thought, Danny. That means that without a shadow of a doubt, or as Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia, would have it, Tagli, it I... means that Johnny of Chicago was undone by Nick of this city because of an argument over a friendly game of cards. You know, Danny, Mike Shrek coined the phrase for such cases. Open and shut. Ah, <laughs> that's Shrek. Now you'll tell me about Nick Joyner. Well, need you ask? Nick Joyner was undone by a poison, the title of which can be found in any child's chemistry magazine. What else? Ah, Danny, we found someone who might be sorry Nick is dead. That's what else. Who? His missus. Mrs. Claire Joyner of 902 Benton Road, Forest Hills. You know, I think I'll pen a note to Shrek about this. Why? Well, it's a riddle to his liking, Danny. Look, if Nick killed Johnny, who killed Nick? All Johnny's friends are in the cooler or in Chicago. That leaves a large question mark. You know, you don't mind if I write to Shrek about it, huh, Danny? Bye, Danny! Can you come back? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about what? I thought you were the door-to-door tea salesman. The jewel truck is across the street, and I was going to tell him... Who are you? Danny Clover, police. Oh. Please come in. In in here. Please sit down. Thank you. I'm afraid I haven't very much time. Nick is... I know. I want to see him just once more. He's at the mortuary. I feel I ought to see him. How long has it been since you and your husband lived together? I don't know exactly how to answer that, Mr. Clover. A month? A year? No, longer than that. Once Nick brought home a black gown, strapless and cut... Well, you know. I put it on. 
I looked like a housewife looking ridiculous in a strapless gown. Nick left then. He moved out? No. No, he, he moved out just a month ago. It's been three years since he bought me the gown. You knew about the... About Nick's business affairs? That he was a thief? That he was a hoodlum? I knew about that. It didn't matter? I'll tell you something, Mr. Clover. Nick would go out and something would happen to him. Maybe he'd beat a man with a gun. He'd come home and stare at me. He needed me so he could feel ashamed. You still loved him. While he was here, I was glad. He's gone, but I'm not sorry. Nick wasn't the kind of man who could live very long. But I had him for part of the time that he did. Mrs. Joyner... No, I... please, you understand, Mr. Clover. Long ago, Nick wanted me to move someplace. You know, Park Avenue, a place like that. But Park Avenue, well, it was like the strapless gown. Did you ever meet any of Nick's friends? Nick didn't have any friends. He had people he had fun with. Like who? So many of them. Women? Of course, lots of them. But he never felt ashamed before any of them. But wasn't there someone, someone special? Well, Miss Lisbon was special. I saw her. Once I saw her walking on Broadway with Nick. On Broadway, Mr. Clover. And she only saw Nick. Miss Lisbon? Pull that Lisbon. Nick told me about her. She stayed at the hotel, hadn't I believe? Well, maybe she poisoned Nick. Maybe. Then I'm sorry for her. She doesn't know what she killed. The woman turned away from me, walked over to the hall mirror, adjusted a wisp of colorless hair under her hat, smoothed her gloves, looked once at her face, looked away, then walked out for one more time with Nick. She'd left the door open. I closed it for her. At headquarters, there was a file on Paulette Lisbon. Kansas City, Las Vegas, Chicago, Paris, the Italian Riviera... The girl who opened the door for me at the Hotel Haddon was the sum of all the places in which she'd been whispered to, clothed in silk. The sum of all the hands that had stroked the shadows on her throat, the edges of her mouth. All there was in the room was Paulette Lisbon. Thank you. For what? For the way you look at me. I thank you. Miss Lisbon, I... Nick looked at me like that sometimes. Other men makes a girl feel good. I mean, good. You liked Nick? Nick brought me pretty flowers. And these on my neck, on my arm, those boxes on the dressing table. Sure, I like Nick. Then maybe you'll help us find his killer. You really want him? The killer, I mean. So many people are celebrating Nick's dying all over town. I know because I've been invited. You're not going? No. No, I think Nick would like me to grieve a little. After that, I'm on my own. He told me so lots of times. He was poisoned. Maybe you can tell me why. I can give you a lot of whys, but don't ask me who. You'd tell me if you knew. Well, cross my heart and hope to die. Who needed him dead? You, the citizens, the people of the country. My Nicky was a stain. That brings us to you. Mm, I needed him alive. A girl like me doesn't know where her next Nick is coming from. Would you open it for me, Danny, please? This rope, the uh, guests might whisper. Miss Lisbon, I... Uh, oh, oh, it's you. I know you. Come on in, Finch. Hey, you don't keep a promise. I even spell my name for you. What'd you bring me this time, Finch? Oh, you'd be so pleased, Miss Lisbon. I stole it from the kitchen. Hunk of pheasant and this cool wine. Mm. I stole it for you. <laughs> there's no charge. Well, there's some bills on my dresser, Finch. Help yourself. Oh, you know I don't do it for that, Miss Lisbon. <laughs> you know, you just help yourself to these goodies. <laughs> Have some, Danny? It's on the house. It always is with Finch. No, thanks. They killed your Mr. Joyner, didn't they, Miss Lisbon? Hey, they had to be brave to kill a man like Mr. Joyner. Mm, if you like it that way. You just call me to clean up the mess when you're through. Bye, Miss Lisbon. Oh, there are so many. Many kinds. All different. You sure you won't have some, Danny? A funeral feast? No. Then throw it away for me, will you, Danny, please? Out the window was fun. Lots of fun. Danny? Oh, hello, Dr. Sinsky. Come on in. Well, what's on your mind? Hey, got a cigarette, Danny? Oh, here you are. Thanks. Light? No, I wouldn't think of it. I carry my own matches. <sighs> 
A very strange thing just happened, Danny. Oh, like what? I just finished an autopsy on Johnny Hill. An autopsy? What for? He was shot to death. What do you need an autopsy for? Because he wasn't shot to death. What are you talking about? Of course he was shot. Of course he was, with three forty-five caliber bullets. But that's not what killed him. Oh, look. Please, I... Danny, let me have my minute of glory, huh? Thank you. I happened to see the photographs taken of Johnny by our boys. Why, I asked myself, is there so little blood for a man who's been shot by a large caliber bullet? Then at the morgue, I examined Johnny. Very little blood on his clothes. So you performed an autopsy? Just to prove my point. Johnny was dead before he was shot. What? Johnny was poisoned to death with the same poison that killed Nick Joyner. Know anybody who didn't like those two fellows, Danny? <laughs> Danny. Oh, sit down. Me? Him. You leave, more. Oh, Danny, I'll lend you my office. Be polite. Out. I... Okay, okay. I said you can sit down. I'm not in the habit of sitting down. Room service, remember? Finch. Room service. Tell me about yourself, Finch. I told you. Room service. I mean, how you live, your friends, what you do outside of the hotel. You're interested? Yeah, I am. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'll tell you. How do I live? <clears throat> oh, I work eight hours, read a lot, go to the movies a lot, write letters to the newspapers. They printed some of them. Spell your name right? Oh, was I have such a simple name to remember. <laughs> Maybe that's why everybody forgets it. What about your friends? Ah, oh, no, I've tried that. People don't measure up. Does Miss Lisbon measure up? She's beautiful. I'd like her to admire me, but... Uh, Really doesn't matter. Don't you care what people think about you, Finch? Used to bother me. I used to try. When I was younger, I took physical culture exercises and correspondence courses and personality, but I never finished. I don't know. Somehow. Well, I don't know. Now you don't care. Ah, oh, people are stupid. They don't know what goes on inside of other people. Me. Why are you asking me these things, Mr. Clover? Because I admire you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Oh, see, let me show you something. I have it right here in my coat pocket. It's a letter I'm writing to the Times. Read it. Oh, tell me about it. It's about those two men who were murdered in this hotel. Society ought to thank whoever did it. Give them a medal. Don't you think so, Miss Clark? Think what? Give them a medal. Whoever poisoned those two men. Yeah, that's, that's one way of looking at it, Finch. See, you know, Mr. Clover, you and I think alike. You can understand a man. I think we can be great friends. Uh-huh. I think I would have hated Nick Joyner myself. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Tell me about it. Well, if I would have poisoned a big man like Johnny Hill, then if someone would have come along and taken all the credit for it by emptying his gun into Johnny... Oh, what kind of courage did that take? Killing a dead man. Maybe Nick didn't know Johnny was dead. He probably just thought Johnny was sleeping. Oh, that doesn't make any difference. Nick got all the glory for killing Johnny. And you couldn't stand that, could you? You wanted that glory. What's that? You killed them both, didn't you? Johnny and Nick. What's that? Poisoned Johnny because of how important it would make you feel inside yourself. You could walk the streets and look at the people and know they didn't know how important you are. I didn't say that, Mr. Clover. And Nick messed it up for you. So you had to kill Nick. No, 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 that's not right, Mr. Clover. You either. said they were both poisoned. How'd you know? I just found no, out. Now, no, listen to me, I... You reported the first murder to me yesterday. You took great pains to give me details. But you didn't say he was shot because you didn't know he was. You've got to listen no. to me. No. You listen to me. Think about it, Finch. Alan Finch kills two big, notorious gangsters. Uh, but, but look, look, Mr. Clover. Think about it, Finch. Your picture and all the papers, your name and all the headlines... Alan Finch. Not just letters to the editor. Pictures. Headlines. Personal interviews? About how I did it? Sure. Of course. Maybe a picture of Miss Lisbon and me. And she'll be crying. Let's go tell the papers about it, Finch. Finch. Alan Finch. F-I-N-C-H. Finch. <laughs> Yeah.
It's the happy time on Broadway. It's after the movies. Nobody wants to go home. It's a place strung against the night like a phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped here. The golden girl. The bright-eyed kid. The man with the promises. And the guy who believes him. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, Marlo Dwyer, Gigi Pearson, Adrian Martin, Lou Merrill, and Jack Crucian. We Americans have a valuable heritage, a heritage of individual freedom that includes the freedom to worship as we wish at the church or synagogue of our own choice. By attending church regularly, we can gain the moral and spiritual strength to meet the many problems which confront us today. Help support your church and attend regularly with your family. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. At one o'clock in the morning, solitude whispers its invitation. And the derelicts of night run from it, beat on a door, plead for a refuge from the offered emptiness. But no door opens to them. At headquarters, you consider it through a grime-stained window. Turn away from it. Find on your desk a slip of paper that hadn't been there before. Homicide, it says. Central Park Lake. And Broadway has finally opened a door. The password, the violent dead. There is the lake and the facade of the city embracing it. There's a shadow covering a dead girl with its coat. The puny effort to thaw the veil of frost on the girl's forehead. Then the shadow rises, shakes its head, and it's mug of him. I don't know, Danny. Sometimes it's, uh... You know, Danny, I got a nephew, three years old. He comes here during the daytime to play, to feed the ducks. Yeah. Who is she? We don't know. They're dragging the lake now for any identification she might have had on her. So far, nothing. Drowned? Uh-uh. Hey, come here, I'll show you. Hmm? See? A knife wound. Where it is, it probably killed her instantly. Then they threw her in the lake. Who reported it? A guy and his girl. They were, you know, smooching. They looked up, saw the body floating in the water. They reported the precinct near the house. Anything? We questioned them. Why didn't they report it right away? They had an argument about it, they said. Didn't want to get into a mess, they said. Then the girl said she told her boyfriend we'd better report it, so they did. Who were they? Smoochers. Nothing else, Danny. We're positive. You made no comment, Danny. On what? The way this girl is dressed, the expensive evening gown, the expensive mink fur coat. I know it's real mink because my wife talks in her sleep about mink like that. So? So a lot, Danny. A girl as expensive, as beautiful as this one. Somebody will come asking for her. It's the least they could do, huh, Danny? There wasn't anything to say after that. And from far away, across the stillness, the brief, wild sob of a boat whistle... The sudden flurry of wind through naked branches. The quick, small sounds in places where there's no sun. This was the autumn's night pastoral, with death in it. I turned up my collar and walked away from it. The next morning it was back to headquarters. 
received the report that so far nothing had been found on the bottom of the lake to identify the dead girl. Go downstairs to the place where it's never daytime, the morgue, and the three people waiting there. The quiet audience sensing the etiquette of stillness in the presence of the dead. All right, you, the lady over there. Muggerman? Uh-huh. We want you to be sure, ma'am. I'm sure. Well? No, it's not my sister. Uh, that way out, ma'am. Now, the gentleman. My wife was blonde. Is this your wife? Now, take it easy. I haven't seen Aggie in three years. This girl is 5'6", weight 124, approximately 22 years of age. Aggie's going to turn up here one of these days. I'll make book on it. But she ain't done it yet. This ain't Aggie. Get through that door over there, please. Uh, you're next, lady. Mrs. Hunter. Coslow! Hey, Coslow! Yeah? What do you want? Why didn't she come Oh, home? it's her. Better get her out of here, will you? Yeah, come on, Mrs. Hunter. Mm-hmm. We know. Never so often this happens with Mrs. Hunter, Danny. Really identified a daughter here about five years ago. Keeps coming back. I don't know. That's all of them, huh? Mm-hmm. Funny. Lovely young girl. Dressed beautifully. Someone must want to know what's happened to her, where she is. Someone must know who she is. Okay, Muggerman, we'll try it another way. Another way was to check with the men in technical. Maybe they had something. They had. The dress the girl had worn to die in was an exclusive, made exclusively for one woman in an exclusive shop just off Park Avenue. The coat, too. The girl had good taste, they told me, and the money to indulge it, and the beauty to grace it. Beyond that, all they had was a shrug. So I packed it, shrug and all, in a cardboard suitcase. And on top of it, the portrait of the girl taken in death. And closed the cover, snapped the lock. At Roderick's Incorporated, just off Park Avenue, a man tried to stop me from opening the suitcase. Maybe I should have been proud. It was Roderick Incorporated himself. My good fellow, the hours for salesmen are between 9 and 10 of the morning. They are? And on Tuesdays and Thursdays of a week. Now that you've been briefed, you may scurry off. And uh, take that uh, that thing with you. This could interest you, Roderick. Why? Because I'm a policeman. Uh, don't turn pale, Roderick. You don't match the color scheme that way. Whatever would a policeman want with Roderick? This picture, Roderick. Look at it. Oh, stunning girl. But so, uh, so dead. You know her? No, no, no. Oh, but wait, that dress she's wearing, it's mine. Uh, That is, it's a Roderick original. A Roderick uh, inspiration. Is it this dress? Oh, but of course, and the coat too. (laughs) Who else could have molded those lines? You molded them for this girl? Oh, no, no, never, never. Obviously, your dead girl is a thief. I created these things for Gladys Hampton, the advertising executive. Surely you've seen her in these things in Harper's. Where else can I see her? She has a place on Fifth, a tired mansion. Uh, Kiss her for me when you see her, will you? Tell her you do it for Roderick, eh? If you don't mind, Mr. Clover, let's get this over as quickly as possible, shall we? All you have to do is cooperate, Miss Hampton. Cooperate? I've just come home from Vermont. Just this morning, I've got work to do. Cooperating with police is not on the agenda. I want to show you something. These clothes, this coat, this dress. Where'd you get them? Have you ever seen them before? I'll tell you why I have. I paid a lot of money for them. They're mine. What are you doing with them? Well, look at this. Go ahead. Take a look at this picture. That's Joan. What's this all about? Who's Joan? Joan is Joan. Joan Fuller, my maid. What's happened? Didn't you miss her when you came home today? No, she didn't know when I was coming back. What's happened to her? We found her in Central Park Lake, murdered. I'm not going to like the publicity about this. That's how sorry you are, huh? I don't allow myself those kind of luxuries. I'm too busy. Tell me about Joan. Well, she's worked for me for two years. She came from Muncie, Indiana. She was efficient. She lived here. I paid her well. I couldn't tell you more than that. How is it she was wearing your clothes? Before I left for the weekend, she said a young man she knew from Muncie was in town. She wanted to dress well for him. Would I lend her some clothes? I would and did. What young man from Muncie? How do I know what young man from Muncie? I suppose Muncie has its share of young men, else eventually there'd be no Muncie. Did you get a look at him? 
Well, he was coming in while I was going out. He was nice looking. I'd probably remember him if I saw him again, but I couldn't describe him. You see, I'm being of no help to you. Besides, I'm busy. Please close both doors to the vestibule as you go out, Mr. Clover. I did, and walked out into the street holding the crumbs she'd given me. The identity of the dead girl. A girl who had borrowed her employer's clothes to impress a young man from Muncie. A girl whose final embrace was holding close the bitter waters of a lake. At headquarters, the routine that is a requiem for the violent dead. A telegram to Muncie asking for information on Joan Fuller. The order to Mugovan to riffle through hotel registers for a visitor from Muncie. A young man, good looking. The sifting, the questioning. The break for a cup of lukewarm coffee. And then another call from Mugovan. Hotel Adams, Danny. A Johnny Barrett. Registered with his wife from Muncie. I looked at him, Danny. He looks likely. The tired room. Complete with stained rugs, stained washstand. The young man at the dresser, manicuring his fingernails. You're here to present me with the keys to the city? I'd like that, because I'm fond of your city. To ask you questions, Mr. Barrett. Now, what would a boy from the country know that would interest a big city man like you? He might have known a girl named Joan Fuller. He might have known a lot of girls. Not one named Joan, though. That's one he's missed. How big is Muncie, Mr. Barrett? Big enough that I could walk its streets, put nickels in slot machines, order a beer, go alone to movies, and never meet a girl named Joan. It teases me, though. I'd like to meet her. She's dead. She was murdered. That makes me sad. I cry when girls die. It's a thing with me. Let's go, Mr. Baron. I haven't finished my pinky. You want to show me the sights? I want to show you to a woman who says a young man came calling on Joan Fuller, a young man from Muncie. Hey, that could be a sight. Get your coat, Mr. Barrett. Let's go. Can't wait. Oh, honey. Honey doll, come on in. Enjoy looking at the shop windows? Jimmy, who is... A policeman, honey. He wants to go show me to a lady. This is my wife, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Barrett? It's hard to believe she's my wife, huh, Mr. Clover? It, me being young and... Well, honey doll here being... But we love each other to pieces. Don't we, honey doll? Hmm? Jimmy, I don't understand. What's a policeman doing with you? Uh, don't worry, baby, I told you. He wants a lady to look at me so she can identify me as the murderer of some pretty girl named Joan. She was pretty, huh, Mr. Clover? Uh, Jimmy. Uh, uh, go window shopping again, honey doll. The policeman and I have got a date. Let's go, Jimmy. Sure. Let's go. This house. Nice house. Ever been here before? No. Bet you wish I had, though. Nice chimes. Pretty. Nice. Funny. Vestibule doors open a bit. Miss Hampton liked her doors closed. Oh, you wouldn't peek, would you? Yeah, I would. <clears throat> Stuck. It'll only open half. Hey. hey, look. What there was to look at was a vestibule floor, a tile mosaic in a simple block pattern. Clean, gleaming. Even the blood that spread across it had a new quality to it. Miss Hampton's blood. Miss Hampton lying there. I knelt beside her. Miss Hampton with a knife in her heart. Miss Hampton, dead. <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Are you ready to sing it again this Saturday night? You'll find a whole hour full of the day's popular music by Alan Dale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, and the Riddlers. You'll hear the tuneful riddle songs that lead to Sing It Again's Phantom Voice Treasure Trove. Five thousand dollars in cash and ten thousand more in wonderful prizes. 
Be listening to Sing It Again this Saturday night when it comes your way on most of these same CBS stations. The Phantom's a puzzler, but some CBS listener will win that five grand in cash. When it's November and the winter is a-coming in, Broadway is a place of regret. The dreams are dying, and it's a long time before April will come again. The orange juice stands put glass doors between themselves and the pavement, serve hot coffee as a buffer against the wind and loneliness. Somebody leaves a newspaper on the stool beside you, not very neat, folded badly. There's a small bit of blackberry pie on the item that tells about a girl who floated face downward in the lake. You flip back a page and consider the minor headline concerning a woman named Gladys Hampton, also murdered. And flip another one and see how they ran at Hialeah. You take your time. Outside, it's pavements. And outside, it's cold. I didn't have it so good. I got my coffee out of a paper cup, and Sergeant Tataglia had put too much cream in it. Or as he put it... Too much cream, huh? And not enough sugar. Ah, you always get them mixed up, Danny. Why is this? We all have our bad days, Gino. Eh, only I seem to have them more frequent than most. Have you noticed? Uh, Let's get on with it. You got anything for me? Uh, yeah, Danny, yeah. In the matter of Jimmy Barrett, the young man from Muncie, it has been established by the coroner that he could not have killed Gladys Hampton since, at the moment of her demise, Jimmy was with you. What about an alibi for last night when Joan Fuller was killed? He claims that he was doing the town up with his wife and cannot tell us what time he was where. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, ha, what? He cannot tell us what time he was where, Danny. How does he like our pokey, Gino? Uh, not very much. He's screaming for his wife. Also, he wrote the little verse on the wild to tell us how much he didn't like it. It starts off... Well, tell me later, Gino. I'm going out. Uh, where, Danny? To see a man's wife. It's you. Where's my husband? What have you done with him? He's downtown, Miss Barrett. We're holding him on suspicion of murder. Well, don't stand there in the hall making a show of me before the world. Come in here. Come in. Sure, Miss Barrett. I was just washing out some of my things in the basin. You live in a dirty city, Mr. Clover. The dirt eats into everything. What right have you to do a thing like that to Jimmy? What right? Because we think he murdered a girl named Joan Fuller. Girl I read about? Girl from Muncie? Jimmy never knew her. He never knew anything like her. Not like her. You know that much about your husband, Mrs. Barrett? I'm a middle-aged woman, Mr. Clover. I know things about my husband that no girl ever knew. Why did you and Jimmy come to New York, Miss Barrett? You won't say any of the things people say when I tell them. Jimmy and I are on our honeymoon. Mrs. Barrett. He loves me. You saw how much he loves me. The sweet names he calls me. I saw, Mrs. Barrett. Took me a long time to bring Jimmy around to me, Mr. Clover. To the things I wanted. I'm not going to lose him to you. You'll help us. Maybe we can give him back. This is a trick. You're trying to trick me. You want me to say something about him that'll make him dead. Something that can save him. What can I tell you that will do that? Did he ever leave you alone on your honeymoon? Go off somewhere alone? Never. Why, Jimmy waits on me hand and foot. That's what first attracted me to him back home. How polite he was. How considerate. When he could have had any girl. Here, Mrs. Barrett. Has he left you alone here? I told you no. He was alone when I found him. That was different. I I went window shopping. I like to do that alone. I like to come back and tell him the things I saw. All the useless, expensive, frilly things that are no use to anyone. Just good to look at sometimes. You've done that other times? Back home, in Muncie, not here. One more question, Miss Byrne. Did you know Joan Fuller? No, I didn't know her. My husband didn't know her. I haven't told you anything that'll save him, have I? No. But I will. You'll see. I hired a lawyer. He's getting a writ. You'll bring Jimmy back to me. You'll see. Wait till I tell Jimmy how you treated me. Just you wait. I'll wait. Don't take Jimmy back home with you, Mrs. Barrett. We'll want you both here. Danny? 
Come on in, Chino. Okay. Just a word to let you know that people questioning around the home of Gladys Hampton had never seen Jimmy Barrett. Also, that Jimmy is released on a writ. Yeah, I was threatened with it. And to tell you that outside is a gentleman from Muncie, Indiana. Another one? Yeah, Danny. You know, this is the first week in my life I have met two people from Muncie, Indiana, one on top of the other. Show them in, Gino. They're this way in to see Danny Clover, Mr. Fuller. Sit down, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. I'm Joan's father, Mr. Clover. I see. I'm very sorry about what... Thank you, but of course you're not sorry, if we mean the same thing by that word. You're a policeman on homicide, and your job's got to do with dead people. People get used to death almost as easy as they do to cigarettes. The sorrow of Joan's death belongs to me, not to you. Forgive me, I made a speech. How did you know your daughter was dead? You notified the Muncie police, they notified me. I've come to take her home with me. If I can help... I'm the person who killed her. We're trying, Mr. Fuller. I've never been vengeful. I've always felt sorry for people eaten by hate. Now it's happened to me. I can understand. Tell me, Mr. Fuller, do you know a man named Jimmy Barrett from Muncie? Of course. Joan knew him, too. Pardon me a second. Bataglia. Roger, Danny. There's a man tailing Jimmy Barrett, isn't there? Yeah, Danny. Get in touch with him. Find out where Jimmy is. Roger. Over. We were talking about Jimmy Barrett, Mr. Fuller. Tell me about him. Well, Jimmy married a woman somewhat older than he. Rather wealthy woman. Why do you ask? He's honeymooning in New York. How well did your daughter know him? Mm, Valentine's. Letters on flowered stationery. Holding hands and dances. That much, no more than that. I see. What did Joan tell you she was doing in New York? Working in advertising, she said. Everyone back in Muncie thought that. I didn't know she was a maid. I know how you feel. Forgive me again, you can't possibly know. Did you have a daughter? Did you tell her stories? Did she cry against your cheek? Did you watch her grow up? Was she found in a lake? Was she murdered? Mr. Fuller, I... We don't know each other, Mr. Clover. We're not friends. Your sympathy doesn't mean anything to me. Just find my daughter's killer. Danny? What is it, Tatalia? The man we had tailing Jimmy Barrett just phoned in. Jimmy just bought himself a new car five minutes ago. Brand new Hudson. Where? Tobin's on 105th Street. Thanks, Gino. You're primed to buy a new car, mister? You're just tantalizing yourself with this new model. I want to, uh... Sure you want to. Everybody wants to. There's no feeling like the feeling of running your hand over this new all-leather upholstery. I'll save it. I'm from the police. That makes you different? That gives you desires different from other people's Look, desires? a man named James Barrett was just in Oh, I'll never forget him. He bought a new car off of me not a half hour ago, paid me cash, drove away on a dream. Cash? $2,500. He just took $2,500 out of his pocket and gave it to you? Well, not exactly. Uh, let me give you a vivid description of it. I found it very thrilling. You thrilled me, too. He looked at the car, asked me how much it was as it stood there, and I told him. Then he runs across the street to the bank, runs back with $2,500 clutched in his wet fist. So you see why it wasn't exactly he pulled it out of his pocket. He was clutching it in his wet fist. Bank across the street, huh? Yeah. Hey, what's the matter? He got it from the bank. It can't be counterfeit, can it? Don't give me heart failure like that. Hit me in the face with it. It's not counterfeit, is it? Don't you find it rather interesting, Mr. Clover, that I, Stephen Chase, am working for the Corn Exchange Bank? We Chases have a bank of our own, you know. I know. And you're the Chase who gave Barrett $2,500. Precisely that Chase. Does Barrett have an account here? As of this morning, a rather plump one. He opened an account this morning and withdrew that much money this afternoon? I see you don't understand banks. Oh, explain them to me. Uh, Mrs. Barrett had a letter of credit from a bank in Muncie, Indiana, which she chose to deposit here with us at Corn. Go on. Uh, Please. Therefore, this account was in Mrs. Barrett's name. However, this morning, Mr. Barrett appeared. Mr. Barrett, the bearer of a letter from his wife to the effect that her account should now be a joint account. Was that all? Please. I called Mrs. Barrett to find out whether the letter was valid. Mrs. Barrett told me to give her husband as much money as he wanted. All this happened this morning? Precisely this morning. Precisely, Mr. Chase. Oh, 
Oh, hiya, Danny. Just going out. Want to go out with us? No, I'm coming in. Oh, Miss Barrett. See, you got all your things packed. Going back to Muncie? Oh, no, no. You said we couldn't go back to Muncie until this thing was all cleared up. We're going to find a nicer place to live. Yeah, me and the honey doll are going to branch out. Nothing but a ball from now on. We're really going to live. Aren't we, honey doll? You're whatever you want, Jimmy. Tell me what you want, Jimmy. What I want? Get out of this crummy hole. New clothes for honey doll. And for me, drapes. Double-breasted. I understand you got a new car. It's got New York talking, huh? We're talking about it down at headquarters. Uh, Jimmy, uh, the man said he'd show us the penthouse at 9 o'clock. It's almost that now. You heard what Honey Doll said, Danny. I guess I'm henpecked, that's all. Tell me when all this happened, Jimmy. The last time I saw you, you were happy right here. How much are you allowed to meddle in our lives? What concern is it of yours where we live? Oh, Honey Doll, don't talk like that to Danny. He wants to come up for a drink sometime. He wants to know our address. Get him out of here. You didn't answer my question, Jimmy. When did you make up your mind about all this? New car, penthouse. I'll tell you. Honey Doll and me had a small talk. We decided we were tired of living like folks, like other people. Honey Doll wants to support me in the manner I'm itching for. And she can afford it. Come here, Honey Doll. Jimmy. Jimmy, get him out of here. Oh, baby, this is Jimmy. Jimmy with his arms around you. Stop it! <laughs> Okay, okay. But you're supposed to give me anything I want, remember? You're a little blackmail, Jimmy. Huh? I had a talk with Joan's father. He said you used to hold hands with his daughter. If you did that, you lied to me. You did now, John. You did lie to me. Danny, so I lied to you. I was nervous. It's getting late, Jimmy. Did you lie to him, Miss Burr? Did you know Joan back in Muncie? No. But you knew Jimmy knew her. You knew Jimmy was seeing her while you were here, while you were on your honeymoon, Miss Barrett. Oh, why not, Danny? Guy likes to look up old friends, especially an old friend who's made good in a big city. I got news for you. Joan was a housemaid. Those clothes she was wearing belonged to her employer. I knew that, and I understand why she did it. To impress me. To make me hate myself because I married another woman. Jimmy, you realize what your lying can cost you. Sure, Danny. Now I'm your number one murder suspect. That's right. Danny. Uh-huh. What's the penalty for murder in this state? Premeditated. Premeditated? Life, the chair. Depends on the jury. And how about for obstructing justice? It depends. One to ten, maybe. But for murder, it can be the chair, huh? That's right. Did you hear that, honey doll? You're going to get the chair. Jimmy. You killed so you could keep your husband in you, Mrs. Barrett. Jimmy. I'm begging you. Get him out of here. If you were afraid Jimmy would get blamed for it, because Miss Hampton, her employer, could recognize him. You had to kill Miss Hampton, too, didn't you? Jimmy. That's what you held over your wife, Jimmy. You knew all this. She had to give you everything you wanted. Thought you'd get as soon as you were married, but didn't. One to ten, huh? That's the way it was, Danny. <laughs> Honey doll, you've lived almost most of your life. They had a week of it with me. Let's go, both of you. Honey doll, I promise you this. When I get out, not spend your money. I'll be happy. Just the way you wanted me to. Broadway looks good now. It's wearing the funny mask with the funny nose. And the big smile painted in scarlet. The scarlet you've known in other places and other times. Don't rip off the mask, kid, because you couldn't stand what you'd see. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat.
Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Irene Tedrow, Dick Crenna, Bob Bruce, Peggy Weber, Stan Waxman, and Jack Crucian. This Saturday evening on CBS, Hopalong Cassidy comes riding to the rescue of an old friend who's suspected of a serious crime. It's a long, tough job Hoppy takes on, literally risking his own neck. With one of the greatest surprise endings you've ever heard, Hoppy comes through. Be listening this Saturday and every Saturday evening when the one and only Hopalong Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is heard on most of these same CBS stations. Dan Coverly speaking, this is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's December and the winter has caught hold, Broadway comes up with a miracle. Silver trees grow out of the sidewalks. Men with beards and red velvet suits suddenly appear from out of the Bowery and dedicate themselves to being jolly. And reindeer roam the tundra of the spectaculars. It's a time of Crosby records, noses against department store windows, and wishing you'd kept up the Christmas club payments. Everybody's happy. Even the finance company sends you season's greetings. The atmosphere hadn't touched the alley, littered and dark, except for a stark cone from a flashlight held by a policeman. Up here, Danny. Shot twice in the back. Still breathing. Come on. Come on, Doc. Take a look, Doc. Let's put him on the stretcher. I don't think this one's got much time. Give me a hand here. Yeah. Easy. We have him in the hospital in five minutes. Know who he is, Muglin? Yeah, his wallet says Ben Justin. Here it is. The ideas of what happened? I think he knows who shot him, Danny. He was saying he'll get even. Any names? Uh, no. Easy with him now. Just slide the stretcher in here. We'll ride with him. Let's go, Muglin. Yeah. Okay, Joe, let's get this ambulance on the road. Who are you going to kill, Ben? Watch it, Danny. Flat him out. Here, hold the bottle up like this. Yeah. Is it all right if I talk to him? You better hurry. Who shot you, Ben? Can you hear me, Ben? Ben. Wait a second. Hey, Joe, you can take it easy. Take your time. He's dead, Danny. Then the slow ride through swarming avenues, the slow tolling of the ambulance bell, because the rhythm of death is slow. And through the windows of the moving car, the procession of fleeting faces, of melting forms scurrying from the bitter touch of an unknown wind. And then suddenly, at a stop, because death in the city must wait its turn, the face peering in, avid for a furtive glimpse of pain, seeing only the shroud-covered man, turning away in regret. The ambulance moves again, and within it, silence because there are no more questions that can be asked of the dead. At headquarters, the setting up of a file on Ben Justin. The word, murdered, neatly typed in triplicate, then the fragments of his life drifting in to be pieced together, to be entered under the correct heading, on the correct line. Ben Justin lived in an apartment on West 86th. He was married to a woman named Evelyn. Go there, ask her the question the dying man wouldn't answer. Ben didn't tell you? He was bleeding to death and he wouldn't tell you who killed him? No, Miss Justin. I like him for that. For a lot of other reasons, but this one's the best. Then you will want to help us find his murderer. No, uh-uh. That's your job. That's what you get paid for. They shot him down in an alley. Sorry, there. but that's how I feel about things. You get what you work for in this world. No one can do it for you. You want Ben's killer? Find him. 
That way he'll belong to you, just you. If you know something, Mrs. Justin, we can hold you. Now, wherever did you get an idea like that? How would I know who killed Ben? It's his secret. He's taking it to his grave with him. Maybe I didn't tell you. Ben's last words were that he would kill him with his bare hands. Ben can't do that now, can he? But you can do something, Mrs. Justin. You can tell me about Ben. You can tell me who wanted him dead. Tell you about Ben? That could take my lifetime. But I'll brief it down for you. Ben did good by me. Dressed me in fancy clothes, showy. Showed me off to his friends. Didn't mind if one made a play for me. Grinned it off. Grinned about it when we got home. Cuffed me a little, and we go to sleep laughing. That's about Ben. Doesn't help as much. Then try this. Ben used to work for the Imperial Insurance Company, an investigator. Go ask them about Ben. I bet those insurance people knew more about him than even his wife knew. It's their business. Imperial Insurance? On Lower Broadway. You can excuse yourself now, Mr. Clover. I want to go over my wardrobe, pick out a black dress for Ben's funeral. Silk... Yeah, Silk. He liked me in it. Uh, Yeah, it's very intriguing what you tell me, Mr. Clover. Look, why don't we go downstairs and chat about it over a cup of coffee? No, Mr. Cogan. Oh, You don't understand, kid. I haven't had my breakfast. How can I do my best for Imperial Insurance without something hot in my stomach? We're trying to find out who killed the man. For this, I have to miss my breakfast? I tell you, you don't understand. My wife sleeps in the morning. She doesn't make me... Ben Justin used to work for you. I want you to give me what you know about him. Now. Because it won't wait. (sighs) On an empty stomach? All right. All right. Yeah, he worked for us. One of our hottest cases... You're a goalie kissed us goodbye. You don't know anything about him after that. You're just... Uh... Look, kid, did I say that? I know a lot about Ben. Let me open my mouth a little, huh? It's open. A year ago, we put Ben on the Colton murder case. Remember it? Who doesn't? Mrs. Colton found murdered, shot to death in her house on Long Island. That one cost us, uh, the company, a hundred grand. The police were handling it. Why did you put a private investigator on it? Oh, don't let it bother you. Justin Flop, too. He said he couldn't find a thing to prove that Mrs. Colton's nephew and his wife committed the mayhem. Remember Johnny and Dottie Reed? The lovable kids that all of us thought were the murderers. The state, us, till they were acquitted. No evidence, not even from our own boy, Ben. And after that, Ben quit. How did you know? Oh, I told you, yeah. He turned in a memo that we should pay the kids the hundred grand insurance the aunt left the boy. Shook hands all around, resigned. Then right away we find out he was making merry with the Reed kids. All over town, in their home. How do you know that? It was a password in our office, how Ben and his wife were always in the company of the kids. Why? The kids were acquitted? They have the right to make their own friends? For a hundred grand, we keep trying. (sighs) Do I get coffee now? Yeah. Yeah, Here's a dime. Let it be on me. Hello. What can I do for you? My name's Danny Clover from the police. Yeah. Is your name Reed? Yeah, that's right. I wondered... You've uh... got to look in your eyes. You want to talk to me, don't you? Come on in. In here. I know that look, Mr. Clover. The police and I have been chummy before. Is your wife here? Vacuuming the rugs in the dining room. Daddy! Hey, Daddy! Yeah, what do you want, Johnny? Turn off the lewit and come in here. We've got a caller. I hope you don't mind the way Dottie looks. <laughs> Holiday cleaning. What'd you say? Oh. Uh, this is Danny Clover, Dottie. He's from the police. I'll be honest with you, Mr. Clover. I'm busy. Well, just a few questions about Ben Justin. <laughs> Guess I'm right, Dottie, huh? Soon as I saw this morning's paper, I told you a policeman would be twirling his hat at the door. Then you talk to him, Johnny. I've got to get my work done. I'm afraid you'll have to hold it off for about five minutes, Miss Reed. Do you have a warrant? I don't need one. All I want... Uh, Dottie gets all mixed up. Ever since the cops scared her to death last year, well, she just could be lost, and the only person around a cop, and she wouldn't ask him which way was home. Johnny isn't kidding. Cops. How well did you two know Ben Justin? We're not going to his funeral. Not even flowers, Mr. Clover. Funny. 
I heard you were pretty good friends. Two weeks ago, Johnny and I took turns yawning in his face. He still wouldn't go home. Then he used to drop in here often. Mm, maybe a couple times a month. <laughs> when I shook his hand after we were acquitted, he took that to mean buddy. He couldn't get through his head out of shaking anybody's hand. Now. Ben Justin tried to send you to the chair. I don't understand. Neither did we. You inherited a lot of money when your aunt was killed, didn't you, Mr. Reed? You people can't leave us alone, can you? Hey, you shouldn't have asked that, Mr. Clover. Dottie's going to be upset all day. It's going to be like this for the rest of our lives. Dottie. No matter what we do, where we go, it's going to be the same way. Get him out of here, Johnny. Get him out of here. You heard him, Mr. Clover. You better get out. Dottie's busy. <laughs> If I turn on the radiator, Danny, it's cold in here. Huh? How can you stand it? There. Danny, you've been over and over the transcript of a year old trial maybe a hundred times. You want something juicy to read? Try this pulp. It's good, huh? Tells me the thrilling things detectives have happened to them. For two bits, it thrills even me. Things that go on. Mrs. Colton was killed with Johnny Reed's gun. Our ballistics man proved it. Brought it in evidence. Exhibit A. But no fingerprints. No fingerprints. And if you read the transcript another hundred times, there still won't be any. What are you trying to build, It Danny? bothers me. You mind, Muggervin? Danny, listen to me. The kid had a right to the gun. Messenger boy for a brokerage house. Briefcases full of stocks and bonds. Sometimes even money. A boy needs a gun in a career like that. They present him with it, courtesy of the house. And it killed his aunt, endowed two kids with $100,000. The gun could have been stolen from him, just like he said. His wife put her arms around him. He felt different somehow to her without the gun. That was the first they knew it was missing, just like they said in court. Yeah. I don't understand what you're after, Danny. The kids were acquitted. I know. They said they spent the day picnicking on the Jersey Palisades. Nobody could prove different. Nobody could prove they were at the murder house that day. They were acquitted. I told you I know, Muggerman. Then what's with you? You think you found a free and easy way to solve Ben Justin's murder? I take it back, Danny. I, uh, I didn't mean to say that. Why so chummy with the Reed kids? You mean Justin and his wife? You care about anyone else? Justin was a top insurance investigator. He couldn't find a thing to prove that the kids were anywhere else but eating ham and cheese sandwiches on the Palisades. That cinched it. When an insurance company... Danny, you gotta go. You just gotta. Here, I brought your overcoat. I'll help you into it. It's not too much, Tartaglia. Where am I going? To the residence of one Mrs. Evelyn Justin. She just phoned in, Danny. She was crying, then screaming. In between said cries and screams was sandwiched that someone was trying to kill her. I made her go slow so I could take her down in shorthand. Here, Danny. Her very words. Yeah. Get your coat, Muggerman. It's a cold ride. Down this hall, Muggerman. Come on. Right behind you. Wish I'd taken that call. Sounds real quiet in there. Locked, huh, Danny? Lean on the bell, Muggerman. Yeah. Danny! Danny, something happened to Take it in. <laughs> Mrs. Justin! Watch it, Danny. The place is a furnace. Mrs. Justin! Oh, Danny, you can't go in there. Don't be crazy. Yeah. I don't understand what happened. We ring the bell, we blow the place up. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There should be plenty of action on CBS Hopalong Cassidy show tomorrow night. Hoppy will be invading the land of the Gunhawks. And though this may not sound full of action at first, he'll finally play dead to capture a band of vicious marauders. Hopalong Cassidy, starring Bill Boyd, comes your way every Saturday evening on most of these same CBS stations. Join him in the land of Gunhawks tomorrow night. On the eve of the holiday, Broadway opens wide its loudspeakers, takes last year's tinsel off a back shelf, considers its tarnish, shrugs and hangs it in a doorway, in a shop window. Just above the summer resort sports shirt sprinkled with artificial snow and decked with dust-covered holly. It makes glints in the winter's sun, 
sways gently in the winter's wind, and it makes you all warm inside, doesn't it, kid? The warm-eyed women walking by, hugging the warm fur close to them, makes you merry, and the music floating out of the metallic throats. Good, huh, kid? But turn it up. That way you won't hear the dissonance of death. That way it won't intrude that explosion uptown. Anyone killed? No one knows yet, but when they do, it'll be given to you. Hot off the presses, shining from the Translux, gift-wrapped with red ribbons. But before that happens, they've got to clear away the charred litter, hold the crowds back, assure the lady her kid wasn't in there. You don't know where he is. And then finally a man comes up to you. It's all clear now, Danny. We can go in. They find anything? Uh-huh. They said in the kitchen. They said to watch ourselves. The walls are still smoldering. Okay, let's go, my Yeah. He said in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Watch it, Danny. Doe, don't look any Come different. on. Not much left, is it, Danny? You were here before. Not much left, huh? Broken up in smoke. Hey. Yeah. Mrs. Justin? Yep. Explosion must have done it, huh, Danny? The way she... The way... She was beaten up first. Slugged. See? Here. Mm-hmm. Here? Yeah. They made sure, huh, Danny? If we hadn't rung the doorbell, maybe they... Call it in, Muggerman. To homicide. Hi-ho, Danny. I come bearing gifts from the boys in technical. To you. You thank them for me, Gino. Goes without saying. Christmas is coming, Danny. Courtesy is the motto of the season. A fellow has Goes to... Goes without be... saying. What have you got? Gift number one. You are confirmed in your deduction that Mrs. Justin was slugged, left unconscious to... To, uh... Well, you were there, Danny. I don't have to spell it out for you. No, Gino. For this pearl, my thanks. This, a poet once Bert said... Taglia. Yeah, Danny. Gift number two. The doorbell was rigged to a booby trap of a type commonly used in the last... Hmm, last. What am I saying? Ring the doorbell and boom! Blast! Poof! It was that professional. To the contrary, wise is Mr. Gordon from Technical. He says it was a clumsy imitation. Gordon didn't like it, huh? He sniffed his nose at it. However, in the matter of an inferno machine, what matters clumsy, huh, Danny? Anything else? Nothing else. Except... An itching in my brain. Huh? Yeah. I am making out my Christmas list, and it itches me. Want to give Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia, for Christmas. Ah, the joy he has brought me. I should return it with a likewise. You... You got a suggestion, Danny? Only a question, Gino. How did you know it was Mrs. Justin you talked to on the phone? Well, she told me, Danny. Several times she told me. Well, what reason would I have to disbelieve what a lady tells me? You're trying to make out I'm a gulliver, Danny? You know... Pardon me, Gina. Likewise, I'm sure. When they tell you their name, see if you... Danny can... Clover speaking. Now, this is Swifty Crenshaw of the 34th Street Post Office, Mr. Clover. They referred me to you. Why? Oh, because I'm holding some undelivered mail for Mrs. Evelyn Justin. Bet you'd love to get your hands on it. Yeah, I would. Fine. Just ask for Swifty Crenshaw. Everybody knows me. Bye now. Who was it, Danny? A Swifty Crenshaw from the post office. Swift... Cren? See? See how you two can be a gulliver, Danny? You Mr. Crenshaw? Uh, you bet. My name's Clover. I spoke to you on the phone a little while ago. You bet. Just wait here. Here you are. The mail addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. Uh-huh. Uh, there's not much there. Circulars, a few Christmas cards from people who heed our message to mail early. One there that's sealed and the center tried to mail a third class. Postage due on that one, but I guess we can forget it, huh? Uh, I can save you trouble turning over that postcard. It's for a free grease job with 15 gallons of gas. Uh, that other is for a book overdue at the library. You've been having yourself a time, haven't you, Mr. Crenshaw? Hey, you bet. What's in this envelope? How do I know? Hey, it's no use holding an envelope like that up to the light. It's Manila. It's postmarked yesterday. Addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. The old box 626, 34th Street Station, New York, New York. Return address. The same. She addressed it to herself? 
Uh, what's in it? You bet, Mr. Crenshaw. Looking up the records now. Okay, okay. Tell him to hurry. Mr. Jasper will speak to you. Good. Mr. Jasper on the phone. What about it, Jasper? You say you have a carbon copy of a subscription form for today's Lady Magazine? Where did you get it? In an envelope. Come on, your girl said you were looking it up, Jasper. The form is used by your company. Signed with the initials D.F. Who is D.F.? Donald Fraser. He would have gotten 400 points if he'd handed the subscription in. But why didn't he? Where does Donald Fraser live? 19 West 16th. He's a pretty good... Yeah. Thanks. You better come along, Muggerman. Right. You ring the bell this time, Danny. No, oh, I'll ring it. I read someplace if you crash in an airplane, the first thing to do is to go up in another one. Now, nah, you ring the bell, Danny. Thanks. What do you want? Are you Donald Fraser? So, what do you want? We're from the police. <laughs> Didn't you hear, Donald? We're from the police. Let's go inside. <sighs> Sit down, Donald. You want a cigarette, Donald? I don't smoke. You drink? No, I can't stand the taste. He's got refined taste, Danny. You signed this magazine subscription form, didn't you? Or didn't you? I don't know. You know. You know, don't you? I signed it. All right. You took a magazine subscription on November 2nd, 1949. That's the date on this form. It's also the date Mrs. Colton was shot to death. So... What's that got to do with anything? It's got this to do with it. It's a magazine subscription for Mrs. Colton. You took the subscription. Who signed it? I'll tell you. You're not kidding. Let him alone, Michael. I, uh, I came by Mrs. Colton's that morning selling subscriptions. Mrs. Colton said to come back later. She wanted time to make up her mind. When you came back, Johnny Reed was there with his wife. I said leave him alone. Yeah, that's right. They were there that day. The girl yelled up to her aunt that I'd come back. Mrs. Colton said to take the subscription... The girl signed for her. That does it, Danny. Not quite. Donald, then uh, then Ben Justin got to you, didn't he? He was investigating the murder and tracked down a lead that a magazine salesman was on the Colton block that day. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, the very next day. Before I had a chance to turn in the form in to Mr. Jasper. I, I, I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. For a thousand dollars, the trouble I'm in. I didn't mean to do anything. He talked me into it. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Let's go inside, Mrs. Reed. Remember how busy I was yesterday? I'm busier today. That's too bad. I want to talk to you, and I want to talk to your husband. All right, come in. I've got an idea Johnny's going to throw you right out, and I want to watch. Johnny! Johnny! Yeah? Look who's here, Johnny. Huh? Oh. Hiya, Mr. Clover. Can I get you something? I just broke out a quart of beer. No, thanks. I want to talk to you alone. Ah, sure, sure, my pleasure. Uh, go make us some coffee, Daddy. I told him you were going to throw him out, Johnny. You're making a liar out of me. Just get the coffee, Daddy. Then you'll throw him out? If he annoys me. All right, Johnny. Now, what's a good word, Mr. Clover? What have you been doing with yourself lately, Johnny? Oh, this and that. I got enough money. I'm lucky with the horses. The money gets used up and replenished. I envy you. Yeah, got a sister. That's fine. I'm glad to hear of it. Is this what you come all the way out here to talk to me about? You impressed me the last time I talked to you. <laughs> you kidding? No, I'm not. Say, uh, you think Dottie needs any help with the coffee? Yeah, probably. She's all thumbs. But she doesn't like you, Mr. Clover. Uh, maybe if I help her with the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you do that? Help her with the coffee. Uh, mine's with cream, Mr. Clover. Two sugars. What do you want? I just came in to tell you to get your hat and coat. That sounds familiar. That's right. You're under arrest. 
right, Mr. Clover. You're under arrest for murder. Let me tell you why it sounds familiar, Mr. Clover. Because it's happened before. What happened before? A year ago, when Johnny and I were arrested for the murder of his aunt, the police separated Johnny and me. Then one cop came to me and said Johnny confessed. That way I was supposed to break down. They did the same thing to Johnny. <laughs> oh, as a policeman, you're a real nothing, Mr. Clover. A real nothing. <laughs> Hey, let me laugh with you, huh? Oh, say, you remember what they tried on us before, Johnny, trying to make us confess? Well, your friend Clover just tried it again. <laughs> oh, Clover, Clover. All right, you had your fun. Don't you think you ought to go home now? I haven't had my coffee yet. Daddy makes such lousy coffee. It really isn't worth it. You know, I don't understand you. Throw him out, Johnny. That's what I mean. I came here to give you something for Christmas. Maybe I'm a little early. Maybe I should come back. If you're giving, we're receiving. What do you got? This. The magazine subscription form that your wife signed last year in your aunt's house. Where'd you get it? From Mrs. Justin's post office box at 34th Street Station. You got it figured, huh, Mr. Clover? Sure. It's proof that the two of you were at Ms. Colton's the day she was murdered. The piece of evidence the DA didn't have at your trial. Johnny, they can't try us again, can they? You, uh... Planning to reopen a trial with new evidence, Danny? It won't be necessary. Justin bought this subscription form from the salesman. He was blackmailing you with it. Then a little while ago, he got afraid of you two, passed it on to his wife. That's why she had it, huh? That's where she mailed it for safekeeping after you killed her husband. You thought you destroyed it when your wife called headquarters and had me set off that booby trap. And now you got it. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Danny. How much you want? How much were you paying Justin before you killed him? Don't bargain. How much? All of it. Everything you got. I want you to sign a confession, you and your wife. Let me sit down and think about it. <laughs> Serve the coffee, Daddy. You gonna stir it with that gun? No. I'm gonna kill you with the gun. You want one slug or two? Johnny! Hey! 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 Ah! 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 This will put you out of your misery, Johnny! Half of it, Mr. Clover. All of it. You can have anything you want. I've got what I want. Let's get your coat, Mrs. Reed. In the midnight cold, Broadway echoes with sounds you hear only in darkness. The fleeting whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. People pass and touch you. You look down, and there are fingers of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Anthony Barrett, Sam Edwards, Virginia Gregg, Michael Ann Barrett, Sidney Miller, and Jack Crucian. Now, here's Larry Thor. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's program concludes the present series of Broadway's My Beat. We thank you for listening and hope to return to the air in the near future when Danny Clover will bring you more adventures along the Great White Way. Next week at this time, most of these same CBS stations will bring you a new program featuring Edward R. Murrow, Columbia's famed news reporter. This new program will be called Report to the Nation. And during its 60 minutes, Mr. Murrow will bring you not only important war and political news, but also summaries of all that's bright and new in the world of music, the theater, sports, and the other colorful, varied fields of American life. 
You'll hear recordings of great speeches and great events in the week preceding each Friday night broadcast. Report to the Nation will report the news for CBS listeners in this unprecedented series of broadcasts. Be listening for Report to the Nation next Friday evening on CBS. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, the Star's Address, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The day without color is only six hours old, and the restlessness begins to eat at Broadway. The waiting, the longing for the nighttime begins to gnaw, like hunger, like thirst. Because Broadway's night is a banquet loaded with delicacies. The scarlet wine of neon, the forbidden fruit of a trumpet scream, the lukewarm stew offered on a tin plate through an alley doorway. But Broadway's day, that's the drab time, kid, the empty time. The time of leaning against sun-warm stone and waiting. And you wait with the rest of Broadway because it'll come. Something will come. And it does. You know that because Broadway nudges you with an elbow, winks, says, Follow me, kid. The day has turned bright. And it's not far away where the day is bright. On 39th Street, just off 7th Avenue in the Garment Center. The crowd is already there ahead of you, toothpicking its last bite of lunch, digesting the spectacle of a man sprawled on the pavement. The dress rack he'd been pushing lay beneath him. There was a scissors in his back. His blood sketched a new pattern on the bright, flowered silk prints. And the man, heavy in the shoulders, pushing his face into the crowd so you can be close to it, so he can fill you in on it. You got here fast, Danny. I was shown the way. Who is he, Muggerman? His wallet says he's Thomas Hart. Social Security card, YMCA membership at all says he was Thomas Hart. These people know him. They call him by name. He don't answer for 20 minutes now, I'd say. Any of them see it happen? No, I asked around. They were all busy with shop talk, with wife and kid talk, with union talk. First thing they noticed was Sinclair Stylecraft's new sample spring line was spilled in the gutter. They kept the cabs and trucks from running over the dresses. Sinclair what? Sinclair Stylecraft. See? On address labels. Huh? A dress manufacturing place up the street. He worked there. They all told me that. And I didn't even ask. Uh, keep them back, Muggerman. They're waiting for us to act something out. Just keep them back. And after a while, one of the onlookers glanced at his watch and hurried away. Lunch hour was over, and he'd be the big man around the water cooler this afternoon. Something big just happened to him. He'd seen a man with a scissors in his back. And a girl looked up from the pavement, smiled across the crowd to a boy in a sports shirt, and walked away slowly. And a woman in a youthful hat took her place. In a few minutes, it was all over. Two men threw a blanket over the face of Thomas Hart and carried him away. Then, work to do. Thomas Hart worked for Sinclair Stylecraft. Ladies and Mrs. Dresses, down the street. Go there. Four flights up on a freight elevator. Nod to the gray-haired man holding the wheel in a comic book and get no answer. And through the rows of sewing machines where a hundred women spend eight hours a day with a dress pattern and a bobbin. Then finally ushered into the office of the man of destiny for the fourth floor, Mr. Justin Sinclair. Sit down, Mr. Clover, Danny Clover, police. About what happened downstairs? That's right. Uh, You want a cigar? Tell me about Thomas Hart. Sure, I'll tell you. You don't mind that I'm smoking, do you? Oh, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. What's that supposed to tell me? Look, I've been in business for a long time. A man gets hard driving for a dollar. Takes a time like this to make me know what kind of a man I've gotten to be. I'm asking you to weep for the boy, Mr. Sinclair. I wish I could weep. That's just what I mean. I've forgotten how. 
Tommy was a bright youngster. So what if he was pushing dress racks around? I did it once. Tommy was interested. Tommy asked questions about the business. I'm sad, Mr. Cloven. Don't laugh at me. I'm more than sad. I'm horrified. Mr. Sinclair. Well, come in. Come in, Stella. Miss Croft, Mr. Clover. Mr. Clover is from the police. Yes, they told me in the shop a policeman was here. That's why I... I'm glad you did. He wants to know all about Tommy. What do you want to know, Mr. Clover? Well, as much as you can tell me. Mostly why somebody murdered him. Tommy was an errand boy and pushed dress racks. I'm sorry he's dead, but frankly, he annoyed me. How? (laughs) Oh, Mr. Clover, come now. Look at Miss Croft, will you? Just look at her now. I'm looking. Does it annoy you, Miss Croft? Not yet. If you came into my office and stared at me, sitting at my drawing board, then if you grinned, then if you winked... You really couldn't blame Tommy, Miss Croft. Natural, normal... Don't you do it, Mr. Sinclair. (laughs) Quite a girl, huh? Quite a young lady. What else about Tommy? Not a thing. Me either. All right. Where does he live? I can tell you that. Follow me out. I'll get the address for you from our personnel man. Yes, you'll find Sinclair Stylecraft cooperative, Mr. Clover, anything, anything at all. Next time, knock soft, mister. You want something from Jonesy, the keeper of the garbage pails, the collective wrench will knock soft. They told me Thomas Hart lived here. Show me his room. Tommy? Tommy's dead. It's been the topic of the day for the tenants how Tommy's dead. He don't need nobody in his room. Now he's dead. Can't use him. Look closely, Jonesy. This is how a policeman looks who wants something. Huh? I don't care what your sickness is. Next time, knock soft. Come on. You knew Tommy? No, oh, sure I knew him. He never wrapped his leavings in the newspaper, not even a, a greasy brown paper bag. What else do you need to know about a man? But sometimes you'd open your door and peep at his collars. Sure I peep. You don't peep when you get the chance. Back off, Jones. Who'd you see? Who? Uh, well, once it was a guy with a dirty white apron and a sack of beer cans. <sighs> Up these stairs, he went whistling. Uh, give me a minute, I'll tell you what he was whistling. Uh, no one else? Sure, sure, someone else. With silk stockings and high-strapped shoes. But living as I live in a basement apartment, it got away from me before I could see the face. That never took a moment's happiness away from me, not seeing a face. What do I do? Uh, Tommy's room. <laughs> Crummy tenant, wasn't it? Crumbs bring exterminators. Exterminators cost the management money. Take your hands off Tommy's suitcase. Something in this shirt pocket? What? Nose tissues? Tommy was always with nose tissues. I forgot to tell you. Money. Twenties, tens. Five hundred dollars. All in there is a wash basin. That calendar you're looking at, I got piled downstairs. You can take your choice. Don't rob a dead man's dream. There's an address scribbled under the picture. Directions. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Out of the way. Uh, that's a dress, all right. You think, uh, hmm? Knock soft, Jonesy. You want something, knock soft. <laughs> Yes? The nameplate on the door says this is the residence of Justin and Elizabeth Sinclair. Is that right? No, I'm Mrs. Sinclair. What is it you want? My name's Danny Clover. I'm from the... The police. You're from the police. Well, come in, please. My husband phoned and said a policeman might be around. Oh, my. Girls, girls, we're raided. (laughs) Oh, I was just fooling. (laughs) No, Mr. Clover didn't come here to break up our canasta game, did you, Mr. Clover? We're only playing for a 20th. This is Mrs. Westfall, Mrs. Meston, and Miss Natalie. Now, Miss Natalie does our hair after the game. She wins Can we talk someplace, Mrs. Sinclair? Of course we can. Deal me out, girls. In here. We'll close the door so we won't be disturbed. Now. Now tell me all about it. All right. 
I came from Tommy Hart's room a little while ago. He had some directions penciled on a calendar. The directions brought me here. Well, but I don't understand. Tommy's dead. Maybe Tommy scribbled those directions before he was murdered, huh? Uh, Oh, of course. Surely. Then Tommy must have been here on some occasion or another. Well, of course he was. What was the occasion? Dinner. You'd think I'd get someone in to cook dinner, wouldn't you? But I didn't. I never do. No, I still cook, Mr. Clover, like I did before all this happened. All this, you know, left French provincial furniture and the set of books and sending my son to private school and... When was the last time Tommy was here? Didn't my husband tell you? Why, it was last night. Just last night, Tommy was sitting in that chair you're sitting in now with that girl draped over him, lighting his cigars and waiting on him hand and foot. What girl did that? Well, the girl Tommy brought with him to dinner. That bleach blonde from the shipping department. In my house, imagine. Why my husband tolerates it. What was the girl's name? Ginny. Ginny Morrow, I think. She works for your husband? I told you she did. In the shipping department. Check her or something, I don't know. He invited Tommy over because Tommy's bright and maybe someday he could learn the business. But why the girl, I don't know. What else can you tell me about Tommy? He ate everything that was put on the plate in front of him. What else? What else? Mr. Clover, I'm a married woman. I've got a son taller than me and... She took me by the hand to prove it. Back to the canasta table. The son was doing fine, wasn't he, girls? Wasn't he? And her life with Mr. Sinclair was all a girl could ask for, wasn't it, girls? What right had a policeman to come nosing around spoiling everything? The card game, the hairdos, making the canapes grow cold, letting the ginger ale turn flat just because someone stuck a pair of scissors in her husband's errand boy. So I explained the rights of the dead. And the girls cried, scooped up the cards, shuffled, re-dealt, and I got up. At Sinclair Stylecraft, ladies and Mrs. Dresses, a woman finished a seam, took the rimless glasses off her nose, rubbed her eyes, told me Jenny Morrow, shipping, was on the loading platform having a smoke. You can keep looking at me, mister. The view is for free. Teeth, courtesy Dr. West Miracle Tough Toothbrush. Hair, courtesy Peroxide 10%. Eyes, cheeks, figure, courtesy, careful planning. You're Jenny Morrow? For Eugenia. Mom called me Eugenia. Found the name in a book someone threw in the trash can. Dramatic, ain't it? Some questions I want to ask you, Jenny. Questions about... You're a policeman, ain't you? Yeah. Tell me about Tommy Hart. Mine hostess of last night blabbed to you, huh? Okay. How long did you know Tommy? Long enough to slap him a couple of times, slap his mouth. Then he says he'll make up to me. He'll take me to the boss's house for dinner. Big deal. You didn't enjoy it. Here I am, practically spilling my life's blood on you, and I don't even know your name. Well, Danny Clover. (laughs) It suits you. (laughs) No. No, I didn't enjoy the supper, Danny. I got the feeling... Oh, I'm crazy. I'm making it up out of my own head. What feeling, Jim? You ever had it? The feeling that you've been taken someplace just so as you could insult people with your presence... Just by being in a place you don't belong, it's an insult. Just by being what you are. But Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair invited you, Jenny. Tommy twisted an arm. That's how come I'm invited. Big deal. Tommy did that to you and he's your steady boyfriend? Oh, steady. What steady? That daisy go pin on Stella the designer. Me. I was the last name on the list. Stella Croft? Stella. The designer of designs. Where is she? By the Pantages Theater on 42nd Street, in the third row on the aisle. An arrangement we got with the management, so Stella can steal the latest Paris creations from the Parisian actors. (laughs) Oh, Stella has a life. Maybe it'll come to me someday. I'll work on it. It was a five-minute walk to 42nd Street in the Pantages Theater. On the stage, a man in a plaid dinner jacket was having a little trouble hoisting a girl to his shoulders. But when he did, they were fine together, circling faultlessly to the music. By the time I got down front, the man was holding his partner over his head, spinning, smiling, and turning red. Stella Croft was there, all right, pad and pencil poised, staring at the act. The dancers bowed. Everybody applauded. Everybody was happy. Not Stella. Stella with a scissor stuck in her side. Lifeless Stella. Dead Stella. You 
are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Every Sunday evening, CBS brings you two of its top comedy stars, Jack Benny and Eve Arden. It makes no difference where you live, whom you know, what your job is. Everyone immediately feels at home with Eve Arden's romantic Harris school teacher and with Jack's careful spending, perennially youthful portrait of himself. CBS cordially invites you to join them this Sunday again when Eve Arden plays Our Miss Brooks on most of these same stations and Jack Benny and his gang are heard on them all. Now the second act of Elliot Lewis's production of Broadway's My Beat. Of an evening in springtime, Broadway stands on a street corner, sips its penny plain, and counts its blessings. The Yanks, the Giants, the Bums, only a ten-cent subway ride's distance, and usually worth it. There's bottled orange juice from sun-kissed California to be tasted for a nickel. And the rides are getting painted at Coney. And the moon that rocks down over Manhattan in April is a special kind of moon. And the music that lilts from doorways is a special music. And the girls are golden. There's more, too. It blinks around the translux and demands your attention for ten seconds. Girl, stabbed at the Pantages Theater. Police seek early arrest, especially me. Oh, it's you. I was expecting the Mestons. More canasta, Mrs. Sinclair? More people dead. The Mestons were coming to console us. They're good at it, make it enjoyable. I don't suppose that's why you came. No. But you want to come into my house and... Ask your ugly questions. Uh Uh-huh. Just stand right where you are. Justin, it's that cop I told you about, the one who... Does he have a right to come in? Of course, Elizabeth. Of course. The man has all the rights in the world. Yes, dear. Justin says you may come in. Sit down, Mr. Clover. Take the world off your back. Sit down and talk to Elizabeth and me. Cigars there at your fingertips. Anything you need, ask Elizabeth for it. Maybe Mrs. Sinclair would like to make you some coffee or a sandwich. Or... Anything that'll take her out of here, huh, Mr. Clover? Don't be embarrassed. You can talk in front of Elizabeth. She knows more about the man Sinclair than I know. Correct, baby doll? Yeah, you want to know about Justin's friendship with Stella, is that it, Mr. Clover? Before the scissors episode, I mean? Well, that's it. Huh? I didn't think we'd get around to it so easy, but that's it. You won't mind if I tell him, Justin? Not a bit of it, baby doll. Just hand me a cigar first. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any time, Mrs. Sinclair. This friendship, as you called it. It was you, Mrs. Sinclair. I remember because it surprised me, the name you gave it. You thought it. There was nothing between Stella Croft and my husband, Justin, except the normal relationship of an employer to his employee. Consultation over dress designs during working hours, approval, disapproval... The putting into production, the countersigning of the weekly paycheck. Nothing more, Mr. Sinclair? There was more, she'll tell you. There were the times my husband Justin took her to fashion shows, to dinners for the buyers at expensive places. There was the time of a manufacturer's convention in Atlantic City. Justin called me every morning, every night. Stella was pretty. Some people thought lovely. She brought us customers, made us richer. That was what was between Stella and my husband. Nothing more. You don't know why she's dead? No, we don't know. But it saddens us, Mr. Clover. Send him home, Justin. I'm tired. I want to sleep. If the Mestons come, tell them I'm sick. They'll understand. More legwork now. The pinching up of the bits and scraps that people leave behind. Get as many as you can and arrange them chronologically, by emotion, by habit, by appetite. Draw a line, one from the other, and peep at a life now nearly dead. For instance, go now to the apartment of Stella Croft. Walk the corridor that once brought Stella home. Turn the knob of her door. The girl in the room was wearing slacks. She watched me close the door blew a smoke ring from her cigarette, watched it die. Then she smiled at me. Hi, Danny. What are you doing here, Jenny? Oh, taking the tour, seeing how a girl lives when she works in the front office of Sinclair Stylecraft. Gosh, 
quilted blue satin. How did you get in here? Did you see the superintendent downstairs? Yeah. Did his eyes light up when he saw you? Uh-uh, huh? Jenny, how well did you know Stella Croft? Who gets to know a dame like that if you're another dame? Look, Danny, I'm not the type to be a Pollyanna. My mother told me, Jenny, never be a Pollyanna. Stand on your own two feet. You don't like somebody, don't like them. And that's how I felt about Stella, to a T. Because she had all this because she was going out with Mr. Sinclair? So I was jealous. But this apartment is something to get jealous about. You're going to try your luck with Sinclair? <laughs> He's already noticed, Danny. The day that I wore that black velveteen with the peasant blouse, he spent practically the whole morning in the shipping department giving me a personal supervise. <laughs> you want me for anything more, Danny? No. Just be around where I can find you, Jenny. Oh, sure, Danny. I really would, Danny. I'd drop all my appointments. The apartment looked like Jenny hadn't touched anything. The place was impeccable, slick, like Stella Croft had been. Lacquered furniture, highly waxed, and full-length mirrors. I walked back into her bedroom, around it, fingering this and that. The small, intimate souvenirs a girl like Stella collects. Then over to a Pullman closet, opened it. Wondered for an instant why a woman needed so many shoes. Wondered... Wondered why it hurt so much. The brightness of it, the pain. The sharpness slipping so easily into my back. Then gave it up because I couldn't hold on to it. the finishing touch, Danny. The claim to fame of Dr. Sinsky. In medical school, it was always commented upon how Dr. Sinsky finished off his handiwork. <laughs> the bedside manner. I don't need it. Oh, that's right. You don't need it, Danny. Now hold on to something, Danny. It'll hurt. Yeah, yeah. Hold on to something, Danny. To me. It's gonna hurt. <laughs> he held on to something. To me. And it still hurt him. What is it with you, Dr. Sinsky? Maybe you need a refresher course in adult medical education. Oh, unruffle your feathers, Mother Ted Tiger. I'm all right. Yeah. Listen to him, Doctor. Last night he got a hole in his back from unsharpened scissors, and this morning he tells me he's all right. Okay, if I go back to my office, Dr. Sinsky. You'll need rest, Danny. I'll bear it in mind. Okay, check me in the morning. You hear, Danny? You hear? Yeah. The debt piles up, doesn't it, Doctor? What debt? What are you talking about? I'll count out the times you've eased the pain. I'll let you know. Uh, get him out of here, Gino. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Let's go, Danny. I'll go get permission from the captain to give a sick leave. and Then I'll, I'll conjure up a squad car, and we'll surprise the Mrs. Sergeant Artaglia in the middle of a mozzarella. And then we'll solve your, your, our wound together. And then... What made two people die like that, Gino? Tommy Hart, Stella Croft. Danny. Danny, you disappoint me. You are thinking on your sick leave time. What ties it together, Gino? Danny, if I tell you, you promise to let me manage your sickness? Huh? What ties it is Tommy Hart and Estella Croft were once married in that place in Maryland, you know, on that quick marriage plan? I ain't making it up, Danny. Mugovan dug it out of the records. It was a secret between you two? Oh, Danny, it don't mean nothing. They got an annulled the next day. That unties it. Danny, you're jeopardizing your good health. Danny! Good morning. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Hi, Danny. Hey, look at me. Yeah, look at you. Since when they move you out of the shipping department into the reception desk? Since this a.m. I told you. I got supervised into it. Oh. Tell Mr. Sinclair I want to see him. Sure, Danny. Watch me. See? What is it, Miss Morrow? There is out here at this moment the gentleman of the police department, a Mr. Danny Clover. Show him in, show him in. Very good. To that door, Danny. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Sinclair. I'm a busy man, Mr. Clover, but I always have time to talk to you. Mr. Sinclair, how much of your affairs can you get in order in the next 15 minutes? In my business, we never talk in riddles. It's how much, why, when, things a man can answer. What's on your mind? You, Tommy Hart, 
Stella? They worked for me, Mr. Clover, and they died. I'm going to pay for their funerals, and I'm going to find out if they had family. They'll be taken care of. We have a fund toward that. Tell the people at headquarters it might make an impression. Honestly, honestly, no. I don't know what you're talking about. Let's stop kidding each other, Sinkler. You're a man with tastes, from the lines of women's dresses to a lacquered apartment to a little employee who's now your receptionist. From Stella Croft to Ginny Morrow. Better find out if Ginny had a husband. I still don't follow you. Then I'll tell you. It's called the Badger Game. Listen to me, Mr. Clover. You listen to me. Tommy and Stella weren't married. Did you know that? You didn't know it, huh? I thought. I, I saw the certificate of marriage. The justice of the peace who married them. I, I thought... Marriage and all the next morning. Badger Game. Stella invited you to make a play for her. You bit. Tommy walks in, waves a certificate of marriage. You pay him. Money, invitations to your home. He gets greedier and greedier. So you kill him. I didn't have to. You don't know what it was, Clover. That boy grinning into my face, taking over my house, making me... What is it, Justin? What's the matter? What happened? Make him understand. Make him understand. Mrs. St. Clair, your husband just confessed to killing Tommy Hart. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you kill him? It's all right, Justin. I'm here now. It's all right. You got Tommy out of the way, Sinclair. Why did you kill Stella? Elizabeth. I said it was all right, Justin. Well, I'll tell you why. Stella knew you killed Tommy. It didn't worry her very much. She just upped the blackmail ante. Sinclair, that's why you killed Stella. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. You did? For what she was doing. Going to my home, to my husband, to my boy, to my boy's name. Yes, and I stabbed you, too, for what you were doing to us. I killed. I'd kill again. What'll we do about the boy? You didn't think, did you, Justin? You just didn't think when you started it. When you saw that Stella, you didn't think. Please, please. The boy will be all right. We have money. It's more than you had when you started. He'll be all right, Justin. It's going to be all right. In the April night, Broadway echoes with sounds heard only in darkness. The whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. There's a touch on your coat, you turn. There's no one, nothing. Only the trail of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Irene Tedrow was heard as Elizabeth Sinclair, Herb Butterfield as Justin Sinclair, Sylvia Sims as Ginny Morrow, Mary Shipp as Stella Croft, and Sidney Miller as Jones. <laughs> If you're in the mood for mysteries, you can try CBS almost any old evening. And there's a top-notch thriller on hand for you. Tomorrow and every Sunday, it's Charlie Wilde. Monday nights, the top Hollywood stars appear in original thrillers on the Hollywood Star Playhouse. Thursdays, there's a swell night for mystery and thrills on CBS. Suspense, Mr. Keene, and the FBI in Peace and War are heard on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In springtime's early morning, Broadway depends upon the mood you're in. Now the seesaw of color is gone, the riot of night sounds is stilled, and the revelers have found their sleep. There's nothing here but litter and mist and the beginning sunlight. But it's the start of an April day, that's something, and you walk into it. And there's something else, the man standing against the lamppost, staring, hands locked in back of him, and last night's newspaper trapped against his leg. Walk past him quickly, kid. It's better to start the day with a cup of coffee. I didn't have time for coffee. The call came while I was pouring the cream. The call with a code number that said homicide, that said an address on Fifth Avenue, that said get there. And get there and get ushered into a room and into the presence of a man who uses words instead of numbers in describing death. Here's a gun that did it, Danny. Revolver. Two shots missing from the chamber. One killed him over there on the bed. We're still looking for the other slug. Who is he, Muggerman? Philip Hunt. Securities, investments. Retired about two years ago to try to enjoy himself, the maid said. Uh, the maid called it in. Oh, uh-huh. but what else? Plenty. Here, let's go. I'll show you. It's down the hall. Big party here last night, Danny. Glasses, scotch, bourbon, gin, cigarette butts, gold tip, cork tip, lipstick tip. Oh, this too. Oh, pocket lighter. Fancy one. Give me a light one. Thanks. Yeah, real fancy. And Evans, catchy engraving on it. Uh, from Barbara to Willard. It'll have to be traced. Mm-hmm. Found it in the bathroom in the shower stall. Uh, doorbell. Maid will get it. In here, Danny, the library. Uh, who are they? Well, the girl stretched out on the couch is a niece of the dead man. Her name's Lois Hunt, the maid said. Lives here. Him, the soldier over there on the, ca- on the uh, chair. The maid didn't know him. Never saw him before. Well, how about the rest of the people at the party? Nothing there yet. Maybe the girl and the corporal will know when they come to. Dr. Sinsky gave him a needle. A needle to a couple of drunks? What are you talking about? They're not drunk. Their drinks were doped. Here, the girl's glass. Hmm? Smell. The corporal's the same. Dr. Sinsky said it's fortunate he got here in time. Then the gathering together of the police reporters and the press photographers. The statement for the noon editions, the jolly farewells over the dead, and the promise of the mention of your name... The bribe for more detail, more, you know what, Danny, got to compete with the comics, kid. And the walking away from it. And in your office, the arrangement and rearrangement on your desk of the clutter that attended Philip Hunt's dying. A cigarette lighter, a gun fired twice, two glasses stained with death. And a few hours later, the quiet opening of the door. And two kids stand waiting, bewildered. Their eyes not touched by the morning light. Dr. Sinsky said it was all right for you to interrogate us now. He said... Oh, come in, Miss Hunt. Corporal. Sit down. Thanks. You sure you feel all right, Miss Hunt? No, no, no. I'm fine. Just a little dazed. I've had other mornings like this. Maybe not quite so sad. Uncle Phil did. You, Corporal? I'm fine, sir. Just fine. Oh, he'll be all right. Dr. Sinsky's a good man. You two known each other long? Been going together a long time? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, a long time. Maybe five or six months. I saw Lois at a USO dance. You're and... lying, Tommy. Don't tell a man a lie. I know what I'm doing, kid. Just, just well, let me. Maybe you don't, Corporal. You, you tell me, Lois. I only met Tommy last night. He was sitting at a bar, lonely, kind of lost. Made him so attractive. I'm rich. I bought his drinks. Then you took him to the party at your home. There wasn't a party. We made up as we went along. You know, bar hop. Picked up people who said funny things. I took them home because I wanted to celebrate Tommy, the nice corporal. It wasn't a pickup, sir. Lois is a fine girl. Sure She's not... I am, Tommy. You're sweet. Was your uncle at the party, Lois? We crashed in on him just as he was getting ready for bed. We all kissed him goodnight. That's how gay we were. We all kissed my uncle goodnight. That's how you left him? Going to bed? Yes, sir. Then you rejoined the party. Yes, sir. 
Well, this gun... Is that the one that killed my Uncle Phil? You know the gun? It's given to my Uncle Phil by his employees. They know how he loved guns. You know the gun, Corporal? Yes, sir. Lois took it out of the case so I could show the party how a, how a soldier uses a gun. Who'd you show your tricks to, Tommy? Who else was at the party? I don't know, sir. Honest, I, I don't know. How could he know them if I didn't? They were strangers, funny party strangers. We had fun. Yes, sir, just fun. Then I passed out. And Lois was sitting there already passed out with a book in her lap. She'd been reading poetry to me, and she passed out. And I laughed, I remember. And... Uh, Danny, I... Pardon me. Pardon me. Danny, they have traced the cigarette lighter from descriptions distributed hither and yon by calm, efficient men on the beat. Oh, you'll tell me, huh, Sergeant Tataglia? Sold by Tiffany's to one Willard Jordan, 2346 East 80. Steady customer by Tiffany's. <laughs> me, I only gaze in their windows on Sundays. All right, I'll check. Uh, do that, Danny. And also bid adieu to Miss Hunt. Our wealthy lawyer has put a bail for her. And the corporal? No, oh, arrangements have been made with the military. Him we can keep. Bail is only for the likes of Miss Hunt. Yeah. yeah take care of things. Be calm and efficient while I'm out, at Tartaglia. I'm very sorry. I'm busy. I'm from the police. Does Willard Jordan live here? Yes, he does. I'm his wife. What is it? May I come in? I suppose so. We'll talk here if you don't mind. I'm uh, getting ready to go out. What is it you want? Is your husband home? No. You'd better stop in another time, Mr. Clover. Where is your husband? I don't know. I, I didn't invite you to go in there. Where, where do you think you're going? Is he your husband? Pepe, I told you if you stared in that mirror once more, I'll scream. Sit down. Sit down and drink your drink. And don't you move. And don't you open your mouth. Not your husband, huh? Then who? Pepe. You must know Mr. Clover. He's a model for my husband. Willard did him as Narcissus. What's Pepe doing here now? Waiting. He dropped in to see Willard. Willard's uh, going to paint him for his summer show. When's the last time you saw your husband, Mrs. Jordan? Early yesterday morning. I handed him his sketch pad when he walked out of the door. Now, you tell me something. Why is it so important for a policeman to talk to my husband? He was at a party last night where a murder was committed. You think Willard did it? Willard? I didn't say that. I just want to talk to him, that's all. Willard commit a murder? Pepe! Pepe, one more time and out you go. Doesn't it worry you that your husband didn't come home last night? Why should it worry me? What do you mean? Willard has not come home like this before? Oh. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, Willard stays way off, and he's a roamer. He goes places, talks to strange people from material to paint. Let's see. Yes, he said he was going to take a model around last night. What model? A, a Pepe? A Barbara, I think. Yes. Barbara Sullivan. Nice girl. You've seen her in the beer ads, Mr. Clover. She lives close by. I'll tell you where. If she knows where Willard is, phone me. Let me know. Will you? Of course you will. Sleep. Open up, Miss Sullivan. It's the police. Must be kidding. Open up. The door's unlocked. Walk in. This is me. In last night's frock. This morning's iPads. Trying to sleep away the bags under my eyes so you won't lose a kick when you draw mustaches on me on the billboards. Mrs. Jordan told me you might know where her husband is. Melissa told you that? Good old Melissa. We want Willard for suspicion of murder. What? You were with him last night with Willard. Where is Willard now? Sleeping off a jag under a cold water tap in the shower stall of a Fifth Avenue mansion. I know. I threw him there myself. Everything I do myself. He's not there anymore. We peaked. Well, then go look for a man with wet coat and pants. 
Drive the gutter on 3rd Avenue and 28th. Willard's favorite, his pride and joy. That's where you left him? I left him in the shower stool. I told you that two yards ago. You threw Willard in the shower, went home. What time did all these good things happen to you? Maybe two, three, four in the morning. I don't remember. All was on my mind was my beauty sleep. I'm vain. Coddle my beauty. Get fat checks for coddling it. So you want Willard for murder, hmm? Anyone I know? Philip Hunt. You were in his house last night. That's where I was. That's where that pale little rich girl took us. I wish I'd known. Maybe I could have wheedled the old man into using me in his advertising. That's all it means to you, a man's murder? Our wanting Willard for it, maybe? Come to me with a Hollywood contract, mister, and I'll show you what things can mean to me. I'll change overnight for you. I'll live for it. Keep posing for beer, Miss Sullivan, just so I'll know you're around. I'll do it good. Because I'll keep it in mind you'll be staring at me through shop windows. Oh, bye now. It's iPad time again. So a half day had gone by and I had nothing. The technical division had something, though, and they gave it to me. There'd been about 17 people at the party last night at the home of Philip Hunt. 17 people, according to the kind of drinks, dregs in the bottom of liquor glasses and fingerprints. Maybe nine men and eight women. So far, I had talked to three of the 17. Result, shrugs and bleary answers. Result, nothing. Back now to the home of Philip Hunt and talk to his niece again. Outside this time in the small garden. Sit in a wrought iron chair and watch Lois Hunt take her three o'clock scotch and soda. Sure you won't have one, Mr. Clover? Uh, No, thanks. Listen to me, Lois. All I want you to do is try to remember who else was here last night. Somebody who had a motive for killing your uncle. I had a motive. Money. I inherit most of the estate. How's soldier boy, Tommy? Nice kid. I'm going to visit him tomorrow. You mean you just picked these people up and brought them home? Oh, sure. Grab bag. You never know. Miss Lars! In the guest tower. What's the matter, Francis? I was cleaning. Please, please look. The guest house was just across the garden and up a few steps. The place was neat as a pin. Starched linen curtains, maple chairs, and three shag throw rugs placed at interesting angles. On the one that stretched diagonally across the floor was a man. I knelt beside him, away from the blood stain that had spilled from the bullet wound in his chest. His coat was still moist, and it was spread open. And there was a label on the inside pocket. Tailored, it said, by Jensen's Mills, expressly for Mr. Willard Jordan. And Mr. Willard Jordan was dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. With the kids of the Beverly Hills Beavers to the right of him and those two curious revenue agents to the left of him, Jack Benny meets plenty of trouble this Sunday night on CBS. Be listening, be laughing with the Jack Benny Show tomorrow night, and be with us, too, for the fun with Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks on most of these same CBS stations. Long winter is dead on Broadway, and the street mourns its dying without a tear. What's to weep, kid? The dawn banging on the radiators, tearing sleep into pieces on a cold morning? The standing on the street corner in the night wind, trying to thumb through the racing foam with 100% wool mittens? And the girls so bundled up you can see their face? That's to weep? Give me the springtime, kid. In the springtime, things bud and blossom. The girls, the neon flowers, the field of golden daisies on the translux. Look at it now, kid. Artist dead in Fifth Avenue guest house. Police sift murder clues. Search link with death of Philip Hunt, millionaire. Ever smell posies like that, kid? Springs come to Broadway. Give up to it. And at police headquarters, that's just what Sergeant Tataglia did. He gave up to it. Ah, uh, Danny, the missus has been slipping the sulfur with the molasses into my pizzas lately. It's that time of the year again. Goody. Tastes good that way? The way Mrs. Tartaglia makes a pizza, Danny, no harm could come to it. No matter what felony she commits to it. Which reminds me. 
When you come in to partake of a springtime pizza? Oh, soon, Gino. As soon as I can. A promise? Hmm? Ah, goody. I have also by mail so invited Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well lady detective from London Town. She's coming? No, she has not as yet replied with her RSVP. On an English caper, no doubt. What else? I will notify you, Danny, when she accepts. You do that, Gene. Now, firstly, and to the forefront. The boys in technical have deduced that the bullet that killed Willard Jordan artist sprang from the same gun that did likewise to Philip Hunt. Thanks for telling me. I thought you would relish it. Secondly, and in the background, Major Robert E. Woodcock retired. Hmm? Uh, Try me again, Gino. I haven't had my sulfur and molasses. Major Robert E. Woodcock retired. Partook of breakfast every morning of his retirement with the late deceased Philip Hunt. A fact established by Sergeant Mugovan while questioning the housemate. Every morning, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting, Gene. Only a stab in the dark. But if a fellow wanted to talk to this Major Woodcock... He would go to the Union Club where the retired Major resides. Naturally. Naturally. Major. Major Woodcock. Wake up, Major. Wake up. It never ends. It never ends. Major? I'm awake, young man. Awake. A recurrent dream, you know. Never ends. Always cut off when it gets interesting. Always cheated of the ending. I'm from the police, Major. And don't pussyfoot, boy. You're from the police. Be proud of it. Nothing to be ashamed of. Walk on tiger's feet. About Philip Hunt. My friend. My old friend. Chaperone to Mademoiselle around Paris in the old army days. Together, Phil and I. Many sunny days to remember. You want to know if I was with Phil the night he died? Were you? Dropped in for a brandy, game of chess. A lot of young people took me in tow. Made me act the major with a boy. A young corporal who was there. I'm afraid it was a rather pathetic entertainment. Then you got away from them. They were happy to dismiss me. Shunted me upstairs to old Phil. We had our quiet brandies, our endless chess game, never finished it, and cried old soldier's tears, and so to bed. You didn't come back for breakfast. Oh, you know about that, do you? Had breakfast with Phil every morning since our discharge, in the library, 7 a.m. Pleasant. Then we'd putter around in the garden. Pleasant. A ritual. But you didn't come back that morning. Why? Too tired. Overslept. Overbranded. I wish I had come back. Why? To bid Phil a good journey. Dead men can hear things like that, you know. Pleases them. There was another reason I wish I'd have come back. What, to console Lois? And thought of that. No. To thank Phil for including me in his will. Left me quite a sum, enormous sum. <laughs> quite an overpayment for my work in his garden. But you knew about that. No, I didn't. Makes me a suspect, though. It does. It should be interesting. When do you ask me about Willard Jordan, the artist? Right now. Painted my portrait, Willard did. There it is, hanging in back of me. Major Robert E. Woodcock, retired. <laughs> Leaning against a field piece. Classic claptrap. But I've grown rather fond of it. That's all there is of me now. Me and it. I can always reach you here, Major. Phil's gone. Where else would I go? It doesn't matter to you that I'm a widow now, does it? You have to ask me questions. That's right, Mrs. Jordan. I won't answer them. I don't have to answer them. Please get out and let me alone. You told me you weren't at Lois Hunt's house last night. What? You heard what I said. All right. I was at Lois Hunt's house last night. I know. It was a terrible party. Pepe take you to the party? Pepe never goes to parties. He spills things on people's rugs. I went alone. Did Lois pick you up at a bar? I never go to bars. Then you were following your husband. So what? So what? It's your right, Mrs. Jordan. Of course it is. I was his wife. Just tagged along. 
Just in case Willard got into trouble with that brewery poster, that's all. Saw Willard go into the house. Waited a while, and then I went in, too. Willard got into trouble, Mrs. Jordan. Where were you? Well. Well. Well, what? Well, a girl has to be sociable at a party. Anybody knows that. Well, somebody gave you a drink. I never did get to see Willard. And you must have gotten to know some of the people. Oh, just names. Like Nicky and John and, and Bobby. Honestly, I don't remember a lot. Honestly. Can I see you, Danny? Oh, sure, Margovan. Come on in. What have you got? I've got a report here from the fingerprint department. You know what's strange, Danny? <laughs> the gun's got the prints of 17 people on it. Well, maybe it did have once. Not anymore. Wiped clean. What's the drama for, Muggerman? Why don't you just say it didn't have any prints on it? Because it has prints on it. The most beautiful set of prints as possible. The entire hand of Lois Hunt. Here's a photostat. Without a blemish or a smear. Killer Lois Hunt, huh? You think so? I'm asking you, Danny. No. No, I don't think so. Somebody doped a drink and pressed her hand against the gun. If Lois had handled the gun to kill both men, she'd have handled it twice. Then there would have been two sets of prints, not one. Yeah. Killer tried to plant a frame, huh? I don't know, maybe. Oh, what else? Nothing. Just these. Photographs of the Hunt Mansion. Interiors, exteriors. Uh, six of the people who were at the party last night are outside. You want me to bring them in? Yeah, one at a time. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Huh? Come back here, Michael. Have you talked to that corporal lately? A couple of times. Six to his story. Passed out right after the girl did. She'd been reading to him, isn't that what he said? Yeah, poetry. He even told me the name of the book. A sonnet's from... Uh... Look at this picture, Muggerman. Yeah? Library, where the kids were found dope. Boy sitting here, girl there. Yeah. See any book near them? Now, look at this one. Picture of Hunt, dead in his bedroom. Squint, Muggerman. What's the name of the book? Yeah. Sonnets from the Portuguese. You don't have to talk to those people now, do you, Danny? <laughs> Lois is upstairs in her room. I'll tell her you're here. Take me to her, please. This way. What time did you find Miss Lois and that soldier in the library, Francis? It's about a quarter after six. I told that other policeman that. A quarter after six, isn't that pretty early? <laughs> sure, it's early. I do it every morning. Clean up in the library so Mr. Hunt and that major could have their breakfast. Saw Miss Lois and the soldier passed out and went to tell Mr. Hunt. You saw Mr. Hunt dead and called the police. I told that other policeman that, too. Miss Lois? What is it? Policeman. Hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. That'll be all, Francis. Well, come to tell me something about that soldier boy, that, um... Tommy Milo? I'm going to try to do everything I can for him. You want a drink? That gun that killed your uncle and Willard Jordan had your prints on it. Aren't you warm? I am. Just a second, Will. Casement open. It's much more pleasant, don't you think? Now, what did you say? The gun had your prints on it. Didn't it have everyone's? We all handled the gun. Why just my prints? Because you wiped off everybody's prints and put your own on it. Oh, I must have been loaded. Why did I do that? Make me think what I thought, that you'd been framed. And someone had put the gun in your hand when you'd passed out. You've come to tell me you don't think that? What were you reading to Tommy when that dope drink caught up with you? Some sonnets, I think. Everybody else had left, so I thought sonnets were just the thing. <laughs> Corny, huh? You were reading the sonnets, and all of a sudden you felt dizzy, and you went to sleep. Is that what happened? Exactly. I told you. But the book wasn't there when we found you, Lois. What? Where was it? On the night table next to your uncle. But I was drugged. How would it get there? You put it there. That was an oversight, Lois. You carried it up to your uncle's room. But I was drugged, you know that. The doctor knows that. I was drugged. Later, you put on an act for Tommy, pretended to pass out, waited for the drug you'd put in his drink to work on him. Then you got up, killed your uncle, came back, then drugged your own drink. Don't tell me what I did. If I'd done that, I would have died. 
The doctor said that drug was deadly, your own doctor. You didn't have anything to worry about. Frances, your maid, always cleaned up the library at 6 o'clock. You knew she'd yell for help. Now tell me about Willard Jordan, Lois. Don't talk to me like that. Don't tell me what to do. Willard Jordan came back, didn't he? He was looking for his cigarette lighter. You know everything. You and Uncle Phil. Came back and saw Tommy lying there alone. Then you appeared. You had a gun in your hand. You're so smart. You walked Willard to the guest house, killed him because you had to. Smart. Uncle was smart. Told me what to do, why I had to do it. It wasn't just the money. You had that. Your uncle gave you everything you wanted. Like I was a little girl. Like I didn't know my own mind. Just the way you're talking to me. Let's go, Lois. No. 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 Come on. No, I won't go. I'm going to kill myself. Get away from that window, Lois. I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump. I don't care. I'm going to jump. Listen to me. Don't you come near me. I'm going to die. You'll be sorry, all of you. But when I'm lying down there, you'll be sorry. My friends will come and they'll look at me and they'll be sorry. They'll be... When I grabbed her, she didn't struggle. Just shrieked over and over. When I let her out of the room, she was still shrieking. And all of a sudden, she stopped. Then she looked at me, bewildered at first, then smiling. An etiquette smile that a girl gives a man after a pleasant dance. Then she touched my cheek. She spoke to me. I don't think my friends would have been sorry, Mr. Clover. I really don't. On Broadway, the fury of the night races against the time of dawn. It needs those hours to prove itself. The mob, the grinning faces, the voice that whispers. But hurry, time's at your heels, and the night lasts only so long. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Kathy Lewis was heard as Lois Hunt, Lee Millar as Tommy Milo, Peggy Weber as Melissa Jordan, Michael Ann Barrett as Barbara Sullivan, and Russell Simpson as Major Woodcock. Our defense program today calls for sacrifices, but the better we produce, the fewer those sacrifices will be. To do this most effectively, we must all work together toward top productivity. The free booklet, The Miracle of America, gives the story of the American system and of the benefits which increase productivity through teamwork as brought to all of us. Write Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City, for your free booklet, The Miracle of America. Remember, the better we produce... The stronger we grow. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
The carnival scream rises high on Broadway, carried high on plumes of neon light. And its shape is of many things. The metallic anguish of a trumpet shriek, the futile beating against closed doors, the laughter, bargained for, bought, paid for, under the winking girl on the spectacular. Broadway's scream rises, shatters into fragments of glitter, prowls through the city, and finally touches you. Wherever you are, it touches you. For me, it was a phone call. A girl dying, it said, from a jackknife in a dime a dance palace on Broadway. Come to it, Danny. Maybe you can grab yourself a free dance. The welcome committee is out, the pale girls with the scarlet streaked across their mouths and the restless scarlet-tipped hands playing in the spinning lights, reaching out for you. Someone called, said a girl was hurt. Where is she? Me, I called. Sure you don't want to dance with one of those girls first? Where is she? You're square. You're a square policeman. Come on, I'll take you to her. George is the neat type. Don't like to spoil the fun. That's why she picked the lonesome lounge to die in. You got it picked out where you're going to die. You should. You really should. The lounge with beaded curtains. With Georgia. Get out. Go dance. It's all right, Danny. You? You, Georgia? Me, Danny. Fran can stay. She's my good friend. Okay if she watches me die, isn't it? Who did it, Georgia? A dancer. Keen dancer. You should have been here for his mambo dancing. It was a show. Who? He stabbed you, Georgia. That makes it all right to tell me. Who was it? He bought five dollars worth of tickets. A man like that, you feel you know. Don't ask his name. It spoils it. With this knife? <laughs> yeah. While dancing. I'm keeping it for a souvenir. Make sure it's with me in the coffin, huh, Danny? Promise. You're a long way from home, Georgia. What brought you here? I like it here. Come here a lot. It's peaceful. The man blows the bugle so peaceful. The crowd, Georgia? Will the boys in the crowd stab you because you're not liked anymore? How can you talk when he's... Listen to it, Danny. Listen. A girl feels young again with music like that. After that, the place got cluttered up. People started to come into the lounge. Policemen with notebooks. A woman in a tweed suit with a press card in her hat band. A couple of men with a stretcher. The only thing the doctor picked up on his stethoscope was a trumpet blowing what is called the blues. Because there was no heartbeat from Georgia Gray. Because she was dead. Find out why. Go now to Mott Street, where it intersects an alley whose name no one remembers. Climb four flights of stairs and wonder briefly why the quality of sound and light in a tenement is like nothing else in the world. Walk a corridor where mice and men live together in perfect tolerance. And stop at a door. Stand in the light a little bit more so I'll know who's... It's Danny Clover, Benny. Oh, you come at the check? I'm okay, I'm okay. Can I come in? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, Danny, I'm okay. Except for the stomach. It hurts when I press it. You've been behaving yourself, Benny? Well, since I got out of the hospital, sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm beating now. He taught me to make things out of beads when I was resting in a ward. Belt buckles and ladies' uh, accessories. You know why I came here, don't you? I ain't a stool pigeon no more, Danny. I got cured of that, too. I'm a, I'm a beater now. Who killed Georgia Gray? I'm a beater. How long since you checked in with your parole officer, Benny? Oh, Danny. What about Georgia? You know as much as me. Georgia was close to Nicky Gallon. You know that. Bought his shirts for him. Ran down the drugstore for him. What's the word on Nicky? The crowd ain't happy with him, Danny. Oh, Danny. Leave me alone. I got an order from a lady down the hall for a love bracelet. 
I got to deliver to day or I'll be breaking my contract. Nothing else, huh? Say, help me, Daddy. Nothing. Where's Nick again? Uh, I'm a beater now. <laughs> You, huh? Off your beaten path, aren't you, Danny? Inside, Nicky. Don't strong arm, Danny. I was going to invite you in anyway. Georgia Gray, Nicky. She's dead. Word came to me how you closed her eyes. I wish it had been me. Maybe you got there ahead of me, Nicky. Maybe you went dancing, saw Georgia in a place you never thought she'd be. Killed her because she was getting away from you. <laughs> oh, you're tired, Danny. Awful tired. No one gets away from me, not even the dead. Come on into the den. I want you to meet my mother. If she'll be hurt, I don't show her my friends. All right, Nicky. I wouldn't want her to be hurt. You'll wish yours had been like her. Just wait. Mother, look what I brought you, Danny Clover. Sit down, Danny. Have a mint. Nicky has a made-up special for me. Thanks. Well, special, huh? Nothing too good for my mother. It's always been like that with my son. Up to now. Nicky hasn't been good? He let his girl die in a cheap place. Dancing with another man for pay, for dimes. That cheap is his name. You could have stopped it, Nicky? How could I have known, Mother? I told you. Don't I snap could... at me, Nicky boy. I'll slap your mouth. Wash it out with dirt. Georgia liked that hole, Danny. I never understood why. She tried to explain it to me about the music, about dancing. Crazy for dancing. Who understands these things in a girl? When she had everything a girl... Everything you gave her. Everything you worked hard for. You're getting your share, huh, Mother? The funeral, too, Nicky? Will you buy me one like the one you're buying for Georgia? Let me show you the invoices, Danny. I never knew dying came so high. Inflation, huh? Maybe it'll wipe out the taste of what happened to her. Where it happened to her. It's just a maybe, son. Don't build a monument on it. <laughs> you want to know why they killed her, Danny? You know, Mrs. Gannon? They think my son is finished. Done. Used up. They killed a girl to frighten my Nicky boy. And you know what? My boy's frightened. Who does that to you, Nicky? Your friends? Your boys? You'll know when you see their bodies on a slab. It'll be in all the papers. You'll save the clippings for me, huh, Nicky? Oh, <laughs> is it your dream, Danny? I told you. Wonderful girl, my mother. When I got back to headquarters, there was a file on my desk. The neatly centered sticker on its front cover was typed, Georgia Gray. Open it, read it, digest it. Georgia Gray, aged between 25 and 29, computed from data gathered from arrests. Hometown, Salina, Kansas. Followed a soldier to New York Port of Embarkation in 1943, but never caught up with him. So she stayed. Counter girl in a 5 and 10. Then model for ladies' garments. Then nightclub hostess. And two years ago in night court... After losing a race with a squad car, she said she'd retired. Because I don't have to work anymore, she said. No a better reason, she asked. Name linked with Nicky Gannon from here on in. Address Park Avenue. Expenses shared by Fran Holland, who said now she'll have to look around. First thing I'm going to do is get another roommate. Did you get along well with Georgia? She had her ideas, I had mine. You know what I mean? Tell me. No, this and that. Georgia was what, a pretty girl? I'd say she was beautiful. Yeah, I guess she was very beautiful. Very. Ah, but she was ruining it. Ran around, danced, but she didn't enjoy herself. I know she didn't. She only enjoyed herself relaxing here with me. Something I haven't made up my mind about. Well, you better make up your mind about it, Danny. Sure. She had all that dough and she lived with a dance hall hostess with me. You know Why? Because she needed someone like me. To run home to, huh? Right. So she could have soft hands rubbing the back of her neck. To bring her cold tomatoes when she needed it. She run the orphan, friend? Look, Danny, she was dance happy. That's why she hung around the place I worked. A little bit of music and a guy in a high waistband with two strong feet could make her smile like she was happy. Did Nicky Gannon mind that she stepped out on him? Why did Nicky care? He used it for a front for his business. He didn't care about her dancing. Who killed her, friend? A man. What else but a man? What man? Who? You know what you ought to do, Danny? You know Tommy Chandler? Nicky's hood? 
The padded shoulder that stands near Nicky with his hand in his pocket. Ask Tommy. See how he reacts when you ask him. You know where Tommy is? I know where he'll be in the morning. You know where the ducks are in that pond in Central Park? Eight o'clock, he throws them bread. Stale bread. But what do ducks know? That one over there likes pump a nickel, Danny. Here, give him a piece. You'll make an impression. We've got none of these advantages of city jail, Tommy. You gonna arrest me, kid? No. Ducks will miss me. You want a piece of pump a nickel, too, Harm? Sure you do. You see how Harm looked at me, Danny? Sad. Like he already knows about the arrest. What are you taking me down for? We'll think of something. Feeding the pintails in Central Park? I won't be able to hold up the head for the shame of... Let's go, kid. That's your squad car over there? You got to blush when I say suspicion of murder? That's been done to me, too. Hmm. You didn't come out for a long time. Georgia. You got me case for that. Georgia was murdered. Maybe Nicky Gannon goes, too. The whole crowd will miss him. I'll tell you something else. Whoever stabbed George ain't gonna be around long, ain't he? The crowd will see to that, huh? I didn't say that. I just said a prediction, that's all. Who takes over if Nicky is rubbed, Tommy? You? Take over what? A backroom poker game for matchsticks? What are you talking about? Well, baby, arrest me if you want, but don't ask me stupid questions. It makes Herm nervous. Hey, Herm. Hey, you are, boy. Herm looked sad when I took Tommy away from him. All the ducks looked sad. For a minute. Then they found a new love with a stale loaf of bread. Swam away, screaming for it. Tommy looked back over his shoulder, stopped to call them a name. Got shoved into the squad car. But on the way down, a code call. A woman's voice in the police radio. Man dead, she announced with a quiet number. Then she said it plain, in an alley, 4th Street, off 6th. Get there, car 62. We got there. Mind if I tag along, Danny? Man dead. I recognize from the number. We gotta share these things. Hold your gun on him, Muggerman. He wiggles a toe. Break it for him. Pleasure, Danny. Let me through. Let me through. They can't skate anymore, can they, Nicky? Not anymore. He was propped up against the wall, his head thrown back, his mouth open. Like he was trying to tell someone about it. The furtive dog scrubbing for food in the trash, not listening. A small crowd he'd assembled because the blood sighed across his shirt front, but not listening. Watching an alley wind gather soot at his feet. Watching me lean over him. Watching Nicky Gannon. Dead Nicky Gannon. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. You'll find Jack Benny in the desert this Sunday night on CBS. Jack and his gang are making a safari to entertain the boys at an airbase in Nevada. And for more laughs, there'll be another session with Eve Arden as the gay, romantic, fun-loving schoolteacher, our Miss Brooks, on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Broadway is wide enough for everybody. Generals in open touring cars, blondes in taxis, and sailors against lampposts. It's the place to come to, for one reason or another. To be a tourist, or get stared at by the tourists. To make a pitch, buy a bargain. Get cheated, insulted, or have your picture taken. And end the day with a memory, depending upon what you wanted, what you got, and what you gave for it. And part of the day's memento of Broadway will be the news item, Nicky Gannon shot down in an alley, 
Hoodlums slain a new outbreak of mob violence. Police seek clues in killing. Especially me and another man, the Sergeant Gino Tartaglia, who had once passed a civil service examination. And the medical examiner, Dr. Sinsky, reveals that death was caused by hemorrhage in the pleura, parentheses, lungs, closed parentheses. And that is why Nicky Gannon was done in. Thanks, Gino. Well, you're quite welcome, I'm sure. Anything else? May I? Yes, you may. Thank you. You know, Danny, this shooting up an alley brings to man mind a case which was solved by Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well girl detective from London Town. Do we have to, Gino? Lady Jane looked at the deceased and flipped her shiny tuppence. Flipped her what? Her shiny tuppence. Lady Jane has a lucky tuppence which she flips before she undertakes a case. Ah, uh, that Lady Jane. May I interrupt? Well, you're the boss. Do you have anything else to tell me about Georgia Gray or Nicky Gannon, please? Oh, indeed I do, Danny, indeed I do. In the murder of Nicky Gannon... Tommy Chandler, our prime suspect, has been released, and without a nickel's worth of bail. What? I have said it. So help me if you're kidding, Gino. Why was he released? Oh, because another fellow has confessed to the deed. You remember Cozy Barrett? Even at this moment, he is with Sergeant Mugovan, confessing all over the place. And that, Danny, is all the news I have for today. Case is solved, huh, Danny? <laughs> Yes, and that ain't all of it, Sergeant. George ain't all of it. Lots of people met with me then ended up under a sheet in the ice house. You killed before, Cozy? Oh, hi, Danny. Come on in. Join the fun. This is a new kick, isn't it, Cozy, for you? Confessing to a murder? Well, what's the matter? You don't trust me? Read me to him, Sergeant. Yeah, I'll brief it for you, Danny. Cozy says he took a pocket full of dimes to the diamond dance joint where Georgia Gray was. To celebrate the end of a perfect day, he tells me. You danced with her, Cozy? Sure I danced. How else I get close enough to kill? You didn't like the way she danced, huh? Crazy for it. Dream about it. Who else I dance away my heart on dawn? That buys you her dying, too, huh? Oh, she gives his insults. And from a foot away, that. But I got close. Eventually I got close. Yeah, yeah. Get on the phone, Mugovan. Have a policewoman sent up here with a portable radio. Danny, you all right? You've been working so hard. You you got a thing against telephones, Mugovan? Yep. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. Ah, what are you going to do, Danny? Yes, you got Mugovan. tricks with batteries and portable radios to make people talk? Uh-huh. I'm talking. Yes. Why you need electricity? Should be right up, Danny. Hey, you're going to put me away, huh, Danny? To the sound of music, huh? You treat me nice because I'm nice to you, huh? Killing. A lot of your line, isn't it, Cozy? I always figured you as more of the purse snatcher type, the jack roll kid, the friend a drunk finds in an alley. Well, I got a right to come up in the world, ain't I? This gives me class, a reputation, the things a fellow needs so he can admire himself in the night. Sure, I understand. Man has to get ahead. You sent for me, Lieutenant. You want this? Yes, come in, please. Turn on the radio. Go on, turn it on to dance music. That'll be all right. Dance with the lady, Cozy. Huh? Go on, dance with her. <laughs> yeah, you're crazy, Danny. I give myself up to you, and you, you, you go crazy. There are people like me, honest. Dance with her, like you did with Georgia. Show me how it was with Georgia. You know I can't dance, Danny. You know I wouldn't go near a dame to dance with her. They laugh in my face when they see me coming. You're never near Georgia Gray, were you? Not, Not even close enough to... Then they promised me they'd get me off, Danny. They said confess, and then when I got off, they'd give me the big dough. Who promised you all that? Well, friends, Danny. I, I got good friends. They they, they, they promised me things. They, they call me up and, and, and promised me things. <laughs> you got to lock me up, Danny, so I don't disappoint them. You got to lock me up. Make it come true for him, Muggerman. Lock him up. <laughs> Now the afternoon was two hours old, and the gray had turned into a wetness, a drizzle that hung scurling in the air before it touched the pavement. The citizens didn't mind getting wet. It was a sight to see. The funeral procession wasn't very long, not like the good old days when a gangster's death took up a mile of Broadway. Not like the good old days at all. None of the mourners walked. They all rode. And the wreaths were wrapped in cellophane, which not only protected the snapdragons from the rain, but it was more sanitary. I went along because I'd known Nicky Gannon for a long time. The rain let up a little when they lowered him into his grave. And none of the mourners stayed, not even his mother. And I wanted to talk to his mother. 
Mrs. Gannon? Hello, Danny. You want to ride back to town? I wanted to tell you how sorry I... You talk like that, you don't ride with me. Come on. My son was a hoodlum. Why should you be sorry for him? We've talked together. We've had a beer together. That's the reason. You cry. Not me. Whatever you want. He was your son. My son got scared. Men get scared, a man don't live anymore. And that's all his dying does to you, Mrs. Gannon? Look what I've got, Danny. A thug's funeral on a rainy day. He was your son. He's dead, Danny. I'm not. I'll think about him. Some things will come up in my mind from time to time that I've forgotten about right now. And I'll smile. And I'll think nice about Nicky then. Do you know who killed him? I know. Who? I said I know. The same person who killed Georgia? If I let you out of the car now, you'll get wet. You're going to do anything about the person who killed Nicky? I'm sure of it, Danny. Sure of what? It's going to rain all day. Funny, ain't it? The paper said it was. In a hurry, Danny Clover? Yeah, I am. Bother you, mister? Mm Mm-hmm. But it bothers me more, your unhappiness. Let's have a good cry over it in my office, huh? Here in the hallway suits me. Used to draft the hallways, spend my life in them, waiting to do things for unhappy people. Spreader of good cheer. That's your business at police headquarters, Mr... What name do you spread it under? Forbes, Counselor at Law, my card. Forbes, Counselor at Law. Someone came to you, said I was unhappy. You took the case. Almost precisely how it happened. They told you what makes me sad. Kindly people, they grieve when a policeman throws away a confessed killer. Cozy Barrett? It seems to them almost ungrateful. However, they respect your analytical prowess. You got something I can hang on my wall that says that? Something much better. Silver cup, maybe, with an inscription. Better. An envelope, manila with money. It could take you hours to count. No silver cup, huh? Better. A bonus, the killer. The real true killer of George and Nicky. That could bring you so much happiness to a man like you. Where do I find it? Mm, where else? Envelope and killer. The Diamond Dance Palace. Where Georgia danced upstairs. One o'clock. That's this morning. Be there and a smile will grow on your face. You've brought me true happiness, Counselor. Thank you. Then he walked away. At the end of the hall, he stopped and looked back over his shoulder. Grinned at me. Then he turned up his collar and walked out into the street. This was at 7 p.m. Then a walk down Broadway and dinner and a double feature on 42nd Street. Then it was time to go. The Diamond Dance Hall was blaring against its time of closing. I walked through it, pushed my way across the floor into a doorway. No one stopped me. Then up a flight of stairs and into a loft littered with old telephone books, cigarette butts, a neatly stacked bundle of your old newspapers. The only light, the light from the spectaculars down the street, spelling out the evening's pleasure. Forty girls, forty, no cover charge. Up front with Willie and Joe continuous performance. Chinese food, fried rice and dancing. And I waited. I didn't wait long. You here, Danny? Come on in, Tommy. Thanks. I brought you some. Here. It's all yours, Danny. Who is he? The killer that got promised to you. Dead? Uh Uh-huh. You bring the envelope, Tommy? (laughs) You bring it? (laughs) Sure. Sure, I brought it. Here. Count it at your leisure. Fifteen thousand, kid. I don't know, Tommy. A dead killer. How am I going to explain a dead killer? I thought of that, too. What did you come up with? Danny, I found a guy in Skid Row. He wasn't doing anybody any good. So I figured he could do us some good. So you shot him? With a police positive, just like you carry. Here's the gun. You track this killer down, he tried to escape, you shot him. Makes you a hero. That's right. And how many heroes have $15,000? <laughs> We're going to get along fine. You've taken over for Gannon? I deserve, don't I? Yeah, yeah, you do. Killing Georgia and Nicky Gannon, sure you deserve it. To courage. You don't know how much. Had me sweating there for a while that she didn't die right away. 
Only Georgia was a girl with character. Live and let live. Die and let live. Great girl. Well, I call you from time to time, Danny. Wait a minute, Tommy. Get used to it, Danny. I said I'd call you. Don't go away. You're under arrest for murder. You practicing being a cop? Don't be a cop around me. You forgot something, Tommy. I can't be anything else. Let's go. Because you're pointing the police positive. You got trouble, sucker? It's that way all over. <laughs> Don't let me fall. I got your coat. Don't. Don't let me fall. I, I don't want to die that way. Hold me. Yeah. Daddy. Daddy, hold. Hold me. His fingers clawed against the sheer stone. Daddy. Body twisting. Face tortured. Daddy. Pleading for a return to life. Daddy. His body hung there below me. Out of reach. Daddy. Then the fabric that held his life together gave way. Daddy. And the noise of the street came up to meet him. Killed her scream. And I got outside and walked through the gathering crowd. I remembered something in my hand. Tommy Chandler's torn coat. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory, and try to forget it, if you can. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Anthony Barrett was heard as Tommy Chandler, Francis Cheney as Fran Holland, Martha Wentworth as Mrs. Gannon, Larry Dobkin as Nicky Gannon, Joy Terry as Georgia Gray, Leo Cleary as Benny Fane, and Junius Matthews as Cozy. Every Saturday night on CBS, Jan Murray gets on that coast-to-coast phone and gives away $1,000 at a crack if you can identify the phantom voice. Be listening for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the early twilight, Broadway is dappled with beginning shadows. It's the time of the small shock. The springtime's day starts its long scream down into night. It's time clock time, the hour for going home again. Close the ledger, lock the store, figure the overtime, smile at the boss, and out into the street. Blink, then run. The subway waits for no man. Home again. End another day again. (laughs) 
My day was just beginning, north on Broadway and to the east, Central Park around the 80s. I pushed through the crowd whose focus was a park bench that faced the street. All right, come on, come on, break it up there, let him through. And Sergeant Muggerman tells you why you're there. Right over here, Danny. Lay right there near the bench. I found the knife. I didn't pick it up. I ripped... Who's the boy? Paul, uh... Paul Gilbert. Yeah. I haven't been home from school yet. Oh, you'll go home in a squad car, Paul. I promised him with the siren, Danny. Yeah, with the siren. What happened, Paul? How did the knife get there? I saw the man take it out of his own back and throw it down. And then the man staggered away. Mm-hmm. Did I show you this, Danny? All this blood? Wherever he is, he's hurt real bad. I want you to think for a minute, Paul. What did this man look like? Tall, I guess. Yeah. I guess that's all. He was tall. Uh, most grown-ups are tall, aren't they, Paul? All of them, except for midgets. One more thing, Paul. Was there anyone with this man? Think hard. No, I don't think so. Well, you told me that... The other man I saw wasn't with him. The other man in the hat just watched him. Then the man in the hat ran away. He wasn't with him. What did the man in the hat look like? He had a hat. That's all I know. I got scared. I ran. That's right, Danny. Paul ran right into Officer Curcio on the beat. Almost knocked him down. Curcio came back, saw the blood on the bench, the knife, phoned it in. Paul, did you know the man, the man with the knife? No, uh uh-uh. I usually don't come home from school this way. We had an after-school game with the 8B2 over there on the playground. This is the first game of the intramural. Squad car, Muggerman, for Paul, with a siren. Then the careful tracing, the sifting through the shadows of a city, the dust of a city, the hiding places of a city into which a wounded man must crawl and lie for a time and then wander in search of a kindlier place, a darker place, and leave behind him the trail of the wounded, the blood of his life. But the man who'd been stabbed had done none of these things. The hospitals told me that, the doctors, the fellow in the neat white jacket in the drugstore across from the park who, not having a wounded man, offered me a special on shaving cream. Then the legwork of the man on the beat, harvesting the crop of those who had been at the scene of the crime, sorting them, packaging them, parceling them out to me, one by one. Look, mister, how many rights do we have to give you guys? I was calling on my girl. I brought her a box of chocolate-covered peppermints. She was beginning to understand me. Well, we won't keep you long. Y- you don't understand, mister. I don't stick close to my little bird. She busts out of her cage. I've known her to do that when I pop out two minutes for a corner newspaper. You were in the park this afternoon, saw a man who was stabbed. Can you describe the man? I was never in no park where an unfortunate got stabbed. An officer took your name. You made him erase it, start all over again because he wasn't spelling it right. So you caught me in a lie. Can you describe the man who was hurt? Describe? Who got a chance to get close to him? Everybody pushing, shoving like it was a parade for a general. I'm lucky I got a peek at the top of his fleeing skull. Oh, that's all. Look, uh, I won't explain why I lied about not being in the park. Uh, my girl, the bird, thinks I work for a living. It's a little white lie I used to keep a cage. That's all. You can go. Then the man who is eager, whose eyes dart and pierce, who follows you as you move away from him, stays close to you, needs the lapel of your coat. I was real close to him. He had a knife in his back. He breathed in my face. I could tell you the color of his eyes, how close I was. Tell me. Blue eyes, washed out blue, and no tears in them, no tears at all, no remorse for the evil doing that had brought wrath upon him. Blue eyes. What color hair? Dirty. A dirty color. All matted. No. No, it was blonde and shining. And it was a kind of light that shone about it. That's because he was dying. Dying in protest against all the wickedness that'll drown. Drown us all. A big man, a short man, a... What does it matter how he looked? I was close to him, I tell you. He reached out his hand to me, touched my hand, tears on my face. Help him out of your office. Motion a policeman over, watch him be gentle with the man, take him away. And then motion for the next one to come in realize, of course, that you're imposing on my time. Not that I mind. It could be a welcome relief from those spoiled monsters I simper and smile at and diaper. You're a nursemaid, Miss Cram, is that right? Call me governess and call me Virginia. Miss Cram doesn't sound like me at all, don't you think? You take the children to the park every day? Four to five thirty, except on rainy days. Hmm? On rainy days, the children and I stay at home and I'm permitted callers from four to five thirty. That's on rainy days. You told an officer you saw the man who was hurt. I was making conversation. I needed that to get those brats out of my hair. You didn't see him? 
I wouldn't have gone near him. But I can tell you who did see him, the looker. Who? The looker. All of us in the park know her. She sits in a window across the street on the fifth floor, watches every move we make every day. Sits there and watches. It makes you feel as if you're being spied on, you know what I mean? Fifth floor, in an apartment on 80th and 5th. Well, you can't miss her. Just stand out in the street for a while. Her eyes will bore right through you. But on a rainy day... I know, you're permitted callers. That's all, Miss Kern. I'm Danny Clover, police. <laughs> we haven't done anything. I know. I don't even know who you are. There's no name card on your door. You want to come in and talk to us? All right. I'm George Mason. She's my... in the wheelchair. Diane's my wife. Uh, good evening, Miss Mason. Diane? Diane, dear. Diane, we've got a visitor. He said good evening to you. Say hello, Diane. This is Mr. Clover. He's from the police. Mr. Mason, there was some trouble earlier across the street from... Now, you talk to her, will you? I'm trying something. Maybe it'll do her some good, talking to her. No one ever does, you know. You just talk to her and I'll answer you. All right. There was a man stabbed across the street from you, Mrs. Mason, in the park. Yes, I heard about it when I came home. Have you found the man? No. Mrs. Mason... I understand that you sit by a window every day. That's right, that one. She sits there, watches. It's her pleasure. Today? Every day. Then she must have seen what happened. She must pretty, have... Uh... Pretty, pretty. What? What are you trying to say, Diane? Mm-hmm. Can't you see how it is? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. George? Yes. What is it? I saw a man today. I saw a knife today. Is there anything you can do? Can you talk to her? Diane. A man today. A knife today. Yes, well, can you tell me what the man looked like, sweetheart? Knife. Was he a big man? Was he a small man? Was he a nice man? Man. Did you like him? Try to erase from memory the eyes of the woman filled with the named terrors, the known terrors that dart and scurry, gnaw and nibble at the fleeting instance of serenity within her. And try to wash away in the city's night screaming the crooning of a tuneless song, and suddenly the known words, a man, a knife. And know that the eyes that absorb all movement, all shadow, all light on faces, and things that pass before them have seen nothing. Not the man who was stabbed, not the one who did the stabbing. And then the long walk to the darkened room, turn on the shaded light bulb and search the cupboards for sleep. And finally, it comes. In the morning, the scorching cup of coffee, the walk to headquarters, and the cheery greeting on the threshold from the cheery Sergeant Attaglia. Oh, welcome, Danny. Welcome to your abode away from your abode. Uh, good morning, Gino. Ah, the best. The sunniest, the bravest. Uh, not so early. Uh, Gino, all I've had is a cup of coffee. For which I am delighted. Huh? For which I am delighted. Come, I will escort you to your office, Danny. You will see there how I have taken the liberty to spread upon your desk a repast. <laughs> I shouldn't have done it, Gino. A repast consisting of a hot paper container of coffee and a half a dozen cinnamon bums. What a... The repast. Partake. Uh, looks good. How else should they look? The cinnamon buns were baked in the oven of Mrs. Tartaglia with her own two lily whites. Go ahead, partake. Munch, if you like. Mmm, delicious. Uh, thank Mrs. Tartaglia for me. Goes without saying. And now, to the events of the morning. <clears throat> uh, okay if I disturb while you munch? Mm, yeah. yeah. We of the department have discovered that this park bench upon which an alleged man was allegedly stabbed has been a lucky bench. Or unlucky, depending, of course, on the point of view of whom sat there. You'll explain it to me, Gino. Goes without saying. 
The lucky part of the bench is that five weeks ago, a man found upon it, wrapped in a newspaper, $300. Turned it over to Lost and Found. So? So is that four weeks ago, same man turned into Lost and Found from the same bench, a like newspaper containing another 300 And we have not seen this pleasant, honest citizen since. Do you have his name? Oh, it goes with our... Uh, Harry Forster, 1345 West 16th. Want I should keep the cinnamon buns hot for you, Danny? I'll do that, Gino. You go ahead and do that. Please help me. Please come in and help me. What's the matter? My husband. No one will help me. I asked the neighbors. They said, call the police. Call an ambulance. Please, help Where is he? You'll help. He's in our bedroom. I think he's... I think he's dying, and no one would... No one... You're Mrs. Foster? Yes, Harry's wife. He came home last night, and, and there was blood. He just looked at me like an animal, and... There he is, mister. Help him. Please help him. dead. No. No, you're wrong. He's been dead for a long time. He was asleep. Only asleep. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. On CBS this Sunday evening, Charlie McCarthy will play a tattoo artist for a group of sailors, while beautiful Ann Southern acts as his reluctant model. There'll be more fun with Eve Arden, Amos and Andy, Red Skelton, and Corliss Archer. Stay with CBS this Sunday, for these great comedy programs will be heard on most of these same stations. In the Maytime, the sun grins down and pats Broadway's cheek. Broadway loves it. The sunlit minutes are added to the ten-minute break for a cigarette. The walk is slower, the sway gentler. The windows are opened wide, and the doors, too. And glints of sunlight are carried through long hallways on the sigh of a summer's wind, touching the lips of the girl at the typewriter, touching the hand of the man at the water cooler watching her, touching the steel of the file cabinets, warming them. And having made the tour, back onto Broadway and start all over again. But where I was, there was no warmth. Only a woman drawing a shawl tight around her shoulders and talking quietly to her dad. Harry, Harry, listen to me. You were right. We should have told them. We should have told them all about it. And you wouldn't be like this, and I would Mrs. Foster, what should you have told us? What? What did you say? What should you and your husband have told us? About the money, nothing else. The money you found on the park bench? Yes. You see, we should have told them, Harry. But he did, Mrs. Foster. He reported it. Turned it in. You don't understand. I knew no one would understand. Then maybe you can help me. Friday was always Harry's day off. From the factory out there. You can see it from here, see. On his day off, I'd pack him a little lunch and he'd kiss me goodbye. Walk up town to Central Park. He... Go on. He always went alone. He always sat on the same bench. Harry used to describe it to me. What he saw, people he talked to. Felt as if I'd been there with him. And one day he found money in a newspaper. And turned it in, like you said. The next week turned it in. But after that, I told him he didn't have to do that anymore. You mean he found more money? Is that what you're trying to tell me? What? You mean he found more money? For five weeks in a row. I told Harry he didn't have to turn it in anymore. I told him to go back. To be sure and keep going back. Every week. Yesterday, too. <laughs> and we'd be rich. No more of this. No more factory. Why didn't you call us when he came home hurt? Call a doctor? Who would have spoiled it, ended it. The money, don't you see? 
I thought he'd live, and we... With that money... No. You couldn't. You couldn't see. Then she turned from me and walked over to the window, stared out of it. Across her shoulder, into the noon sunshine, I could see the factory emptying its lunchtime employees... The crowd breaking off its fragments to the curb with the lunch pails, to the push carts for the ham on white and coffee. Then the other sound, the feet in the doorway, the entrance of the professionals, coroner, photographer, reporter. The man had been murdered. I left. Then back again to Central Park and the park bench of the stabbing. Sit on it. A man named Harry Foster used to find money here. And he was killed. And a woman who had seen it happen, a woman who sat at a window every day. I looked up to the window. She wasn't there. I wondered why. I knew why. She was in the wheelchair. There was a man pushing it carefully down the steps. Can you scooch a little to the side, friend? Oh, need a hand? Uh, Yeah, if you want. Thanks. How are you feeling, Mrs. Mason? She ain't going to answer you. I didn't know she left the house. Why should you even bother? Oh, I'm Danny Clover, police. Oh, hi, I'm Ben Taylor. Uh, got a you drive down the street. Only Mrs. Mason here, different. <laughs> kind of a take drive. Oh, I see. Just today? Oh, no, all the time. Uh, from one to three, uh, the element's willing. Uh, I take her for a ride. Sometimes here, sometimes there. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Right away, Miss Mason. Uh, See you, Danny. Oh, wait a minute. How long have you been doing this, Ben? Right. Well, since her accident. Since at Coney last year. Hurt her back. Here and up here, her head. Right. Come on, right. I I guess I better take her. I heard her cry like that before. I can't stand it. Sure. It's a nice day, Mrs. Mason. I hope you enjoy your ride. Oh, she will. She likes riding in the car. See you around, Danny. I watched Ben lift her gently out of the wheelchair, lift her into the back of the car, close the door, fold the chair, place it in the car trunk, then back and saying something to her. She looked up for an instant. Her eyes found me. Then she smiled and shaped a lost word with her lips. They were gone. And back at headquarters, the wall clock ticking off the hours of Harry Foster's death, Taking off the hours that his murderer came to a park bench, looked at it, smiled, walked away in the warm sun. Ticked off the question of why money had been left there for Harry Foster to find week after week on Friday's twilight. And at four o'clock, the door opening slightly, and all you saw of the man was his cocked head. You Mr. Danny Clover? That's right. You want something? Only to know if you Mr. Danny Clover, and to give you what I have in my pocket... They said I should give it to you, you being the interested party and all. Uh, what have you got in your pocket? This. An envelope. Stamped and everything. I found it. Now give it to me. It's addressed to George Mason. Anybody can see that. That's the husband of that woman. The cripple. The one they call a looker in the papers. The one they think they saw that stabbing. <laughs> I did right bring that to you. Huh? It's been opened. You open it? Don't lie to me. You opened it and then resealed it. All right, I opened it. I'm a normal kind of fellow with all the normal curiosities. First, I was going to mail it when I found it. But then I saw who it was addressed to. I couldn't restrain myself. I'm like the proverbial cat, Mr. Clover. It could be I... trouble for you being like that. Not when you see what's in it. Not when you see what it says. It says, you've made a terrible mistake. That's all. Not another word. See? You can't do anything to me for just reading that. You just read it yourself. That's why I brought it to you. Because I'm a cooperative citizen. Now, where'd you find I... it? At Glenn's tomb. You know, I've been curious about that tomb for years now. Finally, I took time off to go to study it. Then I found a letter on the steps. And I never did get to really study Grant's tomb. Tough. You'll stick around, huh? Some of our boys want to have a long chat with you. They enjoy curious fellas. Sure, anything you say. I'm nothing if I'm not cooperative. Just nothing. I wouldn't say that, but you stick around, huh? Hi, Ben. Well, hello, Danny. Hey, how do you like this, huh? I rigged up so when it's a sunny day, the telephone is on the outside of my shack. 
<laughs> Inspiration, huh? Ah, fine. Who wants to be on the inside when outside it's sunny? <laughs> you car renting, Danny? I can give you rates. Oh, uh, just talk. <laughs> if you don't do business together, we never become enemies, huh? What's on your mind? Mrs. Mason. Ah, oh, yeah. Sad, huh? You know, if you set your mind to it and consider all she's been through, and then look at her, she's a pretty woman. I noticed. You said she was hurt in an accident at Coney Island, Ben. What, what kind of an accident? Uh, on the roller coaster. You know, one of them rides. Fell off. Right near the end of the ride. She stood up. Fell. Was she with anyone? Uh, yeah, her husband. You want to know something? In spite of the heartbreak of having a wife like that, you know, Mr. Mason is one of the nicest guys I ever met. What about Mrs. Mason, Ben? Hmm? What about her? Can anyone ever talk to her, have a conversation with her? I talk to her. About what? Hmm. Things. You know, ain't it a pretty day, Mrs. Mason? Is there a draft on you, Mrs. Mason? I talk to her, but she just hums and sings. But, you know, I think she's getting better. It, Maybe I'm contributing. Where'd you go driving today? Um, down Riverside Drive. You know, the river, Grant's tomb, the churches. Thanks a lot, Ben. Anytime, Danny, anytime at all. Hello, Mr. Clover. Good evening, Mr. Mason. Uh, we're, we're delighted to see you. Please come in. Diane, it's Mr. Clover. Diane looks better, doesn't she, Mr. Clover? Yes, yes, she does. I brought you something, Mr. Mason. Here. Oh? A letter? It's addressed to you. Read it. I don't understand. Read it. Yes, it is. It's addressed to me, but it's been opened. That's right. Read it. All right. No. The note says you made a mistake, Mr. Mason. <laughs> Mrs. Mason, your husband might be electrocuted for a murder he committed. Leave her alone. I wasn't going to touch her. Cut it out, Mrs. Mason. What's the matter with you? Have you gone out of your mind, Clover? I said cut it out, Mrs. Mason. I told you leave her alone. All right, you've come here to accuse me of murder, but leave her alone. George. Don't don't worry about anything, dear. Get me a drink of water. What? What did you say? A drink of water, George. Cold water from the refrigerator. Diane. Darling, a drink of water. Do it. You won't be able to wait on me anymore. Mr. Clover is going to take you away from me. Talking like, like you know what you're saying. You do know what you're saying. What's happening? What's happening to us? It's already happened. It's all over. <laughs> Poor George. You paid off, didn't it, Mrs. Mason? Sitting at the window watching, watching for a man your husband could kill. Simple little man. He came and sat on the same bench every Friday. He got paid for a while. It was you. You wrote that first letter to him. And this one. Made me pay blackmail to a man who didn't even know me, didn't know anything about me. It was so simple. Write a letter, put a stamp on it, drop it from the car. Someone picked up the first letter and mailed it. About five weeks ago, a letter with instructions in it. Why, yes. Leave money every Friday on the park bench. And the man who picked it up, Mr. Mason, you thought was a blackmailer, so you killed him. She's crazy. She really is. She's crazy. No, I'm not. I'm just a cripple, George. I can't move from this chair. Honest. But I'm not crazy. She's crazy. What did that first letter say, Mr. Mason? Well, that a man saw me push my wife off a ride at Coney Island. He demanded blackmail, but I didn't push, Diane. <laughs> Then why did you pay the money, darling? But you weren't going to let your husband alone, were you, Mrs. Mason? Even after he did what you wanted him to do, murder a man. Another letter, the one your husband's holding, telling him he killed the wrong man. It's not much to ask, is it? Wanting George to suffer? Look at me. You're an accessory, Mrs. Mason. Am I? What can you do to me? 
A cripple in a wheelchair. In a prison? Will that be different? Tell me how. I didn't push you, Diane. I didn't push you. You fell off that ride. You fell. Liar. Diane. You're a liar, Diane. Diane, will you listen to me? I made it up to you. I carried you. I waited on you. I, I went crazy that day. I hated you. I don't know why. I don't know. Oh, I know why. You're an evil woman. Evil. Poor George. You should have died. You should have. <laughs> Poor George. Poor It's night on Broadway now. There's easy laughter, and a trumpet scurls its music into the grinning mob. It's top of the evening. Have another drink on me, kid, and let's set this dance out. It's a street gouged out of a scarlet dream. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as George Mason, Kathy Lewis as Diane Mason, and Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Foster. Others in the cast were Herb Vigran, Lou Krugman, and Johnny McGovern. Every Saturday night, Jan Murray takes a tip from Danny Clover and goes looking for people. Only Jan's beat is the United States. By coast-to-coast -coast phone, he offers a grand in cold, hard cash if you can identify the phantom voice. So stay tuned now as Jan Murray and Sing It Again follow immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the mid-afternoon light of Maytime, Broadway shimmers and Langer walks the street. The dream walk, rhythm to the pulse of the sleeping neon, to the sun-warmed blues yawned out of loudspeakers, to the slow, erratic dance of the litter of night, held close, thrown away by a gutter wind. And with the rest of Broadway, you stand and watch, or follow the crowd, and lend your heart to the whispered cry that this day, this time, will not get away from you. But it does. It always does. <laughs> The web of blood in the alley was already dust-heavy, its threads leading you to the man huddled in a forgotten anguish against the flaking brick of an alley wall, his hand still clutched to the bullet wound as if he tried to claw out the pain and never made it, and the other man leaning over him being gentle and polite as he searched the dead man's pockets, then finding something and looking at it, 
Then making the only observation left to him. It's a nice day, wasn't it, Danny? What did you find, Muggerman? Found him like that, all broken up about the bullet in his chest. Tried to tell me why it was there. The word never got out. It was phoned in? Yeah, from the back room of a bar down the alley. A friendly chap wandered out for a breath of fresh air, saw this, ran back to the bar, made his phone call. Bought drinks for the house. He's still celebrating if you want to talk to him. You talked to him? Yeah, friendly lush, invited me to a cold beer. I didn't take it. He knew this man? Never had the pleasure, he told me. All the citizens of the alley never had the pleasure I checked. Uh Uh-huh. What's that in your hand? This? Oh, I almost forgot. It's a ticket for parking made out to a Charles Crandall. Overparked in the loading zone. He can snap his fingers at it now, huh? This your witty day, Muggerman? I try, Danny. Days like this, I guess I don't make it. Oh, anything else, sir? Oh, not a thing, nothing. Except that expensive watch on his wrist. You have to listen awful close to even hear it ticking. Very expensive. It's running, but in this alley you can't hear it ticking. No wallet, no identification, just the parking ticket, is it? That's all. A wristwatch and a parking ticket. Not much for a grown man to leave behind him, is it, Danny? Then the alley, formerly known only to the chalk writers, the garbage collectors, and the shortcut homers, then the alley became cluttered with new faces, mostly scrubbed. The girl in the picture hat and the Pekingese, a maid in the baby carriage, the dad and his son. Mostly these, interspersed with enough men from the police department so that I could leave. I did. Back to headquarters briefly with a traffic ticket and to the traffic department, long enough to check an automobile license number against a name and be given an address. Charles Crandall, rooming house on West 17th Street, and go there. Wait a few seconds until the woman at the front door had finished shaking out her mop. Morning. (laughs) Guess I should say good afternoon. House cleaning, you sure lose track of the time. I'm looking for Charles Crandall. I'm from the police. Oh, my... Charlie hasn't done anything, has he? Is he home? I wish you'd answer me. I'm his landlady, and I never had a better rumor than Charlie. What's Charlie done? We found a man with a traffic ticket in his he pocket. Charlie told me parked illegally. Is he home? Why, no. Charlie hasn't been home for the last couple of days. I see. Yeah. Charlie's engaged, you know. No, I didn't. He brought his young lady over just last week, introduced us, Rosemary. Such a nice girl. Helped me with the dishes. Rosemary what? Oh, I don't remember quite. Nielsen or something. Rosemary, such a nice name for a girl going to be married. Can you tell me why Charlie hasn't been home? Of course. Sometimes he stays at Rosemary's house. Her parents love him like he was their own, like I feel about him. Was Charlie about 5 feet 11, blonde hair, heavily built? But not fat, you understand. Charlie takes exercise every morning. When the chandelier shakes in the parlor, I know Charlie's taking his exercises. And the chandelier shakes every morning before he goes to work. Do you know where Charlie works? Surely Charlie's a longshoreman. That's another reason why he's not fat. Works the peerless steamship line, unloads. That's an idea. Do you want to talk to Charlie? Why don't you go there? You're a policeman. They'll let you talk to him. The foreman said your name was Charlie Crandall. Yeah, that's right. I'm from the police. Oh, oh, the parking ticket, huh? I'm not surprised. I am. I didn't think you were alive, Charlie. Come on. If I'm not being too previous, where are you taking me, Mr. Clover? You'll see. I had parking tickets before. Nobody ever took me by the arm and led me down a cold, damp hallway. That's so? Nobody ever? Never. So help me. I've been missing out on things. Life has passed me by, huh? In here, Charles. Don't tell me. Let me guess. It's a morgue. Uh Uh-huh. I keep looking at such things in the papers whenever you boys put on a safety campaign. Look, the paper says. Drive carefully, or this on the slab is you. 
because I got a lousy parking ticket. You're making me live it. This is the new up-to-date method. There's a chill in the air here. How come I'm sweating? Take a good look, Charles. I'm looking. I make your promise. I will drive carefully, observing all the traffic signals, and I will never overpark in a loading zone again. Promise. Cross my heart. Gypsy blood oath, if you want. You know him? Cover him up. Put him back. I've had him. I said something, Charles. You know him? Who knows people who ask for this kind of thing? A shelf for a grave. I'm grateful to you, though, Mr. Clover. You've introduced me to a new experience. You've given me a memory I never had before. We found this parking ticket on him, Charles. Yours. Huh? Look at it, yours. Why do things like this happen to a man like you? It's very complicated. I'll listen. You sure you got the time? You got nothing better to do? Down here, there's all the time you'll ever need. Fortunate me. That's right, Charles. Count your blessings. What I'm building up to, if you give me the chance. Last night was a blessing. Maybe this, what you're showing me, was a part of it. I wouldn't know. When the mood hits you, the part you know. I'll wait. Well, last night was my night in Sully's Bar on 3rd Avenue. Oh? This man was found in an alley near Sully's Bar. I wouldn't know about that. All I know is Sully's a man with an open ear. I cried into it. Yeah, you'd had a tough day. That, too. I'm a longshoreman, remember? That, too. So you cried a glass full of tears into Sully's ear. Yeah, about the engagement ring I needed for my girl. Or my betrothed, I call her. About the engagement ring I couldn't afford to buy for her. Because a man like me don't lay away for things like that. Must have been very dramatic. Ah, yeah, I put it on. Maybe more than it needed. Because a girl walks over to me, runs her fingers across the beard on my cheek, tells me she has heard the whole thing, or the big trouble I'm in with my betrothed. And she stopped your weeping. You could say that. She told me there was a jewelry store, Scully's jewelry store down the street, to come with her, to pick out any ring in the window I wanted. Like a fairy tale. Yeah, you could say that. So I went with her, pointed to the fattest ring in the window with the fattest numbers, a star sapphire. She says, meet me again tomorrow. I'll get it for your half price. Good girl to meet in a bar. You'll never dream how good. After that, she takes me back to Sally's. Let's me exchange my other sorrows with her. You had more? Only one more I could call to mind. At the time. The parking ticket. Well, she says, give it to me. I know where to fix it. You uh, believed her? I hear it's been done. And that's the last you saw of the ticket? The gypsy blood oath, if you still want it. Who was the girl? Helen, addressed Sally's bar on 3rd. Go to her, Mr. Clover. A girl like that can ease many sorrows. Just ask for Helen. They'll know. Don't thumb through any travel folders, huh, Charles? Why should I? I found a home here. Cover him up, huh, Mr. Clover? It's chilly in here. Sally's Bar on 3rd Avenue, the boy had said. Go there and ask about a girl named Helen. Because Charlie had given her a traffic ticket, and the ticket had turned up on one John Doe, dead on arrival. Third Avenue is a tenement five stories high and miles long. At nine o'clock, the night is going full blast. The open-air card games for juveniles only, the doorstep trysting places. And every seven minutes, the elevator screams. Somewhere between Kam Chu's Hong Kong hand laundry, special attention paid to pleated dress shirts and the Blue Star delicatessen, cream soda and hot corn beef two bits, somewhere between there was Sally's bar. I walked in. What's yours, friend? Beer. To make a draft. Uh huh. One dime. Thanks. Your name's Sally. You own this place. Yeah, so? You work here every night? Yeah, why? Skip any nights this week? Hey, what's with you, buster? You spent the dime, drink your beer, listen to the music. I'm looking for Helen. Who? Helen, tall, blonde, you know. Look, buster. You're here every night, aren't you? You ought to know Helen. I want to show you something, friend. See this? A ball bat. I bought it from a kid who swiped it from the Yanks' dugout. I sawed it off. You want to hear how it goes? That's the way it goes when I slap it on a bar. You want to hear how it sounds otherwise? You want to... Cop, huh? Why didn't you show me the badge before? What about Helen? I get it. Don't be a cop. You figure I tell you about Helen, huh? What about her? I told her to stay out of here. 
What'd you want me to do? Hit her over the head with the bat? The other night she was in here talking to a longshoreman named Charlie Crandall. You know anything about that? Who's in trouble? She or this Charlie? Charlie Crandall was talking to you about an engagement ring. You remember that? Who remembers for what reason my ear gets bent? Helen, I know. You want her, huh? Where do I find her? You wait on that bar stool, she'll be in whispering at you for a drink. Or you can't wait, try the second floor back of the corner house at the end of the block. This side of the street. Can't wait, huh? Walk down to the corner house, which the sign at the head of the steps said allowed no visitors after 10 o'clock. And the other sign at the end of the corridor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Wash out the bathtub. And the door, with the swinging open briefly... Then closing, opening. Helen? Helen? Yet no answer. The tenement draft swings the door open and presents a room, a torn apart room. Nothing was in its place. Nothing was undisturbed except the girl on the bed. The strangled girl with the tumbled blonde hair. The dead girl. The murdered girl. are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Anyone interested in an auto ride from Hollywood all the way to New York? A fella in Hollywood named Jack Benny has to make the trip. He's got a fine Maxwell automobile, and he's looking for someone who loves sharing the scenery and the expenses. For full details and fascinating highlights, be listening to CBS's Jack Benny Show this Sunday evening. And remember, Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, will be on hand, too. Springtime on Broadway is like springtime on a thousand other main drags, except for one thing. Mother Nature doesn't function on Broadway. Nothing grows. It gets constructed. But nobody bothers. There's the salary to be earned, baseball scores to be considered, and the weather to be discussed. However, as in all times and places, there are the crackpots. Some even delirious enough to give you odds that Broadway's liable to get blown off the face of the earth. You waste a shrug on that one and flip the newspaper over another page and scan the quarter column on the right-hand side. Girl murdered in tenement house. Police seek link with death of unidentified man, which was straight reporting. I know, because I was the policeman directly concerned. Next morning, open the notebook and scan the personal brand of shorthand. See now an item. Charlie Crandall had been taken by the hand and led to the window of Scully's jewelry shop to pick out an engagement ring. Go there, look in the same window, and walk into the store. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'm Danny Clover from the police. Yes? I'd like to see the manager. Well... Well, I guess I am, until Mr. Scully comes in. What did you want to see him about? I'm his wife, and... Take a look at this picture, Mrs. Scully. Have you ever seen this man before? I might have, but I don't know him. Personally, if that's what you mean. Maybe I've seen him someplace. Who is he? The man we've got in the morgue. Now, uh, take a look at this picture. Young girl, also in the morgue. How terrible. Do you know her? She could be anybody... Somebody's sister or sweetheart in the morgue, in a police morgue. Well, what happens to people, Mr. Clover? What? My, my, look at him. <laughs> Hello, honey, like it? Blue coat and brown pants. Well, it's different, George. I, I took my brown coat to the cleaners on the way to work. It, it got soiled. I, oh, sorry, dear, this gentleman... Oh, uh, this is Mr. Clover, George, from the police. And this is my husband, Mr. Scully. Oh, Mr. Oh, something I can do for you, Mr. Clover? Yeah, just take a look at a couple of pictures. Here, this one. Hmm. Never saw him. Uh, take a look at this. No. Her either. Dangerous characters, huh? George, they're dead. They're in a police morgue. No, I don't know either of them, Mr. Oh, Clover. Oh, George. I'm talking to the gentleman, Louise. But I'll forget if I don't tell you now. Uh, my wife is forgetful, Mr. Clover. That's a good kind of wife to have. What is it, dear? Mrs. Reed was in here for her diamond brooch. I couldn't find it. Well, why not? Why couldn't you find it? 
Mrs. Reed was furious. You promised her you'd have the catch repaired by this morning. Well, it's ready. Why couldn't you find it, Louie? I looked. It's not there on the repair rack. I looked all right, but I couldn't find it. Call up Mrs. Reed and tell her your husband's here, Louise. Tell her to stop in for a brooch. Well, do it, Louise. You're not missing anything from this shop, are you, Mr. Scully? Missing what? I don't know. I don't understand what you're talking about. A robbery, anything like that? You're joking. If I had a robbery, I'd know I'd been robbed, wouldn't I? You want anything else, Mr. Clover? No? Then you'll pardon me, won't you? Sure you will. Gino. <sighs> What's the matter, Tartaglia? You got a big sadness? From your office window, Danny, you can see the harbor in the yon. It makes you unhappy, huh? Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well girl detective from London Town, she has pushed off from our fair shores, Danny. The paper said she grew lonesome to eat an English kipper in the fog. That uh, happens to a girl sometimes. You're fighting me, Danny. Don't do that at a time like this. There's only one thing to do with a grief like yours, Gino. Tell me, Danny. Don't tease me with it. Tell me. Bury it in work. You mean... I tried, Danny. It don't help. There it is on your desk. Hmm? You buried your grief in this envelope? A part of it. The rest, what's in the envelope, is news from the FBI. Concerning the fingerprints of the man now in the morgue whom you found bullet holed in the alley. They matched them? To a minor hoodlum. Name of Johnny Malloy. Used to work our fair city. Crossed a few sweaty palms with silver. Address unknown. I informed them his new address. Finally caught up with him, did you know? Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. This is Rosemary Nelson, Mr. Clover. Can you come to our house right away, please? Who did you say? Rosemary Nelson. I'm Charles Crandall's fiancé. He told you about me, he says. It's about the ring he gave me. The engagement ring. I don't want it. Nor him anymore. Please come. What's your address, Rosemary? The brownstone with the marble stoop. 1827 West 58th. You'll be here? Right away. You going out, Danny? You mind? Well, if you want to leave me alone with a memory, it's all right. Go ahead, Danny. I'll be all right. I've been alone before. Bye, Danny. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to her, Mr. Clover. She's upset. A lover's quarrel upsets a girl like Rosemary. I know. We've had them before. And that's all it is, Rosemary? Just a quarrel that needs a policeman to referee it? Look at this ring, Mr. Clover. Mm, beautiful. Star sapphire, huh? Take it. I don't want it. Give it back to whoever Charlie got it from. You know where I got it from. Who I got it from. How I got it. Don't make a tear-stained production out of it. I'm not crying, Charlie. Not anymore. That's one thing I used to like about you. You never gave me a reason to cry. You got a star sapphire, didn't you? Is that what eats you? Because you never had a thing like that before? Because the star shoots pains through your head? Leave me alone. Just you leave me alone, you hear? Rose. Rose, honey. Where'd you get the ring, Charles? Honey, Rose, baby, listen to me. I told you I'd tell the police. I dropped into Scully's jewelry store a little while ago. I noticed a little square, clean place in the window, like where a ring box had been. This the ring, Charles? Yeah, yeah. You need an engagement ring, lonely man. Take it. Looks like I don't need it anymore. Helen Griffith, get it for you like she said she would. Half price and everything. Half price and everything. You could go ask her. Except I read in the paper she's dead. So you'll have to take my word for it, huh? You were with her. You were with her. And she sold you the ring. And now she's dead and you want me to wear it. Get him out of here. Get him out. Yeah. Why don't you do that, Mr. Clover? It ain't the same between Rosemary and me anymore. So why don't you do like the pretty girl asks? Let's go, Charles. I'm sorry, Rosemary. Oh, leave me alone. Just you leave me alone, you hear? What are you waiting for, copper? What is Come it? Come on. What are you going to hold me on? Suspicion of murder? Until they come up with a new one. Danny? Danny? Over here in a squad car. Woman down at headquarters, Danny, turning the air blue with complaints about Scully the jeweler. Says he. Tell us about it on the way down, Amugaman. Huh, It'll pass the time for all of us. 
You, me, and our boy, Charlie. Uh, this is Danny Clover, Miss Christie. What am I supposed to do? Put two fingers in my mouth and whistle? You made a complaint about a jeweler named Scully. What's the complaint? Don't talk to me like that. What is this, Mungman? I'll handle it for you, Danny. Now, look, Miss Christie, you told me something about a watch and about Scully's jewelry store. I want you to tell Mr. Clover. What's the matter? You got amnesia, Sonny? Please tell him. It's about my layaway plan. Whirl that around for a while. Danny, this is a mad dream. We lost that one, Mugman. Try another move. Miss Christie. I told you it's my layaway plan. My layaway plan. You mean you bought something for Mr. Scully on a layaway plan? You don't, don't you, boy? What did you lay away, Miss Christie? A watch for a man's wrist. I'm carting. Figured a bull of it make him happy. You still haven't told us what the complaint is. That's Scully. For 11 months now, I've been paying down on the watch, see? Come in with the last payment in my hot little fist, no watch. Scully tries to sell me another one. That watch have a gold face, gold wristband? And if you flip open its backside, there's 17 jewels visible to the, if you'll pardon the expression, naked eye. Hey, Danny, that sounds like the watch we found on that guy in the alley. Yeah. Entertainer, Mugovan. You heard what the man said, sonny? Entertainer. Then a squad car, and on the way to Scully's jewelry shop, the gathering together of the after images of two people's dying. Item, Miss Christie. The fact that her wristwatch had disappeared from Scully's store had turned up on a murdered man's wrist. Item, Helen. The fact that she had gotten a star sapphire from Scully at a big saving. The fact that she'd been murdered. Conclusion. Mr. Scully had been robbed, or he'd been giving away merchandise. Anyway, it was a conclusion that needed Mr. Scully. What can I... Oh. Hello, Mr. Clover. Is your wife here, Scully? In the back, sort and stock. Get her. Well, if it's important, Mr. Clover, but she's busy. Get her. Mr. Clover. Yeah, well, all right. Louise? Louise, come here for a minute. I haven't finished the stock, George. Leave it and come here. Mr. Clover wants you. Who? Mr. Clover, you remember, the policeman. Well, tell him to come back, George. If you stop me in the middle of the stock, I'll forget what I've done. Don't worry about it, Mrs. Scully. It won't take long. Well, what do you want? I told you I couldn't recognize those people. I know. Your husband couldn't either. Well, what's the matter? Don't you believe us? Yeah, don't you believe us? Tell me something, Mrs. Scully. Did your husband ever locate Mrs. Reed's diamond brooch, the one that needed the catch fixed? Well, why ask her? Ask me. Yeah, yeah, I found it. Oh, you mean I found it, George. You remember we laughed when I found it in the repair case after looking there a dozen times. I just couldn't understand it. Because when you looked a dozen times, it wasn't there. Tell her where it was, Scully. What are you trying to do to us, Clover? Tell her where the brooch was, Scully, and the wristwatch and the star sapphire ring. Oh, my. He's crazy, Louise. I don't know what he's trying to do. Oh, my. George. Well, George, I'm not going to lie for you. You might as well know that. After all, you've done something wrong. I know I'm a plain woman, George, and I'm in my 40s, and I make myself forget a lot of things. But not this, George. She doesn't know what she's talking about. You lied to me, George Scully. You said you took your coat to the cleaners, and you never did. When I was in there today, the cleaning man asked me about you. Said you hadn't been in for such a long time. Uh, I told you a little white lie, Louise. I lost my coat. You must have lost the keys to the store, too. Is that why we've been using mine? Is that how that hoodlum Johnny Malloy looted your shop, Scully? Walked in and took your coat when you had it off. Well, when it's hot, a man takes off his coat. But your keys were in the pockets. Why didn't you report it to the police? Because you were with that woman again, weren't you, George? That's why you couldn't report it. But I was only drinking with her in a bar. I don't care what you were doing. After all, you promised me. Louise, I... I I lied for you about the pictures. But I'm not going to lie anymore. Not about her. Even if she is dead. Louise! 
What do you want me to say? I don't know. Tell her you killed Johnny Malloy, only he didn't have the loot. He'd already given it to Helen, so you had to strangle her to get it. And you got it. Hey, I don't know what got into me, Louise. I didn't want you to know. It was such a beautiful night. I was walking along. I stopped to light my pipe. It was in front of the bar, and I heard a tap on the window. It was Helen. She waved me in, and I... I just didn't want you to know. But you promised you wouldn't. And now look at you. George Scully. You're a murderer. I think we'd better go, Scully. Louise, you gotta help me. We'll get a lawyer. He'll tell you what to say. I won't lie, George. I just am not going to lie anymore. In May, the night sighs down on Broadway like a rosy promise. And someone smiles and takes your hand, whispers. And for an instant, the lights are brighter, the noise louder, and your scream mixes well with the scream of the night. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lou Merrill was heard as George Scully, Jeanette Nolan as Louise Scully, and Adam Williams as Charles Crandall. Others in the cast were Peggy Weber and Joy Terry. Say there, Sing It Again's current phantom voice is really a phantom. For the past two Saturdays, she's mystified everyone Jan Murray's called in his coast-to-coast Sing It Again phone. Tonight, Jan may call you. If you can name the phantom, she's worth $3,000 in cold, hard cash. So stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the rumor gets around that summer has begun, Broadway is beside itself with glee. Somebody notices the sunlight and tells somebody else, and the word gets around. It drifts cross town, and a man reaches into his closet for a hand organ, puts the funny hat on his monkey, and takes a walk up to Broadway. Just to grind out background music for the big grin. It's the time for the dachshund, and the silken ankle, and the flowered print dress. The orange juice is sweeter, the knish is lighter... And a guy runs down the street screaming, I'm in love. It's June. And it was June under the Translux, too. A rare day. And the Times Square crowd had gathered there to consider it and take the story of it home to the little woman, dad and mom. There was a man lying in the circle of their feet. He was expensively dressed. He's dead, Danny. What happened, Muggerman? Ah, come on, come on, you people. Break it up. Come on, get going. What is it with them, Danny? What happened? How can you tell what happened? People milling around, crossing streets, going to lunch, looking at the want ads over there in the Times building. Suddenly a guy's face down on the pavement. Somebody laughs, drunk, and somebody sees blood. 
So we got him on the pavement and them watching. Uh, stamped. Yeah. Know who he is? Uh-huh. Here, wallet. Loads of identification. Yeah. Earl Lawson, Park Avenue. Earl Lawson. Earl Lawson stocks some bonds. He's got a name. Wizard or something. Makes money by the buckets. Anybody see it happen? A million people on Times Square. High noon, nobody saw anything. Nobody. Now, look, you people. Why don't you move along and go home? Get out of here. The safest place in the world to kill somebody, Mugovan, in a crowd. Walk up to him, stab him in the back, keep walking. Well, it started off to be a pretty day. Yeah, real sunny. Just across the street, the file of crowd waiting for the movie that was better than life held on close to its place in line. Held on close against the insinuating whisper of the violent dead. It was a trick, kid. A trick to make you lose your place. To cheat you out of a front row seat where love and beauty and other high-class things are handed you on an air-conditioned platter. But a few were sold by the whisper and were drawn by it and joined the cluster attending the dead man. A woman pushed her way close and turned away. She opened her purse smeared a lipstick nervously across her lips, studied their reflection in a window, and then carefully, carefully retraced them with the perfumed scarlet. And death had raised its banner on Broadway. The home of the murdered man was a place whose sounds had been geared down to the soft purr of wealth. The swish of the ankle-deep carpets, the flute-like trills of the parakeets taking the noonday sun in exclusive cages... The butler who murmurs you into the library and asks you to wait quietly. You don't dare open a book because turning a page would release a clap of thunder. And finally, when you'll wait no longer, the soft voice at your shoulder. I'm glad you made yourself at home, Mr. Clover. This is a difficult house to do that in. It's quiet. You can say that for it. You're... Harlan Lawson. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Oh, then the book's on this shelf. My one literary effort. All 20 copies. 20 copies of the same drivel. New Freedom, Pennsylvania, the utopia that failed. Nice binding, though, wouldn't you say? Quite. Expensive. That's my brother. He's everything you say. He gave me those when I got my Ph.D. Made a grand gesture of binding my doctor's thesis and burying it 20 times over on this shelf. Every time he fingers the gold lettering, I tell him how grateful I am. You don't get along, you and your brother? We suffer each other. Let's put it that way. He has his world. I have mine. And uh, your world would be... The back alleys of poverty. You see, I'm in the nature of a failure, Mr. Clover. I'm a social worker. Doesn't pay very much. But I take in tears and give in exchange baskets of fruit. My brother's castaway clothing. And the gestures of sympathy they taught me in post-grad humanities. But you keep on living here with your brother, with uh, Earl Lawson. I exist here. Is this why you came, Mr. Clover? To run your hands over my brother's library? To probe into me? Or is it... <laughs> no, no. Don't say to me Earl has somehow run afoul of the law. Don't say it, because I wouldn't believe it of Earl. He's dead. He was murdered. Your manner of saying it... You leave me nothing but to believe you. He was stabbed, left lying on the street in Times Square. He must have shuddered that it found him in a place like that. I'd swear he shuddered. Your brother dies and that's how it hits you? To each his own way, Mr. Clover. You're implying that it was I who killed him? Let's play it that way for a while. I've dreamed the wish sometimes, but I couldn't have killed her. I slept the morning through. Earl's butler will testify to that. He was serving me brunch when you came in. Expensive brunch with wine. Who else would want your brother dead? Besides me. That would be your thesis, wouldn't it, Mr. Clover? I suggest the scholars approach... Yeah, thanks. I'll try. Then back to headquarters and to the desk... Get on the phone, make inquiries, send out to the newspapers for files, read them, digest them, extract them. Start a file of your own, label it Earl Lawson Homicide. Fill out the form, date of birth, hour of death. Murder by sharp instrument to be filled out in detail by the coroner. And on the lines on the bottom of the page, the incidental information. Jot down the phrases. 
A self-made man, shrewd financial mind, known enemies, probably many due to financial manipulations. Send out for coffee and a sandwich because it's suddenly nighttime. And read some more. Then your door opens and Sergeant Tataglia is all business. Lady to see you, Danny. What does she want? She knows who killed our Lawson. What? She says Bring she her knows. in. This way to see Danny Clover, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Peggy Drake, Lieutenant. Please sit down. Close the door, Tataglia. All right, all right, you can stay. Miss Drake, the sergeant said you know... Not exactly. Danny, she told me she knew all about it. She said... What's on your mind, Miss Drake? I have the murderer's picture. Here. Here it is. Yeah. How'd you happen to take this picture? Well, I'm here on vacation. This afternoon was a good day to take pictures, and I was at Times Square. I took a lot of pictures, and... Well, this is one of them. You can see for yourself. Yeah. I found a store with six-hour developing service, and I got them developed... I was looking through them, and I saw this one. That's why... Yeah. Come here, Tataglio. Look at this. Ray Brewer. That's right. Ray Brewer sticking a knife into Earl Lawson on Times Square. Call records, Dino. Get the last known address on Ray Brewer. And anything else they've got interesting. I guess I did help with that. I don't know how much. Records. This man here with a knife. His name is Ray Brewer. A known hoodlum. A record of every misdemeanor on the books. Yeah, yeah, I cancel. Wait till my society back back home hears about this. I belong to the literary society. We have open forums. I suppose this will be in the papers, well, I mean, won't it? Else? Front page. Probably. What else is? What else? Yeah. What's happened to him lately? Uh huh. Uh huh. How are you making out, Gino? In a minute, Danny. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 I got all that. We appreciate it and thank you. Very interesting, if I may comment on the material gathered from records. What's interesting? Up until a week ago, Ray Brewer was confined to the county hospital for incurables. Yeah, I remember. He was a pretty sick man. Incurable? His heart. Docs gave him a month to live. But last week, he was discharged from the hospital. How come? To die in the bosom of his family, as the records guy phrased it. Where is this family? 1212 West 16th, the man says. Where are you going, Dan? See that Miss Drake gets home, Gino. I'm going to pick up a killer. Open up, Brewer, or I come in anyway. Brewer? Where are you, Brewer? Huh? <laughs> Out here, Danny. Taking my ease on the fire escape, watching you. Watching you spill out your strength. Throw away the gun, Ray. They tell me you've got a month. If you throw the gun away, maybe you can live a part of it out. All of it. It's arranged. I live all of it. Thirty days, Hathray Brewer. <laughs> if I come out after you, Ray, it'll cut your time down to a half minute. You make me shake with fright. Stay where you are, Danny. I'll bring it to you. The gun, Ray. Now, don't drool, kiddo. You'll get it. Funny... When you rang the doorbell, I thought it was a boy from Milford's, but no, it was you. How come you find me so lightning quick, Danny? A girl, a visitor, got your picture sticking a knife into Lawson. <laughs> I never could learn to be camera shy. Broke a camera in my nose and smiled for all parties. Turn your back to me, Danny. I feel a new smile coming out. Listen to me. You, you don't turn your back, you bleed in the face. Turn... You did that, you brought sunshine into my short life. <laughs> One for the road. <laughs> it splintered through me, puncturing, ripping into the dark cells where pain lay waiting for it. Being released, scurry darted through me, opening endless doors on endless hurt. These new ones took over, finally. Gave up because they'd overdone it. I couldn't feel it anymore. And 
and the hall wind cold on the sweat that had drenched me. And looking for Brewer, knowing he wasn't there. And calling to headquarters and tell them to put out an all-points bulletin on Ray Brewer. And then to Park Avenue to ask a question. Why had Brewer wanted Lawson dead? What had Lawson been to a hoodlum like Brewer? Help me. In my bag. It's in my bag. Help me. You didn't. You didn't. Down the long hall, I could see the parakeets preening, pecking into their clipped wings. The new stillness of the man lying there with a knife in his back. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Dead. The nap of the thick rug furrowed where his hands had tried to tear life out of it. And suddenly the, the flute song of the parakeet started again. And it wasn't still anymore. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The sensational young tenor Mario Lanza will take the place of Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen on CBS while the famous pair are on summer vacation. Mario Lanza starts his new series tomorrow, and you'll be heard each Sunday this summer on most of these same stations. And while Jack Benny is off for Korea, Guy Lombardo and his orchestra will be on hand to entertain you in CBS familiar Jack Benny time. Last year's bride mannequins are dusted off, brought out of Broadway's basements, propped up on a rod and arranged tenderly at the side of last year's groom mannequins. And Broadway knows June is passing through. It presses its nose against the shop window, sighs at the cascade of white satin flowing slowly over the wax figure, sheds a tear at the coronet of cloth lilies of the valley, and blows its nose for the sweetness of it all. It's the time of youth, the two-week romp in the Catskills, the burial in the sand at Far Rockaway, and the breathless ecstasy on the heights of the roller coaster at Coney, For the stay-at-homes, other suites, other delights, the subway ball games, the band concerts in the mall, the moon-burned girls in the dark grass, and the my-hand-in-your-hand talk about two brothers dead of knife wounds. Summertime talk. At headquarters the next morning, it was difficult to talk about anything because Sergeant Tataglia had his mouth full of tacks and his fist full of hammer. Building something, Gino? Oh, it's you, Danny. Yeah, you might say I'm building... I'm building a site for sore eyes. Oh? You mind if I look? Well, my pleasure. Pardon me for obstructing your view. Nice. I think so also. A pin-up picture of Mrs. T hammered to the door of my closet. This I consider a worthy hobby. Mrs. T? I call Mrs. Tartaglia that whenever I'm in a hurry. Mm. <laughs> Consider her, Danny, in her Catalina swimsuit, Jones Beach underneath her, the Tartaglia progeny forming a garland of angels at her feet. Ah, nice family picture, Gino. Uh, you mind taking the tax out of your mouth now? So as I can tell you about Ray Brewer, huh? So as you can do that. Naturally. Uh, permit me to close the closet door on Mrs. T first. I don't want every Tom, Dick, and... <clears throat> well... Nothing on Brewer, Danny. The hoodlum killer is still at large. All points bulletins have been sent. Nothing, huh? Bread and butter, there is something. I forgot. The Milfords, of which the hood spoke to you, is Milford's haberdashery on Madison Avenue. But Roman Curcio traced it down after thousands other Milfords. It seems... I'll check it. Well, don't go away, Danny. I got something else. Another pinup? You might say that. Remember that Peggy Drake came in here with the snapshot of Brewer killing Lawson? What about her? Precinct 12 picked her up last night running down East 60th Street in her, you should excuse the expression, negligee. What? Was someone running after her? The precinct boys asked her the same question. She said no. She said she dared herself to do it, then she took the dare. So the boys decided on a small fine and let her go. A lonely girl in the big city. Sometimes it hits them that way. All right if I leave now? You always leave me, Danny. I'm used to it. Go, Danny. Good 
Certainly, sir. Is someone helping you? I'm looking for Mr. Milford. Mr. Milford is dead. What? Twelve years ago. Like that. Zoot. He was discussing plans with a buyer and... I know. Zoot. Who are you? Uh, Mr. Milford, Jr. May I be of some service? I'm from the police. I want some information. Oh, uh, what is it you want? The police department called you a while ago. You said you had some dealing with a man named Ray Brewer. Oh, uh, yes, I did. I did indeed. You want to tell me about it? I don't see why not. Then tell me. Uh, surely. Last week, Mr. Brewer entered Milford's and was fitted for a complete outfit, from linens to warachas. Warachas? Uh, Bootery a la Mexico. Uh, Mr. Brewer was going to Mexico. Uh, note that I said was. Uh, note that. Mr. Brewer changed his mind, huh? Well, that's a man's right. Mr. Brewer decided to stay around the city. Thus, he cancelled the Mexican clothes and ordered town wear. Uh, gabardines. And he paid you? I only ask because it's been bandied about that Mr. Brewer is not a wealthy man. His uh, friend paid me. The friend who was with him when first he ordered. Oh, this friend? Here, this man's picture in the newspaper? The very one. Dreadful clothes. Not ours. Is he from here in town? What's his name? It says right here, Harlan Lawson. Hmm. Ph.D. It says this chap was murdered. That's right. Do you have any idea why Mr. Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico? None. He was so delighted, too, the, the first time he was in here. Showed me a travel brochure put out by the airplane people. Uh, Central American lines, I think. I, I've been to Mexico, you know. Uh, ridden on a donkey. Thanks, I Junior. Thanks a lot. May I be of service to you, senor? I think so. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Oh, my privilege. Uh, you wish to tour Central America to observe our police methods? Mm -hmm. It can be easily arranged. I will speak to the Latin consul. I, I just want to know about Ray Brewer. Uh, about Brewer? Uh, Brewer. Ah, the name has a familiarity. Uh, see, si, see, si, senor Brewer. The man who wished to live out his days in Mexico, the land of tradition and romance. He's a murderer. Do you think he'll make it? What a dying man sets his heart to do is difficult to restrain him from, senor. Uh, this from my father, I learned. But senor Brewer will not make Mexico by way of Central American lines, senor. Of this, I am certain. Tell me why. Because only yesterday he canceled the ticket. It took me so long to prepare. He canceled the tour I had mapped for him. Acapulco, Zapateca, the floating garden. When Brewer came in here to arrange his trip, was he alone? Uh, with another gentleman who subsidized the excursion. This one? In the newspaper picture? Mm, see, si, see, si, this one. Uh, Dr. Lawson, a gentleman of refinement. Now dead, I perceive. Yeah. Brewer didn't give you an address by any chance. Oh, no, no, no. He simply took the cancellation money, told me he preferred your city. As who would not? You peddle tickets to romantic places and you like it better here. <laughs> who would not? Why pay extra fare, senor? Romance is where you find it. Oh, come in, Margovan. Sit down. Nice. Got anything? Nothing. Guy Brewer's hiding someplace. Where, I can't even begin to guess. Nobody knows anything. Stool pigeons, old friends of Brewer's, not a thing. Uh, if he gets out of the city, it's going to be tough. Yeah. How do you figure it, Danny? Figure what? Well, this, the case, the killing of the Lawson brothers. You know what I mean. You piece it all together, it comes out easy. Show me. Sure. Harlan Lawson wanted to get rid of his brother. For he... money? Well, maybe. But more than that, I think. Earl Lawson was a man who beat up the world. Harlan just stood there and cried for it. Well, Harlan was a social worker, Danny. He probably did a lot of good where it counts. Sure he did. But I met Harlan. It's the way he impressed me, Muggerman. He felt sorry for himself. Uh -huh. So he finds a little hood like Brewer hires him to kill Earl. Like you said. Harlan was a social worker. Brewer was in a charity hospital. That's where they met. Harlan found out Brewer only had a month to live, promised him a fling that month in Mexico for killing Brother Earl. Well, then why did Brewer turn around and kill the hand that fed him, if we go on the assumption that he killed Harlan, too? Well, Brewer killed twice, all right. The knife in Harlan matches the stab wound in Earl. He killed both brothers. But why? I don't know why he killed Harlan. Another thing I don't know is why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. If we mm -hmm. found that out... We... Danny, all I 
can say is, thank goodness. Well, say it and sit down in a corner. Mugovan and I were discussing It's it. about Peggy Drake. Peggy Drake? Say, isn't she the girl? Yeah, the girl who took the snapshot. She should have taken the snapshot and left the city. What? Just a few minutes ago, at five until midnight, to be specific, she had a to-do with a cab driver. Tried to force him to take a wardrobe trunk in his back seat. Broke a window while so forcing. Quite a scene. The police suggested a moving company. And, and... And what? Well, give me a breathing spell, Danny. And Officer Padunik suggested his father-in-law and stood guard over the trunk until his father-in-law, the Murphy Movers, hauled it away. Thank Jeep as this girl leaves for her hometown of New Freedom, PA, in the morning. Where? New Freedom, Danny. The trunk has already left by Murphy Trucking Company, and the girl, Peggy Drake, leaves tomorrow. For which, leaving, the police only again wave the finger under her nose. Highway Patrol, Mugman, pick up that van. Escort it back to Peggy Drake's place. Right there. What do you know? So that's why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. Then I waited. It was a little less than an hour when the phone call came. The highway patrol had picked up the van at the entrance to the Delaware Bridge. There was plenty of time. Time to grab a bowl of chili and walk over to the 60s into the rooming house where Peggy Drake was staying. Inside, the banisters of the staircase had been worn smooth by a thousand respectable hands, and the color had just begun to drain from the flowers and the wallpaper. On the third floor landing was a trunk. Beside it, Detective Mugovan. She's in there, Danny. She know we're here? We talked loud. She knows. Stay with the trunk, Mugovan. Okay. Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. Glad you're here. Come in. Please, come in. What goes on in your town? I don't understand you people. Something wrong, Peggy? There was all that noise a little while ago. I opened my door a bit. I saw my trunk. Explain it to me, Mr. Clover. You were sending it back to New Freedom, huh? Of course, where I live, where I came from. That's where you met Harlan, wasn't it? What's he got to do with it? I need some sleep, Mr. Clover. My bus leaves early tomorrow. You're not leaving. You want to bring your trunk back in here and unpack? I'm not leaving. Wait a minute. Margovan, bring that trunk in here. What are you doing? I don't have to unpack. It's pretty heavy, Danny. I'll need some help. Okay. I'll give you a hand. Yeah. You better grab the handle on the other side. Here. Okay, Danny? Uh-huh. Wait outside. Yeah. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. How long did you plan to stay in New York, Peggy? Four days. And you needed a trunk that big for a four-day trip? That's a brand-new trunk, Peggy. Yes, I just bought it. It's for things I want to take home. Books, lamps. Books, huh? I like books. Let's see what you bought. Don't open that. Don't. Why not, Peggy? Leave me alone. What's the girl have to do? I come here for a good time. I'd say you had quite a busy trip. Running down the street at night in a negligee. <laughs> I had something to drink. I didn't know what I was doing. Then creating a stir with his trunk with a cab driver? It wasn't my fault. People here aren't helpful. They're... Peggy, we're looking for a man, Ray Brewer. We want him for two murders. Brewer? You know him, Peggy. You took his picture, brought it to me. Well, that's, yeah, that's right. I remember his name. I'm sure you do. Let's open the trunk, Peggy. No. Don't. Get it out of here. Take it away. Later. You took the picture, Peggy, because you knew the murder was going to be committed. The murder you planned so well with Harlan. Get it out of here. Just get it out of here. Gave us a picture of the murderer. You figured by the time we found who he was, traced him, he'd be roaming around Mexico. And by the time we got to him, he'd be dead. Because Ray Brewer only had a month to live. I didn't do anything. I didn't kill anybody. It was Harlan. One thing is bothering me, Peggy. Why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. He saw me taking his picture. We didn't tell him we were going to do that. You double-crossed him, huh? That's why he killed Harlan. That's why he was going to kill you. I ran from him. It's like a nightmare. Somebody grabbed me by the shoulders and choked me. And I was in the middle of the street. Dressed. Dressed. When you finally got back here, Ray Brewer was dead. He didn't live his month. His heart gave out. Let's open the trunk, baby. There he is, Ray Brewer. I won't look. I'm not going to look at him again. All the while I was putting him in there, staring at me, staring. And I couldn't get the trunk closed. 
his hand. I was alone, all alone. His face staring at me. <laughs> Dawn touches Broadway now. The remnants of the night are driven back into the earth. You walk the streets, and from behind a doorway, you hear the old sound, the, the sound of weeping. You know the nighttime will never leave. It's found its refuge. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway is My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Totaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Peggy Weber was heard as Peggy Drake, Ted Osborne as Harlan Lawson, Anthony Barrett as Ray Brewer, and Don Diamond as Milford. For a full hour of outstanding musical entertainment, plus one of radio's biggest cash awards, play Sing It Again every week over most of these same CBS stations. Laugh along, win along with Jan Murray as he picks up his coast-to-coast -coast telephone and invites you to sing it again and land a big batch of loot. It's exciting. It's outstanding radio entertainment. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde, Sundays on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The summer evening flows gently over Broadway, and the carousel sounds of the street's carnival begin. The brazen trumpet screams, calling the believers to the basement sanctuaries at a dime of prayer. The barkers of the night shout their spiels into passing ears, and the rustle of perfumed silk rides the June wind. You're shoved and pushed and mauled, and there's no bitterness because the taste of night melts in your mouth. You ride the rides, walk the midway, toss the hoop to win the cupid. You try not to notice the plucking at your sleeve. But finally you turn. Your palm is crossed with violence. You hold on to it until the man in the tweed jacket and the gray flannel slacks takes it away from you. Gives death back to the other man, its owner. Sprawled across the silk sheets of his bed, the blood from his bullet wound draining the sleep out of him. And because blood like that can stain the reputation of an exclusive apartment hotel, the man in tweed makes a suggestion. I offer it in all modesty, Mr. Clover, a mere suggestion. This can be... can be... What, Mr. Tracy? What can it be? Handled discreetly, of course. You can do that. You have the power, the know-how. Keep it out of the papers. Treat the frightful mess with velvet gloves. Anything else? I... nothing more I can think of at the moment. Not that I can bring to mind at the snap of your fingers. That's good. Now you can do something for me. Understand me, Mr. Clover. Managing this place is all-consuming. I spent years at school, here and abroad, learning the quirks, the ins and outs of the profession, the very... All that education. Maybe you can spell out for me the murdered man's name. Did I forget to introduce you? Pity. The fellow over there on our bed was once Frank Dunn, a bartender, of all things. 
A rather crude chap, I thought. A but sort genteel of... enough to pay the tab in this slick joint of yours. Well, they do bartenders like Dunn well at the trade winds, I hear. The club on West 52nd? I wouldn't know where the place was. Do you mind? Tell me more about Dunn. Well, he appealed to the female of the species, shall we say. They called on him constantly, at all hours. Tonight? Difficult to say. But do you not detect the faint odor of a lingering perfume? The aura a woman leaves? Pardon, I'll rid us of that. Never mind, I'll get it. Hello? Hello? Frank? Would you put Frank on the line, please? Uh, Frank just stepped out. Could I give him a message? Who are you? Why do you answer for Frank? I know he's there. Does he not wish to speak with me? Who is this? Who shall I say is calling? No. No, there is something. This is not the way Frank would have it with me. Hello. Hello. Yes, please? This is the police operator. Trace that call. And the call was traced. Drug store on 43rd and Broadway. A phone booth there. The third one from the left as you pass the Chiron reducing display. Only who knows who's been using the phone, the clerk in the white coat asked me. You don't have to have friends in Washington to use the phone, mister. You need a dime, that's all. Anyway, what was she, a spy or something? So if that's all, he had work to do. He left. So did I. It was a short walk up to 52nd Street and the nightclub that's known as the Trade Winds. Outside, a beach boy in a custom-made loincloth said aloha and pointed inside. And inside, a beach girl said aloha and offered her nose to be rubbed, which came with a cover charge, the price of admission to tropical paradise. And it was, even to the tropical birds playing tropical games and singing their sad songs in huge cages of gilded bamboo. And sitting in a fan-shaped wicker chair in the corner was Trader Milt Barker, wearing yellowed linen, his eyes bleary with the grandeur of it all. Until he saw me. Hey, damn it. Grab yourself a wicker and take a load off. Yeah. What a place you have here, Mel. Wait till you see the floor show, Danny. Got a dame here that does a routine on a bed of hot coals. Melt, I... Uh... You uh, try the authentic cuisine yet? You like fish? I got cold huma huma nuka nuka apawa. That would set you crazy. Yeah. You sit still. I'll slice you some from the middle. Sit down, Milt. Huh? All right. So I'm sitting. I'm sitting, so... About a bartender here, Frank Dunn. Frank Lee ain't showed up yet tonight. He commits something? He's been murdered. Kismet. Pure kismet. Fate, Danny. The way the department figures, it took a murderer to do it. Yeah, I guess. How'd he go out? Shot. Like I say, kismet. What are you talking about? A guy like Frank, it figures. It just don't make me surprised. Come on, Mill, talk to me. What's on your mind? Well, he served smiles with the tall, cool ones. When Frank wiped the bar in front of a female patronesses, it had a meaning all its own. Personality. Keep talking. Well, Danny, a guy like him. Well, uh, Dame would be embarrassed leaving less than a fin or a phone number for a tip. Did he cause any trouble here? Frank? No. An operator with a head on him. Wait until the male escort was occupied elsewhere, then. <laughs> well, Frank would drop a small onion in a cocktail glass in such a way that patronesses would leave teeth marks on the bar. Uh, like, for instance... Well, well, for instance, uh, who? Uh, Louise Hathaway is current, Danny. You know, the dame who is Mrs. to Edward Hathaway, the guy who manufactures hardware. You know Hathaway's hardware, nails, home. Yeah, well, tell me more about Mrs. Hathaway. She's current. That's all I know, honest. Come on, Danny. Eat some of my cuisine. I'll make you a regular lava lava. And so, as the surprise pink spotlight dimmed slowly over Trader Milt's paradise, I heaved a sigh for the regular lava lava that would never touch my lips and bid a fond farewell to the land of the Huma Huma Kuka Nuka Apawa.
at the Park Avenue apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Edward Hathaway. A maid in gray silk and high spiked heels told me they were out for the evening. She tightened a black shoulder strap to inform me that the Hathaways never informed a person in what glamorous places they were boozing it up, that this usually took till dawn. I said I'd come back in the morning. She said sometimes a person didn't know what side his evening was buttered on and kicked the door shut with her heel. I guess I didn't wait the polite and proper interval after dawn because the girl who opened the door to me this time was still yawning. (sighs) Another thing, the long night had left no scar on her kind of beauty. Can it wait? Whatever you want, can it wait? You're Louise Hathaway? Uh Uh-huh. Sleepy Louise. Tired Louise. If you weren't a stranger, you could rock me back to sleep. I need it so. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Oh, you're the one Celeste told me about. Celeste the maid. What do you think of her? She thought much of you. (laughs) Come on in. Tell me about it. Celeste's in bed. I let her stay because we dragged her out of it when we came in. Couldn't find the keys. You know how it is. But I'll drag her out again to whip up some eggs for us, if you like. No, thanks. Big night last night, huh? Ah, the biggest. You build a lovely city here, officer. Lovely and fair. And at night, it glistens. Frank Dunn, was he a part of the night? You just played the only sad note there is, officer. Frank wasn't in it. Not anywhere. Why do you play a sad note like that to me? Because he's dead. Murdered. I don't think I'd ever let you rock me to sleep. You're cruel. Frank, what about him? I wouldn't know about him, wise man. Once it got bad and I tried to... Frank winked, grinned, splashed whiskey on my dress. That's all, huh? Just a clumsy bartender. So much more you'll never know. Once I was at the trade winds having dinner with hubby mine, and there was a phone call for me, and I took it, and it was Frank calling me from the bar. And hubby mine didn't know why I suddenly turned happy. He had sense enough not to ask. Your husband knows how you felt about Frank? I don't know. I don't care. I always made him tip Frank a lot of money, take him with us after he was through work. (laughs) Well, it's going to be cheaper for hubby mine with Frank gone. For me, for me, such a high price, I don't mind telling you. Will you wake your husband, Mrs. Hathaway? I want to talk to him. (laughs) He's awake. You can talk to him at his factory. Hathaway's Hardware Incorporated. Always the first man there. Sleeps an hour after I've kept him up the night. And off to the factory. Off to make a bed of nails for me. Off to... Just stay here in case we want you, Mrs. Hathaway. So you can talk more to me about Frank? It would be a pleasure. Deep and fair. A pleasure. Any time. That'll be all, Miss Garvey. All right, sir. Who are you? I gave my name at the gate, Danny Clover. From the police, aren't you? That's right. What's on your mind? I just came from your house, Mr. Hathaway. My house? What's the big idea? What did you want there? I had a chat with your wife. My wife? You don't go to my house, policeman. No more. You understand that? You don't bother Louise. You want something? You got a ticket to sell? You got something that gives you worry? You come to me. Louise, don't get bothered by police. She gets bothered, Hathaway, any time the department feels the need. Yeah, you think so, huh? You get bothered, too, mister. Go ahead. Call your lawyer. Say murder to him, because that's what you and your wife are involved in. Murder? Call your lawyer, Hathaway. Look, now... The death of Frank Dunn, bartender, at the hands of person or persons unknown. Your hands, your wife's hands, both... I thought you were kidding. I'm not kidding. Louise is a kid. I got a young wife, Clover. Wild sometimes. Country kid come to the city wild. And not excusing her, understand? I like to watch it. She knew Frank Dunn. So she knew Frank Dunn. So I know Frank Dunn. A thousand people know Frank Dunn. She didn't kill him. Why should she kill him? What could he do for her? Give her a double martini? A couple of those go a long way. Look, Frank Dunn was a joke. Passed over the bar to Louise. Louise is married. So that settles that. All right. Who killed Frank Dunn? I'll tell you this. If he would have put a finger on Louise, I'd have killed him. One finger on Louise. I've told her that time and time again. 
And she and Lily think Who? it's... Lily. They think it's smart. They got to have cocktails at five. They go in by themselves. Who's Lily? Lily. Lily Prokosh, a dopey dame who writes poetry, wears glasses that goes like this. Lily Prokosh. Prokosh? Foreign? Yeah. Talks accent talk. Where do I find her? Lily. Sometimes I pick up Louise at Lily's place in the village hotel. Yeah. I know where it is. Good. Maybe you're onto something, Clover, huh? Billy? It was painful. I opened my eyes and the knife was in me. Here. I say, open your eyes, Lily. It is still the dream. I can't feel my body. I can't move. Lie here. Look at the Operator, get me in the house, body. doctor, quick. Help me. Help me. Wait a minute, operator. Never mind, operator. You're listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. This combination is your open sesame to Sunday night musical delight. CBS Guy Lombardo time, featuring the sweetest music this side of heaven. And the Mario Lanza Show. Enjoy Guy Lombardo's music. Enjoy vocals, old and new, by Mario Lanza. Mario, singing sensation, called both the new Caruso and the hottest singer in a decade, may be heard Sunday nights on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> The nice thing about Broadway, the good thing, the reason why you run the rest of the way until you get there, is that Broadway never lets you down. It's all things to everybody. For the gourmet, the foot-long wiener with a seated roll. For the musically inclined, the rosette of loudspeakers over the slightly used record shop. For the art lover, the windy corner. And for those who just like to walk and be amazed, there are people who will be amazed right back at you. Walk it or wait it out. The day's 24 hours long, kid. Take that dream along. It'll happen to you, one way or another. But where I was going, there was no dream. Only the reality of a girl lying there frail against the decor of plump upholstery. The expensive drapes, the built-in silences. The lifeless girl, the stabbed-to-death girl. And talk to a man about it. The practice talk over the telephone. Because a policeman speaks of death by formula. Apartment 612, huh? Yeah, I got it, Danny. The door to the suite was open when I got here. The girl's name is Lily Prokosh. Okay. The one who called Frank Dunn when I was in Frank's apartment. I'm pretty sure that, Gino. Anyhow, coroner, lab boys, the works. I'll talk to you later, Gino. Lily? Lily, it's me. Lily. Oh. Oh, I, I, I didn't... Come on in. Oh, that's all right. I, I can come back later. I'm from the police. Come on in. Come on, come on. Who are you? Police? Why, I... Lily! What? What happened to you, Lily? What did they do to you? Are you somebody to her husband or brother? I I live across the hall. I... It's the first time I've ever seen her this close. The first time I've ever knocked on her door. I had a little speech. I was going to tell her what my name is. What do you know about her? I listen for her every day. Yesterday, when she came in, I What time was that? that? About 6 p.m. Did she go out again? No. I, I know because I spent all that time making up my mind to knock on the door and tell her I was a neighbor and what my name was. And that's all you can tell me about her? Yes. Lily? Lily, listen to me. My name is Harry. Harry Lynn.
Tartaglia. Tartaglia. Huh? Oh, oh, it's you, Danny. The way I was standing here in the corner daydreaming, I'm not surprised I did not hear you come in. Dreaming? Yeah. Uh, huh? Because of the talent I discovered only last night in our little six-year-old girl, Aida. Oh, tell me about the talent. Oh, Danny, the way my little Aida plays the piano. Mm. Hmm, plays good, huh? Well, not only good, Danny, but she plays the piano underhand. What? And by ear. By ear. Gino. Yeah, Danny. Did you run down that stuff I asked for on the phone? Goes without saying. What'd you Danny, get? Danny, uh, this is the only comment? It's not important. What did you get, Gino? <clears throat> yeah. Well, Lily Prokash, a writer of things that rhyme, gathered material nightly for her rhymes in the trade winds at the bar stool facing the station of the also deceased bartender, Frank Dunn. Hmm. In the daytime, escorted said Frank Dunn to literary teas. Last night, came home at six, an hour after the established time of Frank Dunn's murder. Nothing else? Only that the knife handle was wiped clean. I kept after the boys, Danny, but that's all they could dig up. Yeah. Underhand, huh? Yeah, Danny. Ah, you should see little Aida. I'd like to. I really would. Be sure to invite me sometime, you know? I see the wicker chair is still open, Milt. Danny. Sit in it, kid. Two nights, I see you each time. To what is due this sudden harvest to Danny Clover? Not that the trade wind ain't humored. But to what is due? You know a girl named uh, Lily Prokosh? Well, names don't register with me, Danny. I'll ask for a reason. Is there a reason? A tall girl, blonde, harlequin glasses. Spoke with a little bit of an accent. The one who wrote lousy sonnets on my napkin? Yes, she was a poet. The one who always comes in here with Mrs. Hathaway? That one, Danny. Well, what about her? You tell me. Lily Prokosh and Frank Dunn. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, what? The other day. What are you talking about? The other day. Uh, yesterday. The day Frank met his kismet. She was in here with Mrs. Hathaway about 5.30. Asked for Frank. I told her he wasn't to work yet. I started to tell her where Frank lived, but she said, never mind. She already knew. Left. And then what? Then what? Is she left. Left Mrs. Hathaway with a martini at half-mast. The poet walked out. To see Frank? Yeah, yeah. She bumped Frank, huh? A doll like her. What do you know? And then start all over again, back to the room where I'd first seen Frank Dunn with his blood on the monogrammed sheets. Back to the room where this particular set of violence had begun to shape itself. And touch once more the things that had belonged to a man who had been well-loved. The gold money clip with his initials written in chipped emerald, the gold cigarette case, the gold keychain, the silk robe that hung in the scented closet. And on none of these things, the mark of an identity, the whisper of a killer's name. And all of it with the man in tweed at your elbow, commenting, snickering, fingering the imagined price tag. Hmm. This little trinket must have cost one of them a good deal of her rainy day savings. Put it down. Dead, don't touch. Is that it, Mr. Clover? Exactly that. There's an etiquette about these things, hmm? I've been wondering, Mr. Clover. My brow is furrowed with wonder. I noticed... Hardly touches me, though. Sorry, Tracy. I've been wondering why you asked me to partake with you of this, what shall I say, this chamber of horrors. Because you're a liar, Mr. Tracy. And I indulge myself on the proper occasion. What was the occasion of my doing it to you? Yesterday, when you showed me Frank Dunn. Oh, oh, that. You mean when I didn't reveal to you who had been visiting the bartender at his siesta before death? Now's a good time for revealing. Sorry, but it's slipped my mind. There's nothing the police can do about a mind like mine. Is there, Mr. Clover? Correction, there is. Who was here, Tracy? Who was here? Else you'll beat me. You hardly make it worthwhile defending a dead woman's honor. Who? That foreign thing, with the wind in her hair and the mist on her eyeglasses. Lily Prokosh? I've heard her announce herself that strange way on the house phone. She stayed long enough with the bartender to read him her newest poem... But they had an interruption. You can reveal that, too. It'll cost me a dear little savings plan I had in mind. 
The interruption. Who was it? Lovely, frolicsome thing. Never been here before. Knocked on the bartender's door, was waved away, it seems. Tapped on my office door. Asked if I had a deck of cards. Wanted to play away love's bitterness. Sympathized? Played against her? Won forty cents. Would have won more, only... Only what? In the midst of a deal, I had a call from the bartender ordering me to whisk the Prokash thing away by freight elevator. I did. When I got back, my card-playing lady was gone. You won 40 cents from her? That ought to make a girl like that unforgettable. Ever seen Louise Hathaway, Mr. Clover? I have, in society columns. And that evening, she played cards with me. She's precisely what you say. Unforgettable. And walk the night streets and try to figure why did Louise Hathaway call on Frank Dunn and not being able to see him content herself with playing cards with a hotel manager? Why had she gone to see Frank? She knew her friend Lily Prokosh was there. A lot of whys. And keep on walking east from Broadway to Park and up to the 70s and stop in front of the Canopy apartment house. Pause, smoke a cigarette, then go in. And on the second floor, ring a bell. What do you want? Hello, Mr. Hathaway. I told you before... Let's go inside. You can tell me all over again. Thanks. Who is it, Edward? That cop. Yeah, me. Oh, hi. See, Mr. Clover, I stayed as put as put can be. I'm glad you did. That'll make it easier. What are you two talking about? Oh, we've got secrets, Edward. Yeah. About Frank Dunn. Oh, Danny, Edward knows all about that. Look, Louise and I were playing chess. Chess, huh? You know a lot of games, don't you, Louise? All the ones that are fun. Did you have fun losing 40 cents yesterday to that hotel manager? What's he talking about? What am I talking about, Miss Hathaway? <laughs> Louise. Stop it. <laughs> Darling, listen to me. Let me handle this. Take your hands off me, Edward. Louise. You knew Lily was with Frank Dunn. Why did you go there, Mrs. Hathaway? Why? That's right. Lily was my friend. I didn't want to see her get in any trouble. I told you to let me handle it, Louise. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> you see, like I told you, Mr. Clover, she's wild. Louise, you're in a little trouble now. Let me handle Take it. Take your hands off me. Can't you understand? Take your hands off me. Oh, I'm sorry. I lost my temper. I didn't mean to slap you. Hardware man, fat man, bald man, nothing man. Jump. Jump, Edward. Louise, don't make me lose my temper again. Why don't you jump for the man, Edward? You do everything else I want you to do. Tell the man what you did for me, Edward. Oh, crazy. What are you talking about? About murder. About murder, Edward. You once told me something, Mr. Hathaway. You said you'd kill anybody who laid a finger on your wife. Yes, he told me, too, over and over again. That's why you always followed me, Edward. That's why you followed me to Frank Dunn's apartment house that night. Shut up, shut up! <laughs> and Frank wouldn't even look at me. He sent me away, Edward. And you killed him all because I spent an hour playing cards with a hotel manager. I was never with Frank, Edward. Never. But you killed him for me. <laughs> Go ahead. Jump for the man. I followed you. I always follow you. I couldn't stand that you're going to see that man. Take the hardware man away, Mr. Clover. You too. What? For killing Lily. You couldn't have Frank. Lily was luckier. So you killed Lily. Oh, no, Edward did that for me, too. Didn't you, Edward? Didn't you, Edward? No, I didn't. I followed you to Lily. Her door was open, wasn't it? I saw Lily after what you did to her. Oh, you don't know what you're saying, Edward. Listen to me. You love me, Edward. I'm going to have to sign a confession, Louise. What I just said about following you to Lily's, I don't have to admit that. Sign my name to it, I could deny I ever said it. I don't know whether I will or not. I'll have to think about it. I love you. Honestly. Truly, Edward, I love you. Jump, Louise. Jump. Jump.
Broadway's quiet now. It's the four o'clock in the morning hour, the hour without color. But in a while, dawn will dip down, and there'll be fury again, and roar again, and crowd. The restless wandering, the puppet dance, the running after nothing at all. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Louise, Herb Butterfield as Edward, Joe Granby as Milt Barker, Edgar Barrier as Neil Tracy, and Gladys Holland as Lily Prokosh. Just once around the clock aboard the second hand for Singing Again, an hour of comedy, music, and cash for the CBS listener who can identify the phantom voice. Jan Murray is your host, Judy Lynn, Allendale, the Riddlers, and Ray Block supply the music. Stay tuned now for Singing Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We delay the start of our scheduled program to bring you a bulletin from CBS News. Washington. The State Department has issued a statement in response to the proposal by Jacob Malik, the Soviet delegate to the United Nations, for a ceasefire in Korea. The State Department said that if Malik's proposal is more than propaganda, adequate means for discussion and end to the conflict are available. The State Department said we are ready to play our part. This bulletin has come to you from CBS News. We now resume our regular program. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The nighttime starts at the river before it closes over Broadway. A wind drifts in with the moistened shadows, flings them into the street, flattens them against the gutter, picks a man waiting for a bus and wraps darkness around him. And a light comes on, and another. And down the street there where the crowd is gathered against the traffic signal, high above them a neon sputters, flames. The spectaculars dance. Somebody runs into the street and yells, Come on! And everybody does. Night has come to Broadway. And where I was, there was a wind. The built-in wind, a thing composed of poor ventilation, tears, shed and unshed, and bottled chemicals. It was the basic ingredient of the city morgue, though not to be found on blueprints or bills of specifications. It was something new to the man walking beside me. This place? This place? Just take it easy, Mr. Larson. I'll tell you something. I guess it'll sound funny. I've read about places like this, and I've closed my mind to what I read. I guess I never wanted to visualize anything. Right here, Mr. Larson. What was your daughter wearing? Mrs. Larson wrote it down for me. Hmm. You see, I, I wasn't home when our daughter, when Ruth went to the movies, so Mrs. Larson... Ruth was wearing a skirt and blouse, pink bobby socks and saddle shoes. I guess you want to know this, too. She was five feet one. She was 14 in May. She had brown hair and brown eyes. And I, I want you to know, Mr. Clover, I, I guess all fathers feel the same way. My Ruth was... Well, our friend said she was a remarkable child. She's going... We're going to send it to... Under that sheet. This girl was found in a vacant lot between your home and the theater your wife mentioned when she called. How... I mean... Look, you, you know what Beaten, I... Beaten. Fractured skull. 
I have to lug, don't I? Yes. If it's your daughter. Ruth's a nice girl. She started to go to parties with boys, and she always gets home by 11 o'clock. She, she's going to be a dancer. When people come to the house, she dances for them. Mr. Larson. You see, as I, as I told you before, Ruth... Ruthie? Oh, Ruthie. Who did it? What monster? Who did it to you? Who? Who? And the fury took over. The man trembling with it, shivering with it, scurried from wall to wall, enraged at the wound, the death of his child had clawed across his heart, torn inside his throat. The helpless, futile rage of the animal whose small range of understanding has been kicked, beaten, thrown against the barbed wall of violence. <laughs> not once, not once more did he look at his child. Now try only to wipe out the memory, try to strangle the long-ago laughter and sobs that the child had let echo through it. And finally, the collapse, the heap on the concrete floor. You call quietly to the officer on duty to help you lift the man, carry him to a place where he can sleep away the fury of his dead. Then back to your office and close the door on it. You stand at the window, watching the squalls of the nighttime wash against it, beat against it, and then stare at the walls, and then hear the door open for it to let it all in again. Danny? Danny? What do you want? Well, Dr. Sinsky's report. He was busy on another. He asked me to bring it to you, so... Leave it on my desk. All right. You're not going to look at it, Danny? Why? I know what's in it. Well, I thought I did, too, till I glanced it over on the way to your office. You better take a look at it. You're so eager. I don't want to spoil it for you. Tell me about it, Muggerman. Danny. You tell me, I'm Muggerman. We've had other kids who... And this one's no different. That all, Muggerman? That's what I've been trying to tell you. This one is different. Just what you saw when you first found her. That's what's in the report. Beaten, skull fractured with the butt of a gun. Nothing else. Then give me a motive. Give me another motive why a 14-year-old child should... Glover speaking. Sergeant Tartaglia at this end. Homicide, Danny. Woman in backyard of house at 1845 West 11. People named Murray. Upstairs wants you on it. Shall I tell him you're agreeable, Danny? Tell him I'm... Bring me a motive, Muggerman. Upstairs wants me to run an errand. She's over here, Mr. Clover. Right here. Dead. Beaten. I'd say her skull had been fractured, Mr. Murray. Oh, I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Tell me what happened. We were sitting in the library. A knock came on the back door. I wanted to answer it, but Beatrice said I looked so comfortable. She... There was just you two in the library. You and your wife. And sis. Sis? My sister, Claudia. She can't hear anything. She's deaf. She never goes out of the house. I take care of her. Well, who's in the house with her now? Who's playing that organ? Oh, uh, sis plays. I see. Go ahead. Well, there was this knock on the door, and Beatrice went to the door, and I, I, I heard her talking to someone. At least I think I did. I want you to know I'm not sure about that. I kept reading, that's all, and sis was practicing. Didn't your wife scream? Didn't you hear any... No, 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 I didn't. I, I happened to look up my book a little later... After she went to the back door. How much later? Well, I don't know. I looked up and she still wasn't there. She... she hadn't come back yet from answering that knock on the door. That's right. So I went out back. The back door was still open, but there wasn't anybody there. I called to her. And then I, I started toward the alley and I... I stumbled. I, I stumbled over Beatrice lying... Then what did you do? Well, I... I called the police, and then I told Sis what had happened. You speak sign language. Yes, I, I learned it when I was very young so that I could speak with Sis. She's been with me all the time. Yeah. How long have you been married? Fourteen years. Why, what's that got to do? Happily? Of course, happily. 
Do you have any children? No. No, that's something Beatrice and I agreed on. Sis needs taking care of, and Beatrice is always so busy. Busy? Busy doing what? Clubs and auxiliaries, you know. She was well-liked, got things done. She was admired and well-liked. Then who would want to kill her? Nobody would want to kill Beatrice. Nobody. Mr. Murray. She was a middle-aged woman, Mr. Clover. Everybody she knew was her friend. She did charity work. People came with troubles. Anybody. She'd help them. Why would anybody want to kill her? What motive would he have? What motive, Mr. Clover? It was there again. What motive? A 14-year-old girl, the loved child of a quiet, nameless family, until a killer had taken the butt end of a gun, beaten their name and their dead child's name into the newspapers that choked the trash bins supplied for the purpose by the Department of Sanitation. What motive for that? And for Mrs. Beatrice Murray, admired, liked, charitable, a woman to whom the trouble came, a childless woman who sat in the evening and sewed together the patchwork of her day while her husband read and his sister released the music she couldn't hear. What motive for that brutal death? And because you find no answer, share it with Dr. Sinsky. Ask the question of him, burden the gentle doctor with it. You put me a question, Danny, that is not strictly in my department or in my education. Mind if I bum another cigarette? Oh, here. Help yourself. Thanks. You've been with us a long time, Doctor. Some of it must have rubbed off. Danny, I deal only in known quantities. You boys bring me the wounds you find, I wash them, bandage them. You bring me the dead, I perform autopsies. Known quantities, Danny. Like I know, like I know my name, your name, that this Mrs. Murray was murdered by the butt of the same gun that hammered away the life of the child, Ruth. Why? Tell me why. And I'll go out and buy my own pack of cigarettes. If I had gold, you could have it, Danny. No strings to it. No. For the question you ask, go consult a specialist. A man who puts the microscope of his training to the emotions. The department psychiatrist? Yes, to him. Perhaps he will agree with me. And I'm only an amateur, a dabbler, mind you, Danny, that this violence, this ugly bestial violence, has been committed by what is called a paranoid. Uh, I've read about them. Had them screaming in my office. They dream up hates against themselves. They... For this they kill. An animal, a child, a woman. Excuse me, Danny. Come in, please. Uh, looking for me, Gino? Yeah, Danny. Fresh homicide. Alley on West 10th. Buckman's got a squad call. Let me finish my cigarette, Tartaglio. Well, sure, Danny. Well, sure, if you want. <sighs> it's finished. Yeah. Put your flash on it. Hold it. Hold it right there. Where's that music coming from? Uh, apartment upstairs. Eh? Danny? The back of her head, it's... Uh-huh. Keep your flash still. We've seen it two times already. In a short space. This makes three. It made three. The woman staring into the beam of the flashlight Mugman held close to her face... Staring in the final disbelief that this had happened to her in this place, in this time. She lay in awkwardness, her dress disarranged. Her hand where it had frozen, trying to straighten the wisp of blood-clotted hair under her black straw hat. The alley wind found the white lace at her throat, riffled it. And the murdered woman made three. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The Peggy Lee Show bowed in over most of these same CBS stations last Sunday night. Folks who heard it will be back tomorrow for more of Peggy's charm, Peggy's vocals, Peggy's previews of coming popular musical events. Enjoy the Peggy Lee Show for light-hearted summer listening at the Star's Address. <laughs> The night music of summer spills into Broadway from the scarred throats of the loudspeakers hanging over the record shops. And this summer's kids, in the off-the-shoulder cottons and the transparent California sports shirts, squeeze each other into the doorways and lap it up. And then someone shrills a new diversion in a new shop window on a new corner, and Broadway's youth rebops on down to it. 
It's an old ceremony on Broadway, this dancing in the streets and the sweating barker with a fistful of passes to happy upstairs lands. Just the price of the amusement tax, kid. That's old, too. The girl in the swimsuit lying on the billboard beach, never aging, but old. And the touch of summer's night on your eyelids, that's familiar, too. It's all happened to you before. And where I was, where Mugovan was, it had happened before, too. To a 14-year-old girl named Ruth. To Mrs. Beatrice Murray. And now to the woman lying dead in an alley, not feeling the touch of the man who at first timidly and then, with effort, twisted the purse out of her hand. She was holding on to it so tight, Danny. Open it. So tight. Yeah. Killed the same way as the other two, wouldn't you say, Danny? Uh Uh-huh. Maybe our fair city's being honored with a mad killer, huh? Maybe. A sick man with a grudge against women, even if they're a kid. Looks like it. How long does it take to go through the purse, Mugovan? Just sorting the unnecessary stuff, Danny. Tissues, compact, change purse, bobby pins. There's a cell slip for... Let's see. You, you, hold a flash a minute, Danny. Yeah. Uh, for chinaware. A tortoiseshell comb with silver edging. That's all? No identification? Well, I haven't tried this inside flap yet, Danny. Yeah, here it is. Uh, new social security card made out to... Uh, hold it again. Mm. Alma Russell, 4212 6th Avenue. That's around 8th Street, Danny. Well, maybe she was on her way home, took this alley. It cuts through to 6th. Mm-hmm. Killer knew she took it sometimes, waited for her here, slugged her, made sure she was dead. Got a confession, Danny. It puzzles me. You alone in the world? The three of them dead. That girl, that woman with her husband, and the sister who plays the organ. Now this one. I could understand it if... If the... what? There wasn't a mark on him, Danny, other than the beating from the gun, but not a mark. And this girl's young. About 25, I'd say. Pretty, neat, clean. I bet she was attractive, sweet. What are you building, Mugman? Well, we've had them before, Danny. The guys who wait in alleys go to moving picture houses, talk to little girls, then the vacant lot. This kind we've had before. And in a way, I could understand it. But the killer who... You said he was sick. Dr. Sinsky called him a paranoid. Whatever they call him, it scares me sick. I got a niece lives three blocks from me with my brother. She's... Funny. You're trying to talk about her like the girl's father did. Um... Go call the morgue, McGovern. Danny, the thought that it could happen... Go call them. I'll wait for you. And in a little while, the young woman who had hugged death in an alley was attended to by gentle people which is the miracle of violent death in a great city. The intern, the stranger in the white jacket, knelt beside her, shook his head, and thought a thought that included both of them. And an ambulance driver looked at her and bit his lip when he put her on the stretcher. Then the alley was no longer remarkable. It resolved back unto itself. A play of refuse, mewings, and the shortcut home. It was the end of something or another. For me, it was the end of the day, home now in bed. Adjust the mind not to dream. This can be done by a policeman assigned to homicide. Sleep the night through and wake and have the coffee and read the paper and get to work. Go now to the address on 10th Street because a girl named Alma Russell once lived there. Ring the bell. Adjust your mind again to the fact that you're going to talk about the murder of a young woman at 8.30 in the morning. You from the police? Yes, I am. Well, come in. In here. The kitchen. Sit down. Thanks. What's your name? Danny Clover. Mine's Perdon. Ethel Perdon. I'm mine host to the borders. Had your coffee yet, Danny? Uh Uh-huh. Me too. You won't mind if I try making up this face of mine, do you? I say making up because that's the phrase that's used. How is it that you're expecting the police, Mrs. Perdon? Well, I read the morning papers, don't I? Alma got killed, didn't she? She lived here, didn't she? So, who should I expect? Humphrey Bogart? Yeah. How does the lipstick look, Danny? Kissable or otherwise? Uh, Otherwise, huh? Look, Mrs. Perdon, I want you to tell me everything you can about Alma Russell. Sure, sure. 
Uh, can you reach that mascara, Danny? Hmm? Yeah, right there on the shelf, see? Thanks. About Alma? A maid. Clean, sweeps, dusts. A buck an hour. Who'd she work for? Well, she never said. Quit a job a couple of weeks ago. I think she got another one just the other day. Well, I guess that's the best I can do with my facial equipment. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Ah. What else about her? Well, I don't know what else. She paid board, kept to herself, was no trouble, didn't talk, except a how do you do and a very well thank you. Nice table manners, broke her bread and never left much crumbs. Nice girl. What about boyfriends? None here in my establishment, all ladies. What happens in the street, I wouldn't know. Uh, help me with my coat, will you, Danny? You going someplace? Well, sure I am. I want to look at Alma's room. First landing, door on your right. You want to talk to me soon again, Danny? Maybe, after I look at Alma's room. I'll be easy to find. Your place, your morgue. I'm going down and cry for Alma Russell. Somebody's got to cry for her. Watch her leave for a session of weeping through mascarad eyelashes. The pastime, the protest against her being bitter and lonely and unwanted. And enter the dead woman's room, search it, note its primness, handle the modest belongings of a girl who had washed, dusted, arranged the belongings of other women in other richer rooms. The pile of old magazines carefully saved on the closet shelf. And on the bedstand, the new ones. The fan magazines, the romances, truer than her own because they were printed on slick paper. The dresser, lined with a thin layer of inexpensive underclothes. The wardrobe with the bargain flowered prints. The starched maid's uniform, the cloth coat, and the moth-proof bag. And that was it. The sum of Alma Russell's life. And then back to headquarters and the concern of Sergeant Gino Tartaglia for your tiredness, for your paleness. Uh, Danny, not that it is mine to meddle, but... Well, you should exhibit yourself to the sunshine more. Lull on Far Rockaway on your day off. Gino. Bring cheeks of tan to your cheeks. Bear your pale feet to the vitamin-filled rays My of... pale feet bother you? Nothing whatsoever about your personality bothers me, Danny. It's only that I... I... I know, Gino. You'd feel better if I got sunburned. Well, it is the fashion of the season. There's a rumor murder is the fashion. Yeah, this also. Three... The members of the opposite sex. It would be so simple. If only somewhere I could find where their lives had been touched by one man, by one killer. Danny, don't whip yourself. I put the boys working on it like yes. They can't find it either. All they come up with is a reading on a sales slip. Huh? The sales slip you found in the purse of the deceased Alma Russell. It seems the girl bought a teapot from a place called Ivers, paid $200 for it. And this makes a mishmash, upsets your colleagues in the department. Two hundred for a teapot bought by a girl who makes a buck an hour. Doesn't it upset you? Something we can do for you, sir? Yes, there is. I'm from the police. Good. Are we interested in some chinaware today? Yes, we are. I want you to take a look at this. Uh, this is a sales slip. Uh, what is it? It's for a teapot, one that costs $200. I don't understand why we're lifting our eyebrows, sir. Of course it did. A Stratfordshire teapot on the current market is worth at least that. This sales slip was found on a young lady, a young lady that's been murdered. I see. The young lady happened to have purchased this teapot here. I see. Her name was Alma Russell. I see. How does a dollar an hour made buy a $200 piece of china? Uh, by paying $200 for it. <laughs> uh, Miss Russell paid exactly that much. Then you remember Miss Russell. Oh, indeed, yes. We sold it to her ourselves about uh, three weeks ago. I remember the transaction well. She'd called the day before to price the teapot. The next day she came in with the money about uh, midday on a Thursday. Unless it was a day off she was in uniform. Didn't it seem strange that a housemaid... Yes, it did. Uh, I, I might as well tell you. Tell me what. Uh, the sales slip says $200. She didn't pay that for it. Uh, she paid 190 for it, the tax included. We paid the difference out of our own pocket. 
In the trade, we are known as a sucker for hard luck stories about teapots, and Miss Russell had one. You want to tell me about it now or later? Miss Russell was dusting the china at the home of her employer, broke a Stradfordshire teapot, hid the debris, bought another one before the accident was discovered as a replacement. Just one more thing. Did she say who this employer was? Uh, she did not. However, however, there are some regular clients of ours who <laughs> eat off the stuff. Like who? Uh, the Llewellyns, for example, the Crandalls, the uh, second and third, mm -hmm. uh, the Murrays, the West... Which Falls, Murrays? Uh, on West 11th, uh, the Paul Murrays. Are we being helpful? We'll never know how much. <laughs> Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. Please come in. Thanks. Mr. Murray... You uh... want to talk to me, don't you? Uh, uh, this way, down the hall. Oh, Claudia, uh, that is, Sis is practicing. Uh, we don't want to disturb her. Through this door. In here, the library. Now, do you know the man who killed my wife? We know the kind of man who killed your wife. Yes? A paranoid. A paranoid? A person who's quick to find a reason to kill, and he doesn't need much of a reason. Just cross a him... A crazy and... man? You could say that. Well, they tell me a lot of crazies are clever, but why, why come to tell me about it? You should be out looking for the man. I just thought I'd stop by and let you know how we were progressing. I, I'm busy. Oh? Uh, my hobby, model trains. I was assembling this engine. It's a diesel. Oh. Careful work. Must take a lot of patience. Uh, please... Put it down. It's fragile. I don't allow anyone to touch it. All right. I said I stopped by to let you know how we were progressing. Come back when you can tell me the killer's name. And from what I've been reading, you'd better hurry up. Three killings. Indiscriminately. By the same man. By the same man. The way we figured, Mr. Murray, is that the killer was really only interested in killing one person. He killed the other two to make it look like what you said. Indiscriminate killings. I, uh, I don't understand. To make it look like murder without a motive, without plan. But there was motive. Well, what motive for killing a 14-year-old girl? None. Part of the plan. And, and, uh, that housemate? None. But that was the killer's mistake. If he'd killed someone else, I wouldn't be here now. What? Well, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Aren't you going to ask me why anyone should kill your wife? There was no motive, uh, like the others. The killer had one. He had a wife, a wife who didn't want the burden of an afflicted sister-in-law. That's only a guess. Did your wife ever complain about your sister? Get out of here. You said your wife was a warm and open-hearted woman. She wanted children, didn't she? You're presumptuous. You're crude. Get out of here. You already had a child in your house, sis, your sister. You never let her be anything but a child. I don't have to take these insults. And put that down. Put that train down. You're crazy. Crazy. You broke it deliberately. All that work and you... I'll kill you. I'll kill you. You're a broken toy train. I'll kill you. That's how you're going to convince I'll me you're a madman. you. Cop an insanity Stop. plea. Stop. You're going to try harder than that. That's right. Settle down. You broke my train. Cut it out, Murray. You're no more crazy than I am. Paranoid would have had reason to kill that maid, that 14-year-old girl. You killed to cover up your wife's murder. She'll find out what happened. We'll let her know. Oh, sis. Oh, my God. leaps against the night. And the sound it makes is the crash of life deep inside the earth and the hiss of neon, the laugh that screams. They melt together. The sound you get is shock. There's another sound, the teardrop. But no one listens. No one hears. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... 
My Beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Joseph Kearns was heard as Paul Murray. Featured in the cast were Charles Davis, Martha Wentworth, and Harry Bartell. Two styles of music, both tops in popularity, are heard every Sunday over most of these same CBS stations. Guy Lombardo's sweetest music this side of heaven is one. The other is the singing style of Mario Lanza, new vocal sensation of the airwaves. Enjoy Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians and the Mario Lanza show tomorrow night. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde on Sundays on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the time before dawn, Broadway is an island of silence torn from the blazing neon, the midnight sun of the spectaculars. The river mists mingle with the vapors rising from manhole covers. Through them move the rejects, the stragglers, the wanderers, the men without sleep. One detaches himself, scavenges in a trash bin choked with the remnants of night, finds nothing, moves on to the next. It's the time of the endless search, the restlessness of an anguish you can't understand on the street built for the purpose. You walk it, and a shadow whimpers, and you hurry on, close your heart to it, because the whimper was yours. And finally, you must put aside whatever it was you were looking for, because on a side street, a man waits for you to give you the nighttime's departing gift. The boy lying dead against the iron gate of the tenement's basement court. Pablo Molari, Danny, from uptown, West 109th Street. Carried one of those handwritten identification cards. Find anything else on him? Not much. Five dollar bill in his wallet. His saint's medallion he's wearing on a chain around his neck. That's about all. Now, you question the people in the... Yeah, Danny, every door. No one ever heard of the kid. Had nothing to do with him. Didn't want to talk about him. You know, most of them were trying to sleep, the heat, the kid's squalling, you know. Yeah. Beaten. Jaw broken. This bruise on his throat... Must be the one that killed him. Here, come down here, Danny. Huh? What? Take a look at the sign on this door. Hudson Club, Johnny Hammett, president. I guess it's one of those street clubs the kids make up for themselves. This neighborhood's loaded with them. You think what happened to this kid is part of it? Yeah, I think. What do you think? Maybe. Check it, Michael, and I'll get back to you. And wait now for the decent hour. Give to someone a few more hours of sleep before breaking the news about the death of a young man. And at 8.30, to an address on West 109th Street. Climb four flights and be careful of the rotting steps and the three-year-olds at play. The door opens to your knock. And the woman who pinches her shawl close to her throat doesn't understand what you're saying. And calls a neighbor who understands. Who explains to the woman, the mother of a murdered young man, explains what must be done. Accept the fact of death. Identify the body. Bury her son. Then walk away from all of it. You've started a new day. Call headquarters. Detective Muggerman gives you an address. Looked for and found and checked by the night shift. Johnny Hammett, president of the Hudson Club, a tenement on West 43rd near the docks. Johnny's glad for the company. I dislike having my coffee alone, Mr. Clover. You work, Johnny? Yeah, here and there. Mostly on Broadway, sir. People always want things done. You mean you run errands? 
No, if you think all it is is running down to the corner drugstore, no. Broadway, Mr. Clover. It's full of tourists. Anybody else live here with you? Yeah, my father. I think he still does. I hardly ever see him. How's the Hudson Club coming along? Oh, fine. Fine, thank you. What kind of club is it? Oh, a little bit of everything. Sports, dances, beach parties. The girls do most of the arranging. Girls? <laughs> Isn't that funny? About a month ago, I mentioned girls to my father. He had the same expression on his face as you do. Yeah, girls. I'm 19. I don't chalk walls anymore. Johnny, a member of your club was murdered last night. A boy by the name of Pablo Malari. Oh, is he dead? Nah, he wasn't a member of the club, sir. He just hung around. What about him, Johnny? Who killed him? I didn't. And no one's come up to me since last night and said he did it either. Where were you last night? We had a meeting at the club, a special one. Initiations, plans for the summer. Broke up about two. I came right home. I want a list of your members, Johnny. Names, addresses. No, sure. Yeah, before you go. Look, where was Pablo found? Outside your club, in the vestibule. Nelson might know. Nelson? Toby Nelson. We had him in front of the door last night to keep away undesirables. Where can I find him? Works at a cigar and magazine counter in the Flick Building lobby. I wish there was more I could tell you. I really do, sir. Hey, sis, don't forget your change. There you are, baby. Good luck at the track. What's yours, Buster? Your name, Toby Nelson. Someone send you to ask an important question? Police. That buzzer could stand a little metal polish, mister. Don't worry about it. Oh, sure not. Uh, tell me what I should worry about. About a boy named Pablo Molari. Uh, yeah, I've been reading him in the newspapers. What's he to me? He was found beaten to death in front Hudson of... Hudson Club, I know, I know. It says so in the papers. What went on there last night? I'll have to read the minutes of the meeting. I was outside making these two big muscles that Tatsu wanted in and couldn't get in. What happens at these initiations, Toby? Ah, kid stuff. You swear to do this and that and be a nice Hudson. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I was embarrassed for the kid. Who are you talking about? Paula. Paula got taken into us last night. Johnny Hammond wanted it, so I arranged it. Paula Chopak, which makes us fellow members, which makes me happy, happy. This Paula's your girl. Manicures my pinkies. Look, pretty job, huh? Gives me locks of hair, gets me argyles. Oh, it's a nice thing we got. Tender. Paula Chopak. Uh-huh. I've got her name on my list. She was on top of the grocery store, corner 11th Avenue and 46. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Toby. Anytime. Oh, here, take a scratch sheet, mister. For free. Go ahead, take it. It's last Monday's. And bring to the top of the list Paula Chopak. Climb the stairs, knock on a door with the curtain panels of glass, and hear the furtive scurrying behind it and the slam of another door inside. Then hear a woman's steps approaching, and an instant of silence, then the fumbling with the catch, and the door opens. And the woman had not finished making herself presentable to the caller. The wrinkled cotton house dress needed another smoothing. The graying hair needed to be pressed back again from the forehead. And the tired voice, there was nothing to be done about that. Yes. Something. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. It's good you're here. We not think police come so soon. Please to come in. Please, that chair. I sit by window in it by evening. It's comfortable, clean. You be cool. Please, mister. Thank you, but I'd like to... to... By my daughter to speak. By Paula. Paula, is she here? Yes. By room, listening to records. But uh, first, please, mister, first. You want to tell me something, Mrs. Chopak? About Paula. You, you see what I am, mister. But Paula, by her is great beauty, by the face, by the rich black hair. Mrs. Chopak. Like crown she wears it, my Paula, my baby. I comb for her, brush, wash, put in braids by night for sleep. My Paula is good. Clean, 
Respectful to me, to such as you, never trouble, never bring me tears. Will you call her, please? Go to her. She wait for you. She say me, policeman, come this afternoon. I have much thing to tell him. My Paula say this to me. What my Paula got to say to policeman, mister? <laughs> what? In that room? Yes. You see, my Paula tell you her thing. Then you, policeman, go away from us. Ah, uh, mister. Paula, I'm from the police. I know. I heard. Your mother said you had something you want to tell me. Mom's wrong. I don't think so. Tell me, Paula. Mom can hardly speak English. Sometimes she doesn't understand the things I say to her. I've got nothing for you. Besides, I'm busy. Brushing your hair? Let it alone for a while, Paula. Talk to me. A boy was murdered last night in front of a club where you were initiated. Pablo Molari. Is that what you wanted to tell me about? What's the matter, Paul? Are you scared? Look at me. You think you could scare me? Toby Nelson talked to me. He said... He told you I was sweet to him, maybe. Told you I joined the Hudsons because he asked me. Because I used to jump when he asked. That he told you? That, too. Well, next time you see him, explain to him it's finished. Through, wiped off my memory book. Is it last night? What happened last night? I got initiated in a club. What else can happen to a girl? Murder, maybe? A murder she saw being committed, maybe? Something she's afraid of? I to... said it once. I got nothing to tell you. So go tell Mom I got nothing to say to a policeman. It'll cheer her up. I hope you're right, Paula. For you. For your mother. I hope you're right. Danny, I give you the evening's greetings. Thanks a lot, Gino. You're here so late tonight. Why didn't you go home after you saw the Chopak girl? I had some work to do. Uh-huh. Uh, Danny, would you mind very much if I regaled you with a tidbit that happened early this evening at the house of Tartaglia? Please do. Cousin Stanley from Gay Paris showed up after ten these many years. Not him. Oh, him it was. And with arms akimbo with goodies. Nicks for Mrs. Tartaglia, knacks for the kiddies, and for me, a great big bottle. <laughs> Champagne, huh? Had a call, Danny. Fifty-one. From Paris? <laughs> Those continentals know how to live. Gino, did you have that list of the Hudson Club checked? Indeed I did. And each and every member swears on the bylaws of the club that they know nothing of the murder of Pablo Malari. Danny Clover speaking. Squad car's downstairs for you, Danny. Paula Chopak was washed up on the beach at Far Rockaway a little while ago. Maybe an accident, maybe homicide. You going, Danny? Right away. The night wind off the sea was soft, warm. It sighed against the flames of the beach fire strung along the coast, riffled the sand across driftwood, across the litter. It brought close the far-off sounds of a summer beach at night, the laughter from behind screen porches, the siren call of the ukulele gently strummed, the distant screeching of gulls, and closer, the other sounds, the lash and wash of the surf, the opening and setting up and adjusting of the mechanical devices that attend the dead, and then the trembling voice of the boy who tries to tell you about the girl lying there, how it was, why it was. We were swimming, sir. Lost her someplace out there in the dark. And I heard her kind of scream. Just you and Paula, Johnny? Yeah, it was a beach party, like the ones I told you about. The other members left. Paula wanted to stay. Asked me to stay with her. You said she screamed. Why? She hit her head on one of those rocks out there. The high tide covers them up. I didn't know till I hit the beach she was dead. I tried to... Dead? She is, isn't she? Look at me. I killed Paula. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. 
Tonight's the night. Yes, beginning this evening, there'll be a new host on Songs for Sale. He's affable Steve Allen, a young comedian whose likable personality you're really going to enjoy. Steve Allen becomes head salesman on Songs for Sale, introducing new songwriters and their tunes tonight over most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> On an early summer's night, Broadway stands on a corner, leans against the orange juice stand, and sums up the day. Some days are better than others. Some days you break even. You only had one end of the daily double, but the new blonde in the office looked over her shoulder at you and smiled. And later, when she dabbed on her lipstick with a finger, she smiled again. Oh, it was quite a day today. The Dodgers passed a miracle. You forgot to pay the check at the cafeteria and got away with it. And a girl... The song of a girl was washed up on the beach at Far Rockaway. Here is maybe a tragic day, but here is a day. It was 11.30 toward the end of it when we got Johnny Hammett back to headquarters. Sit down there, Johnny. Cigarette kit? No. No, thank you. Well, maybe you'd rather have one at Danny's. Yeah, here. Here, have one, Johnny. I don't want one. I guess Johnny doesn't like the brands we smoke, Danny. I just don't want to smoke, that's all. Can a man not want to smoke? Take it easy. Sure. Sure, relax, kid. Am I under arrest? You said you killed Paula. It was my fault. I shouldn't have let her swim out that far. Did you kill her or didn't you kill her? It was my fault. Who killed Pablo Malari? You think I did? Did you, Johnny? You think I killed him, don't you, Mr. Clover? There you go again, Johnny. Look, look, kid. A couple of your friends were killed. We're police. We're asking. I didn't kill anybody. You don't have to explain to Johnny Muggerman. He knows why he's here. He knows we need his help. Yeah, help, Johnny. That's what we want. We're not asking for a confession. <laughs> Who's kidding? Who? Were you in love with Paula? She wasn't around long enough. She was around tonight. What happened tonight? You know what happened. What's the matter with you? Look, Johnny, I'm going to tell you something. You're not talking to your little hoodlum friends. You're talking to a policeman. Nobody's trying to intimidate you. Nobody's trying to make you say things you don't want to say. You're talking to a policeman that's trying to do his job. What happened tonight? We had a... Beach party. The Hudson's? Yes, sir. That's better, Johnny. Paul and I came late. The others were already there. Toby Nelson? Yes, sir. Toby wanted to take Paula home. Paula wanted to stay. So we stayed. Paula and I. We were the last ones there. What made Paula want to stay? She'd never been swimming at night. And she swam out past the breakers and a wave washed her against a rock. Is that what happened? Yes, sir. All right, Johnny. Can I go now? Uh -huh. Good night, Johnny. Thanks. What do you think, Muggerman? You believe him? I don't know. I'm going to check. I'm going to talk to Toby. Toby? Toby. Who wants me? Oh, you've got a long nose, mister. Your landlady told me you were up here on the roof. Hers is even longer than yours. What's the guy have to do to get a square foot of air to himself? Your girl's dead, Toby. Paula's dead. You're stale, mister. The smooth voices on the radio have been telling me Paula's dead. For an hour now. Up here, I thought I couldn't hear him. I hear him. Johnny Hammett says it was an accident. That makes it an accident. You were at the beach party, Toby? Never miss it. Gives me a chance to show off my muscles to the members. You did that. Then what happened? Well, let me think now. Uh, yeah, after that, I roasted the hot dogs for the group. We all ate hearty, then it broke up. I came home. And left Paula alone with Johnny? Yeah, that's the other thing I did. Paula was your girl. How come Johnny took her to the party? If she was alive, you could ask her. I wouldn't know. Johnny says you wanted to take her home. Why didn't you? Because she slapped me across the mouth when I asked her. They all laughed. Johnny, too. Then she laughed harder than anybody. That's how I got the message she didn't want me to take her home. She wanted Johnny. Up to the night of the initiation at the Hudson Club, she was your girl. What happened there to make her turn on you, Toby? She's dead. Paula's dead. What else do you want from me? What else do I have to give you? How much can you... She's dead, mister. That's all I got. 
All right, Toby. And leave the boy alone. Give him the time and place of his grieving and the quality of it that's bled out of a tenement rooftop in a city stretching into the hours after midnight. Go away. Resign yourself that another day is over. The next morning, and the legwork, going out to a corner of the city where the sign says 11th Avenue and 46th. Climb the steps and stop at a door. Intrude upon two rooms newly filled with grieving. Please. Please come in. Of my daughter? Mrs. Chopak, the police are not satisfied that Paula... Of my daughter, Paula? There's a possibility that it wasn't an accident. Paula is in another room. The others. Neighbors by me. We have only boxes to sit on. I want you to try to understand what I'm saying. Nothing. Nothing I understand. Only up to yesterday. To yesterday when Paula said to me, Mama, I'm going to swim with this boy, this Johnny. Johnny Hammett? Johnny. He called for her? At first, my Paula, she said she would want to stay home, rather. Then the boy said something to her. Bent down low over her ear. Paula took her suit for swimming, her cap not to get her hair wet. Then she said what I said to you. I see. Just one more thing, Mrs. Chopak. The night before last, your daughter went out. Do you know where she went? To some place. To party. My club has party. What time did she come home? Late. I don't know what time. Did you talk to her when she came home? Only when I tried to give her help. Help? White. Like ghost. I'm sick. I hear this. I get out of my bed. I come to her. I say... Paula, you're sick. Mama, get something. She tell me, go away. Like I'm someone she never see before. Was she drunk? Sick. Was no whiskey I smell. Sick. White. Sick like ghost. I see. She's dead now. Paula is. And the neighbors by me. They're in next room. They sit. They cry. They touch my shoulder. They don't talk. They don't know what words to say to me. Then walk the tenement street and have your passage greeted by the sudden silences of the yelling kids, the turning of backs after the furtive gesture of insult, because somehow you were guilty of that anguish over the corner grocery store. Once you had been welcomed by a mother, and for that you had left her a dead child. And on that street, the guilt was yours. So I got away from it. At headquarters, read, reread the file on Mullary, dead of a beating. On Paula Chopak, dead of a head wound while swimming at Rockaway. And finally, read away the daylight and sit in darkness till a man comes in, looks at you for a moment, and turns on a light. You don't mind the light, huh, Danny? It's all right, Gino, thanks. And I agree with you that this killing, this dying of kids, makes one wish to sit alone in the dark. However... You got something for me, Gino? Danny, all I can give you is a comment upon the children of today. The clubs they must make for themselves. The things they do in said clubs. The hurt they bring upon themselves for so doing. Go on, Gino. Well, it's in all the papers, Danny. How they go out of the way for new thrills, new sensations, new emotions. Only this morning, while shaving, I was bending an ear to the comment from the radio. I called in the Tartaglia You got crowd. something, Muggerman? I don't know, Danny. Maybe yes, maybe no. What? Gordon and Technical gave it to me to give to you. See if the big man can figure it, he says to me. I got news about Gordon. I actively dislike him. What did he give you? Now, he's been studying the bathing cap Paula Chopak wore to the beach party. He says it's curious. Why? He says the girl didn't have the cap on when she went into the water. Paula was proud of her hair. She'd have worn the cap. Why does he say she wasn't wearing it? Because there was no blood stain inside it. Gordon says if she was wearing the cap when she hit the rock, it would have held some of the blood. 
Which means, he says, that the cap was put on her after she was carried to the beach. It means another thing, Muggerman. What? Barlow was murdered. Get me a squad car. It's the police. What do you want? Let's go inside, I'll tell you. Inside, Toby. Are you the only Hudson here? Hey, Johnny, look what's here. We got a call it, Johnny. Good evening, Mr. Clover. Nice clubhouse you've got here. Hey, can I show you around? Where's everybody? I thought you had quite an organization. They'll be around. When you leave, people will start swarming in here. I'm glad you came, Mr. Clover. Thanks. Hey, what's with you, Johnny? You buy a cop for a friend? Don't pay any attention to him, sir. He doesn't know about policemen. He doesn't know they have a job to do. You understand all about that, though, don't you? Hey, what's going on? Too bad about you, Toby. Huh? I said too bad about you. Your muscles, your temper. The mad you had on the other night. Hey, Johnny, what's eating you? You never saw Toby work over a guy, did you, Mr. Clover? No. Tell me about it. Once, a boy tried to get in here. Tried real hard. Toby was in front of the door. The boy never made it. Pablo Molari? Johnny. It wasn't premeditated, Mr. Clover. Toby didn't mean it. He was just angry about something. You're under arrest, Toby. Put out your hands. Gotta do something first! Don't be a fool! Take him off me! Yeah, yeah! Take him off! Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Clover. That's just the way he went after that boy. He would have killed me. Toby will rest a while. What are you doing, Mr. Clover? Rescuing him. Nice cigarette case. Cigarette, Johnny? Are you kidding? I don't smoke those. Don't blame you. Marijuana brings you grief. That's what it brought Paula. Paula? Uh Uh-huh. Paula was a sick girl after she got home from her initiation. You have to smoke this stuff to become a member of your club? Oh, now look. You look, Johnny. Paula was Toby's girl. You wanted her. That's why you insisted she become a member. Put her on this stuff. She'd lose her sense of values. You think I'd do anything like that? Yes, I do. You know me better than that. I know you killed her. I told you what happened out there on the beach. You forgot to tell me why she went there with you. What were you going to do, Johnny? Tell her mother she was smoking marijuana? Is that why she went with you, stayed at the beach after the others left? I don't know what to say to you, Mr. Clover. You're wrong. And I think you ought to take care of Toby here. Paula had beautiful hair, Johnny. I'd go along with that. She'd have worn her cap into the water. You killed her before she went into the water. How, Johnny? With the rock? Mr. Clover. Then you threw her in the surf, saw her suit to be wet, pulled her back, remembered about the cap, put it on her. Why did you murder her? She was so beautiful. She was so beautiful, Mr. Clover. She refused more of your cigarettes. Funny. Worked before. Let's go, Johnny. It always worked. You know it. Got so they'd come around here begging for the stuff. A young man like me, connections, is like a king. I'll tell you another funny thing. I wouldn't touch this stuff. Come on. Yes, sir. Broadway looks clean. The winds of the evening have swept away the litter. Everything looks sharp. Sharp. Like a knife at your heart. You walk against it, and it plunges deeper. Deeper until there's no pain at all. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat.
Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Dick Crenna was heard as Johnny Hammett, Bill Tracy as Toby Nelson, Peggy Weber as Mrs. Chopat, and Michael Ann Barrett as Paula Chopat. On July 8th next week, Broadway's My Beat will be heard on a new day, Sunday. Beginning a week from tomorrow, be sure to listen to Broadway's My Beat and the adventures of Danny Clover, starring Larry Thor. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where Phil Regan brings you the serviceman's own show every Sunday on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world... Broadway's My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So, indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. When it's July and the heat puffs up from the river, Broadway's a place of regret. The winter dreams made for the summer are blurred. The golden girls fan themselves with newspapers. It's the time of the salt tablet, the fly paper, and the sullen sleep on the fire escape. The mornings are filled with a thousand hours and the bleary talk and dead cigarettes in the bottom of paper cups. It's summer, the poet's time, the lover's time. And if you can afford an ocean voyage, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Which is equally true for a policeman if he's retired, if he's come into a fat inheritance from Uncle Ned, ex-wonder boy of the oil fields. Not me, nor Detective Mugovan. We were still working to pay off the bills. Current job, stakeout in front of an apartment house in the West 80s. Stakeout for an armed robber who had shot a bystander to death, ran across roofs, down alleys, finally trapped. Let's hold up on the second floor, Danny. Empty apartment. Ready? Let's go. All the other tenants cleared out? Uh-huh. Had a little trouble with the people in 2B. How come? People named Morgan. Their grandmother died. A funeral. We got all the mourners out. Apartment right next to one of our killers in 2A. You sure he's in there? Probably him, Danny. Description fits. Let's find out. Open up. Open up. This is the police. Mugovan? Yeah. Yeah, those windows over there, Danny, open. The screen's been kicked out. Come on. The killer left this apartment in a hurry. Uh huh. Yeah, these windows lead to a fire escape. He could have gone out this window onto the fire escape into the next apartment, Danny. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah. Must have done it this way. The screens on this apartment have been knocked out, too. Let's go see, huh? Hey, this is the Morgan apartment, Danny, where the Morgan grandmother. Want me to look around? For appearances, Mugovan. I'm guessing our man walked out with the mourners and got lost. Must have made him happy.
Hey, greetings, Danny. Well, looks like we made the boo-boo. It amuses you, Sergeant? Well, Danny, it is only that I am trying to tickle your funny bone with what otherwise could blossom into a severe headache. You get out the all points on the killer? Goes without saying. The bulletin is out, but the puzzle lingers on. Oh, that Mugovan and I were on him and he got away from us? No puzzle, Gino. We lost it, that's all. Ah, be friendly with yourself, Danny. Such things happen. The puzzle to me is that a burglar in his chosen line of duty should so overstep himself as to enter the ranks of the killers. <laughs> Overambitious type, huh? Try to beat his way into Mrs. Conlon's apartment on West 76 with a gun. It bothered a neighbor. The neighbor tried to stop him, tried to beat him off. The neighbor got killed. You got any other troubles, Gino? Oh, nobody's got troubles compared to the way Mrs. Conlon's got troubles. A man with a gun tried to get to her. He didn't make it. If I were Mrs. Conlon, it... What'd you say? About Mrs. Conlon? Oh, when your call came in, Danny, the name Conlon registered on my gray matter. So I nudged it up a notch by referring to a file and flash. It came to me that like a year ago, a Mr. Hugh Conlon was found shot dead at the side of an unidentified woman, also shot dead. Verdict? Murder with suicide. This Conlon was the husband of the said... Hey, yo, yo! To see Danny Clover, permission must be obtained and granted. Don't try to stop me. Don't anyone. Who are you? Now, don't try to bypass me, sir. You have spoiled the plans of Lucian Cobb, funeral director. After we'd rehearsed and rehearsed. This is a new type show business, Danny? Sit down, Mr. Cobb. Tell me what I've done to you. I'll not sit, sir. While bearding a criminal, you this morning did destroy the careful staging of a month. We rehearsed the old woman, Grandmother Morgan. How the little old lady would lie in her coffin, her pose, her attitude. And when death took her, we were ready for it. And now... You're saying our trying to take a killer ruined your carefully planned funeral, how? Twenty minutes ago, the granddaughter of the deceased phoned me, told me tearfully she'd opened a clothes hamper, and there was her grandmother folded in with last week's wash. I'm sorry, Mr. Cobb. Death has a dignity, Mr. Clover. You... I'm aware of it, Mr. Cobb. Do you know? Yeah, Danny. That's how the killer got away. Climbed into the coffin himself. Get on the phone. Find out what happened to that funeral. Tartaglia did very well. He lifted a receiver and dialed and asked a question. He got an answer and replaced the receiver. Hey, Danny, the hearse took off for parts unknown. Deserted the rest of the funeral. I make some more calls to traffic and to highway patrol and wait. And finally a call comes back, one hearse located on a side road off Queens Highway. Driver recovering from pistol whipping, but still bewildered by the strangeness of it all. Go there and talk to him. Look, mister. The first thing I want you to understand is I'm not lying to Just you. Just tell me what happened. We were cruising along through the streets, uptown toward the cemetery. It happened at 180th Street. What did? There's a glass panel between my driver's seat and the, you know, the coffin, the flowers. That's where the tapping came from. Tapping? Yeah, with the butt end of a gun. The coffin was open and this guy was kneeling there with the gun. Then he busted through the glass, pointed the gun at my ear. Says, take a right here. I took a right. Wouldn't you? Go ahead. I took a right. I took off from the rest of the funeral. A long nose, a head full of red hair, and a big gun. When we got to where we are now, he tells me to stop this hearse, to get out. I get out. He slugs me. Is that all? Is that all? You think this happens every day? And phone it in and check out for the night. And go home. Find the heat piled high in your room, waiting for you. And take the blanket and the pillow to the roof. And step carefully past the sleepless child, his eyes wide with reflection of nighttime. And hear the whispered, tired scolding of the man at his side. And the rustle of the woman's cotton robe as she pulls it tight to her throat. And find an empty place. And consider there the pattern a killer has scarred across the summer's day. Consider it. Then make your way back downstairs to the hall phone. Ask Mrs. Conlon to meet you at your office in the morning and go back for the sleep you left on a brownstone's roof. In the morning, she was already waiting for me, and with her, a young woman who took a cigarette from a plastic case and waited for me to light it for her. 
Thank you. You're sweet. Uh, my daughter, Mr. Clover. Uh, Myra. Hi and hello. Uh, well, Myra insisted on coming with me. She said she didn't want me to be alone with you. Don't lie, Catherine. Myra. The reason I came, Mr. Clover, it was a chance to meet a new man. I told Catherine that. The poor thing's trying to cover up. <laughs> she doesn't mean that, Mr. Clover. Myra's a child. All the excitement, that man trying to break in, your call last night, a, a child's mind. It, it can be too much for... You through, Catherine? Because if you aren't, Mr. Clover will never have the chance to tell us why we're here. The man who tried to break in, Mrs. Conlon, had you ever seen him before? Why, no, I never... Uh, I told you that yesterday. Why do you ask again? Maybe the attractive man doesn't believe you, Catherine. Myra, what are you trying to do to me? You come in here, make a show of yourself before this man, talk fresh... Mrs. Conlon, had you ever seen the man before? No, I told you no. Yesterday was the first time he beat at my door. When I wouldn't let him in, he threatened me with a gun. And then that nice neighbor from across the hall. He's helped Myra and me so many times, and now... Mrs. He's... Conan, try to understand why I'm going to remind you of... Of what? Remind me of what? Of your husband's death, of What's how... he got to do with it? What's my husband dying a year ago with that nameless woman got to do with it. Patience, Catherine. Let the man tell you. It's only that the killer we're after might have had something to do with this other thing that happened to you. It's the only way I can figure it. Why should he beat on your door openly with a gun? Why He's should... a thief. He wanted to rob me. A thief who stands in a hall and knocks and asks permission to... What are you trying to do to me? Hasn't it been enough? Haven't I had enough? Oh, Myra, tell him... Pardon. Danny Clover speaking. There's a man sleeping in my boarding house. Answers the killer's description you got in the papers. You want him? I give him to you. Where? Boarding house. 1756 West 61. You come from right away, huh? So I can put my room to let sign. Back in the window. Quick turn over. You can go home, Mrs. Conlon. I'll ask the killer my questions. <laughs> I'm telling you, mister, when I give this man a room, I thought there was something funny. Why didn't you call the police then? Just because he was breathing hard, like he'd been running? Well, that ain't no reason. The reason was this morning. Oh, when you saw his description in the paper? Yeah, yeah, the bright red hair, you know, and the nose. He registered last night, and he hasn't gone out since, is that right? He had a caller late last night, late. Who? Oh, I don't know who. I don't peep. He made a phone call from the hall phone, went back to his room, and later I heard someone go into his room. How long did the caller stay? I went to sleep. I don't know. Where's his room? Uh, 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 down on the right. I'll take you. Here it is. This one. Give me the key and step back. Hey, he's that dangerous? You got to use a gun? Don't worry about it. Ooh. All right, you. Wake up. On your feet. On... Deep sleep already. He really sleeps, huh? <gasps> What's the matter with him? What's the matter? He should have peeped at his collar. You would have seen what a murderer looks like. Or refreshment while you work for enjoyment anytime. Chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's By Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The July twilight bleeds the color out of Broadway's neon, and the street is a summer's sigh done in pastel. The delicate cottons cling to the visitor's shoulders, and their husbands shoo them away from Broadway's kindly folk. And Broadway's forced to other summer delights. The boat ride to Coney. Try that, kid. The quick shipboard romance. 
And at the end of it, the guided tour through the Hall of Mirrors. Or the rendezvous at the coffee pump in the automat. Or just stand on the corner and sniff the cool air from the Catskill sent in the open envelope from the wife and kids. And compare its message with the one in the headlines. Fugitive killer found murdered in boarding house. And decide, it's better here, kid. Happiness is where the heart is. It's better here. And at headquarters, feel the twilight slip from your fingers as the door opens. And the night time is brought to you in the capable hands of capable Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. I come to sound the hour, Danny. At the sound of the bong, it will be late. And even now, the aroma of the cacciatore that awaits at Tartaglia's house is being wafted from uptown down Center Street to tickle the nostrils. Bong. Give me what you got, Gino, and then you can go home. Thank you, Danny. You are indeed a kindly, generous employer. Did the ballistics check the gun that killed Joe Gruber? No, it is the same with which this Joe Gruber murdered an innocent neighbor in the to-do in front of Mrs. Conlon's apartment, which proves to all concerned that this Joe Gruber was indeed the murderer of the innocent neighbor. Uh, anything else? What is else is that the take of Mugovan has compiled for you the criminal record of the aforesaid Joe Gruber, which I will bring. It seems that in his this past, Joe Gruber Danny, was... I got the record on Gruber. Detective Mugovan, I'm surprised at you. What's the matter with you, Gino? Oh, I was about to parlay the information you have gathered. Efficiently, I grant. But I was about to parlay this info into the ear of Lieutenant Clover with my own mouth. When you were so rude... Oh, you did good anyway, Gino. You can go home now. Mrs. Tartaglia will be waiting for you. She'll... She at least appreciates the endeavor I make to... <clears throat> good night, Lieutenant Clover. Detective Mugovan. Good night to all. Good night, Gino. Tell Mrs. Tartaglia you were fine today. Tell her I... What's eating him? Call him up in a little while. Tell him you're sorry. What for? What'd I do to him? Oh, just do it, Mugman. Okay. What have you got on Gruber? Oh, Technical's got the knife that killed him. Trying to trace the make, manufacture, distributor, retail outlets, etc. You, uh, you said you had a record on him. Yeah, 20 years long. Gave it to us when an officer booked him up for disturbing the Pell-Mell Rotisserie and Bar in 3rd. Got in a beef with some woman, mauled her. She yelled police. Happened five days ago. Well, who was the woman? No, we don't know. She didn't show up to make complaints, so we released Gruber. You want the rest to run down on him? If it means anything. Well, it's up to you. Yeah, Gruber began 20 years ago in San Francisco. Car heist, filling station holdups. They finally got him good on a negligent manslaughter charge. Fifteen years in San Quentin. Released six weeks ago. Next heard of it, the Pell-Mell Bar. Then released to murder Mrs. Conlon's neighbor. Then dead on arrival. That all of it? Yeah. Anything, Danny? Not much, huh? It wasn't much, but it was all I had. Joe Gruber had been mixed up in a disturbance at the Pell-Mell Rotisserie and Bar, which was on 3rd Avenue, which took up 40 front feet of sidewalk, and whoever was thirsty enough to dare what was inside. The inside was all bar and three fellas deep. The rotisserie part of it being a cheap hot plate burner that melted things upon occasion. It took a few minutes to get close, but I finally made it. Yeah, what's yours? Talk. I'm from the police. Here, badge. Oh, something wrong? No, I'll just talk. Oh, sure. Hey, Ed, come here, take over, will you? I gotta talk to a guy. Yeah, scooch down to the end of the bar, mister, so we won't get our talk mixed up with people. Ah, better, huh? Hey, uh, can I give you something from the shelf? Some Johnny Walker? About a week ago, there was a little trouble in here. At least I keep the trouble inside, off the sidewalk. Uh, take a look at this picture. You ever see this man before? Well, who is he? Name's Joe Gruber. His eyes are closed because you took a while he was on the slab, huh? That's right. Yeah, I seen him. Like you said, about a week ago. Trouble with a dame. What dame? I don't know. I didn't see much what happened. I got told. Had you ever seen Joe before? Uh, first time. He was in here, picked up one of my customers. You know, throw the arm around the shoulder, I'll buy you a drink pickup. Friendly, buy drinks. I ask him to pay. He says, sure, sure, my sister will be in a minute and pay. He looks serious, so I fed him drinks. Later, I was back in the storeroom, I hear yelling. I get back in time to see a cop off the beat, hauls this guy away. Leaves Mal standing there. Drinks unpaid. Mal? Mal who? The arm around the shoulder pickup, Mal. Hey, Mal! Mal, come here! Yeah? Well, what do you want? Yeah, my friend here's a cop. A very nice You're cop. Out of my way. Hey, come back here. Let me through. Let me through. Let go of me. Let go. If I'm going to have to take it down on the floor to talk to you, that's where you're going. 
How'd you get here so fast? It ain't been five minutes I opened up that pay for him. But it was only because the operator got snippy. A man's got a right. Let's go. Look, I'm booked, ain't I? So give me my shower in a cell like always. What, am I different or something? I want you to look at a picture, Mal. Here. You know that man? Must have been a lot of long-distance calls from that pay booth you tumbled, Mal. That change could add up to grand larceny. It was that much, huh? I guess I was just born lucky. It's going to be a hot summer in that jail yard, Mal. Sit down, Mal. Cigarette? Your friend's got a cigar in his pocket. Margaret. Yeah. You want a light? Here. My feet are killing me. Put them up on my desk. <sighs> Comfortable? Well, what's your trouble, fellas? What about the picture? You guy's name is Joe. Bought me drinks. Nice fella. Very nice. My cigar went out. Now let's let's hear all about it. He buys me a lot of drinks, tells me the story of his life. Now how he did a lot of time on the coast, you know. Mm. A lot about his sister Mildred. He liked his sister Mildred a lot. Go on. You know, he says his sister Mildred ran away to New York, got herself married. Uh, this is about 20 years ago when she was a youngster. And by the time sister Mildred got back to Frisco with her hubby, Joe was in stir. His sister Mildred come to visit once, then he lost track. Ain't seen her since. Well, how'd he fi- happen to find her in New York? Phone book. Looked up a married name on the off chance, and there it was. He called her. Did he tell you what her married name was? Might have. Uh, slipped the old mind if he did. He called her, said he'd wear a red posy so she'd recognize him. What the dame shows. <laughs> Guess what happened? Danny. Leave him alone. She walks over to Joe and asks, is he Joe who called? Joe says, I am he, only you ain't my sister Mildred. My sister Mildred had red hair like me, he says, so they walk over in the corner, they start to talk. Then the lady raises a roof about something, starts to hurry up. Joe runs after her right into the arms of the law. What did this lady look like? Frankly, Joe fed me too many drinks to remember, clear. Hmm. That's about it, boys. Uh, light my cigar again, huh? Muggerman picked the nickel thief up by the frayed collar and carried him off to the showers which left me alone to sift the pleasant time we'd had together and come up with a name, Mildred, Mildred Gruber, the sister who had run off to New York 20 years ago to marry, and wonder why it wasn't Mildred who showed up when Brother Joe phoned her, and wonder why it wasn't possible to go and ask her herself. But for that, you needed her married name, the name only Joe Gruber could tell you, the dead Joe Gruber. And remember that the city has a hall of records, and that girls' names are entered there for births and deaths and marriages. Go to the Hall of Records. Be handed over to a man named Franey. Wait for Mr. Franey to come back from the long voyage into the files. Finally, he does, waving his find under your nose. I found it, Lieutenant. Found it. Thanks. Let me... Uh... Uh, I'm afraid you couldn't read my scroll. I'll translate for you. On May 12, 1931, one Mildred Gruber applied for a marriage license. Age 19, height... Who'd she apply with? Uh, got that, too. Uh, Mr. Hughes Conlon. Age 27, height... Conlon, eh? Uh... Look up what you have on Conlon. Please, Mr. Franey, do that. Wait again. And know somehow Mr. Franey would look just like that when he came back. And you got something this time, Lieutenant. Conlon was married again, just three years after the first time. And I looked and looked, and there's no record of a divorce. The penalty for false statements is clearly stated on the bottom. Sure it is. Thank you again, Mr. Franey. Hi and hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. In here, the living room. Say, I've been trying to make Alexander's for years. Can I try one on you? How old are you, Myra? Seventeen. And I won't breathe a word of it. Is your mother home? Let's chip in and send her to the movies. Get her. Are you kidding? Get her. You're a fool. You could have had an Alexander. Did someone come in, Myra? Do you want me to lie to her, Mr. Clover? I most always It's the police, do. Mrs. Conlon. I want to talk to you. Hello. I was about to go to bed. I... Maybe you won't make it, Catherine. 
We'll see Mr. Clover. Myra, I'm sure there's nothing here to concern you. Will you please go? No. Myra... You heard me, no. When you were in my office, Mrs. Conlon, there was a question we never got finished with. It concerned your husband and the woman with whom he was found dead a year ago. And a man named Joe Gruber. I, I don't at all understand what you're talking about. Mother. Mama. Mom. Don't you have a date tonight, Myra? Every night. It'll keep. They always keep. All of them. All the time. You still haven't told me what I want to know, Mrs. Connell. Well, my husband shot himself. Because of me. Because of my child. He was ashamed of what was going on with that woman. He killed her and then shot himself. That's Daddy. That's my pop. Shut up, Myra. Shut up. I've never laid a hand on you, but I... Mother. Mother, dear. You're talking like a mom. Never talked to me like this before. The woman found with your husband was his first wife. Did you know that, Mrs. Connell? My husband's first wife? That's not true. Why did you find out he wasn't divorced? Why, it's not true. When Mildred Gruber showed up? Daddy had such bad taste in women. Myra... Myra, I'll... You'll hit me? Go ahead. You... I'll... Myra, Myra, please. You found them together, your husband and Mildred. Killed them. Made it look like murder and suicide. Why? Listen to me. Then Joe Gruber showed up. A long lost brother looking for his sister. Looking for Mildred. Found the name Mrs. Hugh Conlon in the phone book. Thought his sister was you. Please, please, listen to me. When you met Joe at the bar, he saw that you weren't Mildred. He began to figure, and it started to build into money. That's what he wanted when he tried to break into your house. Myra, child, try to understand what I wanted for you. Gruber got away from us, holed up in a room, called you for money. You came to his room, stabbed him to death. You did all that, Catherine, for me? Just because Daddy was a bigamist? Just because all these years you haven't really been married to him? For you. For you, darling. For your name, darling. Wait... When you're married and have children of your own, wait, wait. Mother. All for you, darling, don't you see? I I couldn't let that woman destroy what I built for you, or that man, or your father. The years, the good name I wanted for you, I... Wait till Charles hears this. Myra. (laughs) Charles will die laughing. Wait till I tell him I'm just nobody. (laughs) He'll float the evening in champagne. He'll be here any minute. Wait till I tell him. I'll marry him, Mom. His last name is Tobin. Then I'll have a name, Mom. Myra Tobin. Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped there, the bright-eyed kid, the voice that whispers from a doorway, the poet, the dregs. It's crowd, and it's laughter, and a Nickelodeon where you get pie in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint gum. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story. And that you're enjoying Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia, and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. 
In tonight's cast, Barbara Whiting was heard as Myra and Irene Tedrow as Mrs. Conliffe. Featured in the cast were Lou Krugman, Martha Wentworth, Norman Field, and Jerry Hausner. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world... My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing. Delicious. In July, the night slips down over Broadway like a black silk stocking. And you drift to it, because the other promises you made to yourself never happen. The part of your life that never counted is left behind. And you stand on a street corner, beating down the scream in your throat. The shadows start at 7 o'clock and deepen into night. You hug it close, because it's your chance that something will happen to you outside of the movies. And the tap on the shoulder starts it, or the laughter that floats down to your end of the bar, or a smile, or the man who runs down the hall after you. Danny! Hey, Danny. What's the matter, Sergeant? Glad I nabbed you before you took off for the day. Phone call, Danny, from a hysterical woman. You know, I had a hard time Come piecing on. it all. Uh, 1647 East 56, Danny. Fourth floor apartment. That's where her fiancé lives. The guy's threatening to blow his brains out. Uh, here, the names and such I jotted on this paper. Squad car, Gino. Waiting for you downstairs. Muggerman's with it. <laughs> That's it, Danny, 1647. Uh, who'd you say was doing all the threatening? A man by the name of Blaine. The first name is, let's see, David. <laughs> Try the buzzer, Muggerman. Yeah. He did it! Miss Carroll said he was going to do it, and he We're did. We're from the police. It happened up there on the fourth floor. Mr. Blaine, it happened just now, not more than... Who's that crying? That's her, Miss Carroll. See her? See her? Hugging the banister up on the third floor landing. And that's Mr. Fallon at the rail on the second Let's floor. Let's go, Muggerman. Dead. The gun's here, Danny, by his chair. It's brand new. Looks like Mr. Blaine had his choice. Uh-huh. It's quite a gun collection from Derringer's on up. Complete equipment for a young arsenal. Muggerman. Yeah? Those people we passed on the landing, that boy on the second floor, Mr. Fallon, and Miss Carroll on the third, I'll want to talk to them. Yeah, Miss Carroll's still crying, Danny. You hear her? Poor woman. <laughs> And stand for a moment and consider the virulence of death. How it is not content with its own, it must reach out to slash the livid scar into the heart of those crowding its edge. The woman crying softly. The other tenants whispering, moving restlessly in the lower corridors, and then hugging the wall because the attendants on violence must pass. The photographers, the interns, the technicians. And the moment is gone. It's routine now, official. The first entry in the file of night.
The next morning, gather it into a neat stack on your desk and sit down to it. And be surprised at the opening door and the quick presence of the woman you had marked for later interrogation. The man who was with you last night, he said you wanted to talk to me? It could have waited, Miss Carroll, until you felt better and until you... It'll not be forgotten that easily, Mr. Clover. That's what you mean. If you have something to ask, ask. Only don't prolong it. Don't make me wait and wonder. Sorrow is enough by itself, don't you think? Yes, yes it is. And you, try to understand us, Miss Carroll. A man I loved, who loved me, is dead. By his own hand, by his own will. He could have lifted his burden on to me, whatever it was. But he didn't. And now he's dead. You want more than that? Maybe. Because this is my job. Because I can't rule out the possibility that David Blaine was murdered. Awful. How ugly of you to think a thing like that. That anyone could have wanted my David dead. It's ugly. Tell me about him. He loved me. He was going to marry me. He was polite and gentle. Sometimes he'd forget himself. Then he'd beg my forgiveness. Wept sometimes. Showered me with gifts. So I'd be quicker to forgive. This watch. He called it an engagement present. But it was really an atonement for... Look at it. See how he loved me. It's a beautiful watch, Miss Carroll. See? Listen to it. And it ticks, ticks. Takes away my life with David softly, gently. Listen to me, Miss Carroll. Why would David kill himself? You were in love, you were going to be married. Why? He had a secret. That's it. He had a secret. He didn't want to stain me with it. Isn't that it, Mr. Clover? Isn't that why a man kills himself for the girl he loves? Oh, I'm sorry, Danny, I thought... But it's important. It's all right, Dr. Sinsky. You can come in. Well, that'll be all for now, Miss Carroll. Thank you. All? You helped a great deal. Thank you. You have nothing more? Nothing. Not now. Then I'll go. If you should want to talk to me again, I promise I'll be... Goodbye. Uh, it's not easy, huh, Danny? To pry into grief, to scavenge... You've to... got something, Doctor. Just tell me. Oh, forgive me, Danny. Sometimes my mouth gets the better of me. I studied it, Danny. I put it on your desk for you to study. Read it sideways, upside down. Still comes out suicide. Then it's done. Finished, huh? Nothing to bother our brains about. Like you say, Danny. Finished. Except... When a man who dies as Blaine did in shock spasm, arms rigid at right angles to his body, fingers clenched, how is it the gun was not found in his hand but on the floor? It's just a small question, Danny, to gnaw at the brain of a medical man. Sometimes it happens so, but... Yeah. Go practice medicine, doctor. Maybe I can bring you back an answer. Maybe where a man died, someone has an answer. busy right now. Your name, Richard Fallon? I'm from the police. I guess that gives you a right. Come on in. You want to sit over there? Move those papers off the couch. Just put them on the floor. You a writer, Fallon? You interested or curious? What do you write about? About your city? About how it's not like my part of the country? About your many-faceted city? About your stinking city? Your people? Your small people, your hurry-up people, your no-place-to-go people. The no-tears city, the rat-hole city. That's what I write about. Any material up on the fourth floor? I figured that'd be your gambit. Uh-uh, nothing. Your city caught up with a man and he shot himself before it drowned him. I'll think about the man and smile and wish him well. Know anything about him? His name was David Blaine. He walked arm-in-arm arm with a third-floor woman, Miss Carroll. Last night I heard a shot. I ran out into the hall. 
Mrs. Galvin downstairs ran out into the hall. Miss Carroll upstairs ran out into the hall. We looked up the stairwell to the fourth floor from where the shot came. David Blaine was dead. I know that about him. What else? Uh Uh-uh. Nothing. Sit there if you want, but don't stare at the back of my neck when I write. Makes me self-conscious. My gratitude for permitting me my ten minutes at the water cooler, Danny. Feel better, Gino? Goes without saying. And now to the toils of the day. It comes to that part of the rundown in which I proffer you your daily piece of resistance. In two parts. To wit, <clears throat> gun found that side of deceased David Blaine is indeed gun with which deceased did do himself in. Now, Gino, that hasn't been... Patience, a... Danny. Part two will settle the question itching in your brain of suicide versus murder. Scratch it for me, Gino. Delighted. Part two of report from technical states. Impossible for any tenant to have shot said deceased, make an escape down the fire escape, arrived in the hallways in time to look up and yell, man dead on the fourth floor, in your presence. Add to this the double whammy I have held out on you. Give it to me, Tartaglio. Beaks you, and any. The legman assigned to such duty I've come up with that David Blaine did indeed lose upwards to 50 grand by sour bets in the stock market. This in the period of the last month. Fifty grand in thirty days. For this, guys kill themselves, Danny. For a lot less yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Gino, close the file on Blaine. There's nothing more to... Danny Clover speaking. They switched me to you. You the man on that Blaine thing? Yes. What about it? Who are you? Blanche Hemby, mister. 1834 East 59. Room 11. You said Blaine. What have you got? Huh? Uh... What have I got? I got he was murdered, mister. And go there, and walk the hallway mottled with shadows and scuffings, the short corridor that ends in the door with the tin numbers and the pull-down bed and the basin in the corner. Knock on door 11, and get no answer. And go in, because there was urgency in the voice that said, Come here. The bed was pulled down, the rug was frayed, and the splotch of blood trailed off it onto the floor. The girl was behind the couch, huddled, her knees drawn to her chest, and only the fat summer fly pinging against the window made sound. That and the lonely room silences that intruded upon the dead girl. The murdered girl. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the glittering midsummer's day, Broadway takes time out to shimmer. The chrome is polished high, the better to reflect the passage of women who lean for a moment against the summer's heat and then walk slowly on. The mouthpieces of the payphones glisten with the moist whispers of an empty summer afternoon. A money clip glints through the dark of an alley, and you know that someone has gotten odds on a piece of the day. There's the drone of the neon, and the tired wind nudging a headline in a shining trash bin. Cop finds murdered girl in tenement room, and the wet shirt pulled from your back. Like other summers, other days... Where I was in the corridor between my office and the show-up room, that had happened before, too. Only the names of the dead were different. Blanche Hemby. I got the rundown on her you wanted, Danny. What'd you get, Muggerman? Oh, I'll have to slice it off fast, Danny. I'm due at the show-up. A woman there, a Mrs. Westfall, real eager to identify a prowler she dreamed last night. I'll walk you down. Uh, this girl, Blanche Hemby, frequent visitor. Hmm? Got her name on her guest book uh, maybe five times. For what? Oh, nothing sensational. Brawl over a hairdo with another dame in a bar, phonographs screaming, her screaming, disturbing the neighbors, 
beat a guy's head open with a bottle because he called her a gimme gimme girl, things like that. Any tie up with David Blaine? I know it's around the bars where she had the trouble, the tenement where she lived, the place she was working at two weeks ago. They fired her? Uh uh-uh. uh. No, she gave notice, Danny, two weeks ago. Said she was sick and tired working for nickel tips behind a hamburger counter. She had better, she told him, a lot better. Bit a hole in her time card, threw it on the griddle, walked out. Work anywhere else? See anyone else? Mm mm. No, I checked that too. Blanche slept away the days in her room. Three times a day she got up to phone for beer, once a day for sandwiches. Uh, here I am. I'll check with you later, Danny. Yeah. How do I know where I got it? Why don't you leave me alone? Muggerman. Stop making a show. That kid up there. What about him, Danny? Some punk probably. That's the boy who was the tenant on the second floor where Blaine was murdered. Get him, Muggerman. Bring him up to my office. Sure, Danny. Right away. Not anxious, Jerry. Hands off me, your scum, all of you. Take it easy, kid. What happened? The city trying to drown you the way you said it does to people? I hate it. I get drunk at night because I hate it. That way I see it for what it is. And you can't stand that when someone like me sees you for what you are. You hate me. And you kick me, you throw me in jail because I'm better. Even drunk, I'm better. He's right, Danny. He's a lot better than us. He goes around with a pocket full of watch. Like this. Because he's so much better. That's it. Where'd you get this watch, Richard? (laughs) I held out my hand and I begged and a kindly person dropped it right into my begging hand. Where'd you get it? I told you. I walked the streets and it fell into my hand because I was crying and lonely. And sick for home. Miss Carroll, your neighbor has a watch like this. You steal it from her? You steal it, Richard? Lock him up, (laughs) Mother. A watch exactly like the one Regina Carroll owned. Her engagement present from the man now dead, presumed a suicide, suspected murdered. If it were Miss Carroll's watch, what was Richard Fallon doing with it? It was a simple question, and Richard couldn't answer it. So call Miss Carroll, get no answer. So open the plush box that held the watch. Levante, jewelers for over a century, that's what the satin ribbon said, glued against the inside top. Stolen from Levante, jewelers for over a century? Go there. Ask Mr. Levante. Oh, no, not stolen. Purchased. By whom? A policeman, you said you were? Let me see, please. Sure. Here. Yes. This watch was purchased. You've already said that. Apologies. I'm temporizing, you see. I'm trying to gather my forces together. Now, as to who purchased this watch? Perhaps to a Miss Carroll, my old friend, Miss Regina Carroll. Of course, it's impossible to tell. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Levant? You see, this is quite an unusual watch. We rarely sell more than one a year. Our own design with a foreign mechanism. However, we sold two in the last few months. Remarkable? Who did you sell them to? Even more remarkable. A few days ago, Miss Carroll purchased such a watch. A few months ago, a fiancé. Now dead, I've heard, a few months ago. This gentleman also purchased such a watch as an engagement gift for Miss Carroll. That makes two watches for Miss Carroll, both the same kind. Is there an explanation for it, Mr. Levante? Well, Miss Carroll said she lost her engagement watch. Thus, she purchased another one. She cautioned me not to mention it to her fiancé, or to anyone for that matter. But now, you, a policeman, Mr. Blaine, dead? Well, you don't think I'm going back on my word to an old friend, do you? Miss Carroll is your old friend? Her dad and I were close. I toddled, Regina. Poor woman. You mean about her fiancé? About all of them. What do you mean? There were four of them, you know. Two at college, one when she was a sophomore, one when she was a senior. Then about ten years ago, a young man, since quite successful in groceries, has a nice store for select customers on medicine. Chap named Mason, I think. Miss Carroll was engaged four times, huh? She's 37, you know. She doesn't look it, does she? Still a beauty. A bygone day kind of beauty, if you know what I mean. Victorian? Would that be it? I often wondered why she never married any of her young men. Why they backed out on their marriage. I wonder why, too. (laughs) 
You need some help, sir? Uh, I'm looking for a Mr. Mason. All right, I'm Mason. Uh, I'm Danny Clover, police. The first name's Pete, Danny. You got a couple of minutes? Any time for you, fellas. I need a couple of minutes to recuperate anyhow. Mrs. Smythe just had me on the floor. Oh? She comes in here with her French poodles, three on a leash. Maid and chauffeur trailing in back. Orders a dozen... Well, did you ever hear anybody say bagel with a broad A? She wants a dozen boggles. <laughs> I don't understand her. Finally, she tells me what she wants is receptacles for a delicacy known as locks. How did she say locks? Locks, the chauffeur said. What can I do for you, Danny? You were once engaged to a Regina Carroll, weren't you? It was an experience. I'm not sorry for it. Who broke the engagement? You've got to ask that because it's important for the police to know, right, Danny? I broke it. Why? Why? That's a question I often ask myself. Sometimes my wife asks me. And I'll tell you what I answer. Go ahead. Regina was a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. Close to the wedding, I discovered this is not the type of girl I wanted. Personally, the girl that married my dear old dad, my mom, nagged my father to an early grave. Mom and Regina, two peas from the same pod. Go on. I'll tell you about Regina. I figure she has a picture in her head of a husband in a smoking jacket with satin lapels and a curved pipe in a fireplace. I don't fit the requirements. Personally, I like poker better than cribbage. Uh-huh. What else? Well, Regina, how she dressed. Pretty, you understand. But she made her own fashions, which she never changed. Ribbons, dresses choked against the throat, and always a little too long. She slipped on the ice once, and I told her she had pretty legs. She slapped me. That's what about Regina Carroll, Danny? That enough? Plenty. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Gordon? Oh, uh, Danny Clover. <clears throat> I couldn't be more charmed if I tried. A quiet evening in technical, huh, Gordon? It was. Now the place screeches at me. Did you do that, Danny, just by walking in here? You mix yourself bitter pills in those test tubes? I don't have to. I have company. <laughs> no offense. The gun that killed David Blaine. Get it out. Go over it again. Well, I've already examined it thoroughly. My report was placed on your desk. Get it out. Well, I can recall it to you if memory fails you. Thirty-two caliber, Smith & Wesson. Fired once. Get it. Examine it. All right. All right, Danny. See? I'm examining. It's still as it was when Blaine held it close to it. The barrel. Put it on a slide. Hold it up to the light, whatever you have to do. If you ask, Danny. I'll do better. Perhaps this will amuse you. The spectral micrograph enlarges 45 times. Down. Uh, and there. Have a look, Danny. You look. All right, Danny. All right. Hmm. What? Wow. What? These infinitesimal scratch marks on the barrel. Fascinating. And a new quirk. It didn't register on me before. I checked the rifling in the barrel against the slug, which we call standard operating procedure. I didn't think of looking at the outside of the barrel. Why should I with a suicide? I guess I should have, huh? And what would you have found out, Gordon? That the man killed himself with a silencer on his weapon. Now... <laughs> That's what I call taking quiet, please, a shade too far, huh, Danny? Oh, Mr. Clover, I knew you'd come back. Knew there'd be more things you'd want to know about David. Did you come in? Thanks. You may sit down, that chair. No, thanks. What makes you think I wanted to find out any more about David? I assumed it. Suicide. Files to complete. I realize it's my duty to be cooperative. Miss Carroll... I can tell you so much about him. He was generous. He was a gentleman. Rare thing to find out. He was murdered. You suggested that before, Mr. Clover. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. Murdered. He was dead minutes before we got to him. That's stupid. Listen to me, Miss Carroll. Stupid, because I heard the shot. We all heard it. We all ran out into the hall. 
Do you have a gun, Miss Carroll? Yes, I have a gun. David gave it to me. Woman alone. Did he show you how to fire it? Of course he did. He loved guns. I interested myself in them. Shall I get the gun? It isn't necessary for now. You don't have to get the silencer either. What are you talking about? The gun you shot David with, his own gun, was equipped with a silencer. Mr. Clover, I don't understand you at all. I'm a lonely woman. And I admit it, I, I'm a helpless one. How could I have killed anyone? Someone I loved. Hmm. Nice view from this window, Miss Carroll. You could stand here, see Detective Mugovan and me coming, fire a blank cartridge from your gun, run out into the hall. Look up, and everyone thinks the shot came from the floor above, from David Blaine's apartment. Do you admit it, Miss Carroll? No. No. I want to show you something. Here. Look at it, Miss Carroll, a watch, just like the one you're wearing. I didn't kill him. David Blaine broke his engagement to you, didn't he? I didn't kill him. The kind of woman you are, proper and proud. You gave him back the watch. But what to tell your friends? Tell them that someone else walked out on you the way three other men did? A proud woman like you? So you bought another watch, just like it. The one you're wearing. Please, please. Because I have the one you gave back to David. The watch you had that boy, that writer, Richard Fallon, steal from David's apartment. So the police wouldn't find it there and ask questions. You told him to get rid of the watch. He got drunk instead, got picked up. Look. David jilted me. But I didn't kill him. You did. You couldn't live with the thought of another man's walking out on you, like the other three. That's why you bought the watch, so your friends would think you were still engaged. Mr. Clover. So your friends would think David died because of the money he lost. And Blanche Hemby, the reason why David walked she out on you. Filth. The woman David loved. Filth! Beat her to death. Beat her, beat her! Let's go, Mr. Like David, it was filth! Instead of me, her, a woman like that! Miss Carroll. <laughs> True what you said. Those men didn't turn me down. I turned them down. College boys. The grocer. Not good enough. It isn't true. It isn't true. They did walk out. Take me away. Put me someplace. I don't want to look at anyone. I can't look at anyone. Broadway's deserted now. Maybe it's the heat. Maybe it's just that people get tired and want to go home because Broadway threw sand in their eyes. Maybe you found what you were looking for and couldn't stare it in the face because it's a street that'll give you anything you want, any way you want it. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for chewing anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Prussian as Mugovan. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This is Bob broadcasting from Topeka, Kansas, Hope, and thanking the sponsor of your regularly scheduled program for this two-minute interruption. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last ten years, I've visited many dramatic spots in this world, but just a few minutes ago, I returned from a tour of what was once North Topeka, Kansas. I've just seen block after block of total destruction, streets caved in, buildings undermined and flattened. Entire new housing developments are shambles, with the houses jammed together like battered boxes. As we toured this sickening area, I thought of the heroics that must have accompanied this disaster as it happened. The emergency operations of the Red Cross, Salvation Army, Air Force, Coast Guard, veterans' organizations, and the thousands of civilian volunteers, all striving to hold this hungry Call River within its banks. Then the complete frustration when it crashed into the streets. But the excitement of that time has passed. Today, it's a dismal task of dirty drudgery. Imagine the heartbreak of returning to what was once your home and finding three feet of dried mud on the front porch. After scraping and digging for hours, you finally get the door open only to find dried, drifted mud banked throughout the house with everything in it destroyed beyond repair. Countless of the heartbreaking stories of human despair this great flood of 1951 has written. But you and I, neighbors of these Call Valley folks of Kansas, can help. And I mean help with dimes and dollars. The Red Cross and other agencies have done a magnificent job taking emergency care of 10 to 15,000 refugees, and they're still doing great work in helping the needy with rehabilitation. But that's a far cry from the tremendous job that lies ahead. In Topeka alone, the loss is $100 million. That amounts to $1,000 for each and every person in this city. I'm appealing to that great heart that has made America. It's never failed before. Won't you send your contribution, large or small, to flood Topeka, Kansas? That's all the address you need. Flood Topeka, Kansas, and join me, Bob Hope, in bringing new hope to thousands of unfortunate American folks. Thank you. The William Wrigley Company has donated the time for this message from Bob Hope. Now, after a short pause, we switch to Hollywood for your regular program, Broadway is My Beat. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world... Broadway's My Beat, the exciting drama of mystery and murder and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. When the summer becomes August, Broadway pauses for a while, considers... What happened to the springtime dreams to be fulfilled in the middle of July at the very latest? And what of the blonde on last month's snapshots, the one with sunny legs, the one you tried with poetry and she touched your cheek, the fawn of Camp Nevercare, jewel of the Catskills? She's back in the Bronx shoe store, kid, and the last time you walked by, she didn't look so good. And walk the streets furious with people and heat, and feel your throat tighten when it suddenly comes to you. Another summer's rushing away. Maybe next year, kid. Maybe. And uptown, east of Broadway, where I was, in the outdoor swimming pool, catering also to the seekers after something or other, the crowd was divided into swimmers, non-swimmers, sand sitters, ukulele players, and miscellaneous. And the man in the swimming trunks, lying on the concrete walk, the man who had drowned, and the police emergency crew working over him with a respirator, and the man from headquarters who had gotten there before me. They've been working on him for quite a while, Danny. Why'd you call me to come down, Muggerman? 
ask the same question of Patrolman Kenny. It's like this, Danny. Kenny was flagged off his beat when this man was dragged out of the pool. Took off the man's locker check, went to the locker. You know, for identification. The locker was empty. Forced? Uh-uh. No, those locks answered with dime store skeleton key. Robbery gets a dozen calls a day from these pools. So you figure that man's drowning and his locker's being robbed had something in Maybe a coincidence, Danny. Maybe something else. I don't know. I wanted you to be here in case. Yeah, let's take a look. One of you men called the morgue. A lifeguard who pulled him out is that one, Danny. You want to talk to him? Uh Uh-huh. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Uh, Russ Gavey. What happened here? Well, I was on my stand. Him, he started to yell. I went in after him. How'd you get those scratches on your shoulder? He fought me. Had to take him under to break his hold. And when he stopped struggling, I got him out. By that time, he needed artificial respiration. I gave it to him. Until your man came. All right. Did Detective Muggerman here tell you this man's clothes are gone, that it's going to be pretty difficult to identify him now? Yeah, he told me. Any ideas about it? Nope. Okay, Russ. Back to the office at headquarters and sit with it. A man had been drowned in a public pool. From a policeman's point of view, worth only a quarter-page form in triplicate. However, the fact of his lockers being robbed may be something else again. Probably not. More forms. Then a couple of hours later, when the office gathers up its private shadows, a door opens. A man walks in. Uh, Danny, you busy? Come in, Dr. Sinsky. Sit down. Thank you. I just came from the autopsy room, Danny. And? Uh, has that man brought in from the swimming pool, the drowned one, has he been identified, Danny? Not yet. What's in your mind? He was murdered. Murdered? How? Whoever administered artificial respiration to that man killed him as surely as if he had driven a knife into his heart. Dr. Sinsky... Gently, Danny, gently. I'll explain. Inside of the chest, Danny, is a delicate system of balances. Balances which cannot be upset. Else a man's heart will be affected in his lungs. What's that got to do with murder? Simply that the autopsy I just performed on the drowned man revealed small internal hemorrhages. Bruises of the muscles and bones of the chest from too active a manipulation. You mean that lifeguard didn't do... I mean he did a very bad job of artificial respiration. And that's why you call it murder. Not premeditated, of course, Doctor. This is not the question in your mind. You wanted to ask if it was premeditated, didn't you, Danny? And let the question take over the room. Add the weight of its violence to the oppressive night heat... The stifling remembrance of other such questions posed in the same room, quietly, fearfully. Because a policeman, too, reacts to the touch of death. It fills the room, and against its pressure, you lift the phone, make the call to the Department of Public Works, have them check personnel files, come up with an address for Russ Gavey, lifeguard. Go there, to the hall bedroom furnished in the style of brownstone, East Twenties. Find it empty of Russ Gavey. Be told on the way out by the woman spread wide on the stoop you should have asked before. Russ was across the street in the park, on that bench, fighting for his share of the night air. Walk up to Russ. Let him chew the last fiber of a matchstick. Yeah, I'm taking my well-earned rest. You want to help, Mr. Clover? Sure. Mind if I sit down, Russ? Yeah, sit down. You were almost a hero today, Russ. You're kidding. That's how I make my daily summer bread, 50 bucks a week. Ogle a girl, save a life. How long you been a lifeguard, Russ? Oh, six, maybe seven summers. Time out for a frolic on Anzio Beach. Then you've uh, had a lot of experience saving people from drowning. Am I a lot of share? The medical examiner down at headquarters says that man you try to save... Yeah, I remember. Our medical examiner says he was murdered. Huh? How come? Our man says it was murder because artificial respiration wasn't applied properly. Well, your man is a smart man. But a four-bit-a-week lifeguard does the best he can. He studies in classes. He follows a first-aid manual. <laughs> you call him a murderer because he didn't make out with one poor slob. You tell me, Russ. You murder the man? Well, considering the percentage of lives that are saved and not saved by such as we, that's a question you may never be able to answer. I'll cut. I'll keep trying, Russ. You won't mind, huh? <laughs> Danny, why don't you never turn on a light? 
You sit like this in the dark by yourself. It's... I got one of the Tartaglia kids to home does the same thing. You both make me feel the same way. And you've got your problems, haven't you, Gina? Yeah, I could do without them. You in the mood, Danny? Sure, for whatever. What have you got? Nothing. No progress on identification of the drowned man. No progress on a connection between him and that lifeguard, Russ Gaby. Reports on Gaby State, he is looked up to at the pool by girls and ladies-sized swimmers. Occasionally, he buys for one or the other a beer at the concession stand. Occasionally, escorts one or the other type to her home, deposits it, goes to the newsstand, buys super-type magazines, goes to his room. Healthy, normal muscle boy. Maybe a murderer, Gino. Oh, pardon me, Danny, but I must take a... Sergeant Artaglia speaking. Yes? Yeah, I got it. Hanson's Pawn Shop, East 34th. I told you I got it. <sighs> they bother us with such... Such what, you know? A man with a pawn shop got the nudge just in the midst of a nice conversation because somebody who works in a pool hocked a suit of clothes. <laughs> Valuables. Look to this Mr. Hanson like stolen goods. On East 34th? Yeah. Then why bother yourself with it, Danny? Because maybe it'll give me the name of a murdered man. You might ask me why I called the police, Mr. Clover, after so many months of abstemiously staying away from you fellas. All right, Mr. Hanson, why? Because there was something fishy about it this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, this suit, this watch, ring, money clip was brought me by a boy who's an attendant at a public pool. Pool on Upper Broadway? Inevitably, that pool where that unidentified man was drowned, his things stolen. You read about it, of course. Who brought these to you? A boy. Know him well. I've had dealings with him intermittently. Who's the boy? Bobby Kent. He's got a room in one of those crates on East 37th, uh, uh, 1654 East 37th. Just ask for Bobby. We all know him. And you think these things belong to the drowned man? The man was robbed where Bobby works. Died where Bobby works. Bobby pawns things that obviously don't belong to him. What is there left for a decent man to think, Mr. Clover? Then the three walk to the languid summer night. The city-bound and the dream-bound people on the sandstone steps who find their delights in a pop bottle. Or by taking possession of a star in the sky... Or by cooling themselves with a fan, courtesy of Swanson's chicken fricassee. Pass them and mind the kiddies at their nighttime play, the patter of little feet up an alley, and arrive at the address on 37th Street. And over one of the bells, see a name Bobby Kent, apartment three. And the sound you hear is the far off thunder made of heat and air currents and stratosphere. And the lightning through the window at the end of the corridor lights up the number three on a door. Briefly. Then again. Bobby. Bobby Kent. This is the police, Bobby. Open up. I'm coming in, Bobby. Bobby was in. His shirt was ripped, his face bloody, hands tied behind his back, belt around his neck, and the belt was strung over a pipe near the ceiling. And I brought over a chair to stand on. There was lightning again, and the whole room was stark white for an instant. It took a while to get Bobby down, but it didn't matter. Bobby had been dead when I got there. Bobby had been murdered. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. <laughs> We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
Broadway leans against a doorway, flips a coin, and makes odds on the 31 days of August. This month, kid, it'll come in. The filly in the third, the dream boat, the oil on that little piece of property you leased in the Texas Badlands. Gotta come in. Otherwise, what have you been building, kid? Gotta come in. So you can indulge the whim of the hour, enjoy it, own it. All that neon, yours to turn on or off. That music of the dance calling to you from basement dance lands. Yours to play soft or loud or cut off like that. Dance in dark and in stillness if you want. The traffic signals pushing back the people. Yours to make say stop, go. You're a king man with headlines at your feet. Boy murdered, hung by belt in tenement room. Unknown man drowned in public pool. All yours, kid. Clean shuffle, a minute of luck. And it's all yours. The next morning at headquarters, consider your share of it. Yours and Detective Muggevins. You still stick with that, Danny, that the man in the pool was murdered? Yeah. You don't like it? Oh, it's not that, Danny. It's only so many people drowned, so many can't be saved. You going to go back and call everyone that wasn't the murder victim? Russ gave you a trained lifeguard. He told me the man fought him, had to be pushed under. Happens that way sometimes, Danny. Could have been the other way around. It could have been Russ wanted the man dead. It could have been he fought the man, drowned him, finished him with his own brand of artificial respiration. Could have been. But where's the string that knots it, Danny? What connection that is That kid there? that was hung, Bobby Kent, the attendant at the pool. That could be a connection. Because he stole a man's clothes out of a crummy locker? We're not even sure they belong to the drowned man. What do we know about them, Muggerman? Well, from the cleaner's marks, they belong to a man named Howard Crawford. Married. Now, he checked his wife. Should be at the morgue to identify in a half hour. Would have come sooner, wanted to go out and buy a dress first. I let her. I'll go down and meet her. You get whatever you can on Bobby Kent. Friends, people he stole from, whoever wanted him I'm dead. working on it. I'll put a tail on Gavey. Every breath he breathes, I want to report. Got it. Anything else, Danny? Yeah. Why does a woman need a new dress to look at a dead man? Well, I don't know. Ask her when you see her. <laughs> Ready, Mrs. Crawford? Waiting for you. All right. Just look at this man and tell me if he's... Uh... Okay, okay. Put him back. He's mine. Can we get out of this place now? Of course. Now, through this door. You want to sit down on this bench for a minute? Or else, huh? Sure, I'll sit. What do you think of my husband, Mr. Clover? Can you imagine it? Howard getting himself a piece of marble in a police morgue. When did you see him last? I got out of a warm bed yesterday morning on account of the phone ringing. It was for Howard. He pinched my cheek, said, Goodbye, honey, I'm going out of town. This happen often, his going out of town? In his line, salesman. And you didn't see him after that? Look, boyfriend, I was in the middle of a beauty exercise, bendovers for the figure. I was grabbing my ankle, so I looked back. There he was, going out of the house. Doesn't it seem strange to you that he didn't go out of town, that he was fine? It's strange to me he's dead. But I'm going to get used to it. Who do you know had a reason for murdering him? Murder? Thought you said he drowned. Do you like to swim, Mrs. Croft? You see this sunburn? You think I got it standing under a hot iron? Look at it, see? How you like it? Did you get it at that swimming pool uptown? Coney. I know a part of Coney where they carry a pretty good crowd. That's where this burn came from. There's a lifeguard at that pool. I go to Coney where they carry a million on a weekend. I don't confine me to public pools uptown. Did you have anything to do with your husband's death, Mrs. Crawford? Now, I'm a girl who's going to tell you the truth, boyfriend. Every time I've thought of it, I've wished Howard dead every hour on the hour. I'd have wished him dead on the half hour, too, but that's when the race results come over the radio. Howard, things have come true. I've wished for him. That's all, Mrs. Crawford. You can get out of here now. And watch her reapply the lipstick and readjust her clothes. And walk away from her dead to a summer rhythm that no longer held any part of him. A woman starting the new day fresh. The memory she had submitted to now happily dead on a marble slab. And at the end of the corridor, the street sunlight touching her face for an instant, darting away, leaving only pallor and the smear of scarlet on her lips. And 
Back in the office, order a shadow for Mrs. Crawford. Then a telephone report from Muggerman. He had found a girl who was the girlfriend of Bobby Kent, a box office girl at an all-day, all-night movie on East 125th. Lucille Lang, on duty for the rest of the day and night. How many? Police, Miss Lang. Take back your badge. It don't buy you nothing. You were a friend of Bobby Kent's. Look, Hugh, you want to lose me my job? All we want, Miss Lang. All you want is to mark me lousy with the management. A sweaty cop snooping around where I live. I know my girlfriend called me. Told me he had his nose in my affairs, asked questions. She had to tell him I was cozy with Bobby. All we want is something that'll give us Bobby's killer. Search me up and down, you won't find Bobby's killer. Then maybe someone who wanted him dead. All the kid ever did was steal a buck here and there. So he could make an impression on me. On my girlfriend. Boy has to die for that. He was a thief. Ain't everybody kiddo one way or another. To sweep out the locker room in a public pool. To empty the foot bath, scrub them out. You think that's the end of the rainbow for a kid? Did you know about the clothes he stole from the pool? The watch, the ring, the money clip? Sure, I know. He told me. I even know about the 500 bucks that was in the suit. 500? We were going to take it and go off to faraway places. Do you know something, kiddo? What? Bobby's dead from hanging, and I'm cooped up in a cage. So I ain't gonna make it, am I? Danny? Well, come on in, Margaret. What do you want? An opinion. About what? About how soon we should pick up Russ Gavey for the murder of Crawford and that pool attendant? If we pick him up, how long do you think we can hold him? A killer, Danny, he's... How are you going to prove premeditated murder by artificial respiration? Now, maybe we shouldn't start from there, Danny. Maybe we should start from the attendant. Now, he killed Bobby Kent because Bobby stole the clothes. Because Bobby would learn that the clothes belonged to Howard Crawford. Bobby was a sneak thief. From there to blackmail him, one easy lesson. So we get back to Howard Crawford. You know what we need, Markovan. Yeah, motive. We gotta find out why. Danny! We got something, Gino? Officer Ratchie just called from a gas station on Queens Highway. Mrs. Crawford just rest registered at the Ritz Lodge Motel, about ten miles out of the city. Thanks, Gino. Markovan. Yeah, Danny. That shadow you got on Russ gave you, get him off. I don't want him followed. All right. Where are you going? To find out why a widow wanders far from home. <laughs> Where do you see? Bought some new clothes. You'll like them. Oh. You'll like them too, lover. You like them? Is that your going away dress, Mrs. Crawford? It could be for that, too. You've got a home in Manhattan, Mrs. Crawford. What are you doing here? Where is your home, boyfriend? And what are you doing here? I wanted to talk to you. Me and my sunburn made an impression, huh? So you got a flunky to follow me. You could have done it yourself. No uproar would have happened. Well, here we are. You still haven't answered my question. What are you doing here? Girl likes to get away sometimes. You'd be surprised how many phone calls I've gotten since Howard drank all that water. Here's a dime. Throw it in the radio. No? Then I'll throw it a dime. Yep, phone calls all day long. No, it's your turn. Just to talk, to kill some time. Ah, oh, that Kenton. Yeah, oh, what'd you say, lover? Nothing, I didn't say anything. Look, be a doll. Will you go away? Come back another day. I'll be here. Let's pick a Tuesday. Make a definite, huh? Why don't you go right now? Out the back way, through a window? Just get up. Hi, Russ. Got a little trouble. Come in, Russ. Close the door. I'll bet the lady told you to get out of here, Mr. Clover. Uh Uh-huh. You two know each other pretty well, don't you? Yeah, a swimming pool romance. I saw him in those California feet flippers and it twisted my heart. You two planning on going away together? I only ask because the back of Russ's car is loaded with suitcases. We're going to get married in Maryland. 
Is there a law? Yes, there is. There's a whole section in the penal code about murder. Oh, back to that, huh? I could have picked you up before, Russ, but I needed a motive. I had to find out why you murdered Howard Crawford. There she is. How did I kill him? By drowning him. You made sure the resuscitator squad wouldn't revive him. You crushed out whatever life there was in him. Listen to him, Edith. Yeah, listen. You killed Bobby Kent. He was a petty thief. He took the clothes you'd stolen from Crawford. Sooner or later, he'd put two and two together. Probably would have blackmailed you. You couldn't afford to let that happen. You ready, Edith? I'm ready. Only one thing, Russ. What? I'm a happy girl, Russ. I like to live happy. From just now on, you're going to be a burden. As long as lover here's got you, I don't want you. Both of you. You're an accessory, Mrs. Crawford. Well, that changes things right away. Russ. Yeah. Don't be a fool. Okay, your way, Russ. You'll never be the same. Ready to go back to town, Mrs. Crawford? It's the time on Broadway when the crowd gives up, goes home. Then it's the street of the dim moonlight and the dark whispers. The wind of the night. The wind that scatters everything. Yesterday's headlines. Yesterday's dreams. Yesterday's people. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at the same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. In tonight's cast, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Edith Crawford, High Averback as Russ Gaby, Stan Waxman as Mr. Hanson, and Michael Ann Barrett as Lucille Lang. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway is my beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
When it's September and the summer sighs away, Broadway is festooned with the colors of fall. The pastels of the cotton dresses mix sadly with the brown and gray of the flannel. And here and there, Broadway's shapely foliage turns to plaid. It's the time of the quickened step and the crumpled travel folder and Coney dyed beaver. And the September song is a deep-throated sound, the mob voice, the hay fever, and the oysters being torn from the half shell. Another season, kid. One more three months band to get where you're going. In the autumn days, have their six o'clock in the morning time, the just beginning another day time. It was a street where Broadway turns a corner into the 40s, where I was, and Detective Mugovan, and a woman. She's in here, Danny, this car. Right there on the floor in front. Who is she? Well, I don't know. No identification, no handbag. Just this. Hmm? Car registered to Edward Bishop, 1110 160th. Uh Uh-huh. Slip was in the glove compartment. Who found her? Officer Kaplan. Tagged it late last night for traffic violation parking. Five o'clock when he was going off duty, he noticed the car still wasn't moved. Opened it, looked. Found her under that blanket. I'd say she was about 27, huh? Shot once in the back. From up close. Yeah. Death probably instantaneous. Um, Here they are, Danny. In the front of the car, Doc. Hey, you're a new doc, aren't you? Uh, Don't move her, doctor. Wait for the photographers. But don't just stand there, doc. You gotta... (laughs) You get used to it, kid. This kind of thing happens a lot. And the cluster of the walkers to work, the people of the subway, glad for the delay of the dead woman, the dead woman who lies at the beginning of another day, stops it for a time, holds it, the desolate pause, the time for turning back. But the hungry day will not wait. Subways are empty and must be filled. The clever machines in the offices long for the fluttering caress of quick fingers. Can't stop for the dead kid. A buck has to be made. Give someone else your place in line. And in the corridor of the address on the registration slip, a woman in a raveled coat sweater sweeps away the night litter and autumn mists, gathers them on a dustpan, throws them into the street. You ask for Edward Bishop, and she shrugs you to a scarred door at the end of the hall, watches you as you knock, waits with you for the door to open. You're an early bird, mister. Police. Huh? Oh, my. The woman drops her broom, scurries away to tell her friends and neighbors. Early bird out to catch a worm, huh, mister? Not me, not for something I've done. I never do anything bad. You, Edward Bishop? Oh, not me. Mr. Bishop's my roomie. Uh, he gone and done something naughty? Come in, mister, and tell me all about it. Where is he? Oh, out frying his nightly kettle of fish, I presume. His bed ain't been slepted. No? Huh? Oh, oh my, that, that hollow you see in the bedclothes is where I tried it. Uh, I'm an experimenter. Long as he wasn't in it, I thought my roomie's bed might be better than my own. It wasn't. Mr. Bishop's gone and done something naughty, huh? Do you know where he is? I want to tell you something about Mr. Bishop, my roomie. He's a tight-lipped man. Rock face, I call him, when he ain't looking. That's because he never whispers a secret to me or shares a coke when I offer him part of mine. He just lets me dab his hanky with cologne sometimes when he's going out for a heavy evening. He had a lot of them, evenings like that? Well, for a man who has to shave twice a day, he has more than his share. You wouldn't know with whom. Oh, I might. But first you tell me what my roomie did to you. Maybe you'd find it cozier down at headquarters. Maybe that Japanese kimono you wear makes it... You're getting rough. Hello there, mister. I'll tell you what I know, then you tell me what you know, huh? My roomie's been squiring a lady by the name of Anna Compton. You know her? Oh, just to talk to on the phone. The lovely voice haunts you. When would you talk to her last? Oh, two or three days ago. I'll tell you just how it was. She kept calling here evenings, asking my roomie to call her back. Uh, Just leave her name, Anna Compton. (laughs) My roomie, squiring a married lady. Bishop never shared anything with you, and still I'll tell you about that, too. Her her haunting voice made me nervous. I told you I'm an experimenter. So one day I sat down with the phone book and called every Compton there is. Then a man answered and said his wife Anna wasn't home. Who was calling? (laughs) Of course I hung up. Then you know her address. In the New Rochelle phone book for everyone's eyes to see. Now it's your turn. What did Mr. Bishop do? A woman was found murdered in his car. My, oh, my. That's as naughty as you can get, ain't it? 
Mr. Blackburn said that. Then Mr. Blackburn reached over to my lapel, pinched off a piece hanging from the buttonhole, and dangled it accusingly under my nose. This is the way I left Mr. Blackburn. Then back to headquarters, issue an all-points bulletin for Edward Bishop. Then down one flight to the photo lab, be handed a picture. Tuck it in the black notebook where you've jotted the name of Leo Compton and his address in New Rochelle. Then the ride there to the community where the houses have the built-in attitude that violent death never visits here. In the next street, maybe it happens, or to a friend of a friend, but it never happens here. Anna? Anna, is that you? Lost your key? Anna, where have you been? Is your name Compton? Leo Compton, that's right. I'm from the police. My name is Danny Clover. Oh, uh, yeah? Uh, mind if I come in? Well, I guess so. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute there. Yeah? Police! Mr. Compton... It's about Anna. It's about Anna, isn't it? What's happened to her? Listen to me, Mr. Compton. All right, all right, I'm listening. I... Is Anna your wife? Yes, yes, yes. This, uh, this woman, this picture I have here... Yes, that's Anna, yeah. How did you get that? How did you get Anna's picture? I wish I knew some way to say this. Anna's dead. We found her this morning. She'd been shot. Oh. She... Her body's at the morgue. Anna. I've got to ask you... I know, I know. She didn't come home last night, Mr. Compton. No, no, you're wrong. She came home. Anna came home to me. It, It was my fault, really. I sent her away. I told her I didn't care. And the things I said to her, the names. Suppose the last words you ever said to your wife were names like that. What happened last night, Mr. Compton? Well, she came home. It was about seven yesterday evening. And she had the bracelet on. She was wearing a bracelet when we found her. She had the bracelet on. And I asked her where she got such an expensive bracelet to wear. And she said she got a bargain. A bargain. What do you mean? From her boyfriend. Oh, she told me. Anna told me all right. And listen. Listen, you know what I did? I called him up. I'm not narrow-minded. Things can happen just because it's your wife. It doesn't mean it can't happen. I called her boyfriend up. And I told him to come over. I'd pay him for the bracelet. Did he come over? Oh, he came over. Anna was stunned all right. And I wrote a check for the bracelet, $200. Don't you think Anna wasn't stunned? Mr. Compton. Did you know what she did? She left with him anyhow. Bracelet, check, she, and him. And that's when I said... What was the man's name? Bishop, Edward Bishop. He's an auctioneer for the Hunter Galleries. Oh, there's something else. Yes? I'll call for Anna. I'll take her out of that place where she is. Come in off the Avenue of the Americas, mister. Behind these dirty shop windows, there are bargains. Edward Bishop worked here? He did, till he killed himself a woman, ran up a parking ticket. You know all that for sure. I know Eddie. He works for me. The pitchman to end all pitchmen. The spiel that kills, that's uh, Eddie Bishop. He talked you into buying something you don't like, mister? You said he killed her. Why? You're a cop, aren't you? Come inside. I'll brew you something warm. It gets cold for everybody on the avenue. No, uh, leave the door open. A looker might want to come in to browse. That's how it is in the world. Lookers, browsers, handlers. Then walk out. Just like my Eddie. You want a sip of the warm brew? Why did you say he killed her? It's in Eddie to do a thing like that. It's what's about him that fascinates a girl. That and the clever way he handles an auctioneer's hammer. I could show you a three-time bruise. 
three times in your soul on a man like Eddie. You read in the papers a woman is found dead in Bishop's car, and that makes you know he's a murderer. That and the way he spoke my name sometimes after we closed up the shop. Zoe, he'd say to me. Zoe killed the long day for me. You don't argue with a man like Eddie when he talks like that. You knew Mrs. Compton? When the summer began to fade, Eddie started talking to me about her. How she looked when she walked in one day to bid on an object of art. Then how she looked over a cocktail at a corner bar. And then how it was with the lights of Coney on her face and in Eddie's car on the long way to New Rochelle. All this my auctioneer told me. That's how I know the dead Mrs. Compton. I'm glad for her. You never saw her with him, it was last night. I watched from behind the counter. I saw her shove her wrist at Eddie. Eddie put a bracelet on it, one he'd bought from stock. I thought it was for me. Right in front of me, he did it. If it was like that for them, why would he kill her? Who knows? Maybe she rubbed him the wrong way. Maybe she asked him for it. Eddie was a man to oblige a lady. Mm. All right. Thank you. Uh, do something for me, mister. What? You find Eddie Bishop, give him my message. Tell him I want an invite to his execution. It's been a dull season. Danny? Over here in the squad car. Hey, you got something, Muggerman? Well, maybe, maybe not. Guy was found dead in the building excavation over on 3rd. Nobody wants to touch him. Yeah, let's go. Drive down the ramp, Muggerman. Yeah. Well, this sidewalk superintendent's really got something to stare at now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what happened, mister? Him. Him and a scoop happened. Not far ago, I decided to scratch this ground. First scoop full of shovel come up with was him. Hey, let's get it down, huh? Sure. Okay. Yeah, real good. I'll take a look, eh? Shot, Danny. Now, here's a wallet. Hey, look at this. Check for two hundred dollars signed by Leo Compton. Uh huh. Paid to the order of Edward Bishop. Edward Bishop. He's the man we figured murdered Anna Compton. Yeah, the man we figured murdered Anna Compton. What? Well, what'd you say, Danny? Nothing. I didn't say anything at all. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Singers Alan Dale and Sarah Vaughn will be Steve Allen's guests on Songs for Sale just a little later tonight. Once again, Steve will be playing host to four amateur songwriters and their unpublished songs, one of which will be chosen for nationwide hearing. For merriment and melody, hear Songs for Sale later tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. <laughs> September morn dips a dainty toe into a Broadway billboard and unshivering gazes down upon a street that only yesterday was choked with summer. But the refuse is there, where summer has passed and left pieces of itself. In the scratch and warp of summertime blues still screeching out of the loudspeakers. The sunny mannequins, wax slightly melted, waiting in shop windows to be replaced by the fall and winter models. The faint odors of the sun-warmed perfume, the souvenir of the golden girl who walked right past you, turned a corner, vanished into a place where summer never dies. A place not open to you, kid. Only autumn's ahead of you, kid. Start using it. It's already giving you two murders. A woman in the front seat of a car, a man scooped out of the earth on the teeth of a steam shovel. What more can you ask? September's showering her gifts on you, kid. Take them. They're all yours.
And at headquarters, Sergeant Tataglia brings you your share of them. Holds them from you with a smile that shows he slept well last night. The accumulated datums on the murders, Danny. In these papers, I tease before you. And have a good night, Gino. No complaints come to mind, Danny. The evening was a fulsome one. Father McCleary came to call. A pleasant time was had by all, as is our usual procedure. Yeah, Father McCleary's a fine man. Salt of the earth. I asked Mrs. T to break open a bottle of Mogan Dovered wine. He don't even blink an eye. Sips with you, talks with you, brings presents for the Tartaglia brood. This is a man who also brings you the gift of restful sleep. Remember me to him, Gino. Roger, we'll go. Now, to the papers I am about to bestow upon you. In them, you will find a report from Technical, to wit. The bullets that killed Mrs. Compton and Mr. Bishop, Technical States, came from the same gun. Mm-hmm. Markings are identical. The rundown on the past histories of Mrs. Compton and Mr. Bishop is contained in reports from interested neighbors and relatives gathered hey, by... Uh, you spare me a moment, Mr. Clark. Look, you... Standard operating procedure is to knock when one desires a moment of Danny Come Clover. in, Mr. Compton. I've come to demand something, Mr. Clover, and I intend to, not leaving here until you give it to me. What would that be? Anna's bracelet. The one that... Well, everyone's dead. It belongs to me. Because you gave Bishop a $200 check for it? I stopped payment on my check. After all that, that Mr. Bishop did give it to Anna. I needn't have made that stupid gesture. And now she's dead. And he's dead. Yes, your wife is dead. You loved her, you told me. The bracelet's mine. You want to quibble about it? Have me spend money on lawyers? You're right, Mr. Compton. It's yours. Take it. We've no more use for it. We have photographs. You understand. It's not the money. It's only that if it once belonged to her, it now belongs to me. It's a kind of... Remembrance uh, of the dead? Well, I'm not going to think about it. I have enough trouble... Living in an empty house with no one to scrimp and save all my life, share it with Mrs. Compton. And the cost of things, Mr. Clover, it's outrageous food, furniture, clothes, and transportation. You know what cab fare cost me from New Rochelle? Five sixty. It's outrageous. You could have come in another way. Oh, yes, and be mocked at, pointed to, as the husband of a murdered woman. They put my picture in the paper, you know, and that makes me a curiosity, a freak. You didn't tell me when I last saw you, Mr. Compton. What did you do after your wife left you with Bishop? What's that? I said, what did you do? Go anywhere, talk to anyone? Well, of course I talked to someone. A man's wife walks out on him when he's given her all this. Who? Mervyn Mago. He's an old friend from boyhood. I go to him whenever I'm in trouble. He's a professional helper. He's in that business. He makes money by helping people? He runs a mission on East 40th. You'll like him, I think. Well, thank you, Mr. Clover. You were easier to deal with than I thought. Danny, a man's wife is murdered and he comes back for... Danny, you think... It's something to think about, huh, Jim? It was something to think about. Consider a man whose wife had been murdered. Consider, in space of 24 hours, his tears had dried, the shock of death had dwindled into something much more negotiable. A $200 bracelet, for example. The grief tempered by the high cost of taxi cab fares... Leo Compton had motive enough to commit two murders. His wife because she had run out on him. Edward Bishop because he had run with her. Motive, certainly. So check on his story. Item. He was a man who needed companionship at the time of stress. Specifically, he liked to talk to a man who ran a mission. Go to the man who ran a mission and ask questions. Glad you came to see me, Mr. Clover. I really am. So am I, Mr. Mago. A dozen checkerboards and a few back-issue magazines. You'll admit I do the best I can. Then there's always the coffee and donuts. The boys expect them. Standard fare for places like this. Sure. Now... uh... Once I got a bright idea. Put in a ping-pong table. Build it myself. You know, ping-pong for the boys. A little physical exercise. What happened? The boys didn't understand about ping-pong. Took down the net. Made a backstop out of the old magazines. Well, I confiscated the dice. (laughs) Loaded. How often does Leo Compton come down here? Sometimes often. Sometimes not for months at a time. Whenever Leo feels the need. Need of what? Someone to talk to. But why do you? Because he doesn't have to explain himself to me. The embarrassment of bearing himself to someone doesn't have to be done. I know him, Mr. Clover. I know him well. That's what I want you to tell me about, Mr. Mago. I guess it was 20 years ago I met Leo... We went to the same summer camp in the Catskills, a charity camp. I was his big brother, assigned by the counselor. 
You know, the older camper. I showed him how to put a French tuck in a bed. His swimming buddy. You know? Uh Uh-huh. And since then, whenever he got into trouble... With himself or with the world, he came to me. I like to think I'm necessary to Leo. I can understand. Leo is a product, Mr. Clover. The making of a living. The background of poverty. Even now, now that he's fairly well-to-do, it still eats him. What does? Even at camp, the pattern was there. He would organize little card games after lights out. Wouldn't play himself, but took a cut from every pot. That sort of thing all his life. I see. Tell me something else. When his wife ran out on him, he came down here to talk to you. What did he say? Not a whole lot. He told me the story. I listened. That's just about all he wanted down here. He told you and then he went home, is that it? Not right away. He told me, and then the boys started to straggle in for their coffee and donuts. He joined them. He always does. He ate four of those donuts, Mr. Clover. Oh, sure, Mugovan. What is it? I want you to talk to a man. Come on, Mr. Scott. Uh, This is Mr. Scott, Danny. Mr. Scott, Lieutenant Clover. I do. Uh, Well, sit down, Mr. Scott. Sure, right there. I'll be fine. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Scott. Give the lieutenant the bracelet. Thank you. I uh, thought it was the right thing to do, Lieutenant Clover. I saw the man's picture in the paper mixed up in a murder and... Then that he should all of a sudden the come to me, Mrs. come up was to me of all yeah, people, and out of, out of the side of his mouth, off of the Where did sunny... you get this bracelet, Mr. Scott? I told you, didn't I? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you mind telling me again? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Scott. Please do. Well, here I was walking toward the subway entrance on 59th Street, and he come up to me. Who did? The man whose picture was in the paper about his wife's being slain, that's who. It means Leo Compton. I mean Leo Compton. He plucked my sleeve. He offered to sell me this bracelet. He said he was making deliveries for a jewelry concern, and the bracelet was left over, and nobody seemed to know where it come from. Uh-huh. Uh, how much did you pay for it, Mr. Scott? Ridiculous price. He asked $5.60 for it, and that's what I give him. You, you might as well know, too, that he kept turning his face for me, but I certainly recognized him. That's why I've come here. A mug of right, Mr. Scott, a voucher for five sixty, And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Scott. <laughs> Call me in, Danny, and you ask me to step over into a department that's not strictly mine. And uh, why don't you wait for the reports from technical? Huh? All I want is an opinion, Dr. Sinsky. Whose toes would you step on if you give me that? Gordon of technical. <laughs> All right, so he deserves a toe smashy once in a while. What do you want of me, Danny? You examined Mrs. Compton. The bullet wound, yeah. the, the type of wound where it was in her back, is it one that would bleed freely? Oh, yes, Danny, but... You know these things as well as I. Why do you I just you got these photographs. Uh-huh. Hey, look at them. The inside of the car where Mrs. Compton was found. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Sinsky? <laughs> you know as well as I do. Tell me anyway. I, I want to be sure. It is obvious that the loss of blood in the car was slight, which makes it to me apparent that the woman was not shot in the car but somewhere else and then put into the car and... Uh, I'm a doctor, Danny, not a... A detective? I didn't mean it to sound like that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Thanks for the opinion, Dr. Sinsky. It's all around in the backyard. Go through the gate. Well, I hope you appreciate me crating all this stuff for you. Why aren't you, Mr. Clover? Moving day, Mr. Compton? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. My wife's things. It's hard to live with. I see. Giving them away, huh? Well, not exactly. Selling them? I saw an ad in the paper where they buy merchandise. Like... Well, yes, yes, I'm selling Anna's clothes. Why? How much are you getting for them? Why? I'm curious. Why? Five sixty for a bracelet worth two hundred. A man like you to do that strange. How do you know about the bracelet? The man you sold it to got scared. The bracelet was mine to sell. Why should he get scared? That's not the point, Mr. Compton. The point is why you should sell such a valuable bracelet for so little. You could have gotten more. I got what I wanted. Yeah, I guess you did. You broke even. Bishop gave your wife the bracelet, so legally it's yours. 
but you'd paid him for I it. I told you that. You gave him the check so we'd find it on him. So your story of what happened the night of your wife's death would hold up. What's that? But with Bishop dead, and the bracelet legally yours anyhow, why should you be liable for the check? His estate would have the check cash. Well, that's right, I did. I, I gave him a check for Stop it. Stop payment on it, too. That's right. Why should I spend money I don't have to? Sure. You see what I mean, don't you? Sure. You know, you're a funny man, Mr. Compton. Well, I guess people say that about me. I don't care. You're so careful with money, and you're an honest man. But you couldn't stand having that bracelet around. It was a symbol of what your wife did to you. See, you sold it for the cost of your cab fare, even all round. (laughs) That's how much you know. I lost plenty. I lost my wife. You're a funny man. I told you my wife had a boyfriend, and I was ready to forgive her. She walked out on me anyhow. Oh, she would have come back. Don't you worry about You'd already that. killed her when you called Bishop. Look, I ki- I told yeah, you that. Yeah, I know. I told you how it was. I said that. Then when Bishop arrived, you killed him, too. Wrote out a check and stuck it in his pocket. Put your wife and Bishop in Bishop's car as if she left with him. She did, I told... Oh, you didn't listen at all. I could call technical. They'd find blood in your house, no matter how hard you scrubbed. You don't understand anything. I worked hard all my life. I put my own price on things. My wife belonged to me. She was mine. And nobody gets her. Not for a $200 bracelet, they don't. What do you think I am, anyhow? Let's go, For a bracelet? What good is that? What does she need that for? As if it were something. I'm a hard worker. Things I own didn't come easy. What's going to happen to them now? Mr. Clover, you better get in touch with Mr. Mago. He'll know how to advise me. Well, he's just like a big brother to me. It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, this Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. Walk it slowly. Lean your heart against it. Shop for the kicks, the bargains, the heartbreak. Until it all explodes in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Howard McNear was heard as Leo Compton. Featured in the cast were Billy Hallop, Lou Krugman, Joe Forte, and Francis Cheney. Two styles of music, both tops in popularity, are heard every Sunday over most of these same CBS stations. Guy Lombardo's sweetest music this side of heaven is one. The other is the singing style of Mario Lanza, new vocal sensation of the airwaves. Enjoy Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians and the Mario Lanza show tomorrow night. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde on Sundays on the Columbia Broadcasting System. to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
In autumn sunlight, the September day trots out its promises for Broadway's considering, displays them in doorways, in push carts, in gutters, decorates them with price tags, invites you to browse, don't touch, buy, don't squeeze. And at cut rates are the second-hand delights, the tears slash down to any man's purse, the bolt ends of dreams. The vendors simper, the hawkers wink, buy, kid. That's a winter sun on your shoulder, and the day is short, so buy. And that's what you do, kid, because on Broadway, there's no other choice. And at police headquarters, the September's day has arranged its wares of violence on your desk, stacked as to category, degree, grade. Because the day is still fresh, you put off the reaching for them, the touching of them, but it screams close to your ear. In the morgue, Danny. Come down, I got something of interest to you. And walk the corridor to the room of the dead. Through the swinging doors into a place without season, where all nights, all days are of equal length, where temperature is constant, where the wind is conditioned before it's let flow over death. Walk up to the man who waits for you. A nervous twitch, Danny, to juggle things in my right hand. Maybe I'll be remembered for it. What have you got, Dr. Sinsky? The man lying there. They found him in his bed last night, murdered. These that murdered him. Two bullets. Look. Uh, a twenty-two and, and a thirty-two. Uh, wouldn't you say so, Doctor? That I wouldn't know. What I know is only one of these was needed to kill him. Either one. The man was wanted dead twice, Danny. He was killed twice. Two bullets, different size, twice dead. You know who he was? When they brought him to me last night, there was a tag on him. A name, Tom Keeler, an address, the Nixon Hotel. Nothing else. No other word to the living about why such things must happen. You're sure, Doctor? Uh, You're sure that the... Each wound was a mortal wound, Danny. Each wound could... Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. You want these, huh? Yeah. Take them. And that's the way my day began. And the ingredients of it were a medical examiner, a murdered man, and two bullets. In a room of no value except to the dead. Except to those whose business is with death. Consider that briefly, then push it away. Leave, go, get out. And hurry. And in the corridor, find what you're looking for. The breath of air not controlled by a thermostat. Then the walk down the hall... Turn over the two bullets to technical. Then outside, in the squad car, and the ride to West 25th Street, and to the Nixon Hotel, to the five-story brownstone that seemed to list from pressure of the insurance housing project next door to it. Go in. Ring a bell. Wait. Be greeted by the man in gray suspenders and no shirt. Morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Danny Clover, police. Randy Quantrill, hi. You had a little trouble here last night, didn't you? Oh, just a mess of it. Did you know the man who was killed? You mean Tom, huh? That's right, Tom Keeler. What do you mean, know him? Uh, Talk to him, have a beer with him. Said hi to him, that's about the extent of my to-do with him. How about visitors? Did, Did he have any? Look at the sign over my shoulder, Mr. Clover. Mr. Clover, you know some clovers down in Selma, Alabama. You any kin no, any no, clover? No, no, no. Look at the sign over my shoulder. No visitors, no visitors. And you think just because the sign is there, Tom Keeler didn't have any visitors? No, no, I don't, mister. We got a sign in each and every room says no smoking in bed. In the last year, we had three mattress fires. So what I'm saying is I never saw anybody sneak past this desk that I said to myself, there's a Tom Keeler visitor. What else about Keeler? Oh, we got mail this morning. Maybe I ought to tell you that. Yeah, maybe you should. I'm going to. Fresh mail that come this morning. Here, a letter. Oh, thanks. From the Great Northern National Bank. So I see. Please come in and talk to us with regards to your commercial account at your earliest convenience. You read upside down, Mr. Quantrill? I've lived in Baltimore. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Quantrill. Thanks a lot. And for that, Randy Quantrill winked at me, laughed noiselessly at me. (laughs) Leaned against the mail rack, 
scratched his back with it. It wasn't the moment to intrude any longer on such private pleasures. So I left him. At the Great Northern National Bank, a guard, uniformed in tattletale gray, took my name, my business, walked down a marble aisle with them. An aisle lined with identical desks, identical faces behind them. Unerringly, the guard chose one, the right one. This was a shrewd guard. He muted his voice to the extracurricular business I had brought to the Great Northern, offered it to the man. The man considered it, digested it, and when he had it all in order, motioned me to the chair the guard had placed discreetly close to him. I'm told we can help you, Mr. Clover. A man named Tom Keeler had a checking account here. They're aware of it, therefore... Then you know that he was murdered last night in a cheap hotel? They're aware of many things, Mr. Clover. Our research... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What'd you say? <clears throat> I say that our research department makes a point of informing each of us here on many diverse matters. Matters that could even most remotely concern us. Thank you. Beg pardon? Uh, I said thank you because you let me hear what you had to say. Hmm. I was appointed, Mr. Clover... Should any questions arise about the late Thomas Keeler, should any questions arise, I was to answer the question. Your interrogation is what, Mr. Clover? We down at headquarters think it's strange Tom Keeler slept in a flop house when he had a checking... Checking account with us? Uh Uh-huh. Philosophical question, Mr. Clover. Somewhat out of my problems. Uh, Pardon me, what? I say that all we know of Thomas Keeler is that we were asked to transfer $50 weekly to his account, which we have done religiously until... Who asked you to do that? Counselor of Law, General. George Webber. If you want his address, we shall give it to you. Thanks. Uh, you were saying you did this until... Until what? Until two weeks ago. Possibly two weeks in the fraction of a day. When Mr. Webber asked us to discontinue his generosity. Why? I suggest that it's a personal matter concerning Mr. Webber. I don't mind troubling you with it. What? What? I, I'm sorry. I, I said uh, that I would... Never mind. Probably wasn't important. <laughs> And go to the Park Avenue apartments of George Weber. Be told by the person at the desk that Mr. Weber is not at home. Perhaps at his office, the person suggested. And be handed a slip of paper with the office address in a handwriting with the eyes dotted with small circles. Weber and Marley, the slip said. Attorneys, finance building, suite 12. Go there. Go through a door and pass the beam of an electric eye. And wade through a carpet to a desk and an olive-skinned girl with tight black hair. Offer your name, show your credentials, and be told Mr. Weber is out. Would you see his partner, Mr. Paul Marley? You would. You nodded past another door and another beam. And to a slender young man who is waiting for you in front of a wall lined with every law book ever written. Be chaperoned by him through yet another door. There he was, Paul Marley. Partner to George Weber, impeccable in morning coat, striped pants, and an army discharge button in his lapel. That'll be all, Robertson. Now, sit down, please, Mr... Uh, Clover. Clover. Please sit down. Thank you. The information you gave out there says you're a policeman. That's right. And this is about what, sir? What can I do for you? It's about a man named Tom Keeler. Keeler? Keeler? man found murdered last night. Yes. Shot twice with different caliber bullets, either one fatal. Yes. Is all this a matter of legal advice for the police department? You want to know if a man was shot by two people and each That's shot... That's not it at all. Uh, Tom Keeler, it seems, was supported by your partner. By Mr. Weber? That's right. Each week, $50 was drawn on Mr. Weber's account and deposited in favor of Tom Keeler. Uh, surely there's, there's no mistake. Some... That's the way it was. But I know Mr. Weber so well. His affairs, everything. Where is he? On Fire Island, since the day before yesterday, he has a place there. I'm pretty sure he went there. A lot of season for Fire Island, isn't it? Oh, I don't think so. The end of September? Mr. Weber goes there all year round. Whenever. Whenever what? Whenever he's disturbed. He has the idea of the sea, the strand, the loneliness of it. Personally, I don't... What was Mr. Weber disturbed about? Well, he has a sister, Peggy. She's just 20, so you can imagine. No, I can't. Beautiful girl of 20, rich, and you can't imagine. Look, Mr. Marley... My partner was constantly arguing with her. We're a conservative firm, Mr. Clover. Individually, both Mr. Weber and myself What's that got to do with Peggy? Peggy Weber is headstrong. How? I take my partner's word for it that she's headstrong. Therefore... And they argued, Peggy and her brother. What about? I have no idea. And he went to Fire Island to recuperate. One way of saying it. Anything else, Mr. Clover? No? Then please, 
these documents here, if you don't mind. And get in touch with the authorities at Fire Island. Check on the whereabouts of Mr. George Weber and wait. And an hour later, a phone call. Mr. Weber is not on Fire Island. Mr. Weber's place there is deserted. From the looks of it, hasn't been inhabited for over a month. So come up with a conclusion. Mr. George Weber was missing. Put out an old points bulletin on him. And go back to his Park Avenue apartment. Make a request of the management. We're always glad to accommodate the uh, police. Then uh, let's go, shall we? Of course. Mr. Weber's apartment, right this way, down the hall. Yes, sir. Although, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to know why we should intrude. Don't worry about it. Yes, sir. Open the door. Of course. And here we are. Yeah. We are, aren't we? What? What did you say? Uh, what did you say, Mr. Clover? I didn't... Oh. It stopped both of us. The management and myself. It was a sight that needed only one glance, and the details were there forever. The free-shaped coffee table and the grotesquery of the man spread beside it. The tracery of blood that stopped abruptly. Mr. Weber, that's Mr. Weber. The penknife, bone-handled and cheap in his heart, to be remembered. Details in the death of George Weber. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There will be a slight pause while we think of an adjective to describe Mario Lanza. Sorry, guess there just isn't one adjective to describe a guy who sings just as well in the popular range as in the classics. But here's a suggestion. On CBS Radio tomorrow night over most of these same stations, don't miss Mario Lanza's All Request Show. And more of the same by lovely Giselle McKenzie and Ray Sinatra's music. When the night slips out of Broadway's fingers and the false dawn blurs the shadows, Broadway stands bewildered. The carnival is run down. Only the stragglers walk it with their step without pattern, like their dreams. And the color of their loneliness is the darkened neon, the last sparks of a cigarette butt, and pavement gray. And they walk it. They never know. Broadway's closed for the night. And somehow or another, whether it deserves it or not, the world gets to be nine o'clock in the morning. Then there's a place for everybody. It's daytime, breakfast time, work time, make a dollar time. Or as Sergeant Gino Tataglia said it... Lend me a dollar, Danny. Oh, sure, Gino. Here. Ah, thank you. The reason for this transaction, Danny, no, is... No, you don't have to explain. I want to. I want to. Go right ahead. Thank you. Mrs. Tartaglia forgot to tuck my dollar into my lunchbox today, as is her wont, for the little things a man needs during the day. She just phoned me and confessed her deliction of duty in this matter. Gino... She it... said, ask Danny for it. And tomorrow, she will tuck in two dollars so that you will not go hungry. Tell Mrs. T not to worry. Roger, we'll call. And now, Danny, to the chores of the day. Knife which did George Weber in was of the variety which can be purchased at our leading hardware stores for the nominal sum of one ninety-eight. Practically untraceable. Prince? Wiped clean. Go on. Well, that's about the sum and substance of the intelligence which has been shunted from the downstairs to the here, Danny. As of now. However. Yes? A young lady is in the ante room and wants to see you. Who is she? A Miss Peggy Weber, sister of the most latterly deceased. Get her. This way to see Danny Clover. Now, sit down, Miss Weber. Well, that'll be all, Gino. I'm glad you came, Miss Weber. Your name's right here on my calendar to see today. I knew you'd want to question me about George. How did you hear about his death? I was home, the late news on the radio. You see, I didn't live with my brother. We didn't get along. Oh? It's going to be a lot simpler now with him gone. I'll wear a black dress like this one for a month and call it a decent interval of mourning. It's not any concern of mine, Miss Weber, Oh, it's but... entirely your concern, Mr. Clover. Your position demands that you locate people who would have motives for murdering my brother. I would. Did you kill him? A few of my friends and I got together some time ago. For kicks. We were going to try things together, you know. 
was for kicks. Black magic. Well, I spent the first ten days of my membership sticking pins into my brother's picture. And all that happened is that he got a sty on his eye. Outside of that, I never harmed a hair on his head. Why all this hate, Miss Warner? Simply this. I love a boy. I told George about him. George got red, then blue, red again, and then a lovely color I never saw before. He found out who the boy was. Ruined him. Who is the boy? Ralph Clay. Now runs a bowling alley on third. Uh, one more thing. Do you know a man named Tom Keeler? Not offhand. Why? Oh, never mind. Uh, well, leave your address with Sergeant Tataglia, Miss Weber, and thank you very much. You, Ralph Clay? Huh? Oh, hello. He asked me. It's my dying day. You walked in on an empty hall, mister. Feel real sorry about it. Oh, don't be. Uh, this way we can have a long talk. Shall we? Uh, don't let it get away from us, mister. I want to take care of this thing coming up. Kingpin, seven pin. Challenge. What do you think? Go ahead. Watch me. Never say go ahead to me in that tone, mister. Not on that shot. My quirk, each day I live for it. I'll remember, Mr. Clay. Look, police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stick your thumb in the ball, mister, please. Have fun. I'll write it off under entertainment. Joint's bad, no one will know. Something Peggy Weber said. It, it sent me to you. <laughs> Peggy? A girl of class. she tell you I kill her brother? I got the impression she was in love with you. Pity the girl. She lives in ancient history. In a time where she loved and I loved back. But ancient history. Under the bridge. Peggy did something to you? She had a brother. Now dead, I read. It stopped me for a breath on the way to the sports page. George Weber did something to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm a man who likes to talk about it. My daily nourishment. Share it with me? Huh. Georgie Porgy Weber didn't like how his sister used to put her hand in mine, so he marked me lousy. How? Standing before you, Mr. Police, is a boy who once thought he was a lawyer. Cap in hand, he went to Georgie, assumed to be brother-in-law, asked for a job, keep it in the family. Georgie smiled, shook his head no. And with words and music, he told me it spoiled for me any job I took from anyone he knew. Because you loved his sister? I was second in my class in law school. You want to invent other reasons? Why well, hate Peggy for it? Things like that run in the blood. I'm going to stick around till it comes out and Peggy and slaps me in the head. Then that gives you a motive for having killed Weber. Yeah, ain't had a luck, you know. And Tom Keeler, what did you have for him? Keeler? A man who got killed in a flea bag. A man Weber supported until... Typical, typical. This supporting him. Good old Uncle Tom was an old friend of George's and Peggy's father. After the father died, Uncle Tom still hung around. Why is he called Uncle? Peggy calls him Uncle because he was her confessor, her hero. Everything that ate Peggy, she brought to good old Uncle Tom. Not to her brother. Who goes to a man like that except to kill him? <laughs> I give you something to ponder, Mr. Police? Yeah, you did. I'm glad. Makes me want to live through another day. <laughs> Watch the bitter boy make his strike. And consider the lie he'd flipped to you. The girl's lie that she didn't know Tom Keeler. And wonder over it. Jot it down in memory as a future conversation piece with Peggy Weber. And then, remember a man who said he knew all about George Weber. Everything. Everything but the mention of Keeler's share in his partner's life. Go to him. Wait for him to finish his preening. To taste to the full the decorations bestowed upon men of know-how. Got this little time machine for being on my toes, Mr. Clover. Handsome tidbit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Seventeen jewels, Hamilton. All because I proved in court the chap's wife had been unfriendly to said chap. <laughs> Look what the grateful devil had engraved on the gold. To chum Paul Marley for setting me free. To chum. What was there about Tom Keeler that shut your mouth about him? My... My... My compliments, Mr. Clover. Brilliant strategy. 
Attack while the enemy celebrates minor victories. In tactics class at Fort Meade... You tell me to... about Weber. Personal things about him. His sister. Why not about Tom Keeler? It pained me. For George's sake. My deceased partner's sake. It pained me. You'll show me where it hurts. You think you'll be able to understand? Don't answer. It doesn't matter. Keeler was a derelict, a bum, a hungry shadow in George's closet. That's why George opened that account for him. To keep him from coming here to beg. George and I had a large investment here. The presence of Keeler was Weber hardly... cut off the account. At my insistence, my counsel, it made quite a row the other day. Between Tom and George, I had to shoot people back to their desks. You killed George Weber? Attack, attack. I admire your method, Mr. Clover. Well, the investment, the plush carpets, the perfumed secretaries, the junior partners, all yours now. You kill Weber for that? The death of my partner was a great loss to me, Mr. Clover. A personal loss. Were it in my humble power to hunt out his assassins, I would dedicate my knowledge, my life, my... Yes? Uh, Danny, something I can do for you? Uh, Dr. Sensky, I have an idea about something. I want you to check it for me. Gladly. Get out the medical examiner's report on Tom Keeler. Gladly. Yes, sir. Uh, here. What do you want it for? I want to put it side by side with this one I've got on George Weber. So? Here, look. It says uh, Weber died day before yesterday at approximately 6 p.m. Uh-huh. And it says on this report that Keeler died about midnight on the same day. You know what that means, Doctor? No, what? There's a pencil on your desk. Figure it out. You used my address after all. Mind if I come in, Miss Weber? This evening you can go as far as calling me Peggy, but you can't come in. I'm afraid I'll have to... You'll have to force your way in? Well, I could relish that. Peggy. But a friend's visiting with me. Ralph Clay? You said the password. If you know that, you might as well come in. Ralph! Come out, come out wherever you are. Say hello to Mr. Clover, Ralph. I told you a big fib, didn't I, Mr. Clover? Well, now you know. I didn't know whether you'd broken off with Peggy or not. It doesn't matter anymore. You want to ask Peggy questions, huh? You too. Goody, goody. You lied to me too, Peggy. Because I'm a liar. I give Ralph a lot of trouble that way, don't I, Ralph? Let's just listen to what the man has to say. Your lie about Keeler, Peggy. You said you didn't know who he was. I explained it to you. I'm a liar. I found out who killed your brother, Peggy. I said I... We heard you. There were a lot of motives floating around, Peggy. Yours. Leave her alone. She didn't kill her brother. I did. Oh, cut it out, Ralph. Peggy. Ralph had nothing to do with it. I did it. What's the matter with you, Peggy? You're crazy. You're a liar. You lie. That's why you're saying you kill your brother. Ralph, Ralph. Neither one of you killed him. You thought Ralph did, Peggy, and Ralph... What are you trying to do to us, Clover? What are you doing? Police methods trying to get us to play against each other? Take it easy, Ralph. Go on. Take it easy, Ralph. Take it easy, Ralph. What are you trying to say? Talk, talk. Tom Keeler. Killed Peggy's brother. What? Clover, so help me out. Listen to me, both of you. Clover! Let him talk, Ralph! Keeler killed him because his source of income was cut off. A man like Keeler could kill him. A desperate man, a man without livelihood. A tramp who made a habit of living off someone else's generosity. Ralph! Ralph, it was all my fault! You found your brother dead, didn't you, Peggy? Yes, and I. And you thought Ralph did it? Yes, I thought. Oh, Ralph. It's going to be all right, baby. And Peggy went to her Uncle Tom like she always did when she was in trouble. Told him Ralph had killed her brother. What did Tom Keeler say to you, Peggy? He said... He said not to worry. Just not to worry. Then he got in touch with you, huh, Ralph? Yeah. Yeah, he did. You know what he told me? I think so. He told me Peggy killed her brother. He was a killer all the time. And I'm supposed to be a bright boy. So I had each of you believing the other had killed George Weber. 
How much money did he want from each of you to protect the other? Oh, what difference does it make? Doesn't matter anymore. Blackmail. That's why Tom Keeler's dead, too. Murdered. Yeah. You slapped the cuffs on me for that one, Chloe. No, Ralph. No more. You don't have to anymore. Mr. Clover, my uncle said he wanted everything I had to keep quiet about Ralph. So I went up to his hotel room while he was sleeping. And I shot him. No. No, Peggy, that's what I did. That's what you both did, to protect the other. You both shot Tom Keeler. <gasps> Peg. Peg, baby. Pe- Stop her! Stop her! There's a time on Broadway when the crowd gives up, goes home. The lights buzz fitfully, die. Then it's a street of dim moonlight and dark whispers and the wind of the autumn night, the wind that scatters everything. Yesterday's headline, yesterday's dreams, yesterday's people. It's Broadway, the the gaudiest The most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lillian Bayef was heard as Peggy Weber, Anthony Barrett as Ralph Clay, Paul Fries as Randy Quantrill, Bob Bruce as Mr. Chase, and Edgar Barrier as Paul Marley. Here are two Sunday features that have captured America's fancy year in and year out. On Sunday afternoon, the distinguished music of the Symphonette, directed by Michel Piastro. On Sunday evening, the outstanding vocals of the Coraliers. Listen for both these musical treats every Sunday on most of these same CBS radio stations. The Symphonette in the afternoon, in the evening, the Coraliers. Stay tuned now for Songs for Sale, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, this Monday night, Lux Radio Theater features 13 Hollywood stars in the Gala Salute on the CBS Radio Network. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's October and the night has slipped down over Broadway, the street is spangled with autumn strollers. They come here, the seekers after something or other. Pick a doorway with promising neon. Pick a smile and run after it. Pick a postcard, write home about it. It's a place to be. You've got to leave your mark. Buy a turtle and have your name painted on its back. Buy a necktie, buy a pillow and send it back to Mom. Sometimes you'll be lucky and get lipstick on your handkerchief. But the odds say you'll buy a newspaper and go to bed. But it's Broadway, kid. 
and you've had it. And where Broadway ebbs off into the side streets downtown, where I was, close to where I was, close to where 18th Street touches the river, the shock was a thing composed of crowd and a nighttime sky lit by flame. The elements, later to be noted in police and fire department records, fire at Russell's Chemical Company. Time, 4.15 a.m. They're bringing somebody out now, Danny. Uh, strange. What? What'd you say? I said it's strange, Mugovan. After four in the morning, why should anybody be... Uh, come on, let's see. Put the stretches down here. Somebody better... How are they? Huh? Oh, hello, Danny. These two, I think that's always in there. I just started to say, somebody better get a priest. They're both dead. This one is. The other one... Danny, is... look at him. Ed Coster. Huh? Do something for him. Don't hey, let Doc, him. Doc, over here. Ed Coster. Hurry up, Doc. You know him, Danny? Yeah, he's a policeman. Policeman? What was he doing in there? Doc, do something for him. In the flames beating against the night sky, burning an opening for dawn. In the street, their reflected glow darts across the face of death, holds for an instant, then scurries at the breath of the October wind. This is the time of shadows, the brief time, the time for shrouding of the charred body of a man. The time for quick gentleness. And the other man, still in anguish. And the lifting of the men of the vehicle reserved for the dead and the dying. The closing of a door upon them. The hushed ride that puts an end to night. In the morning at headquarters, watch the sergeant lift a phone, dial a number, and after a silence, ask for news of a man who was known to him, who was a friend. It's me again, Dr. Sinsky, about Ed Coster. Any change? Any... No. Ah, thank you, doctor. I'll keep calling. Gino. What do you want? Ed, how is he? You heard? No change. Hits us all, Gino. Coster's that kind of man. Ed's been to the Tartaglia house, dangled a Tartaglia child on his knee. He'll make it. Ed'll make it. Sorry, Danny. I, I keep thinking about Ed's wife, Vera. I, I keep thinking... You got something for me, Gino? Yeah, yeah, I got something. I'm sorry, Danny. The man found with Ed, the dead man, technical checked up on him. In ways they got to check on such things. Fingerprints, maybe. They know who he is? We got a file on him this long, to my arm. Joe Gant, professional arsonist, a man who sets fires. In this way, he makes his daily bread by burning. Anything else? It's on the record Gant was friends to Frankie Crown. Oh? How were they friends? Gant once lit a playful little bonfire in a machine shop concern. Frankie Crown bailed him out, treated him to Frankie's lawyer. Gant got off. Let's see Frankie get out of this one. I hear Frankie's a big man now. Eh? Not that big. I'll want to talk to him. Yeah, but maybe you better listen to this other thing first, Danny. What? It was called in a few minutes ago. The automobile of one George Russell exploded, blew up in the face of his daughter Patrice in the driveway with a booby trap. Russell? Of the Russell Chemical Company, where the fire was. Home address, uptown, 1923 East 112. Thanks, Gino. Dr. Sinsky, me again. About Ed. Any change? Any... No. I'll call again in a little while. Yes? Mr. Russell? Yes, what is it? My name's Clover, police. Oh, morning long, you police. Mind if I come in? I suppose you may. In here. This is my daughter, Patrice, Mr. Clover, another policeman. Hi. How do you feel, Miss Russell? Mm, got my pinching hand in a cast. Oh, the disadvantage of it all. <laughs> Wait till Jimmy sees it. Patrice. It was your fault, Daddy. Wasn't it his fault, Mr. Clover? I understand your car blew up this morning. Well, not mine, his. Daddy's. What happened? Her car is in the garage being repaired. I loaned her mine. You see how it's his fault, Mr. Clover? He spoils me. I only wheedled him for the car this much. This much, and he patted me and said, Yes, my darling daughter. 
And you stepped on the starter and it... And it blew. The way things do, bang, like that, bang. She's a lucky girl. <laughs> Fortunate me. Hand in a sling, gauze on my cheek, and plaster dappled with it. <laughs> Poor Jimmy. Your car booby-trapped, Mr. Russell, your plant set fire to by an arsonist. An arsonist? That's right. The man who died had a record of arson. What's happening? I, I don't understand. Oh, Pop. Hey, Pop, how's business, Pop? Patrice, you'd better... Do what, Pop? My business is fine, Mr. Clover. If you've got any idea, I had my Pop place. Pop carries burned. a lot of insurance. Uh, cut it out, Patricia. Look, Mr. Clover. What? Don't pay any attention to her. I know you police have to think along certain lines. If it was arson, what happened to my plant, you've got to think maybe I was the cause of it. Look for reasons. Well, I netted 70000 last year, and this year it's better than ever. To coin a phrase. What am I going to do with you, Patrice? I'm a mess, huh, Daddy? Mr. Russell, there's some connection between the arsonist who was found and a hoodlum named Frankie Crown. Do you know Frankie? Frankie Crown? A hoodlum? Why should I? Look, Mr. Clover, I didn't ask you into my house to listen. I just asked. That's all he did, Pop. I don't know him. Never heard of him. All right. It's fun, huh, Mr. Clover? Hoodlums, arson, booby traps... The nice things that can happen to a modern miss. Oh, brother, wait till Jimmy hears. Tonight's the night he won't be able to shut me up. And consider the girl for a moment. Consider the delight she had found in the touch of horror upon her. Then the intrusion of her father's face, stricken with the sudden fleeting understanding of the girl. Then turning to you, trying to smile, trying to erase the impression his child has made. She's suffering a shock she doesn't understand, Mr. Clover. She doesn't know why. And the girl looks up, laughs at him. <laughs> and leave them like that. <laughs> then to the discreet office of Frankie Crown in a discreet downtown building dedicated to the deep understanding of stocks and bonds and the affairs of commerce. The shiny new setting for Frankie Crown, hoodlum, alley boy, friend of dead arsonists. And Frankie holds out a discreetly manicured hand to have it shaken. Only it doesn't happen to him. Mm -hmm. Have it your own way, Danny. I thought it would spark something between us if he shook my hand. You're a long way from home, Frankie. Blessed, that's me. I've been blessed. Wipe your hands of the old life and a new world shivers on the horizon waiting just for you. <laughs> Gotta try it, Danny. Been to any good fires lately, Frankie? Oh, busy, 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 busy. Frankie Crown has been so busy you couldn't conceive. No fires, no street dances, no fun anywhere. The penalties of the new life. Dear. A friend of yours was at a fire, though. <laughs> I got crazy friends. They flip over the craziest things. Joe Gant, arsonist. Friend of yours, Frankie. Somewhere in the back of my brain, the name Gant shivers. Uh, help me, then. The consensus is he set a fire early yesterday morning at the Russell Chemical Company. He died in it. Can't. Can't. You bailed him out once, favored him with your private lawyer, got him off. Joe Gann. I did all that for him. We got a memory course at headquarters, Frankie. You just signed up. Don't get hard, Danny. Doesn't suit you. I always said about Come you. Come on. The touch of your hand brought it back to me. Can't. Some way he's got a mother. I know because she came to me that time, cried on my sleeve. Please help Joe, she cried. He's a good boy, she cried. Made my eyes water how with my dough and lawyer Joe Gant was going to reform. So I gave in. I break up at a mother's tears. Maybe she'll cry some for me. You going looking for her? No, don't bother, Danny. I bought her a place in her old country. She impressed me so much as a typical mother. You close all the doors behind you, don't you, Frankie? The mark of a polite man to close to it. How about the one on George Russell? It come over the tape. The Russell plant burned to the ground. This morning, his car blew up in his daughter's lap. Now, there's a door that's never been opened to me, Danny. The Russell door. I'm blessed, huh? Absolutely blessed. You get out of there, back to headquarters, sit at your desk and shuffle your thoughts. The coincidence of a booby-trapped car and a fire... The link between a hoodlum, newly respectable, and an arsonist, newly dead. And another man, a businessman, who had a daughter, who tried to find a category for her. 
try to find me. Danny Clover. Dr. Sinsky, I'm calling from the hospital. How's that cost her? Get down here, Danny, right away. And go there. And the only sound in the corridor is your footsteps. A, a sound that hurries toward pain. Open a door and find it. Doctor. He's dead, Danny. Vera. I'm sorry. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In days of old, when knights were bold, King Arthur and his round table were the rage. History's not exactly repeating itself, but the best entertainment of Arthur Godfrey's weekday shows is every Sunday afternoon on King Arthur Godfrey's round table. Listen for it starting tomorrow afternoon on most of these same stations. King Arthur Godfrey's round table on CBS Radio. <laughs> The October wind shrills through Broadway's corridors, sets in motion the light bulbs dangling from twisted, frayed cords, grates the new autumn soot against scarred window panes. And Broadway walks faster now, the wind that slept in the summer warmed rivers awake now and sirens the coming of the cold days, the gray days, the days sodden with autumn's mists. And the corridor people, the doorway people, try to hold back, clutch once more at the sunlit visions that never happened. But the October wind shrieks it out of their hands, pushes it into a corner with the rest of the debris. That's how autumn happens to Broadway, kid. Go fight it. And autumn has other sounds. The lingering overtones that float in from a hospital corridor. A woman's call to a dead husband and... 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 Vera... Vera, let me give you something. Let me give... Don't... Don't talk to me. Just for a minute. Don't talk to me. Vera. It's all right now, Danny. Empty. Nothing. There's no more crying left in me. I'll get you something, Vera. Something it says on the bottle that makes you feel better. I told you, Doctor. There's nothing I want. Nothing I need from anyone. Ed was a fine man, Vera. We... You'll miss him? You, Danny? You, Dr. Sinsky? All of you? Vera... They say death comes when... It... They say bitterness won't help. They're dead wrong. It helps. I'll take you home, Vera, then when you... Some other time we'll talk... About Ed? Yes. What's wrong with now, Danny? You can talk to me about Ed now. We never held secrets from each other. I couldn't understand something... What was there about Ed Coster you couldn't understand? Only how he happened to be at the scene of the fire. How he must have been there even before... He was cold, Danny. An anonymous call. It told him a fire was being set at that chemical company. It even told him what time to get there. Did he have the call traced? It came from a public phone booth. Ed was new on the burglary squad. He was glad for the tip. He thought it would make for a good start on the burglary detail. He thought maybe... He'd been maybe... on the narcotics squad before that, put in for a transfer. Do you know why, Vera? Because I asked him to. Because I didn't like the idea of his being on the narcotics squad. It... It didn't fit Ed. Ed was fine. A good man. He gave me all his love. All his generous. And listen to her until the time comes when your only answer is silence. And not silence quite, because the screaming questions intrude themselves. What is the word to give to a woman whose husband is dead? How do you fill in reports? How do you make a statistic out of it and file it in a ledger... 
How do you write heartbreak as a number? You don't know how. So you turn your back on it. Leave. And to headquarters again. Call in Detective Muggerman. Tell him to get out the record of Ed Coster. And wait. And a while later, a door opens and Detective Muggerman walks in. I got it, Danny. Okay, put it down. Aren't you going to look at it? What's the matter, Muggerman? You're restless? I'll look at it. I know you will, but I think you ought to look at it right away. Look, Muggerman, you... All right, then I'll show you. Hey, you see it? Here. This arrest, June 12th this year. Patrice Russell. Uh-huh. Ed arrested her for the possession of narcotics. Now you know why I wanted you... Take it, Muggerman. Lieutenant Clover's office, Muggerman speak. What? Bad? Oh, sure, sure, right away. Danny. Uh-huh. A bomb was thrown into the home of George Russell. When? A few minutes ago into the living room. The fire department... Let's go. in the house, Danny. I checked with the boys in the fire department. You looked yourself? Yeah, Danny, I did. There's no one else in the house. Just him, you and me. You ask about his daughter? woman in the crowd outside told me she saw her go out a couple of hours ago. Described her wearing apparel right up to her hat. The woman in the crowd leans out her window and notices things like that about her neighbors. You make a note of what the girl was wearing? It happens to me like a reflex now, Danny. They tried to kill Russell once before. This time they made it. Can't we go into another room and talk, Danny? The way it hit him at the... In a minute. He must have been sitting at this window. The force of the explosion threw him... Yeah, like that. They sure wanted him dead, didn't they? Then routine. Put it on the teletype for all the precincts. Have men go to places where a girl like Patrice Russell might be. Wait... Patrice Russell is at none of these places. Then an all-points bulletin, find Patrice Russell. And more routine. Out of your office, down two flights of steps, down a corridor, open a door. And for all that effort, a man named Gordon greets you. Close the door, Lieutenant. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. Don't you ever open a window in here, Gordon? For fresh air? You need fresh air, Lieutenant? Oh, poor you. Down here in technical, you're hermetically sealed. Take a whiff, Lieutenant. Hermetic, hmm? About the fire at the Russell Chemical Company. I've been sitting here for two hours watching the door, waiting for you to scrape in here, Lieutenant. You need Gordon again, don't you? Look, Gordon... Don't raise your voice, Lieutenant. I'm a civilian technician. I don't have to bow my head and shuffle my feet when you talk to me. Next time you walk in here, say to yourself, don't raise your voice to Gordon. What about the report... Nicely phrased. Here. Mm -hmm. In case the three-syllable type words make you scratch your head in utter dismay, I'd better tell you. The fire was not only set by an arsonist, but there was an explosion. Explosive neatly placed to explode at a comparatively low heat. It was a... Danny, I got a morsel for you. You... Close the door. Close it yourself. Let's get out of here, Gino. I said... I heard what you said. Come on, Gino. What have you got? Patrice Russell. Detective Fuller spotted her in the village. She climbed the stair and went to a party at 1212 Bank Street, where she is at this moment. Thanks, Gino. Patrice Russell. Thanks. Patrice. Cut in, Danny. Cut in. Come on, dance with me. Come to me, Danny. Come to me. Come on, we're getting out of here, Patrice. Buddy, where will we go? Just away from here. I've got to talk to you. My car's outside. I know a lovely place to talk. Outside in the halls, far enough. Halls are trapped. Come on. 
or you'll bruise me. <laughs> All right, come on, let's go out in the hall. Here? Here. For what? Your father's dead. You kidding? No, you're not, are you? How? Someone tossed a bomb in your living room. Poor Dad. Poor Daddy. Who did it, Patrice? Honest, I, I don't know. Poor Daddy. I loved him, you know. I, I really did. But he loved you. I know. I know he did. Patrice, you... I, I wasn't very nice to him, Daddy. You know something? Every morning I, I'd wake up and say to myself... This is a day that I'm not going to hurt Daddy. And it never worked out. I want to ask you something, Patrice. Because I never tried. Around breakfast time, I'd think of something to do, and, and during the day, I'd find out a way to do it. What about the narcotics? What? The narcotics. Oh, no more, Danny. I promised him that. And I kept my promise. I took the cure, and it worked. I haven't touched it since. Not since that detective picked me up for it. His name is Ed Costa, Patrice. He died because of that fire at your father's place. I'm sorry. Listen, Danny, about the narcotics. I want you to know it's all over. It lost me everything. I had a boy. We were going to get married. And he's gone. You know what I do now? I go to parties. Like this. Goodbye, Danny. And leave her, and leave Greenwich Village. Ride uptown to the one stop you had to make, the final stop. In front of a canopied entrance to a Greystone apartment house. Have your badge sniffed at, then be told the man you're looking for is a penthouse dweller. Find the elevator, press a button, because the man you want is 30 floors away. Get there, and the man you want is waiting for you as you step out. Hey, come on in, Danny. Thanks. Yeah, like Frankie's new house, Danny? Classic. <laughs> Wait till I show you outside. I got the city for an awning. Come on, I'll show you. All right. My Manhattan Tower, Danny. I'm happy for you. You uh, figure on renting a place like this? That's why you come to look? Uh-uh. And a what? I want to take you away from all this, Frankie. <laughs> Too much sweat got me here, Danny. It isn't going to be easy. Not hard. Just a walk to the elevator and a ride downtown. Uh-uh. There were times when that could happen to Frankie no more. It's going to happen. It's got murder in it. What are you talking about? George Russell. What about him? Dead. Had a bomb pitched through his living room window. Rumor said you used to do things like that, Frankie. Uh-uh. Rubber balls through tenement windows when I was a kid. I'd give it up. No future. It all gets back to Joe Gant, Frankie. Come on, Danny. You're in a classy place. Make classy conversation. What about you again? The connection between you and who? Finish the visit, Danny. I got a day. It'll wait. Maybe I can still catch it, Danny. Maybe she's got a friend. You want me to try? Don't bother. Well, let's finish the visit. Sure. It started way back in June. What did, Danny? Come on, come on. When Patrice Russell was picked up on a narcotics charge. George Russell, Patrice Russell. What is it with all these Russells? George Russell must have pleaded with the officer not to press charges against his daughter, Patrice. He didn't make it. The charge nearly wrecked his daughter. All right. What's this got to do with me? The arresting officer's name was Ed Coster. Russell was going to get back at him. (sighs) Danny. He found a way to do it. Somehow he found out Coster was transferred from narcotics to burglary. That was his chance. (laughs) That's my day, Danny. I don't like to keep a lady waiting. Tough. See? She's impatient. Tough. I'm telling a story. Russell came to you. He said he wanted a fire set in his place for whatever reason he gave you, for whatever amount he gave you. Look, Danny... You better forget it. So you arranged it, sent Joe Gant. Joe set the fire all right, but he was followed by Officer Ed Coster. Because Ed got a phone call telling him where a burglar would be at what time. All right, so they both burned... Why should that keep me from a date? The phone call to Ed came from Russell. Russell rigged the place to blow up when the fire started. It blew all right. Gant was killed. Ed died. And I wipe a tear with the back of my hand. You couldn't let Russell get away with that. One of your boys was killed. Bad for your reputation. You evened it. The bomb in the car didn't work, but the bomb in the living room did. Danny. You can say goodbye to her on your way, Frankie. I asked you, Danny. You didn't agree. It killed you. Put down that gun. Yeah, 
You're not going to get to say goodbye to her, Frankie. She went away. Broadway is wearing its harlequin clothes. It winks an eye and beckons. And in the press of crowd there, a pale girl walks like a queen because Broadway's a dream street. And there, that man with begging eyes, hungry for a new dream. It's a laugh or a cry with nothing in between. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Anthony Barrett was heard as Frankie Crown. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Paula Winslow, Herb Butterfield, and Ed Max. My friend Irma is everybody's friend Irma. There's something downright appealing in that gal's goofy mentality. And every Sunday evening, Marie Wilson stars as the world's most adorable dumbbell, my friend Irma. Kathy Lewis is her level-headed roommate. On most of these stations, Sunday nights, enjoy CBS Radio's My Friend Irma. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, the Frankie Lane Show is your date for slick syncopation every Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the sunlight of an October morning, Broadway stands on its street corner and breathes deep of the autumn-filtered air, presses out of its lungs the taste of the night past. This is the time of day when neon is silent, spectaculars doze. The shadows have not yet found their final shapes, and the pavement is flecked with glints of sun fragments. Doorways are opened on the October day, and the night dreams are swept into the gutters. It's the time of the coffee and cakes, and break from the starting gate. And the odds, even up, you never come in. And where I was, the sunlight filtered through Italian damask, swiftly caressed Grecian fragments, a torso in black marble, a head in stone, pocked with antiquity, a glass case with golden coins hermetically sealed against corrosion and desire. And impervious to it all, the man who leaned fastidiously against a Grecian column then lifted his glass of champagne, silently toasted the bust of Plato, 
then let the realization flow over him that a policeman was there among his treasures. You respond well, you people, and quickly. Bravo. At headquarters, they said your call sounded urgent. Did they say that? How perceptive of you people. The extraordinary qualities one finds in the most unimaginative of... Uh, delicious. That's right, Mr. Hanson. No imagination. That's why you will have to tell me the reason I'm here. It's exquisite. You'll be ravished by it. Uh, shall we set it off with champagne? Look, I... will reject the bubbly. It's going to be such a grisly day, Miss Clover. I promise you. It's off to a good start. Goodbye, Mr. Hanson. Come back, idiot man. Come back. In this room full of dead antiquity, there is so much vibrant death, pulsating death. And you turn your back on it. Idiot man. Someone's dead? There will be. Does the statement chafe up an emotion in you? Who? Nola, my wife. Once of such beauty. Such beauty that would put all these, my Grecian delicacies, to shame. That torso, for instance. It would blush to its tippy toes at the beauty that once was Nola's. But no more. And she's going to die because... There will be violence of one sort or another. Death? It is almost too much to hope for, is it not? Though Nola deserves it. How that old girl deserves it. She's done something? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. She convinced a boy to come here all the way from Europe. Not down as of a boy. Kurt could turn on the old girl. Young gods turn on old beauty sometimes. Destroy it because it offends their sense of the aesthetic. Kurt? Kurt Bauer. A young thing with a pair of skis. I fear Nola is playing with her own demise in that boy. And she's not aware of it. No more than she's aware that... That what? That my daughter Connie, by a former less colorful marriage, also has no love for Nola. You must talk to Connie at her place on Sutton. Ask her why she loathes Nola so helplessly. It'll amuse you. And you, Mr. Hanson, what about you? Why? I, too, am a creature of violence. Delicious, isn't it? I don't know one day to the next how I'll react when something's taken away from me. I fear for Nola, Mr. Clover. Such an exquisite fear. That's why you called us? But exactly. Nola's a lovely old girl. I'd fret if there was so much as a scratch on her. You'll prevent that, you people. Won't you? If you can. If you can. And saying it, Mr. Hanson poured himself a drink moved over to the slender Grecian column, faced me, and took his stance next to Plato. He fingered his mustache, cocked his head, and used a half of his mouth for a smile. That's the way I left Mr. Hanson. Then call his daughter, be told that Miss Hanson was not at home momentarily. Momentarily, she had an appointment elsewhere, at Rockefeller Plaza, the ice skating rink. So go there. Have her paged. Miss Hanson. Miss Connie Hanson, please. And watch the skaters briefly. The young thing who catches your eye in pirouettes. And Swifty, the rapid boy on racing blades. And the lady who gets up again, brave and intent, and skates close to the rail. And the very tall young woman who skims out of the crowd and talks to the announcer. Hi, Miss Hanson. Uh, that man has to wait. Do you want to see me? Yes, uh, my name's Clover. Uh, can we sit down? Sure, if you want. I'm from the police, Miss Hanson. Go on, go on. I'm not panicky. I had a talk with your father a little while ago. What's his current burden? I'm not sure, Miss Hanson. He seems to be worried about your stepmother. <laughs> he should have started to worry about her 15 years ago, the day he married her. If I were he, I'd give up by now. You know, come philosophical about her. What did he say about stepmother Nola? He said something would happen to her. Somebody... Kurt? Would... He mentioned a name, Kurt Bauer. <laughs> Kurt Bauer. You know something? I've been waiting for Kurt for two hours just to cross hands with him and dance a blue Danube with him. He won't show up. Would you show up for me, Mr. Clover? For a girl who's six feet tall? I want My her. complexion's not so bad, but look at this hair. Ever see hair like this on a girl? I chuckle to myself when I put lipstick on my face. Tell me about Kurt Bauer. Hmm, see me gush? Don't make me do that, Mr. Clover. I'd titter and poke you with an elbow. Well, just tell me who he is. Young man, we found him in the Italian Alps. We? Stepmother, Nola, and I. We were skiing. 
Something came out of the blue and plopped down beside us and made nasty little slaloms in the snow. That was Kurt. What's he doing here? Stepmother Nola stopped waxing his skis long enough to tell him she could get him a job come winter at Lake Placid. Then why would he want to do anything to harm her? My daddy tell you he would? <laughs> Dad was ribbing. He's a river. Great sense of humor. He reads Plato and hits passers-by over the head with folded newspapers. How about you? You don't like Mrs. Hanson, do you? I don't like any woman who's lovely. You blame me? Now, pardon me, Mr. Clover. There's a tall man skating over there. He's alone. I never saw him before, but maybe he's looking for me. I'll give him something to look at. And watch the girl skate away with a surprising grace, glide to the center of the rink, and begin an endless whirling, a whirling whose fuel was disappointment and frustration, the frenetic spinning, turning, cutting of numerals into ice, the magic symbols to draw beauty to her. And it doesn't happen until the awkward crash against the spectator's railing, the clumsy fall that sparked only a laugh, and no one helps her to her feet. <laughs> Check now with the proper authorities for an address on Kurt Bauer, ski instructor. Be given it. Go there. To an apartment whose odors are of wax, of oiled wood and steel. And blend it with it the perfume of the woman who runs her fingers across the boy's mouth as he speaks. Please, Nola, please. The man frightened you, Kurt. You've met his type before. Don't be frightened, darling. You will understand, Mr. Clover, that Mrs. Hanson... Nola, darling, Kurt, Nola. Please take your hand from me. In the presence of this gentleman, it is not... You realize what you're doing to this boy, Mr. Clover? You frighten him. Because he's been harassed by men like you before. By police? You're all alike, whatever they call you. Police, authority, men on horseback, men in uniform. Only you're not, are you, Mr. Clover? On horseback, I mean, or in uniform. But Kurt has met you before. What it... Mrs. Hansen is trying to say for me, and I would wish she did not... Kurt, I was only trying to... What say... Mrs. Hansen is trying to say is that I served with the Nazi Alpine Corps. Against my will, that I deserted them, that my innocence has been proven by your occupation forces in my native Germany, that my relationship with Mrs. Hansen is only... Only that, Mr. Clover. I I'm a sort of fading employment agency for young men who fly beautifully through the air. Your husband said he was afraid for you, Mrs. Hansen, that something was going to happen to you. Something bad? By whose hand? Your stepdaughter's, maybe. Kurt's, maybe. Your husband's, maybe. Shall I give you my reaction? Mrs. Hanson, I'll we... give it to you, my reaction. Connie, my stepdaughter, pathetic girl, she's so in love with Kurt. She might hurt me, even try to kill me. Yes, she might. And I could understand it, believe me, I could. And my husband, you've met him. He's vicious, no? But if he stooped to soil his hands that much, it would astonish me. And Kurt, my Kurt, could you hurt me? Why? I want you to go away from here, Nola. Some place where you will be safe, where you... You're frightened for me, Kurt? You don't want anything to happen to me, your nice American friend? That inn in Vermont. There is snow there now. You will enjoy it, Nola? We'll talk about it, okay? When this gentleman leaves, we'll talk about it. I wish to assure you, sir... He's that... leaving now, Kurt. See? I'm helping him with his coat. And then we'll discuss it. Here. A tug on your jacket, Mr. Clover, and you're ready for the street. Goodbye, Mr. Glover. Danny? Come on in, Muggerman. Oh. What's on your mind? Nothing. Just going home, Danny. How about you? Yeah, a few minutes. You bowling tonight? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Well, don't do me any favors. You don't feel like bowling. Say you don't feel like bowling. Yeah. I'm... What's the matter with you? I'm bewildered, Muggerman. You ever get bewildered? That's why I bowl so much. It takes my mind off the many times I'm bewildered. I can't figure those people. Each one of them. Dale Hansen, his wife, his daughter. That Kurt Bauer. What about him? I don't know. If I said they were strange, would you know what I meant? Uh-uh. Me either. There's something shrill about all of them, like, like they were waiting for something to happen, like each was waiting for the other to make a move. Mm -hmm. One of them was... Danny Clover speaking. Dale Hanson, Mr. Clover. 
Yes, what is it, Mr. Hanson? Have you been inside Kurt's apartment recently? About three hours ago. Why? I suggest a revisit. I strongly suggest it, Mr. Clover. Goodbye. Who was it, Danny? I'll tell you on the way. Come on. Door's wide open, Danny. Thank you very much for the information, Margovan. Go on in. Right, all right. What's supposed to be here in Kurt's apartment? I don't know. Look in that that room. Uh, yeah. Danny, look. Look, Danny. He stood there in the doorway, Margovan did, pointing, pointing at Kurt Bauer, lying there on the bed, arms outstretched like the beginning of an embrace, like the end of one. And beneath the white silk scarf around his throat was the shaft of a ski pole, steel-tipped, impaling him. It was the thing that killed him, the thing that had murdered Kurt Bauer. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Robert Q. Lewis is in the Waxworks for a solid hour of pop tunes every Saturday night on CBS Radio. If you go in for Tin Pan Alley favorites, come in for Robert Q.'s Waxworks just a little bit later tonight on most of these same stations. Robert Q.'s name guests who know their music and sometimes sing it. America's discs, America currently sold on. Enjoy them all on Robert Q.'s Waxworks later tonight on CBS Radio. <laughs> It's the time that was saved up for, Saturday night on Broadway. The time when the great explosion flings itself out over the city. And the lights climb in columns against the wall of night like licking serpents. Crowd gathers to give it voice. The hawkers, the gawkers, the hurry-up boys, the take-it-easy girls, the laughers, the weepers, the footsteps, the sigh of silk, the whispers. And inside, a thin sheet of glass away, the cocktails on the varnished bar and the piano, and the secret sounds from a corner table. This is it, kid. Broadway, in the blaze of the moon, Saturday night time. And the night had an hour in it to find a man murdered, to consider him, to watch the police technical department attend him, to talk to the med... ...then to leave... To make a call to Dale Hanson, summon him to headquarters. For the first time in my life, Mr. Clover, I feel, well, municipal, like a citizen. It has the shade of a sensation about it. You knew we'd find Kurt Bauer dead, didn't you? Of course. I called you from the phone next to his deathbed. I've been complimented before on my presence of mind, so you needn't bother. Did you kill him, Mr. Hanson? You are Mr. Clover's, I suppose you people would say, sidekick. Did you kill him? Certainly not. I went to give him his fee for making my dear ones proficient on ice. Let's see that medical examiner's report, Margovan. Thanks. Uh, Kurt Bauer died at about 7 o'clock, according to this. And I called you at 9. From 6 to 8.30, I was being sweated and massaged. You may check my club, the Hermitage Club. Well, check it, Margovan. Premacy 51110. Let me ask you something, Mr. Hanson. Certainly. You tried to throw us off the track, didn't you? Told me your wife was in danger while it was... Believe me, this whole turn of events is merely a pleasant surprise. Who killed him, Mr. Hanson? I suppose someone who's 40 is pleasant surprises. I caused you to frown. Forgive. Did you know your daughter was in love with him? She'll grieve. And your wife? My wife is a foolish woman. And harmless. Her attempts to recapture a lost youth is saddening, but I bear with it. I just spoke to a masseur named Bill, Danny. Yeah? Yeah, he baked him and massaged him from six to eight. Give him a half hour to get dressed. You're in the clear, Mr. Hanson. You can get out of here. Then the phone call to the Hanson apartment. Be plugged into the chauffeur's quarters. Be told in a crescendo of yawns that Mrs. Nola Hanson had been taken to Grand Central at about 4 o'clock for a jaunt to Vermont. 
that she packed three custom-made bags, stopped off at Brooks Brothers for an undersuit of Woolies. Then to your room to watch the October night die out of your reach. Then the morning and the quick searing coffee against the call to be made. The call on Connie Hansen, stepdaughter of Nola, hater of Nola, unloved by Kurt. Miss Hanson, please. Well, who are you? Police. Well, now, you mustn't trouble Miss Constance with why she tried to do away with herself. She tried to commit suicide? When? Last night. Can I see her? Well, doctor left things like you to my discretion. Can I see her? Well, I don't see what harm it'll do. Come along. Miss Constance? Didn't make me any more attractive, did it? I thought maybe. Why, Miss Hanson? Why? Kurt did, haven't you heard? I ever tell you about Kurt? Beautiful Kurt, handsome Kurt. You're not a woman, so you don't know what it was when he touched you, even by mistake. He never drew his hand away from you the minute he did. I could gush like this forever. You could have killed him, tried suicide knowing it wouldn't work to make us think... <laughs> You're a ray of sunshine, Mr. Colmer. <laughs> you really are. A big help. You're thinking I could kill Kurt. <laughs> that makes me something, doesn't it? Really something. A girl a man could want. <laughs> a man could want a girl like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Hanson. I... You better leave, don't you think? Danny? Oh, hello, Gino. Happy holiday. Oh, thanks, Gino. I... Holiday? What holiday? You kidding? No, no, I'm not. What holiday? Why, Danny, on this date in 1774, Samuel Adams did call together the Continental Congress. Oh, uh, I guess it slipped my mind. Uh, don't let it bother you. Last year, I forgot to. And, Danny, to celebrate this auspicious occasion, I gave my oldest, Emilio, a new Columbia bicycle. <laughs> Why, what a happy, laughing lad he was upon receiving it. I'm sure he was. Well, Danny, let us not twaddle. To work. If you insist. As indeed I do. However, the news I have to give you is pause. It's what? Pause. Not much of it. I put in a phone call to Vermont... And the inn where Mrs. Hanson is staying. She was out walking the hills, so I left a message to get down here post-haste. Now, what else do you know? Well, I already told you, Danny, that the news was... Oh, hello, Muggerman. Hi, Gino. Uh, Danny. Yeah? I've been over the immigration department most of the morning checking on Kurt Bauer. Mm, what'd you find out? Oh, not much we don't know already. Uh, he was in the German army deserted. You know what Kurt told you. Just one thing, though. Yeah? Bauer came over here with his mother. Set her up in a little house out in Flushing. Uh, here's the address. Oh, thanks, Mugman. Kurt was something fine, Herr Clover. Something beyond your understanding. I met him, Mrs. Bauer. Talked to him. He told me he was a deserter. My Kurt was a man of intelligence. When promises. Dreams were not what they pretended to be. Court fled from them, as he fled from your authorities in our country. He said he'd been an unwilling Nazi, and that he was cleared. He was, but it was still flight, because Mrs. Hansen beckoned. She loved him. Many have loved Court. Many Mrs. Hansens. Younger, richer, less greedy for youth. And many husbands have wished my Court dead for this. Dale Hanson? A curious man. This house, it was his gift to court. Court's clothes, his apartment, money to spend. You mean they were a gift through Mrs. Hanson? No, no, from him, from him personally. Because my court went to him when we came to your country, explained to him his interest in Mrs. Hanson was only professional. She had talent for skiing. Explained to him his gratitude for the opportunities of your country. My court was an intelligent man. You could call it that. 
Was it not intelligent of him to call to Mr. Hanson immediately when you found him with Mrs. Hanson? When you told them of her husband's fear for her? Kurt did that? Immediately. To ask of Mr. Hanson the favor of money for our return to our home. Kurt had no wish to be present when... And what did Hanson do? He promised Kurt the money. He told Kurt to come here to me. He would bring the money to us. You wish more from me, Mr. Clover? No, no nothing. And leave there and get back to Manhattan and back to headquarters. Check in and make another phone call. Call Vermont and talk to a desk clerk and be given answers. Then to a Park Avenue apartment where you'd been once before. Mr. Clover, come in. And watch Mr. Hanson as he took up his post again next to Plato. And then notice that to the room another treasure had been added. His wife, Nola Hanson. This is a delight. I'm glad you're back in town, Mrs. Hanson. We're all glad. You've heard about Kurt, haven't you? I cried for him on the train, all the way to Boston. Then she met a Harvard professor. He took a clinical interest in her. How'd you find out about Kurt while you were in Vermont, Mrs. Hanson? Your sergeant left word about what happened. The desk clerk at the end gave me quite a detailed report. I forgot to tell you something, Nola. What? I saw Kurt a little before the police. I went to his chambers to speak with him about you. There he was, that tool of his trade right through his chest. I cried. I really did. Have either one of you heard about your daughter, about Connie? Yes, she tried to commit suicide. But she does that frequently, Mr. Clover. However, she's very careful not to succeed. By now she knows precisely to the pill her limit. She never exceeds it. Poor desperate girl. I wish I could feel more fatherly about her. Well, how could you, dear? Connie's so tall and you know. Let me ask you something, Mrs. Hanson. Yes? When I first met you, you were with Kurt Bauer. You were a different person. Nola has that talent. Thank you, Dave. When I first met you, Mrs. Hanson, you seemed so concerned about Kurt, so warm toward him. Well, he was alive then. That's your talent, huh? Precisely alive. Kurt was something shining, vibrant. Dead? Well, he's dead. He sure, sure is. Well, Nola... Mr. Hanson... Don't be embarrassed, Mr. Clover. Nola and I will say our goodbyes right in front of you. You planned it all, didn't you, Mr. Hanson? Exceedingly well, don't you think? Well, let a girl in on it, will you, boys? What are you two talking about? About something exquisite, Nola. I had a man murdered, and Mr. Clover can't touch me. You murdered Kurt? I didn't say that, my dear. What time did you catch the train for Vermont, Mrs. Hanson? Hmm? Oh, well, let me see now. The... Chauffeur drove me to the station a little before four, and the train left soon after that. The train left, but you didn't. What do you mean? There was a train at four and another one at eight. You took the one at eight. I called the inn at Vermont. You arrived too late to have taken the four o'clock train. You mean I stayed around that dismal station all that time? You don't pay attention, Nola. He didn't say that either. That's right, I didn't. You didn't stay at the station. You used that time to murder Kurt Bauer. Me? This is very important, Nola. You really should make an effort to concentrate. He said, you. Your husband said he had a murder committed. And he was right. He had you commit the murder, Mrs. Hanson. Dad, do you expect me to listen to that? I do. Indeed, I do. Your husband's a clever man. He understands people. He knows how people close to him will react. Right, right. He set something in motion, Mrs. Hanson, through me. He used me to frighten Kurt away from you. I told Kurt that something might happen to you. Kurt didn't want to be mixed up in it, so he ran. Like he always ran from everything, whenever there was trouble. Kurt didn't run, I ran. Kurt told you to go. And while you were away, he planned to leave the country. I found that out, too. I drew a diagram about what was going to happen. It has. So, congratulate me, Nola. They, they'll help me. That's more emotion than you've shown to me for years. Truly, Nola, I've missed it. That's why I did what I did. I grew bored about being embarrassed among my friends about you. Dale, help me. So you killed Kurt, Mrs. Hanson, because he was walking out on you. He told you that when you were waiting for the train, when you went to see him. Listen to me, Dale, you've got to help me. I was foolish. I was foolish before. You, you've stopped me before. All you had to do this time was to tell me to stop. And it was innocent, Dale, you know that. Listen, Dale, I was doing it for Connie, for your daughter. She's so unattractive. I was trying to convince Kurt to be kind to her, to love her, don't you see? Don't you see, Dale? 
And when you do have an emotion for me, my dear, it's so distasteful. Goodbye, Nola. Nighttime blares down Broadway. The canyon streets gather it in like some passion. And the night is a backdrop for a million fragments. Neon and roar and melting shapes and shock and clots of crowd. It's a fury that sweeps you up and holds you close and throws you into the gutter of your choice. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Betty Lou Gerson was heard as Nola Hansen and Ted Osborne as Dale Hansen. Featured in the cast were Mary Ship, Irene Tedrow, and Robert Boone. When Squire Jack Benny invites the whole gang to a swank Hollywood nightclub, the natural question arises in everybody's mind, who's picking up the check? They'll find out, and so will you, tomorrow night when CBS Radio brings you Jack Benny time. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, the Frankie Lane Show is your date with slick syncopation every Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>